carry oh, on I whatever see. it is yeah, that you're saying. Pause. Go ahead. Uh, well, sure, but like probably we should probably provide like the context, I guess, for why this discussion has arisen. Doblin died. <laughs> He's my favorite. And, and someone said Doblin? that, that was <laughs> Doblin was a real G. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Doblin. What something... was that? Was that his official name? Is was Dobby short for Doblin? I just, I just find it funny to call him Doblin. <laughs> Doblin, because he's a little goblin. Dobby he's the supposed goblin. to be an elf. No, no, no. Dobby the goblin. <laughs> what? He's what? He's a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. The goblins are the ones who run yeah. the banks. The, the, I dude, forgot. The, the, the goblins just straight up look evil, but then no. yeah, the house <laughs> not elves. Not Dobby, like, no, not him. He does look he's evil all cute, at all. Nice, but he's this is like slavery. It's so he's awkward. Fucking dead. It's really weird. It's just slavery active for the wizards. It's so like, oh gee, yeah. that's the sentient creatures, sentient magical creatures. Just they're just your slaves. That seems a bit. However, uh, you can give them a fucking sock. Sock. <laughs> And so, <laughs> it. It somehow I feel like if we were to rewatch those movies, we'd be like, "Oh, this is shit." Actually, people ain't ready. People ain't but it's so ready. different now, though, right? I mean, when these films or when the books were written and when the films came out, there probably weren't that many people sort of on Twitter going around looking for allegories for the Jews, for example. Which oh no, 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 yeah, it, it was just shit for its own reason. That was that's never gonna be a fucking argument from me for why it's bad. That's. The goblins own in the banks or whatever, like, I don't, it's the same, it reminds me of the whole orcs are black people thing, it's like, ugh, you gotta be careful saying shit like that, because it makes it sound like you're seeing it, where it may not necessarily exist, so sort of stuff, you gotta be careful, but, um, Harry Potter was filled with all kinds of crazy shit, like, it's, um, the, all Remember of the, how they the, casually introduced time travel into the third book and gave it to a girl so she could go to class? I was aiming more for, well, that's, you know what, that actually is an extension of what I was about to say. The dangers for the students. The insane levels of ways people could just die easily. It was, it was absolutely nuts. If and, you touch uh, any random object, it could be enchanted to teleport your ass to a different, totally new location. I, that's not going to be used to kidnap children forever. It was, um, it was something else. Undeniably, uh, and 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 you know we should do an Eve Havoc on that. I think those movies it would be funny. I would be totally down for an Eve Havoc. Absolutely. Would you be up for it though? Oh my goodness! <laughs> like, I, oh. Movies, I will be up like I'm flying through the air on my Quidditch. Is that what the kids say? The Quidditch. <laughs> on your Quidditch. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my Nimbus with, 2000. On, on your, going on your Quidditch with Doblin? Are you gonna yeah, go on Doblin and I are going to go on the Quidditch I, I adventure the, together uh, through Hogwarts. The, the reason why this has arisen is because somebody on Twitter said that like that Doblin guy dying <laughs> is like, the saddest scene in cinema. <laughs> so. I haven't even seen the movie's past. <laughs> Dobbers. Five? Dobbers was a real one, I'm just saying. Okay. Well, so, Dobbers, I, mean, I haven't seen it in a while, but I'm just going to take a wild guess and say that Schindler's List was a little bit more moving than, no. than Dobby dying. Just, just a bit. No. little tiny, tiny. Yeah, Tears and Rain ain't got shit on Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I watched the uh, the last two. Did, was that when, like, little Dobby guy? Like, is that, I think he died I, in one of yeah, those two. Dope. Yeah. That tells you how much of an impression those films left on me. I can't so, remember anything about them. Who, wait, who died first? Doblin or Dobbledore? <laughs> Dobblindore. Dobblindore. I like, remember people, that, was, that was a big thing on the internet when, it was uh, a big thing when Dobblindore was killed. Uh, yeah. I, before the book came out, she had said that a major character will die. And and everyone was speculating, who could it be? Oh, it's going to be this person. It's going to be that person. Nobody be expected person. it to be Doblin. Was... No one expected it to be Doblin, that <laughs> major character. It was the time that the most powerful three words in the English language at that time was Snape kills Dumbledore, because you could just ruin yeah, so much for so many that was people. It. It, was, it was really a good time to be an absolute But it was like a superpower, dick. because you knew, you knew something that people <laughs> didn't. That they I wanted could ruin the secret. rest of your year with these three words. And then it happened again did. with The Force Awakens. Han Solo dies, Han Solo dies, Han Solo dies, Han Solo well, dies. This yeah, I, 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 that's right. Like, when, when The Force Awakens came out, like, people were just tweeting. Like, if anybody ever said anything about the film, or, like, there were videos, people would just say, like, Han Solo dies, so you could, like, you just couldn't be on the internet if you wanted that wonderful movie, that great movie, The Force Awakens. I will say, spoiled. 
when that scene starts, it's like, so he's dead. Like, just if... Well, it's just, you know, if you it's, understand, you know. like, common filmmaking language, <laughs> like, you know like what's about dead. to happen. Yeah. yeah. And then if you know anything um, about the meta, you'd be like, oh, he's definitely dead. Well, because I don't, a lot of people have pointed out that, like, um, that Harrison Ford at the Disney Expo talking about, like, uh, the new Indi uh, Indiana Jones movie, that he looked way more excited about it than he's looked for, like, any Star Wars thing, like, in the last 30 years. I've never understood that, because I, I quite love Han Solo, I love Indiana Jones, but he seems to think only one of them is worthwhile. <laughs> it's like, it's worthwhile. Right. So much so that they'll continue to make bad movies <laughs> Indiana Jones instead of just letting him rest, leaving him alone. Get yeah. back in the fridge, Harrison. Do you, do you have any expectations at all for Indiana Jones 5? No. Like, in Who's way? directing it? Steven Spielberg? Uh, I think, it's I think the guy who made Logan, the guy who made Logan is doing it. Yeah, didn't he have a big old thing on Twitter, though? Oh, didn't he, like, yeah, I think he did. Super embarrassing. <laughs> Also, do you guys like the thumbnail? I do. I put, I have to I put slight I, effort into I, it, I, okay. I'm like, oh my god. Wow, you did put some effort into that. You got your little MS Paint out to like, oh, well, maybe even Photoshop. Like, to do your Maybe even Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> I am not an elf that is loved. I'm an idea. Oh, no. Yeah, I guess, I guess that would be the one she's most associated with. That's the classic <laughs> Joaquin. We ain't associating her with a good one. Yeah, that even is though the, you've chosen to do that, I will not do that. She is. She is. What's that guy's name? Who is always in the bad movies? Um, Jared Leto. <laughs> Jared Leto. Jared Leto's Joker. <laughs> That's who I'm associating her with. Um, I can't remember his movies. I just knew he was in the Suicide Squad, what, what, the what, Snyder what Cut, he? and Morbius. What's the what's the inspiration behind the Galadriel Joker? Like what what's the uh what's the Her what crazy grin? Idea? I thought what? I thought the grin just landed itself to a Joker smile. Um but then of course when she's like, on their horse. I would I would argue it's personifying the show is clownish, you know? Well There's sure, but clowny like clowny elements. Oh, I see. Well, I would say that the show has gotten more clown like uh, as it's progressed. I, I would say so three and four are ago. very clowny. I didn't feel that one and two were very clowny. They were more dry as fuck to me. They, yes. Well, I think I think I would say that uh maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit, but I think the impression that I had of after the first two episodes was like, meh. Whereas now it's like, nah, it's just bad. Like <laughs> it's it's just bad. Very bad yeah. Like, <laughs> I realize by the way, we managed to not talk episode two was bad the end of episode two is sort of that's what kicks it off because then you have the entire sort of freaky fish guy thing yeah you yeah well to clarify I, I thought yeah. one and two were bad i i just i think these they two were yes, worse yeah. yeah they were bad but Green now it's worse. like in, in really firm <laughs> bad territory maybe you'll agree when you hear our arguments precious audience maybe Who knows? yeah um but i was just yeah. gonna say we managed to not talk about the thing we were going to talk about we, 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 Which is our guest, oh, Lost Chord. No, Say hello. that wasn't even... That wasn't... No, no, no. The, the broader <laughs> topic that was raised by the, the Dobby thing, which is, oh. um, what is... What does it mean to try and claim what is the saddest scene in, like... Cinema? I like how he like, tried to introduce your guest, our guest and for you. He's like, not... no, back to the dead elf. Yeah, you... Cause you dead you, elves you... are much more... I like dead elves. I'm all fine with that. Oh, Try to fast track mm -hmm. guest intro, which happens after the intro intro, and then after that is the intro. And the intro Gosh, intro rags. is the conversation, which is yeah. how do we quantify what it means to be the saddest scene in like a film or in in the cinema? You know, I how would be curious that? to see what people like in general would say, but I don't know how. I we just go with general trends as the closest you could do. Well, like, I it guess seems the to be that most is, people. Um... Mm -hmm. Well, I, the only way to maybe say this with any objective measurement would be to get a study of people who have written down elements of a scene that they find sad so now you can put an objective number to how much a trend applies and then see what scene has all of those elements in it that's something um, of course it's it's just based off of what people generally tend to think or how I they guess, generally tend to feel. What is, I guess what it, that's like that's something. But um, what 
what's going to make people sad is always going to vary to some degree based on the things that are meaningful to them or maybe personal experiences that they have. So, like, even even if we could develop some, like, rule set that's going to... Feelings are pretty subjective, you know? Like, what? The, way, the way that you... The way that something makes you feel is, uh, that's pretty, uh, personal and subjective. And so, something that makes... Uh, this is, I'm pretty sure Muller and I have talked about this before. I get Probably. sad a lot easier with, like, animation, is something I've noticed. I, that just seems uh... to be the case. Like, animated films have, have often... Whereas I think you've often said, like, live action seems to... Yeah, and I've been at peace with that for a while. Live action gets to my heart quicker, um, and I've always assumed it's because I can more easily believe it's happening, uh, because like, it's just real people doing it, as opposed to drawn or animated or designed people, but that doesn't stop me from possibly shedding a tear with... I could already think of an example I'd give for one of the most emotionally affecting scenes recently, and it was animation. Would have been Go to Arcane, mm -hmm. probably, episode 3. Mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, I it's good. it's one less yeah. layer, like one less barrier between an act yeah. of humans' emotions. I wouldn't want to imply it. it's worse in any way. It's just that it's um, it gets to me faster. Maybe faster is the word yeah. I should go for, rather than more or something. Yeah, probably. You have to overcome yeah. that that barrier between you know the well, actor acting and me watching. I guess I uh, I don't know if like I would say that animation, like the character being animated, is a barrier in like um. I, yeah, I'm not sure that I would see the barrier, I guess. if it, It's that you have to take something, like you have a human actor who is, you know, acting out and emoting and everything, and then you have to do things on top of it, or there are steps in the way in terms of yeah, animating. But I, uh, and... but I say that, like, when it comes to animation, that there are some... When you think about, like, some... If you, if you look at, like, an animated character... Where like certain aspects of the face may be like exaggerated, or certain aspects of the face are downplayed. That like by doing that, by in some ways, uh, uh, I don't want to say like stripping away complexity because I don't think that that's what it is. Like deliberate choices that you can make to emphasize certain parts of the face, like visually compared to other parts of the face, like increasing the size of like parts of the face. That like that may have some effect on how potent. Uh, um, the effect is. Well, that could I, go I both know, ways, maybe. right? Um, uh, maybe. It could I'll... with, like, emphasis with, like, cinematography, I would agree. Like, like what parts of the face that you choose to focus on with, like, the real human. Because well, I'm following what uh, you're saying, it might actually, like, tap into some, in the same way that larger and softer eyes will always make us feel like something is cuter yeah. and safer, but yeah. it could be that there are plenty of people out there who see that and they're like, oh, now, now I don't believe this is a real thing, now it looks ridiculous, right. you know, that sort of thing. Well, maybe that would be, like, the nature of the craft, right? How effectively you're able to convey that through animation. Um, but also, it, that was a slightly different question as well from the one with which you began, because then you're talking about what individually, and in, on the individual level, at least it's the greater feelings of sadness within the individual, and then, of course, you can form sort of group assessments based on that. But if you're talking mm. about what the overall saddest, uh, most sad-inducing thing happens to be, um, then in a way, starting at that level probably isn't the best way to do it. I mean, what you do is take a very sort of a meta-analysis of it first. Just ask people to, you know, compare scenes, score 1 to 10, did you feel sad or not, and how sad did you feel? Once you've got that basic idea, then you've got a broad brush sense of what type of scene is creating more sad feelings among people, then you can go into sort of the individual aspects of scene construction or narrative construction and try and identify what the common themes that emerge are. Um, some people would find it easier to cry too animation and some people wouldn't but if you were to start with that sort of meta-analysis then you'd uh, you'd sort of you'd encompass both in whatever result you got i think that's probably <clears> the <throat> way that you would want to do this if you're gonna actually try to to uh like figure something out here in terms of sadness as like some sort of uh something that you could track and like figure out you know like sounds like for films being suggested is to pull the audience on how sad they were from 1 to 10 when Doblin died, and we need to see because that's well, animated um, well, and real life so, at the um, same I time. Think be, I think that an important question to ask these people is like, yeah, but have you consumed more stories than Harry Potter? Like, mm -hmm. have you <laughs> have you watched lots of other movies or read why lots would, of other why books? Would why, yeah, why, why would you? Yeah, what's the point? Why would you? Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> There's nothing that will surpass Dobby. <laughs> <laughs> Doblin's Captain Dobbers. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was. I, I wonder was... um how uh something I've noticed is that uh when like a story is based on on like historical events and is like in some I, I I've I've noticed that like if a story is based on historical events that it can um it can become like uh more. Ah, uh, don't it, like it. Can, it can be effective in in uh evoking like those emotional responses because you're like, yeah, but this this happened, right? Like you're like these these things happen, you know. Like if you, I, it, do you get what I mean? Like that sometimes it seems like films or stories that are based on historical events, uh, can like tap like into you're invigorated that by a sense of it, you know it, those people existed and they did something approximate in this, and I can feel even yeah. more sort of invested by that. Fact. You imagine a real person, yeah. Doing it, yeah. Well, I mean, like Saving Private Ryan, like all of the characters in that film, like they're you know they're not they're not real people, but like the experience the experience that they went through, like that those characters went through, was felt by real people. Yeah. And so, like, if, if you're like watching that film, you're like, you you like it's it's almost that the the events themselves, like World War Two, the the reality of World War Two, like sort of uh maybe that's like an example of something where it, it almost like has that direct direct connection or like that fast tracking that expediting of that emotional response yeah i, I think that's true because there's that thing right where like some uh, veterans were watching the film and they had to like leave because they were getting uh, incredibly uncomfortable with how especially the opening yeah. scene um yes the uh, omaha beach was um it, it was uh very intense yeah, for, uh, for yeah, a lot of veterans. <clears throat> so yeah, that's definitely going to be a layer as well. I as... mean, yeah, like the, yeah, just an individual... historical stuff has access to a lot, a lot of different. Well, it has access to different narrative devices, but it also has access to essentially this sort of culturally permeating sense of emotion. Like everyone growing up, growing up has heard stories about World War Two. Most people at some point would have encountered a poem by uh, William uh, Owen, for example, Wilfred Owen, even. Um, like everyone already knows how to imbue specific war scenes, especially the Second World War, with an entire sort of cultural memory of emotion. But then, if you also go for something like I don't know, taking in a way, it's, it's, this isn't just unique to historical things, but it's it's sort of a, a general thing to prequels. And I guess you could say that a World War Two film is kind of a prequel to the modern day. But you also have the the access to sort of the, the doom aspect of it. So if you like, if you take something like What's that film? Is, um, is it Tom Cru Valkyrie? Is that the one with Tom Cruise when he tries yeah. to kill Hitler? You already know how that's going to go. Um, and that sense of doom that it brings, the desperation, but our own foreknowledge that we're also trying to suppress at the same time um, in order to keep the story going adds an extra sense of, I think, poignance to the loss. It's not in the sense that, oh my God, that was an unexpected death, but it's actually it's this tragic fulfillment of something we already knew was predestined. Chernobyl, um, you I have access Chernobyl to other things as well. That. Like... Hmm. You know, oh, like dude, with the yeah. firefighter. Oh you, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like you you know that that what's going to happen to him. Um, but like seeing it play out with the knowledge of how it's going to go, or like e even the the broad story in general with like, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people before they watched that film, uh, that film, that show probably didn't like fully know like what happened with Chernobyl. But I mean, everybody's heard of it. Um, so like, yeah, that and I, and I think I guess like prequels in general can leverage that too. Like, um, if, if the prequels, the Star Wars prequels were better, like, could you imagine how, uh, how, like, intense it would have been as it was leading to the conclusion in Revenge of the Sith where, like, you yeah. know what's going to be fair, happen. Like, it really was for a lot of people anyway. Uh, like, that's true. That's I, true. I, I remember yeah. being, like, hype as fuck to see that movie. Mm. Um, yeah, anyway, the, get, the trailer, the trailer for Revenge of the Sith, I remember being awesome. Um, it was a really cool trailer. Because I had, sure. I used to buy the, um, Empire magazine, I don't know if... Any of you have any familiarity with that? But it used to come with the. I know Empire, yeah, yeah. It used to come with a DVD uh, for trailers for like newer set of films, and the one that had Revenge of the Sith on it. I think I watched that quite a few times. I was, I was, I was like, I want to go see this. And my dad was like, All righty, let's do it. Back I think even my dad was like, Oh it, shit! Yeah. When uh, Christopher Lee got his head chopped off, he's like, Oh, <laughs> there he goes. I um, what's the saddest scene in the Lord of the Rings? The the movies. Ooh, <laughs> we've we've me. definitely uh, had this conversation before. Uh, I don't know what yeah, our answers would have hey, been, but um, it's pertinent though. Now, do we have to when... one for the three movies or one each? Uh, maybe like one each. That's just the saddest scene in the in the movies. Well, Battleship's gonna be borrow me a dying. That's pretty easy for me. Uh yes. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the contest would be. I even, I um, feel a shit ton when uh, Gandalf dies, but I don't know what it is. This is a me a guess to me very, very personally. I feel very bad when he dies. Mine's a little bit cheesy, I think, although I'd, I'd go for the Greyhaven scene at the end of uh, that's, Return of the That's King. what I would go for overall. Um, mm. But movie to movie, I don't know, I, I always felt really, really sad. I, I might say the number two moment is when Boromir, um, when when he chases Frodo away, and then he's like, oh, I, yeah. yeah, and then, and he's, then he's, like, he's crying and out, he's sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's uh, oh, that's a really good scene. <laughs> well, there's a lot of really good scenes though. Yeah. Um, I mean. I guess Two Towers is next. Uh, Theoden at his uh, son's grave. Oh yeah, that's a powerful one. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm trying to think if there are... I'm, uh, oh, the Lord Two Towers is not one that I have associated with sort of sad feelings, really. Um, yeah, Lord no, Lord the son's grave, I'd have to go with that one. What's cool about Lord of the Rings, and I've said this on a couple of streams, and um, funnily enough, one of the one things that was making me think about this recently was uh, God of War from 2018. Um... Movies, TV, or or, or uh, games, even that that make you feel awe. It's not a common common feeling. We uh, it we're, isn't. We're low on that in a lot of our media overall. I would say, like you know, drama, comedy, yeah. I don't know, romance and uh, and horror and st a lot of them pop up, but um, awe doesn't. They try. Often... Many try. Like Lord Rings of Power tries. It's ass <laughs> yeah, it wants to. to. It, ain't, it ain't doing it, but it wants to. Well, I, I I guess um. What would commonly be considered awe, I think, can easily be mixed up with just big. Like, hey, look, isn't that like a big vista? Yeah, because uh, um, battle? obviously it's like, hard to say. Remember, everybody was like um, struck by uh, Columbia and, of course, Rapture. Uh, yeah, I think those two capture it. Even though I don't like Bioshock Infinite at all, I can agree that when you burst into Columbia, it's quite epic. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Um. Hmm. Because. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like, everybody felt that in Endgame, when they did their little charge, like, that the, <laughs> this is what I mean, look at how dismissively I call it, the little charge. <laughs> little charge. Like, Endgame, end game, when they're all running there. Now, it doesn't really do much for me, but, like, still in Lord of the Rings, like, at the Black Gate, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, like. Yeah, the music gets uh, quiet for Frodo, and he charges on. And then oh. they do the theme, but they do it with an epic choir, and it's like, yeah, this is uh, this is pretty, and of course the ride of the Rohirrim, you know, like oh, well, yeah. That's, yeah, you know, uh, like one of the most epic scenes in, in cinema. You know, when Denethor, oh, well, there you go. Oh. when Denethor yeah. realizes the enemies are at the gate, sort of thing, that shot where he sees the entire army, that's like I almost want to describe it as evil or like, like, but I'm, I'm struggling for a word yeah. like uh, terror, mean. maybe or something. Sort where, of. Um, I I know what you mean. Like it's awe, but you're not like. In you're not in awe, you're in um dread. Some people are saying like that's a good one. Despair. Do you think, um, do you kind think of shock. The, I I'm I'm, th I'm wondering if uh the nature of awe like has to do with con because you said God of War like the new the specifically um like, what made me think of it is when you first meet Yormungandr. It's so fucking cool. Right. Like. Maybe, is it the contrast of the quiet, like, because God of War opens on, like, a really quiet moment. Um, maybe it's the contrast of, like, quiet I think contrast definitely, really... definitely helps, yeah. Because if you just have a, a, a wide a wide shot of a landscape, it's like, okay, cool, cool. Not quite getting mm -hmm. there, though. It's like, what what is the key thing of what we're highlighting all these moments? And it's like, um, a lot of them are reveals and surprises. Uh, well... One of my favorite moments in Dark Souls Three is uh, when you you find um, the the, the, the snow town. What's the snow town called? Is it Irithil? <laughs> like the Irithil. That's right. When like you you see Ir I, Matthew Matosis talked about it in one of his uh, like I think it was the the one where he's talking about Demon Souls. Like the reason why that's such a cool reveal. Like it wouldn't have been such a cool reveal if the whole world was yeah. um, that place. Like there's no contrast. It's the it's the variety that like gives um gives the the things their meaning. Yeah, because you're in a stanky you, cave yeah. for like hours before that. Yeah, but like, there's um, there's like there's the superficial aspect of of like visual contrast, which is designed purely to get your sort of. It's designed to be visually awesome or awe inspiring. I mean, Rings of Power has this when when they arrive at um uh, Numenor, for example. I mean, you you go from the 
relatively mm-hmm. small practical set of, of the boat straight into this this massive vista again. But we don't have any attachment to Numenor. We don't know anything about it yet in the show, and we don't really know any of the characters involved either. And that's that's what sort of marks that out as being very much less impressive and less or inspiring or awesome than say Denethor when he sees the the uh, coming of Saruman's armies or um, the lightning flash at Helm's Deep when they say they see the full extent of Saruman's hordes arriving there as well because we have way more actual investment in the places but also in the people we've had more time to actually come to know them it's not just hello it's not just what rotation of that thing oh you mm-hmm. cut out for a second man Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, I'm saying it's um, it's it's the it's the connotations that sort of are embedded by our knowledge of character and our knowledge of the places that just that it looks big and fantastic and it's a contrast. It's also this is what we think this means for the character, whether we state it or not. Um, that's what makes it sort of a properly awe-inspiring scene. I'd say. I think I think I, definitely uh, onto something. I would just I that, caution that, like, I was trying to think with uh, with Columbia's reveal. Do we even know? much of anything at that point well so i uh, thinking about video games um breath of the wild like when when uh when link leaves the cave and walks walks up to the cliff and then like does the big pan to reveal the world that's a pretty that's a pretty awesome moment um but i think part of the reason why that's so awesome is because of like expectations that the player has about what they can do in this space yeah um and maybe maybe it helps with the the meta knowledge of um Oh, like it, like if you hadn't played the game up until that point, like if you didn't know anything about it, um, you might not know that like this this world is gonna be like a huge sandbox for you to ex- to to explore, like a really robust sandbox, and that everything you can see is a place that you can visit. But I, I think that like in a lot of video games, when when you get to see a place that you can visit, like, and then you finally get there, that can usually be a really cool moment. Because, like, so often you can see stuff in games where it's like, yeah, but you can't go there. Like, that's in the background. Like, that's not that's not a place for you to go. One of the things I find really, um, it, I guess it's in a similar vein, but in, this will seem odd, but I kind of got that feeling every once in a while when I was playing Battlefield 1 and I was in the planes. Because when you're in the planes, you're in your first person view. And you could look around and you've got your wings over here and over there. And when you change positions in the plane, your character actually goes in or you hop into a turret or you go through and you go into the cockpit or whatnot. And so you're moving around the plane and you're looking around and the, the noise and everything. And if you're if the pilot's moving around and if you're a gunner in particular and you're just sort of along for the ride with him and his other planes are flying around is, is really, really good at kind of giving you like that. Holy shit. Like this was a thing people did and this is a this it it was kind of awe-inspiring in that sort of way that this could give me that feeling of almost like vertigo where you suddenly realize that you maybe this happened in games for a lot of other people but i'll suddenly realize that i've like leaned in really close uh to the screen because i'm just focusing so much that's immersion right yeah yeah like very immersive i think video games are uh, very well positioned to be immersive because of the interactive element Oh. Um, and also the way that they could leverage perspective that films often don't do. Like, I don't know if I'd say first person is inherently more immersive, but there is something about like playing a game from a first person perspective that can be really uh valuable. Oh yeah. For yeah, the immersion is like a like when it's when it's at its peak is such a drug. Um, I remember That's like pretty excellent when I was super into Breaking Bad. It would just be like. You're just watching it and everything else is gone around you. You're just one to one with it and away. watching it happen. Yeah. And the same with all like, the top game experiences I've ever had. It's always just been everything else falls away, which is such a fun feeling. I think um when we're thinking about like uh emotions and contrast, I um we I'm pretty sure we've talked about it, but one of the problems that we've noticed in like Marvel movies is an unwillingness to let you sit with an emotion for too long. Yeah. Um, the over the course of a video game, because of like how long some of them can be, or like how focused they are, something that's really rewarding about a lot of games is like the types of emotions that they seem to be deliberately and consistently trying to evoke. Like Metroid games, that feeling of isolation. Um, you think about like a lot of action games, a, a sense of empowerment and overcoming challenges, like an obstacles before you. 
and like the kind of um the impact that can um be derived from like uh you know surmounting a challenge like putting you in an intense situation that is getting you like heated to then finally overcome that challenge and it's like the 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 difficulty the conflict the um adversity to then overcome it is like incredibly cathartic the the willingness to i guess um to explore emotions that are a little bit more uh, s specific than just happy and sad yeah like that's that's kind of where where it's at like in maybe maybe like intensity or uh, it's it's i think contrast is yeah contrast is super important why is it that games feel so rewarding to complete it's like well cuz you weren't always having fun in the strictest reading of that word of like a purely happy experience i guess. well maybe that's not what fun means but it, i think you know if, if you get what i mean i do and since we're up to half an hour we should probably finish the intro intro a little, like that was our casual yeah, so, conversation before the episode starts so i will say and now we gotta talk about rings of power oh, it's all downhill <laughs> It's all uphill from here. You I was going to say we got a little so good. Got a little uphill <laughs> and then it's downhill. First uphill is hey, welcome to EFA episode two hundred four with special yeah. guest the little platoon um, slash. Do, wait, what? What do you go by? Is it L TLP? <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, what? I like normally it, it's always been Lost Chord is my screen name, but the channel name is the little platoon, and I'm not yet experienced enough to be savvy at marketing, so I don't actually know how to do that. Um, I w I. I Whatever you think sounds most um sonorous. Uh, yeah, little platoon makes me think of child soldiers. Well, <laughs> I've not had that one before. But like cord, but I somehow like it more. Cord works. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lil, I like resort Lil, to that. Little little cord. Oh, MC yeah. low cord. LC, you could have that. I don't know. Do you? LC. You see the the. The way in which you hold yourself, I could see Charles working well for you, but uh, I, yeah, I assume you're going to want to choose yourself. <laughs> Maybe no. Eric. Oh. Eric. Eric. You call yourself Eric. You 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 gunning for the Charles and Eric being an X Man? Is that was that what that was, or are you, are you thinking of something else? Uh, I'm just thinking of Eric. Who is he in uh, X Men? Magneto. Oh yeah, well that that's Eric totally Lentra. coincidental. Wow. Legitimately uh, coincidental. I I did not know that. Mm, well, um, yeah. Seems like the name you'd have. We are indeed here. To discuss Rings of Power, episodes three and four. Which, by the way, once we're done with that, we will be halfway through the entire show. Can you believe that? That is insane for the first season, and they've already paid for five. How many was it? Uh, well, I think it's a five season like commitment. Mm. Um, just with the way that things lock in, but I, I wonder if they can change their mind on that. I wonder. When you get to that, you get to the, you know, midway through the, you know, or near the end of the second season, and you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> we gotta just scream more of these. Out, we? Yeah, like, damn. What do we do? That's the point at which I think they're gonna start going for desperation cameos. It's like, Ed Sheeran will turn up as the king of <laughs> proto-Gondor. Yeah. Oh, oh I thought you meant cameos in universe cameos. Like, oh my gosh, everyone, it's, it's Tree Bilbo, Beard. and he walks on the screen. <laughs> it's Bilbo, it's like, hey, everybody, actually, four thousand years old. Bilbo, but young. I mean, that's where, it, that's where it feels like some of them have been so far. Just like you know, you know the name Galadriel, and then you're like, stop. <laughs> like every time I see her, it makes yeah, me yeah, like little teases. Don't you like Galadriel? You do, don't you? Don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Um. Because where we left off, the totality of the... Are they four major plot lines? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's safe to say, right? Because we've got the Galadriel plot line. Hobbits. Um, the Elf Ranger like, plot line. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the Hobbits. And wait, oh, and the fourth one is Elrond. That's like mm. the... That's yeah, the Elrond and dwarves kind of go together. Humans and Elfmen kind of yeah. go together. Hob uh, yeah, Hobbits and, uh, and Galadriel. So I think those are our four major ones. Um, not much had happened in two hours for any of these plot lines. No, not not much had happened in two hours. That's that like, sucks. Summarize the Hobbits one. It's like, well, a guy fell out of the sky, and a girl is like, we shouldn't reveal him to our village people. 
while she was help. Oh wait, no, that's that's to come. <laughs> I was I was about to say more, and then I was like, oh shit, no, that's three and four. Oh, yeah, that's that's that is literally yeah, yeah. everything that happens in the first. Yeah, <laughs> there, there are so many scenes though, but it's just the same <laughs> so argument many. over and over and over again. It's just why do you want to go out into the big wide world? It's not natural for a not Hobbit. Stop doing that. We've had it five times. Only She's one not like other girls. It's every scene. Someone should make a compilation of how all of her scenes are just people telling us how adventurous and off the trail she's going. You know, just in case she didn't <laughs> understand who this character is. Like, because it was really difficult. See that trail? To she tell is who she not was. going on that. No fucking way. Uh, okay, yeah. Humans and Elfmen, uh, orcs attacked a, a village and they ran off to, um, to a little elf hideout. Meanwhile, our Elfmen got captured. That's, a, that's two hours. Done. Uh, uh, what? Uh, the, the Elrond. Jesus, I don't actually know what happened in the first two, like, he, where to draw the he line. He went to Moria, well, Khazad Doom, and he had a chat, and I think yeah, that's he's, about it. He's, be, he's been sent to to build, help, help Celebrimbor build a thing, and he's decided to he, ask the dwarves he, for help. Yes. Or rather to contract them, it seems. Yeah, they walked over two to hours. Khazad Doom. And then, uh, the final one is Galadriel. She, uh, she reckons Sauron is about. And then uh, her boss is like, nah, it's fine. And then sends her home. And then she's like, nah, I don't want to. And then kills herself, but then miraculously survives because she bumps into a raft and then bumps into a ship in the ocean. Which is really common. That happens all the time. Everyone will tell you that. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ocean um, is not a small... And that's it. Home. That is actually it. We've summarized the first two hours of Rings of Power. Um, and so I'll hand it to th episodes three and four. I think it would take us longer to summarize three and four than it would one Actually, and two. kind of, yeah. It's, it seems thicker. Hmm. Seems thicker. Then they're not better. <laughs> they're not better. <sighs> so we may as well get started then, I suppose. Uh, we wonderfully open on our Elfman. No, we don't. Yeah, we do, I think. Yeah, yeah. Just checking. He's, um, oh, we open on the, the intro, of course. There's not much else for us to say on that intro. I think it's uh, we find it rather meh. Um, it's a very, very meh intro. Um, is there, it is. Is there lore meaning behind it, Mr. Mr. Platoon? I believe you're uh, more familiar with the books than any of us three yeah, are. You're a sand expert. Uh, possibly. Remind me of this scene. Sorry, I haven't actually got oh, it. Oh, just the, uh, the intro being all the sandy bits of rock and stuff. Floating around and forming oh, well, titles, the formation sequence. that that's the thing, but well, the, the title sequence, yeah, that yeah. they um, yeah. the one that everyone thought was CGI but actually wasn't, they just made a practical effect look like CGI. I think that is just supposed to symbolize the, the formation of the rings. I think I could be wrong about that, that's not what I've looked into. Oh, out of dirt, uh, it's or, symbolizing well, it, rags. Material. God, oh, yeah, what? Oh, I is it? Oh. That was... okay, so that that's it. <laughs> I was wondering if there was anything more than that. I, I, I have no idea. I, I didn't spot anything in it, and I've sort of been curious. Also, are you, are you sure it's practical? Because, like, it makes me wonder about the um, that same thing that happened with the other trailer they did, where everyone was like, that's terrible CGI, and then they were like, ha, loses, it's actually practical, and then it's like, yeah, but it, look at it, I think they fucked with it in post. Like, I don't believe this is just practical. So um, well, the same thing happened, because someone said, why did you make it look CGI, and then someone said, ha 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 ha, no we didn't, it's actually real. Um, but they might have fucked with it. Make it look like CGI. That's it's like that George Lucas <laughs> Palpatine's office. So like, this is a real place, but why? How? Why did doesn't you it look, it look real? Like, <laughs> did you put a filter over? What did you do? Yeah, I, I feel that way about it. But I'm just, uh, you know, I, maybe it's a suitable intro because I feel bored by it. I'm like, yeah, here we go. This is sand. Do you think they? <laughs> so all the sand is real. Apparently, but they but they made it look like CGI. Well, because that's what I'm saying. It a, looks like CG to me, but um, it does. I yeah, I, I, I thought it was. In fact, when we were watching the last episode, when we were watching the intro, a thought came into my mind, which was it must have taken them ages to animate all these little pebbles for a worthless intro. But because it looks animated, it looks like it's CG or something. I don't know what they did to it. Maybe they like slowed down the speed of it so it didn't look like they're vibrating too much and so that i don't know what it is point being it's a waste of an intro i learned virtually <laughs> nothing from it there's no relevant artistry here that i feel uh the music's kind of meh i Maybe, expect better from howard shore 
I'll give her the benefit of the doubt that maybe there's more to it than I can see or understand for now. That's all I can yeah, say. Yeah, maybe it's like the arcane intro where it gets better as the show progresses. Maybe, but there's, there's been a few things in the show where I've thought, no, maybe there is more to it than I'm giving it credit for, but invariably the answer is no, there isn't anything more to it than that. It is actually the show. I'm, I know that I'm feel. looking at the shapes. I'm looking at all of the shapes as they form, and I'm like, I'm trying to put those onto things that I've seen before, and you know, it's we're after four episodes, I'm still like, I, I, I don't know. Is it's, it's? Do you think they just had one of those weird vibrating tables? They just had one, and they're like, oh, we can use this for our intro. I guess so. I, I think what, it was magnetized as well. In the Amazon offices, uh, is it done the with vibrating table? Yeah, is it done with like <laughs> sound waves or something to move the the pills like that? Or I uh, might be making this up. I thought I'd read somewhere that there were magnets involved, but I could just be making maybe. that up completely. Yeah, if you have if this dust stuff is uh, you know it's metallic of some sort, yeah, you could use could magnets. Be, yeah. And then sound waves or a very light vibration on this panel could make it all you know shift about. Well, uh, yeah, that was exciting. Also, like, we're kind of used to Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon, and actually giving us introductions that mean something. And oh god, serve the a point and the purpose. House but... of the Dragon intro is downright cool at this point. It's like, great. The more you understand about it, and the fact that it's changing. To be fair, the Game of Thrones one did as the show went on as well to match the events, and you know, I appreciate that. That's cool mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. wah, 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 wah. Yeah, chat. For those who don't check out the streams with Nerdrotic, uh, the fifth episode of House of Dragon came out recently, and it's probably my favorite. And it was uh, it was quite quite good to the point of like downright like man, the show is fun. I'm liking this. I'm in now. Mm. Uh, ain't recommending it yet, though. <laughs> nope. Need a bit more time. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, we do begin on Elfman being dragged into the... Well, wherever he's going to end up. And I suppose, I can't remember if it's as early as this that we find out exactly the nature of this place. But it's uh, obviously, like, big shenanigans are going on. The, the orcs have been up to no good. But we also see, like, lots of people doing, like, mining and stuff. And it's like... What? You know, as the scene is moving along, those um those coverings they have on the top to prevent the sun from getting in, they're not very effective. Those are sunbeams just shining in. Oh, precisely what the orcs do not want. Orcs cool, just pissed me off though. straight from yeah. the beginning. Because apparently they okay, they, they can't they don't like the sunlight. In the law they just they fear the sunlight, but they don't actually fry like vampires. But <laughs> in this though, it, it turns out all they need to do to be able to move around in the sun is just wear clothes. You so, see this? Look at this. Yeah, Look how ineffective the their covering is here for the rooftop. It's like, you guys are, you can barely walk in here if a, a single that's beam burns good. you. Yeah, that's that not was, good. That is definitely, like, style over substance. They like the god it looks rays cool, like, yeah. coming through. Yeah, and so they didn't care whether or not the orcs would be happy with this arrangement for their, their ceiling. Just walking down the tunnel, ow, 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 <laughs> ow, ow. <laughs> guys, you gotta put, put more blankets up there. Guys, please. Why, we should have just done tunnels. We already did that. Ah. <laughs> no, what giant trench. Um, so yeah, I, th I think all, all we learn at this part, a point is he gets he gets chained up with his... Uh, he sees his elf friendos. Yeah, so th that's the realization you have. is like, holy shit, all of the elves that we were aware of are all here. Um, as well as obviously the townsfolk from that one village that got completely ransacked, I guess. And they're all being forced to dig a big old trench. Now... We'll talk more about that a little later, I think. For now, we'll just be mm -hmm. like, yes, how shocking and terrifying. I wonder what this could all mean and where it's all going to go. Because my god, this plotline is dumb as fuck. But we'll get there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big old shock. It's terrifying. And they even show like an orc is just whipping someone meanly. Those cruel bastards. As they do. As they do. As they do indeed. Yeah. Um... Well, yeah, then they cut to Galadriel, and legit, uh, especially after 3 and 4, whenever a scene starts with her at this point, I'm just like, oh, Not that I'm, like, super excited for any other scene, but... I'd rather see other scenes than her. I'd rather see anyone else. Dare I say? Yeah, I'll say this. She is very consistent in this episode with how she has been portrayed in the first two. However, that way that she is portrayed is inconsistent with what her life has been described as to us. Um... My god, she is reliable in terms of how much she'll fuck up a conversation with somebody. Like, every time. <laughs> she's her own worst enemy, and I don't know if the show's aware of that, or if the show thinks she's being strong. 
I can't tell and anymore. We are somehow supposed to believe that she is about 3,000 years old. No way. She's, she's actually old. She's <laughs> no. older than Elrond at this point in the lore. Um, and yet he's much, much more sort of measured and calm and mature. Like my sister, when she was 12, was probably a better, nicer human being than, than this uh, Galadriel. Yeah, I got a uh, six-year-old yeah. cousin who is actually pretty civil and polite and well-spoken, and she could get way more out of the Numenorians than Galadriel ever could. <laughs> because she's not stupid as fuck. Yeah, well, she I'm glad he's trying to never, kill them all. The concept of diplomacy is utterly foreign to Galadriel. <laughs> Galadriel, she's... it seems, the way she speaks, it's as if she's been given everything she wants yeah. always for thousands of years or however the fuck long her life Which is. Which should be, the because, like, as it's Spoiled. seen right now, she's she's had to fight, like, persistently. Like, she, if anything, she should have that attitude, right? That she needs to fight for everything that she can she can get, like, in, in service of her goals. Instead of just fighting everybody, like, all the time, you know? Like... By the way, she was given... Necessarily. Given shelter, food, and boarding uh, for, for all of this journey, and she's already, like, aggressive when she gets up here. It's so annoying to well, watch. Like, why would she be, like, what, would you prefer to just be out on that little raft in the middle of the ocean? <laughs> like, going nowhere in particular? It doesn't help that her fucking buddy, who... Is, is like on the path of becoming the evil bad guy for the show, apparently, is like way more reasonable than her in most of these scenes, because it's just like this comparison. It kind of reminds me of like uh, what they ended up doing with Walker, right, in uh, Falcon Winter Soldier, where you're just like, you know what they want you to feel, but like, unfortunately, they're really bad at it, so it's often the opposite of the two goals they have, and it ends up flipping, like, the results. Um... Also, uh, it was talked about by everybody, so I feel like people would be upset if we weren't to mention it. The, uh, the armor for these lads. I think it gave Shad an aneurysm. Um, <laughs> what is every what is the thoughts and feelings on it? I think it looks really shit, but, like, in terms um, of... I think it's the, it's what, it's the materials. Because you have, um, it looks like... I, this doesn't strike me as armor that you'd wear on a on a ship if you're going around messing with sails and stuff like that. I don't feel like this is what you'd wear out and about all the time. Uh, it just it doesn't seem like it fits with their job. Let me let me scroll to see it here. Well, like the uh, up, up, up. the shot that I've got right now, like the the distinct impression I get, irrelevant of like practicality, is just good God, they look ugly. Like I don't know what. Uh, yeah, it's hardware. like a it's like a a leathery looking breast. Plate. I think I'm not sure. Yeah, Is it it's they, they look super ill fitting. Looks... The the sort of the the indents for his boobs are not looking good. This is why everyone's calling it the boob arbor. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that doesn't seem necessary. I guess that's a stylistic choice. They just look so awkward. And can you I'm see how much of a gap the... there is in the like belly portion of the armor to his actual belly? Yeah, I was. I, I guess was, that, that was... was the thing that was um that seemed to be like really weird. I that assume thing, if yeah. you're on a ship, you have to. I it seems weird because it's like they want both without committing. Like this looks like something that seems it would be very difficult to work on a ship with because. Even as high as that breastplate goes up, like imagine like bending forward, like to pick something up, right. or like moving around to pull on sails, or to 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 trim, or to lift, or to to work on a ship. It just doesn't seem like something that you could work in. And like they have like these these bracers on the side of the arms, and I'm like, man, I don't know. Those just would probably just ugh. It looks like you're Something... probably hot as fuck in that thing, because that mm. looks like a gambeson looking kind of yeah outfit underneath the blue. There's, there's the added like inconvenience as well. If you fall in, you're probably going to drown if it weighs too much. Um, yeah, I think you probably wouldn't get. I don't. I don't know that I'm right, but I don't think if if you were just sailors on a ship of this kind, you probably wouldn't have them wearing very much armor at all. You'd have like a division, the equivalent of like the Marines, which would be tasked with going and doing the fighting and you might expect those to be armored but if you're just a seaman um <laughs> using that word advisedly uh then you might not expect them to be wearing this kind of thing but and it's yeah. not likely that you're going to get snuck up upon out here you know so if oh no there's an enemy ship over there 
we should put our armor on before it gets here. Like, yeah, let's do that so that we don't have to wear this all day. The 99.99% of the time we're not actually in combat. We don't have to wear this fucking get up. Well, you know, it sucks. Thinking about that, it's prompted me to say, like, oh, well, Numenorians though, they are, like, faster, stronger, and live longer than your average human, right? But, like, did you guys get that do impression they? at all in this show? Do, wait, do they? Are they supposed to? As yeah, far as they, I'm aware, they're, they're, they're supposed um, to be... They're Aragorn's ancestors. Yeah. Did they so mention that they, in the show? They lived to about 300 years old, I think. And they're just supposed to... Aren't they supposed to, like, they're better stats than your average human? In general, yes. maybe I certainly didn't get that impression from the show. That's what I'm suggesting. Or remember like, him bringing it up. Even they seem kind of meh. <laughs> like I don't know. They they do seem very meh uh, for a very sailing heavy focused culture. Uh, it seems there. I don't get the sense that there is this 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 seafaring martial prowess that they have. Um. Yeah, I think a lot of it starts with how these outfits just don't seem to match. They don't look good. They don't seem... I wouldn't want to wear it. Mm -hmm. um, the blue is a fine color, but it's everything that it, I like. The belts are fine, and the blue color is fine. There. Yeah. I said nice <laughs> things. I said nice things. Uh, but yeah, oh. it's the color. It looks leather. It looks like it's a piece of leather that's been... It doesn't look like metal, you know? It... Well, it, you were saying about they, like... they might have difficulty bending over. It's like, I'm sure they're fine because it's not actually hard. It's going to be floppy because... Well, no, they would real. because it's, it's fastened to you. Because you could see, like, the, the buckles where it holds it tight to you. So even if it bends a bit, if you bend down and that thing is held to you, it doesn't really have anywhere to go. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. So it would, like, um, it, it's on... You, have you ever worn shoes, right? You have shoes, right? You guys heard of shoes. I if think the, I've heard of them. If the front of the, you've got the hole at the top of the shoe where your foot goes in, and if it's too if it's fastened too tightly or if that hole is too small, then whenever your foot or, or your leg bends forward or your foot lifts up, you get that crease that kind of digs into your the, the 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 bottom of your shin on the front. That's what I feel would happen with these if you ever wanted to like lean down. Apparently, it was the. One of the elven armor that Shad had an aneurysm over, but as far as I know, Shad fucking hates this show and pretty much everything in it. Just don't want to make. I want to make sure I'm specific about my Shad details, okay? I haven't caught up with every episode of Shads. I uh, uh there's so many. Everyone, everyone's covering everything, okay? It's impossible. I have to like plug all the videos directly into my brain. Um, but yeah, I feel bad for him having to deal with this, but he likes House of the Dragon, so there's a bit of a reprieve for him as well. Another medieval show. There's dragons in it neat everyone likes dragons anyway the dialogue begins and we're pretty unlucky because it's uh it's as good as you'd expect it to be um the, the the exchange in total is galadriel being like what vessel is this he's like my betters will answer your questions and she's like what port do we sail see for yourself and then i think uh Halbrand is like yeah but where though he goes home and it's just like oh i hate I hate the conversations in this show. <laughs> like, this is the you, wanna, is you may not understand just from that one example. This is how they always talk. Everyone talks in this. Nobody listens to each other. Everyone says things. Yeah, the only, it's there was all one nice thing about history. this exchange is there was no metaphor that they used though, or no simile. <laughs> For one, that, that's the other thing they always do, and they are painful. Well, he, he did say that. He did say we're going home instead of where we're actually going. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah. That's true. like uh, it's like, kinda... like how would that. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I I would like to point out my one of my biggest gripes with this scene is Galadriel's continuous total lack of anything approaching gratitude yes. or respect to anyone else around her or common decency that she just had her life saved on the open seas by this ship. You have to just, understand where, where does the, this ship? The way that Morphid plays this role gives me the impression, along with the writing, that Galadriel feels entitled to all of this. Like, yes, and it's unacceptable that they're not giving him right more. Right. That's the impression I get if I were to read this yeah. as I believe it's intended. But I have imagined, I imagine the writers like, no, she is, she's, of course she's thankful. And the she's writers amazing. be like, oh shit, we probably should have written <laughs> like saying thank you or something. I don't know. Yeah, thanks for saving my life. That was you didn't have to do that, but you did. 
especially learning that you broke like a big social his big a bit of a social faux pas in Numenor to bring an elf and yeah. I'm an elf and you brought me. So thank you for bucking with that cultural tradition of yours in order to save my life. I legitimately appreciate that. Let me show you my gratitude. No, give me a ship, bitch. I'm going to Middle Earth. Also bring your army because I saw a vision. <laughs> No, she saw the mark of Sauron. Oh, yeah, that's right, because I saw the mark of Sauron and your buddy brought me... We'll get there. We'll get we'll there. We'll get there. God, it's dumb, but... Uh, yeah, just the the, the, the... the issue I take with this moment, though, is just that if you s just see what they're saying subtextually, it's like, asks question. I'm not going to answer any of your questions. My boss is Will. Mm -hmm. Okay, asks question. He d refuses to answer question. Asks question. And then gives a vague answer of the question. I'm just like, ugh, so annoying. Like, nobody's... I've, I feel like the question will be, well, can you not tell me anything? Surely. This is, this, I mean, this, this is, is the... of course, after you're, like, thankful and you show gratitude and respect for your, your rescuers, you know? Yeah, because when he says, like, um, my betters will answer your questions, it's like, the first thing you'd want in snappy dialogue is for her to make some kind of commentary in response to that concept. Like, can you not speak for yourself? You not have things to say yourself, like so something that has a back and forth, but she sort of just ignores and moves on, and even changes the question. But it's it's fine. We can't. We we, we, we Numenor. Numenor. Everyone. This place is amazing. It is. Um. It cost a whole this bunch. This is really. Yeah, it looks like it did. It looks expensive, and yet, oh, I just I can't shake. I see stuff like this, and I'm like, oh, I just, it's not kind of, real. It's kind of what we were talking about, I think, as well. The, uh, I'm not awestruck by this because of the context it's in. Maybe if this series of, like, showing off Numenor were in um, something that I was much more invested in, I could be awestruck by it. But I was just sort of like, okay, this is a big place. We're here now. Yeah, yep. like... So yeah, I think, you know, it, 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 our opening conversation was, turns out to be hyper-relevant. All right, guys? That was all on purpose. Um, I, but... I have bug, bug bears with this 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 entire thing. The, one of the, it looks very fake when you get the first... I, I don't think this is a particularly good example of the show CGI, but like, this is mm -hmm. an example of when you don't blend the practical with the CGI properly. So you go from largely practical set on boat to without any sort of intermediate step, there's no blurring of the lines. You're then immediately into CGI yeah, and Megascape. This is and the practical looks, scene. The texture this is different. The, the lighting is different. Everything about it. It's like you're watching a different show completely. And um, yeah. if you compare it to say you know, the way that Jackson did the Lord of the Rings films, there was a there was a, a blend all the way through those anyway. So a lot of the shots were the backdrop was painted rather than CGI'd or the buildings, for well, example. Jackson went um, to locations. That too. He went to places. We got so many gorgeous shots of the New Zealand landscape and the mountains and the hills. I don't think they can build it was all real. So but there's just quite like, a lot yeah, of there. drone shots in this show as well. I, mean, I think the difference is because even the studio shots with the Lord of the Rings films, like for Orthanc, the tower at Isengard, for example, they would actually build the entire base of the tower. They would green screen the top of the tower, but the backdrop would be painted. And so you get this, this blend all the way through every single shot. So there's not this hard cut between this is entirely practical, this is entirely CGI. Everything in it is designed to minimize the, the sort of uncanny valley aspect of it. Whereas with Rings of Power, it doesn't have that. I don't think it's just the locations because they do have these lovely drone shots from time to time. It, I do think it is just, I don't they think don't they understand contrast. Well. No, no, they just do it randomly because there's a scene transition that they need something to be on screen for. So it's just, have well, a mountain, it, mountains are It cool. feels like those scenes are just, like when, when you got those shots in the Lord of the Rings, it, would, it was used for some effect. Um, mm. But here, it, I feel like they're trying to kill time in this show so much that even environmental shots they get lumped into the oh you're you're just you're just killing time you're just lingering so that the so we could so that seconds pass yeah and then there was, there was another thing about it i mean the, the boat is obviously because everything about the um the way the cg moves in the background is way too still as well if you watch the bow line of the boat and there's no movement at all I, I live on a boat or i have lived on a boat for like most of the last few years and it's just like slightly uncanny when you see that the thing i did i quite liked the music i think for the, i'm just sort of undecided <laughs> on the soundtrack for the approach to Numenor, but like the music has been really underwhelming so far and there's not been any kind of motif that you can really well, there's nothing memorable will, about it. I, I thought maybe it was like the first yeah, instance. There's a, 
there's one motif that I've noticed. It's like, like, I keep hearing that a lot. Is that Galadriel's one? I think it is Galadriel's thing. Well, the dwarves definitely have one. They've been hearing it all the time. Theirs was awesome. So I like the yeah, when we, you have when we the, saw first. Yeah, Durin, Durin's there, and then all the dwarves, they slide in from the side. They've had they a couple... Guitars, and they're like, are you ready to rock? And they're like, dwarves, <laughs> and they're always ready to rock. Um, Because they might. I, yeah, I, I will say, though, like, the, yeah, the, the score hasn't made that much of an impression on me. Nope. Oh, um, oh, oh, speaking of score, though, this score, try for how much we've talking we, we've been talking about how it doesn't really grab you or you know anything like that they try very hard to use it to do that thing where music and the soundtrack swells very mm. prominently when something is supposed to be revealed or shown to us or they want us to feel something the soundtrack is working very very hard to try and make this um the forge to make emotional reaction. grandiose or drama yeah yeah when nothing really of any seeming importance happens or there's that disconnect between how I feel and how the show's really trying to make me feel. Cause it's not, it's not nailing the foundation. Um, well, how come these guys, these other guys on the boat, they don't have the breastplate. They just have the blue and that looks so much better. Yeah. They look more normal. They look like I is like, yeah, I, I'm probably a bit hot and sweaty in this, but it, 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 I can move around. I don't have this stuff strapped to me. I'm that lovely because a lot of the aesthetics for the Numenorians are great. Like it looks really lovely with the. It's it's almost like um, uh, like Grecian or Minoan. Uh, it has that you know the white and blue prominently, which I, I really like. I think it looks good. It's a shame I don't care about anyone here, <laughs> which is kind of the most important part. <laughs> you, you, yeah. yeah. It's it's a shame because people clearly worked hard on this show. Absolutely. Um, but anything that I like about the show is completely overshadowed by the people who didn't do a good job. Well, it's, sure it's all it. all great work, like by set designers, visual effects artists, costume designers, and what? Well, barring the <laughs> the, uh, the the suits that the guys are wearing. Um, like everybody it's it's all in service of what a pretty bad script so like doesn't doesn't have the impact that uh yeah. it probably should have you know um, i it was never in doubt that this show would look expensive it's amazon they have more money than god and they're willing to put a lot of that into this show but that was never in doubt you know i'm i'm not you know i i was expecting it going in for it to look expensive yeah so, uh, for the people who don't know a lot about the lore or the books this even comes from, I I get baffled by their approach with the information they provide, because basically, like as these two oh. walk in, she's she's like there was the there was the big if war, you... and there were men who fought with Morgoth. The men who fought with the elves were rewarded Numenor, and then they stopped allowing elves to come to Numenor. That's all the, we get. The show does this all the way through. The show backfills its world building. It, it's it has no idea of how to set things up for payoff later. So, so yeah, the, the basic idea of of Numenor is that you have the fight against Morgoth. The men who side with the elves, as you say, against Morgoth, they are given Numenor by the Valar. Um, and we spent you know, the opening monologue of episode one in Valinor itself, which is where the Valar live. You might think, given you're going to, it seems at least, be introducing gods with the power of intervening in the world into this show, might have been a good idea to do that from the off. You wouldn't have even needed to do very much different. You could have inserted a line saying the elves wanted, you know, they beseeched the Valar for help against Morgoth and the Valar turned them down at that time, so they left on their own account. Um, but because they didn't do any of that at the time when it, they really needed to do it, they get to this point in when they first arrive at Numenor, and they have to start building a lot of stuff that's going to become very relevant later as well, because if they're doing the fall of Numenor, which I think they are, they are going to try and do, then the end point of the fall of Numenor is that the Valar themselves will actually flood the city because the Numenorians tried to invade Valinor. Now, you wouldn't know any of that from what the show is telling you, but also you wouldn't know about the existence of the Valar anyway unless they decided in episode three that it was relevant for the point of that episode and things going forward. 
But it's this this backfilling of information in this show. It's not the first time they've done it, and they'll do it again later as well. It just it's really, really, really sloppy writing. But I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised about that. I mean, I, I just think it's baffling writing. I don't know why they chose to do it this way. It is fucking confusing. Like, uh, yeah, I, the state of the world. I don't. When, I, don't I don't. I don't know. You, you're telling me Galadriel knows that elves are like shooed away from this place, even though they're supposed to be on like amazing terms because they fought a war together, and this is a reward and stuff. But she is she lacks any sense of curiosity as to that throughout her entire visit here, at least in the two episodes we have. I was like, then, she also what's doubly weird? Why. Well, what, Wait, do you what's say she does know why? Her not in... No, no, she doesn't. Because the, the yeah, dialogue yeah. here is she, she, so she says, well, she's he says, do you do I detect a note of envy? And she says, no, sorrow or sadness, whatever it is. Um, she uses, and that. then they have the conversation, and then and then he asks her, you know, what happened, and then she says, "We might be about to find uh, about to find out." So, like, she, all she knows at this point is that the elves, their ships are being turned away. That's all she knows. They don't. She doesn't know what's changed about Numenor itself. So she doesn't really have any reason to be sorrowful. She should be intrigued about where yeah. she is and what's changed about it. Not well, she learns all that she's not sadness. like even really allowed to be here necessarily. Like it's a big deal for her to be here. Mm -hmm. Um. She she is simultaneously not at all curious as to this change in attitude towards elves, but she uses their old alliance with the elves to try and get her way. She appeals to that. She it almost seems um, like I wasn't blackmail is not the right word. She's she almost tries to like use it as a debt. Um, kind of yeah. You we gave you this yeah. It's the whole you know paid in blood thing. We'll get to in a moment, mm. but it's. I guess we could, yeah, when that line comes up, we can... We'll talk about it a bit more, really but my, the only thing it. I want to say here is that as someone who's trying to take this and trying to judge it without without a sense of anything, even even not even involving the movies, right? Um, like, I'm taking this for what it is. You're telling me, like, one of the most prominent elves of all time is like, yes, these are our allies, but they don't like us anymore. And it's like, I'm gonna find, you know, hopefully we'll find out why. And then she, like, doesn't ask about it at all. Yeah, she doesn't ask about it, and yet she relies on it not being the case, which is like one of those things has to be addressed. Yeah, it's, it's like if you go to someone's house thinking that your friend is there, and then you learn he's not there, but you still tell the people at the house, oh, uh, well, I need to be here because my friend's here. Like, no, no, you, did, you missed that first bit of info. He's not here. You can't use that as a reason for you to get what you want. Um... And, and then, then, I guess before we move on, the uh, the rowboat here, I just noticed this. Uh, those oars on that little thing, I don't know what the thing that holds the oars on the side of a boat are, but if you're going to go backwards, you can't, because your oar will just slip oh, out of the... That, oh, that... It is... That's no for good. A, for a seafaring people, um, that's kind of a... That's a pretty substantial fuck-up, actually. <laughs> For being a seafaring people who are big into boats in the water, you can't back up your boat. Yeah, because it's supposed to be that it's like a like a U shape, right? Not a C. Yeah, so you could. Yeah, you don't have to keep it down. You have to keep it from you know forward and back, so you could row. That's what you are pulling. It's a, that's what. Yeah, that, that's you need that. That's necessary. So that means like this is just like the, they would have to spin the boat every time. Uh, yeah, they'd only have to have one person rowing on one side to <laughs> help. It's just like, man, I guess they, I guess they never needed to back them up in the water. So they, or maybe they noticed it like, well, it's not going to be in the shot. So fuck it. Mind you, if they don't ever need to back them up, then they're going to have a really tough job getting out of where they are. Cause haven't they gone no, in they just front do, they just, One guy yeah, they... just goes forward, so it spins the boat on the spot. Easy. Done. It's going to look great. It's <laughs> yeah. all looks stupid as fuck. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry, so it, sorry, Rags. Their boats always look to the front. That's what makes them float better. Ah, of course. Yes. You see, their boats don't no, look down. Yeah. They, they look, look up. up. Not look forward. Up. Uh, up, look up. up and forwardish. You know, up and forward. -ish. He said up. Um. Didn't he say to go look to the front. forward or something? The point being well, is that forward, you can ignore all practicality if there's some flowery something behind it. Some metaphor. The or scene. Whatever. There's the walking scene sort of ends with uh, Hullbrand looking at a forge, and I swear to fucking god, if if it, he really is Sauron, and he's looking at the forge because he can't wait to forge the rings, this is one of the lamest shots in the history of foreshadowing. Uh, it's not the forge, because the rings, they are for- that's what Celebrimbor and Elrond are trying to build, I think, is the forge over in Eregion, which is where- the, well, No, it's, but, but, it's but, yeah, not- but, like, it's, 
it's foreshadowing because Sauron is supposed to be. It, this is one of those things where they try and appeal to people who have like read the book or do know the law, but they're also appealing to people who are going to be disproportionately annoyed at them for ditching the rest of it. But Sauron is is a smith, not just a smith of the rings, but when he is. Uh, when he is sort of in his pre-big supervillain form, he is a famous and noted smith. So his long sort of lingering glance at ironworking is, is supposed to be kind of foreshadowing for people in the know. It's just that it's not really a good guide for people because, again, everything else has been ditched. So are we supposed to take from this that the show will be following the book that most people haven't read anyway? Or is it then going to throw a, a curveball and just ditch the rest of that again? It, it's just very strange that they should try and make these particular nods when they've also proudly gone and said, we're not going to be basing what we're doing on the stuff we're now nodding you toward. I was going to say, I, wanna... I think it's a lot shallower than that. I think that the, the writers are just like, it's so neat when you go back into season one after you get the reveals that you can see him eyeing up a forge and getting all excited because he's going to be making <laughs> the one ring eventually. <laughs> I just want to give you a few shots here. Because, oh. of course, I've, I've just only seen these. Give me just a second. Here we go. So, if you have Amazon money, then I don't expect you to be making these kinds of continuity fuck-ups. Look at the people that they're passing here in this shot on the backside. Red hat, blue... Uh, Blue, red hat, blue hat, and then there's this one guy with the the, the orange hat as well. They pass, mm -hmm. they clearly pass them, and then the next shot, they pass them a second time to get their money's worth out of the, yeah. So they actually did that in She Hulk, but you'd expect it of something like She Hulk because yeah, yeah She Hulk just people make that don't give a fuck. When did I do that? But there's a, an she... office sequence when she's walking through. There's a guy with a briefcase who appears on two floors at once. Uh, oh, well, yeah. obviously, <laughs> Doctor Strange. A good lawyer. Doctor Strange yeah. had a had a class example of that as well. Oh uh, yeah, the guy who see, times, it happened. Like it happens. The, 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 see the screenshots? It swapped to Arabic. See, in between the two screenshots, <laughs> the the subtitles swapped to Arabic, and I don't know why they're doing that. Mine did it to Spanish last night. Maybe it's just a general problem. I Virus. don't see in in between the screenshots. You could see. Like Sending a message as a cell somewhere. <laughs> it's Elvish. Elfahu Akbar. It's Elvish. <laughs> Trying to warn you, stay away. Um. Alrighty, yeah. So, uh, then we we go to the I don't know city hall. Something We're having the having a big old discussion. We have uh the the nature of Numenor right now is. There's a king who they quietly asked to fuck off, and he's in his bed, I guess. Like, from what I was trying to gather, and then you got the queen regent is currently running things, which is his daughter, correct? Yeah, that's... Yeah, he's removed because he likes the elves. I think I think they do actually mention that later in this episode. They do. Um, he, he's too fond of the elves. But then she's queen regent. They say they deposed him, but if she's queen regent, she's exercising somebody else's royal authority, which is presumably his, so that he hasn't really been that's what I'm, deposed. Uh, that's so what I was actually going to ask you to clarify for me, because I don't understand if they got rid of him as a ruler, why would they accept his daughter? It, it doesn't... I mean, legalistically, it would work if she, for example, had a male heir. I think this is how basic monarchy works. Like, if she had a male heir who was next in line to the throne, but was underage, then she could exercise the royal prerogative on his behalf as queen regent. Um, but the regent, if, if it's a queen regnant, then she's ruling in her own right. But if she's queen regent, then she's ruling on behalf of somebody. So she's queen regent in this. The father yeah. is still there. He still lives in the palace. He's just sort of a, a vegetable. So we that assume makes... she's ruling on his behalf, in which case she was, he wasn't deposed. Exactly. Yeah, there. It, just, it would make ruling. sense if she's ruling while he's alive but unable to give orders as a... Like, yeah, yeah, on but, his behalf. But as, as, as I remember it, they they say that like he was he was like he was pushed off. He was like, "Go away, we don't like you." And then she's in place, and it's like, why would they? Why wouldn't they just elect their own chosen leader? Why would they get his daughter? That that's a weird choice. It's it because is, he yeah. didn't want to. It almost seems like it's because he didn't want to. It's very confusing. I guess we'll get to there in just a little bit, but he it's it's like the library right that they go to he wanted to tear it down but they said no he didn't want to tear it down mm. everyone else did so they said oh yeah well we're going to depose you because of that but they didn't tear the tower down anyway and they let him mm. stay in the tower to be king but not really king and they put his daughter 
to be in charge instead of him. It's all very confusing. Yeah, and Goga said he apparently there's a line to say that they did actually vote her in. But then why would you do that? But why would they do that? Yeah, I, I, she's, she's the last the person you want voted in. She's literally got his ear. Like, he, as in, well, vice versa, actually. He's it's, got her it's, ear. It's weirdly and unnecessarily complicated, because uh, you get the two main characters, they're both introduced here. So you get the Queen Regent, um, and you get Al Farazon, who's the guy with the big bushy beard. Yeah. And like, if you're going from... in the, the book version, the the king, King uh, Palantiri is his, Tar Palantiri is his name. He dies, and then Alfarazon ma forcibly marries the queen regent, and then make, becomes king instead. But the 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 point being, they managed to kill off the king in the in the book version, which sort of does away with this weird complexity. Which I don't. Like, they must have done it for a reason. Like the the continued existence of the king must serve I, a purpose. Oh but... yeah, she has to go. <laughs> Galadriel has to go in, you know. That, but I, then she just discovers he's a vegetable. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I, maybe we assume too much when we say, oh, they must have done that on purpose. For, <laughs> because, you know, there's a lot of stuff. But yeah, well, so as you can as you can hear, chat, we're a little a little confused. We're a little like, what? Well, I don't really, I'm, I'm a little lost. But that's fine. You know, just because nothing's made sense so far doesn't mean it won't start making sense at any point. The thing is, it should be so easy to make sense of. There are two factions on Numenor. There's just two. There's the faithful who like the elves, and there's the king's men who don't. That's it. Like, there's no... You don't... It's it's kind of hard to fuck that up. But, well, they managed to find a way of doing it, so congratulations, I suppose. Um, One of the things I think Holbrand says when they're walking on their way here is essentially, like, don't antagonize these people, Um, which is hilarious to think. Uh, he but, says but it in like other words. You have to tell someone that. Yeah, and does does this is this advice listened to? It's like no, um, no, she doesn't listen to advice. She does, as everyone has called it, her Daenerys moment. Um, when introducing, she's like, "I am Galadriel of the Noldor, daughter of the Golden House, Finarfin, commander of the Northern." It's like, shut the fuck up! No one cares. <laughs> People don't even like you. There's like, she knows this anti-elf. Why wouldn't you want to introduce yourself as like, I am Galadriel, friend of Numenor? Something like yeah. that? Yeah, or like just something simple, like I'm Galadriel of, it, just whatever's customary. Like, I'm, I'm Galadriel, I'm, you know, daughter of da-da-da. You could even say, you and... know, like descendant of and then person who provided Numenor slash fought in the war. Something to appeal to that these would be, people. That would be clever. Well, I know. That would be bad, clever. Know, but... <laughs> I know that the show looks down on cleverness, but... Um... Yeah, and so she does all that, and then she's just like, give us a boat to Middle-earth. And, and it's just like, wow. It, did anyone else think that they turned Halbrand into Bronn in this scene? Because like, uh... everything about him, accent and the type of human... Like, when she, she comes off her big spiel of titles, and he just goes, on oh, Halbrand. Oh, Even yeah, the accent, you're right. I thought, and the mannerisms as well. He just sounded and looked exactly like Bronn. So for... For those who don't know, uh, season don't one know. of Game of Thrones, um, Tyrion is with he, he, Tyrion hires a cell sword to fight the Vardis for his life. It's fucking great, and and the cell sword wins. It's Bronn. He's fucking great because uh, he's really fast, and he's against someone who's super amazing armored, but he keeps just slicing between the seams, and eventually gets him to kills him by several cuts, basically. And that's Bronn's introduction. Everyone fucking loves Bronn. He's a fan favorite. Manages to he's he's one of the many characters that gains intense plot armor as the episodes go on because people really like him, um, which is a shame. However, when they're heading back to Tywin's uh, sort of encampment during the wars that are going on in the first season, they have to head through like loads of woods and they eventually get hit by like bandits and stuff. But uh, Tyrion manages to talk his way out of it by telling them he'll give them all kinds of riches and, and weapons and armor and stuff if they take him to his father. Because another thing that Game of Thrones had was really awesome. Tyrion would always talk his way out of every last like threat and danger he ever got himself into. It was really cool. Um, when they arrive, Tywin sees him with like three of the these 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 big dudes and Bronn. And so it's like you got he's like I, I am Tyrion. This is my father, Tywin. And then. Tyrion is like, uh, Tywin is like, and who are your friends? And he's like, this is Shaga, son of Dolph. This is, uh, uh, he's the leader of the Stone Crows. And then, like, he introduces all these people, and then he goes, um, this is Broad. Uh, and then Broad just goes, you wouldn't know my dad. You know, it's like, it's like a fun, just like, haha, everyone's doing their names, and then he doesn't, 
have his one. And then, yeah, the equivalent is done here, where she does her whole set of names, and then uh, Holbrand is like, um, I'm just, I'm just Holbrand. All. Okay. Um, which, uh, you know, it, it's the closest this show probably got to making a decent joke. I guess. Feels like we've seen it before. I'm trying to think. There, I think there might have been one thing that I was like, oh, that was clever and amusing. I can't remember what it was. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just crazy. I guess we'll find out. Oh fuck yeah! The 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 one this is more similar to, I guess, would be it's like season six or seven of Game of Thrones, where Daenerys does all of her names, and then Jon Snow is introduced by Davos, and he just goes, "This is Jon Snow," and that's it. There's no like loads of extra names, which is probably a good comparison of why people like Jon Snow toward the end and didn't like Daenerys. There's um a level of vanity that comes with a billion names on top of your name. That is uh, unappealing if you're not exactly doing great in the appealing factor for a character anyway. I mean, that's how they introduce Xerxes in uh, 300. He's got all those names and all these titles and it goes on and on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she wants a boat. And then she's like, no, nah, we don't do that because we're not a fan of elves. And then she's like, yeah, well, you got this place thanks to elves. And then she's like, oh yeah, well, we paid for that with blood. And, like, I'd, I'd argue the conversation, as much as I hate her strategy, all right, that's, that's kind of making sense. There's, you know, these backs and forth, it's kind of working for me. And then Galadriel says, if blood is the price, then I will pay it one way or another. I will depart. So that's uh, just, like, a threat. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> fucking hell. Like, did she Why seriously did just that? threaten to kill them? What are you doing? I... What are you, this, is, this is the last... What are you thinking, woman? It... Are you so fucking cocksure and full of yourself and spoiled that, by the way, still no thanks, still no gratitude, still no, you know, wow, you, you, you pulled us out of the water, you brought us to your palace to talk with your ruler, none of that, um, it's just instantly into death threats, <laughs> so that's great. She's literally, she's doing a Terminator, it's, you give me your clothes and your motorcycle, <laughs> or just give me your clothes and your boat. Well, so funnily enough, as someone in chat just kind of pointed out, if we're to take it as, as almost literally, let's say, uh, she said, like, it cost blood to get Numenor. Uh, and then she's like, well, if it costs blood, then fine. Like, as if to suggest, I will bleed in order to leave. Like, I'll die in order to get out of here or something? I'll, I'll die to get out, get what I want. It's yeah. Like, which, um, uh, it's like, really? I, don't, I don't know. Are you sure? <laughs> is, that, is that what you... I wonder... When they wrote that line, I wonder what we would think that's supposed to mean. Do do they intend to have this be a like a a death threat? Is that the intention? Because a part of me wants to go like, surely well, they so wouldn't do that, right? When she says one way or another, I will depart. I think that's supposed to be a badass line. But I was just like, oh, what are you doing, you nutcase, you fool? The intention of it is, is, the intention is that's a badass line, but the reality is you just threatened to the ruler of this place right here in front of everybody right now. Yeah, and everyone's like, oh, blah, 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 the whole crowd and stuff. Yeah, and then she's like, yeah. I welcome you to try. And she's like, I have no need of your welcome. This is, you know, the equivalent of that is, is when someone goes, um, I don't know about that, man. And then you go, I am not your bad. I am <laughs> not something your man. We are like, are you trying to, like, are you trying to get an own at every sentence? It's like, this is just pathetic. Stop it. The, it this I, I'm this not is... your buddy, pal. I'm not your yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Like she goes on, guy. and because it goes on after that as well, because she said, "And you are quickly outstaying yours, welcome." And they just carry oh, on. They, they've got this guy. welcome wordplay that they're really, really proud of. <laughs> they're so very they proud. Carry it going. <laughs> Someone said, "Rags, guy. these are the same people who unironically wrote there's a tempest in me.' That one makes some level of sense. We'll get to that one. It's not good, <laughs> but like compared to this, it's bonkers. This, like, is, yeah, but you, you are right. This is like, I have to score some clever, quippy point all the time, regardless of context and regardless of what childish. it actually is. Because I, I, yeah, I have to be the best at all times. Like Even saying, in conversations, I have to be the best. Like, you suck. And then she goes, you suck more. It's like, I suck more, meaning I'm better at sucking than you? And you're like, yeah, which is worse <laughs> than being... And then she's like, wait. <laughs> so then you accept defeat. I am the master sucker. <laughs> I'm a better sucker than you. Um, but yeah, part of the really crazy it thing of this for hundreds of years more than you. <laughs> um, is that they have Holbrand say like, "Ah, oh, 
Man, looks like, uh, yeah, seems that leaving presents some complications. How about you think about it for three days, and then and then we'll move on. Everyone just is like, yeah, okay. Yeah, great, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. It's just like, that's all, all we have to well say? Well. That's it? Bygones be bygones. Like, there, it was, there was no, uh, like, silver tongue nature here. There's nothing of him appealing to anything he'd learned so far or There's making note of... clever. Yeah, it's just, it's just, give us three days? Okay. That should be the default for them, though. It's like, oh, you want, you have this request. Let's assume that she made this request in a very charismatic and in, in intelligent way, right? Let's assume all went well. And then they would say maybe something along the lines of, well, we will consider your request to... But you just got here. Surely you need to rest, and da da da. And it's like we'd have to prepare a ship. Is like, give us some time to think about it. Um, in the meantime, just hang out and enjoy our hospitality. This is um because a lot of people like the great deceiver though. That I mean, it's like no, that's my point. Is it would be really cool to see him do that, but he's not doing that. This is because they don't. They can't write that, can they? They can't write him doing something really it's, clever. It's well, yeah, that's clever writing. In order they to write something do. clever, you have to be clever as a writer. At the, the end of episode four, I think it is, they actually do have him be almost clever. So they, they can do it. It's just they're incredibly slow. And then they can maybe do it once every four hours is their problem. <laughs> and so they, they couldn't do it in this. I think I know what you're talking about. Their power, that's really. their power, and it has a four-hour recharge time. <laughs> <laughs> you can't pay gold to get rid of this one either. They paid it all. But um, She even... She even interrupts him, blood. like, halfway through trying to appease these people who are on the verge of fucking killing them, or jailing them. Galadriel's like, <laughs> like in the yeah, middle That's of the literally what she's like, yes. That noise is what she's like. It's shockingly true. Oh my god, I will not be made a prisoner. It's like, you, you know what? That's yeah, not up to you! Yeah, I... Th like, oh, the, being a prisoner does not require your consent, as it <laughs> happens to be, so, um... No, right, she'll kill everyone. And you know what? She probably is capable of doing that with this, how this they, show works. They would edit it, yeah. She could single-handedly destroy entire nations, absolutely. She's that much of a boss, man. Ugh. She's very cool. She is very cool. And so, like, if in case you're not grasping our issue with this, it's the Galadriel has been alive for a fucking long time. She is uh, not only a incredible warrior, but she's also pretty high up in the political game. She should be fully aware of how these interactions work. She should have full knowledge of histories that happen between all these different places. Why is she so beyond stupid with her approach to all of this? She can't speak she's to anyone old properly. Enough to know better. Exactly. Is incredibly unsatisfying watch this like random scruffy dude manage to outwit her at like everything to do with speaking and if someone was to and say to me like no 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 but it's Sauron it's like no 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 they've just made her incredibly stupid to his relatively stupid so he looks is that, that's clever. what they're going for right so what they're going for is she is they're trying to depict her as being the biggest bestest strongest smartest toughest person around but she is she gets taken under the sway of this relatively charming man she met on a random ocean raft. And then by her, this is, this is sort of the fulfilling the prophecy that Gil Galad mentions in it was episode one when he sends her away, is that when she looks for the thing, she accidentally fans the flames of the fire or whatever the fuck he was talking about. <laughs> so the, the idea is they're bigging her up so they can bring her down by having her betrayed by the one person she ends up coming to trust, which is Halbrand. So you can see that's what they're going for. But the problem is that you can't just pretend that like 3,000 years of character history don't exist just because you want to do that with your character. She has a background, and they've just had to forget it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. That That's uh, part of what they're going for. But my god, they've not built it properly. It's almost more embarrassing when you can see what they're building, but it's just so poorly done that you're just sort of embarrassed for them. You're like, oh. See what you want, but... Yeah, that back and forth is really funny. I will depart. I welcome you to try. I don't need your welcome. You're wearing out yours. <laughs> Oh, well done, writers. You could string a sentence together. Um, and yeah, they're like, "You'll be a guest. You're not a prisoner. Don't worry about it." Like, all righty. Um, a woefully unsatisfying opening scene, and then this happens, where uh, because uh, he's a Lendial, right? The the. Salesman who, who saved her. He, salesman? I meant, I meant that as like sail on a boat. <laughs> like uh, the boat. Oh, a salesman. Seaman. Yeah, yeah. 
He's a seaman. Uh, he's a seaman. He's a so, sail seaman. Seaman's man. So when this uh, when this happened, um, when I first watched the episode, I was like, so Hullbrand's definitely taken something from him. I'm not sure what it is, but he's probably taken something. Then we find out he's taken Galadriel's. Uh, it's safe to call it a sword, right? I think it's a sword. Dagger. It's, um, it's it's long enough that it makes me think a dagger might not be accurate, but I don't know. I I um, think a dagger is 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 very. What do you call a thing between the lengths of a sword and a dagger? Uh, short sword. I get maybe I I still think it's I still think it's. Oh wait, no, uh, you're right. It is definitely a dagger. I remember pulling it out dagger. later. I I was thinking of something longer, um, as I often do. But uh, yeah. So he's he's taken that off a land deal. Now, if maybe we could um. First Can we talk. pump the brakes for just a second here? Okay, yeah, what do you want to talk about? I Yeah, just in regards to what you're going to say. like, like This is like one of those hold-up moments, did that just happen sort of things. Well, so I was going to start with, what would his motivation be to do this? To make Galadriel happy? Is that it? <sighs> so, if generally, when you... Steal a weapon from someone, I know technically it's hers, but it's stealing, off of him to give back to her. I mean, you, he's trying to... Is it literally only to curry favor with her? That, so that this is why I want to get this sorted first, back. so that we can really highlight how fucking stupid this was. Because let's pretend for a second that sword was the key to opening some ancient doorway that's the, the, per, the big goal of their whole adventure. It'd be like, okay, I could see why he had to get it back. But if it was literally just to be like, I know you like your little sword, your little, your little dagger, here you go. <laughs> I bet you like me now. Uh, so yeah, just, just to be clear, I'm pretty sure that's it. Pretty, pretty sure. That is the only thing that comes to mind, even though I, the last thing that I would be doing after she said all those things is to give her a weapon. Yes. Especially if I was in her company. Like, the way that they perceive her is probably going to rub off on me because we're like a pair of, mm -hmm. uh, in their perception, at least. And she's threatened to, like, kill people and spill blood to get what she wants. I shouldn't give her a weapon because she might be insane and crazy enough to actually do something about that. Um, then again, so... I mean, she is, she is the person that he needs to accomplish what isn't you know, inevitably going. He wants to curry favor, essentially. That's, he must that's... see the potential in what she's doing. Uh, but fair. again, it, it does require the, the leap of trust, obviously, and that she's not just going to go and randomly commit genocide on an island. But I don't, you know, the point I think they're trying to make is this is him. This is his grand deception. The first stage of the grand deception is deceiving her. He wants to gain her trust. And you see the payoff probably in subsequent episodes, which is when, you know, he betrays her and then is revealed to be the thing that she was sort of warning against. She, but like, so the, this is the thing, like how much curried, curried favor does he have compared to already, she's probably likes him most, the most out of everybody in this whole city right now. She already likes him because he saved her life, technically twice. Um, so like the idea that it's like, how much is he really gaining from stealing this, this thing uh, versus the risk? And it's like, maybe we should talk about that. So let's talk about the risk, shall we? This, Let us uh, talk about the risk. Let's discuss. We're in... What is quite possibly one of the most important like rooms in the in the entire city with most important people in the entire city you're being treated pretty much as prisoners and you've got your like guards surrounding you who have taken your weapons and you're stealing one right off him when you're meters away from the queen regent and you've already uh, you're with someone who's threatened to kill everyone all eyes are on you all attention is focused on you in this room full of dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people he's got nowhere to hide it by the way our guards yeah, yeah how... I, I was wondering how the hell he did it. He's, he's got no well, sleeves. Not... He can't well, like, hide it's it in not his shot. It's out of frame. <laughs> like, look at this guy. <laughs> you, that's the thing. Putting it up your sleeve is the, the most like believable thing, but he ain't doing that. So where's he putting it? And it's like up his little shirt, I guess. He's gonna have to awkwardly do that. Hopefully no one's looking at it when he does it. Yeah, where did where did he actually put it? It doesn't look <laughs> I don't know, man. And I, went, I think I watched that probably four times over to try and figure out what he did, and the, then, I cannot figure out. Maybe there's a magician in chat who knows how this works, but I couldn't. And he would out have myself. to use his left hand to do it because his right hand was around his shoulder, hugging him. True, and you have to rely so, on Elendil not 
detecting it whatsoever, which is lame, but hey. Um, yeah, he'd then... notice he has an empty scabbard, right? Um, was it in one? Forget. I'm not even I sure how it's attached, it. but obviously it needed to be relatively loose for this to work. I'll take a look real quick. Uh, but the but, other uh, thing is that these two, you have to remember that the, the vibes in this place is that everyone's like, ew, these two, get them out of here. Like, the idea that he was lucky enough to not have anyone looking at him when he did this, just like, fuck, mate, all right. Risky move, let's put it that way. Sleight of hand? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, he does it later with the, uh, the crest as well, but... Um, yeah, stealth 100. Yeah, <laughs> Drunk man his... in pub doesn't it notice when Crest is... Or does notice, sorry, when Crest is stolen. Trained soldier does not... <laughs> who's sober as well does not notice when Dagger is stolen. Uh, is or no one else in the room, I guess. Or anyone else. Yeah, nobody else. Everyone's too busy in talking to each other room about of people things. people that are probably staring at him. I legit have no idea where he put it. Yeah, I have no clue how he was able to... Yeah, I've... What are you? Uh, yeah, he's, so he's got to yank that out of there without, without Elendil noticing. All right, sure, whatever you say. Definitely. And then to make things worse, it's pretty like they're standing at the like on the stairs to the entrance and exit of this place, and he's handing it to her. Like, you might want to do that at a different place. Just saying. Yeah, this isn't a good time for that. My subtitles went back to Arabic, but you of all the, you pick the. It sure is lucky, you know, that no one noticed. Yeah, they're all like, everyone's turned their backs to him. That's lucky, yeah. No one's interested in this elf and this guy who got picked up and this chick who made threats against her queen. See, like, that's, that's not know. a small thing. To, I don't even know where he pulled, where did he pull that from? <laughs> like, was, he, was he trying to just sort of wrap it into his, his arm itself to try and, like, because that is not a good way to conceal it, but sure, it's fine. Well, here, there's a scene here where he's, uh... Ah, yeah, that, there you go, so you can see it with that. So, yeah, this, this is, this is his incredible sleight of hand. He managed to get that past everybody. You know, I wouldn't be able to spot that. <laughs> it's just too yeah. good. As they're walking to the, um, yeah, as they're walking away, he just clearly doesn't have it. And then it appears in his arm as they're... And remember, we have two guards right behind them who are watching... I'm you know, sorry, like... Watching him climb these stairs. I think it actually probably would have now been better infringed. that they didn't show us this so that we could... Like, just telling me this is how he did it is just like, oh. Oh, you can almost hope there's, like, a little cut in his... Uh, like, the, the upper portion of his outfit there that he can slip it into and then slip it out of. That's something I could imagine, but now I have to see that and be like, oh, that's how he did it? Okay. Yeah. Sure. No one notices. The guards are, of course, not looking at their charges. That would be nope. ridiculous for them to do that. No one in this room is watching them now. They've lost all interest. Uh, Elendil doesn't notice. He's been... It's, do you see, like, how the mechanics of things happen matters? Because I don't believe that what you told me happened could have happened. And it's not, and it's not clever. I guess it's supposed to show that he is capable of stealing things very effectively, which maybe isn't true. But if this ain't the way to show it, you could claim that that's what this is. But I don't believe you. There's a disconnect between what I think that a skill should allow for, you know, him to be able to do, and what you are writing him to do. So, uh, also, Queen... they don't get him any new clothes. That's kind of weird, and or do they later? Does he still does he still so. wear these eh, rags? But <laughs> oh, they do eventually. He does eventually get a shirt. Okay, okay. Oh, it's just nice a very similarly colored shirt. It's nice that they gave him a shirt. That's nice. So you got yeah, uh, Queen Regent and Fa Farazar, I think was his name. Al, oh no, Al Farazon even. Farazon. Okay. Al, because it's not Arabic. It's Al Farazon. Yeah. Um, he's like, so, let's solve this quickly. And then he's like, she's one elf. Or, I can't remember whose dialogue was whose in this part, but they just say, like, yeah, he could be the beginning of something real bad, which they'll give us more context for next episode. But now, though, they're like, what of, uh, what of the semen? And uh, it's just... What of the semen? It's, it's very just the same way they always do everything. 
Like, his name is a lead deal. He is of a noble line. He is now a sea guardsman with he a son, has a son. <laughs> who wishes to follow in his career. It's like, what? All right. Well, we got... God. No, that's great. We, we, we we're filled in now. Thanks, show. I, all right. We I got just, it. Like, we got I, all our info now. That's nice. The obvious criticism. We would be able to see this in all the scenes we're going to have with the sealed one. Why would you do that? Why Why was it necessary for that to be said between them? What, how did that help well, anything? Like, between... Imagine if the first time we see him sitting down with his son and he just casually refers to him as a sealder in the conversation, that would have been far more interesting than just, ah, yes, his son is sealder. It's like, oh, come on, man. Sometimes subtlety is the way to go. How they just, he just matter of factly refers to his son by his name, a name that you recognize. And that's like, that's so much more interesting. Yeah. Um, and then we got a scene, and I remember seeing Gary's review of, of this, where he just like, this, we take about five minutes, and in total, is, Isildur is like staring off into the, like, his mind is in the clouds, you might say. And then um, he's like almost fucks up a thing. We're just doing stuff. Doesn't he hear a voice? Sea. Doesn't the voice say his name? Yeah. yeah, he's he's looking to the west and uh, sorry, west Numenor, which is where his family comes from. Um, and this con there, there is a constant sort of undergirding thing that the show occasionally remembers it wants to do because they do mention it maybe three times across the entire thing. But they, if the first time they mention it, it's as though we should already know what it is. Um, and you know, I I've read the Silmarillion and I can't really remember what the distinction is. It's just, it's, yeah, so he has this weird sort of whispery voice as he's glancing over, and then he lets go of a rope and some guy goes flying, but then the captain of the ship just doesn't He doesn't care. care he just which carries is... on. He goes on about talking about the ocean being a harsh mistress or master or whatever it is. And that's a really interesting comparison to yeah, what happens yeah, the yeah, next sure. time something like this yes, happens. Yes, I know. Oh, that makes the next one so more irritating, because it's like, I've seen you do it a thousand times and you've never fucked it up. Well, well, we'll get you, it. You saw him do it, and like the last time he didn't do it, so... Uh, there is no harsher master than the sea. That guy is weird, dude. And then they do this thing of like they like they're like worshiping the sea, and he's like, "The sea is always right." It's like <laughs> there is what? so much you can do with that image. I don't actually you... know what that's supposed to mean. The sea is always right. Um, I've like, heard way better quotes the about the sea that are way cooler like you, than that. You can't fight the sea. You the sea's right. You have to work with the sea. Is that what they're trying to say? I think yeah, like the sea is just a force of nature that it's never don't fight it, be work with it. Some some bullshit like that. I don't know. The sea is always right. It doesn't come across very well. It's just like the rest of the shit they put in this. The sea is always right. It's like okay. It's it, well, this is well, this is naval terminology. It should be the sea is always starboard, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> See what you did there. Oh oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Oats and hose. By the way, in microcosm, okay, this is such a nitpick, but just Isildur, your sister is here. I was like, right, <laughs> like in case I had to figure that out from the way they talk to each other, I'm sure I'll be fine now. We can do it. I and guess, then... I guess they'd want to let him know if she showed up. Yeah, but you could do it in. This is why I said it's a nitpick. I just prefer dialogue that that doesn't feel to me like you. The writer was like, "That's Isildur's sister," and I'm like, okay. I, you didn't have to do it that way. Could have, it, they, it they do it again. Like stage directions when they do it like this. It's like sister enters stage left, but a character is actually speaking it as a line. Like yeah, you yeah. Can make, you can blend it into your natural conversation so much more easily and believably than that. You have, um, I think, the same character. Like a few seconds later, is like, "Come see us later. Don't be like your brother." Like <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm yeah. never related. His brother and sister. You, you don't understand that. You follow, and you're like, "Yeah, That's I do." Yeah, it's the Han Solo Millennium Falcon thing. Your father, Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your father, Han Solo? I remembered for you. I know you forget. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads of that in this show. All the time. They just, they just keep telling... Everyone tells each other stuff they already know. It's great. Nothing is... Nothing is emergent in this show. It's all on the nose, and it's directed at you in this in this clumsy, clunky way. You don't you don't learn things. I, maybe that's it. You never learn things. You're told things. Yes. Um. Mm -hmm. So moving swiftly on, uh, Queen Regent is like, you know, I will be right back. I'm when the going. when the petals fall from the the pretty white tree, it means that the Valar are looking, and they it's like they're crying. 
um, which is going to be relevant later, at the end of episode four <laughs> even. And they didn't yes. have the balls not to repeat the line when they do it then. I thought they were going to do it. They were going to let us try and remember what she said, but then they played the thing, and I was like, ah, oh, okay. I don't know why I thought otherwise. Um, so anyway. I sort of had an argument with myself in my last video on this. Is, like, is it because the writers think that the audience is stupid, or is it because <laughs> the writers actually are this stupid themselves, and this is how they are with each other all of the time? It's uh, You wonder, because when they played that scene and the, the petals are falling... And originally it was just that, and it's just shown, and then you see the reactions, they were like, wait, is the audience going to rem remember what she said all that time ago? And then some other writer was like, oh, it was like an hour and a half, it's not that long. And someone else was like, yeah, but oh, they're... It might be. <laughs> this, this, this is a bit long, isn't it? An hour and a half? And it's like, yeah... We I wouldn't mean... want somebody to not fully understand, like, a scene. We don't want that. We don't want it to be possible to misunderstand anything in this show. We gotta, we gotta get them to feel the feels, because otherwise they won't know why the characters are freaking out. And it's like, well, I guess they could go back and check, right? And it's like, they're not gonna rewatch this. Come on. Well, alternatively, if they were paying super close attention to this so great show, you know, they would, uh, maybe they'd remember it. It's like, oh shit, I don't know. Apparently not. Apparently, they don't trust well, us Just to be safe. Just to be sure, you know, <clears throat> just in case. So then we get quite, I, I thought this was funny, okay? Like, some, some of this stuff, I'm treading on it. I don't even know if it if any of it is directly from any source of any kind. So, you know, but just, just being like, what does, uh, what does your name mean? And he's like, it has one meaning that was a little bit more obvious. She's like, there's another meaning for your name. And he's like, elf friend. And then she goes, are you an elf? friend <laughs> i was just like this sounds so stupid what the hell like <laughs> and he's like i'm a servant and then she's like yet you saved her why and i was like in my own head just like really he's gonna how are you supposed to be able to tell what like he, pill he picks her up sees her ears and then goes ah fuck off and kicks her off the boat like did you really expect that to happen <laughs> is that is that like the the standard protocol at this point uh, it, it's tricky because yeah, yes and no in that because you have these two factions the faithful are the elf lovers and then you have the kingsmen the kingsmen really don't like the elves but the, the show isn't tracking the timeline so the, the the reason they don't like the elves isn't actually established in this show so if you're just critiquing by this show it doesn't make a huge amount of sense would they later on in the timeline in the book have potentially kicked an elf into the ocean yeah maybe actually because they, they go and become these sort of fascistic if... tyrants so but that's in this the thing. Show, it just doesn't make any sense. Had he kicked her off, and then she managed to swim back to Numenor, and then we, everything ran the same way, I would be baffled. Because I'd be like, why are they so aggressive at that point, but now they're so chill? Because if if this this is this is what I mean, it's not matching up to me. Like their approach with the the elf reaching their shores in in this show is pretty chill. If they're supposed to be in a position where they, they want to kill them on sight, or at least not help them to the point of them dying on sight, I didn't get that impression at all. Um, nor I'm not even sure what impression to give. Th this is what honestly, I'm trying like their attitude towards elves. This is what I'm trying to say. They like just... you've got to give some space for people who have not seen anything from the source. This show is trying to tell its own story, but it's absolutely confusing at this point because obviously they're pulling some stuff and then they're leaving other stuff. So the fact that she's like, why didn't you let her die, baffles me because of how well they're treating the elf right now and how well they go on to treat her. Like, why aren't you killing her? What's later, the difference? Then, yeah, later, though, the, the, you hear that you know, for the reign of the grandfather and the grandfather's great-grandfather, they've hated the elf. So for all of that time, apparently, they've, they've been on very bad terms. And yet there, there's not been this, this mass buildup of, of antipathy that's, that's there that creates a sort of this murderous antipathy. It is just... Oh, well, she's here now, so house arrest, darling. That's that's all we're going to give to you. Um, but it's because it is condensing about 2,000 years of history at this point. So there is this is the problem with its selective law citing, because it, it's borrowing events that really are contingent on events that it hasn't borrowed. And so it's supposed to be filling in the gaps that arise as a result. It hasn't filled in any of these gaps. It's just trying to sort of breeze past them, usually with stupid dialogue. But the, the, the next bit, when she is <laughs> still interrogating him, and he says, well, I, I brought her back because the sea is always, always right. And she <laughs> says, well, the sea doesn't commit treason. I love that what? line. I don't understand what any of this means. What are you doing? <laughs> the sea is always he right, yeah, says... but it doesn't commit treason. <laughs> what does that I mean... even mean? <laughs> 
Fuck's he sake. says that in his experience, it's not a good idea to, you know, decide what you're going to do guessing after signs and portents, which is portents, which is a line I really like. But mm. then he says, oh, I brought her back because the C is always right. Which is, yeah. He's <laughs> like, that's, but, but so there was no real reason, actually. It's just because the C is always right. That's not conducive with what you said before. Well, then he follows I, up I, with, I, like I did what I believed is most prudent. Which is, um, couldn't he just say, like, yeah, I yeah. just didn't want her to die, I guess. I mean, I don't, I, mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't follow. It. If she felt this way, if she's condemning him for allowing the elf to live, then why isn't she killing the elf? Yeah, it, would it look bad in front of your people? If it would look if bad it in would, front of your people, then why do you have this attitude in the first place? Exactly, that's why I'm so confused. Like, it seems like they've adapted half and half, and it's caused a huge problem here because, like, I'm now lost as to what the fucking yeah. the, the, the approach with elves is. And then even if you, you read it so the other way, and the way it does pan out as, is that you know she's sort of putting on appearances here, but she, secretly she is much more like her father in that she doesn't actually have a, a massive hatred for the elves, and she is at least amenable to making deals with them. But then you get back to the earlier question as to why she's on the throne to begin with, because you know that was to be expected, you would think. Um, but the, the dialogue just continues to make no sense, because so she says, okay, the sea's always right. But the seed doesn't commit treason, which just invites you to play that clip from Fellowship when Galadriel says treacherous is the sea. And then it goes on later on when she says, if that is your wish, then I have a mission for you. But I don't know what the wish part of that refers to either, because he says, I did what I believed to be right. So then she says, if that is your wish. Does she mean that uh, it was his is, why wish did you believe to be that right? To be right? Yeah, well, yeah, not if that is your wish. It's why did you think that to be right? Or if that is what you believed. Not if that Why is your you wish, because what is, yeah, what is he wishing? Is he wishing to do what he thought was right? Or is he wishing to do the right thing that he then thinks is right? It, uh, at the entire this, exchange, this conversation just feels pointless. Yeah, this, this conversation feels pointless, because I don't feel like you need to have a conversation with him saying, why did you pull this elf out of the water and bring her here when you found her in the middle of the ocean? Like, I feel like the answer to that is obvious, and he would have, like, you do you have to... What is the state of this kingdom and attitude that gets her in a position to where she even needs to have this conversation with him? To, to interrogate him about that in particular. To be clear, by the way, uh, the newest episode of House of the Dragon is conversation, 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 and then right at the end someone dies. Um, it is like an hour and five minutes of people talking and then a action thing happens. Um, the, the conversations are that good that you just like you just like oh yes I I learned a lot from that I learned a lot of that these ones like almost every time I don't feel like these are real people talking to each other and I'm often it's very confused. Empty calories. I There's just I nothing here. Do not, they don't feel like people to me. Um, yeah. Really this don't. isn't how people talk to each other. This isn't how well, two human beings talk to each other. What's been high? The, these conversations are like needlessly convoluted. I was gonna say complex, complicated, but like that's not. It's convoluted not that. is the They're right convoluted. word. Yeah. They are convoluted because everything that these characters are saying to each other could be achieved with so much more clarity, but they feel the need. We talked about it in the in the previous coverage. Like everything is purple prose. Like the way that these people talk to each other, it's like you know what? I need to make this more confounded. I need to throw in more. Yeah, like, uh, it, it's incredibly, unnecessarily, needlessly convoluted. But there's usually a compensating strategy, though. I mean, is it any, and anyone who's ever written, like, undergraduate prose will know. People who go in for colourful pink purple prose, they usually have nothing to say. That's the reason. Yeah, like, that, they, that's they have the nothing to convey prose. either. It's, it's, all, it's a massive language game to trick you into thinking that... Well, and actually, meaning has even been exchanged here, which really... I mean, it hasn't. It's right? I can't... It, there's no real... There's not even basic meaning that's being conveyed between these things. But like, the House of the Dragon example is really useful for another way because you, know, you're, you are actually being thrown into... If you compare the two... You're being thrown into a really similar setting. You're in. You're being thrown into a kingdom with which you're not previously familiar, unless you've read the book. It's both kingdoms are in their relatively or their mid to late stage of development, shall we say? And let's say you have no equivalent. You have no foreknowledge of either of them. By episode five of House with the Dragon, you're pretty up to speed with the dynamics of the kingdom itself, the place it's set in, the factions involved, yeah. uh, the different alliances that are that are in play. 
episode four, and so we had one fewer episode, but episode four of um, of Rings of Power, it, you don't get that. Like, there's no understanding of what Numenor really is, and it's such a sim- It's a relatively simple kingdom to depict. Again, there are just two factions you have to work with here. You don't need to do a lot to make this make sense. But they haven't even managed to do the bare minimum to make it make sense because they don't know how. Partly because they don't have to write fucking dialogue, which is just astonishingly was, um, meaningless. I, the last House of the Dragon discussion, I said, like on Rings of Power, it feels like we're not done with the intro yet, and we're halfway through the season. Mm. And it's not. It's not like a short. These episodes are long. They're yeah. longer than the average show. Like the average show, yeah. hour long, used to mean like forty three, forty four minutes. These are an hour and ten minutes. These are long episodes. We got time. Like these conversate. I think the impression I get is that like in the writer's room, they're like, so fantasy is when the characters speak, uh, I guess, elegantly, you know, like um, everybody, everybody is, uh, they've got the big words that like, you know, they're very prosaic and charismatic. And and like something that they've lost in that on in that reading is like yeah, but they are people, right? Like they're people, just like yeah. you and me. They're trying to and actually like, communicate ideas. Yeah, they're not trying just, to. Yeah, w- that's the purpose of a conversation is to like convey something to somebody else in a way that they'll understand. That's like the point of a conversation. I'm trying to tell you something, but these conversations don't play out like people trying to tell each other something. It plays out like they know that there is an audience watching them. That they need to like impress with with their words. I know, yeah. Um, like you don't talk like this when no one's watching. Exactly. Um, and I mean, it's like you mentioned. Um, the, the, it's like Chad, Chad, simple writing in a sense. Like the, the like the, the um... Lord of the Rings, as it seems. <laughs> if if you because I I actually read a little bit yesterday because this came up in a different conversation, but the Lord of the Rings as a as a book is. It's not complex at all. It's it's written very matter of factly, and it's easy to tell what's happening. Um, it's not. It's it's. You don't have to have this grandiose kind of you, this extensive, you know, lexicon to know what's well, happening. We talked about contrast before. Something that's often been said about prose and how to use it effectively is that when a scene is straightforward. And normal, you know, like the, I guess you could call them the connecting scenes between the big payoffs and the big moments. That a good way to contrast those big moments is to have regular scenes play out in a straightforward way and to save like really descriptive, um, like descriptive prose for the potent, like big payoff moments. Cause that way it's like, oh, wow, we're like, you know, the, the more, uh, involved it becomes the more it draws attention to itself but like because you're being selective about what you're drawing attention to it just makes those parts more effective here there is no restraint every every scene everybody it, like, i mean you were talking about it before like how many times have they tried to inject these weird allegories oh, these God. weird they don't know how to write them parables and and sayings that are just confused they're just really weird and yeah, stupid. Why, what are you trying to tell me? Like, seriously, the whole point of a conversation is to get your ideas into my head, and I have no idea what you're trying exactly. to tell me. What, what, like, what are you saying? I don't <laughs> want understand me to understand what you're trying to convey. The other, the other problem with that, of course, is that it seems everyone of every race, every background, and every origin speaks in exactly the same allegorical yeah. way. So, like, the Harfords yeah. use the same speech turns as the elves do, and the elves use the same speech turns as the dwarves use. Um, and if you have a writing team which is making every single one of this massive disparate cast sound exactly the same, what you're really listening to there is the writers and not the characters that they've made, because the characters, they are just conduits for the same writer putting their own words into the mouths of disparate peoples. It just doesn't make for a believable world either. It makes for a nonsensical one because the metaphors just don't make sense, but it also makes for an, a less believable one because it's so obvious that there is one guy who's just been sitting there coming up with these for probably a week, and he's really proud of the the fire and the, the sweeping the salt from the table and the chopping the head from the prairie grass and the whatever else he's come up with. It's, it's very transparently the writer coming through, and um, this writer is, is not good. You don't want to see him. You... You know, I now that you mentioned that, it, excluding Galadriel, 
because uh, I think that a lot of her, a lot of her lines can be directly attributed to her because of how standoffish a lot of them are. If you took like the lines of dialogue for any other character in the show and took the name away from it, I don't think that you could you I think it would be like virtually impossible to figure out who said what line. Mm. Like it would be so difficult. If you took a line that was um I guess as contextless as possible but like still a line yeah, of dialogue. Yeah, like blurred out the name so you, uh... Yeah, like and then you, you maybe it to some of the Harfoot talk is a bit more vulgar, maybe. but maybe yeah, like but even then, could you identify specific Harfoot? You wouldn't be able to no. tell which one. Yeah, probably, yeah. Nah, probably not. They're all too. I mean, I guess Everybody maybe the fat the Harfoot point, is basically. really like timid, and that might come through. The fact that you had to say maybe timid though. Yeah, yeah. and you have to well, describe I, I her as the fat well, Harfoot. You don't even know her name. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah, but I don't I blame you. I to go dodge the entire time. I don't know what her name. I is. don't know what her name is either. It's it's something, but maybe that element of her personality would come up in text. So that's one character, maybe. The fact that it's even maybe in a, in a what twenty characters? How many characters does this show have? It has a lot you of know. characters. Well, I feel um, like the most um, individual, dare I say, might be Durin. I feel like he's the most, he always stands out to me. Probably. And I have many issues with his characterization, many. and yet still, yeah. I think it's the actor that's doing it for me. I'm not sure. Oh, his acting is wasted on this show. Well, maybe it's, um, because this show is devoid of levity. There's it's so yes. little, like... He is they're, exactly the way that I would phrase it, yes. They're, they're, they're not willing to ever have, like, a joke. Um, it's the same problem I have with fucking the Halo show. Like, the Halo show, there's no fucking jokes. It's, there's yeah, never it's any so... Fan. And, like, the games have lots of jokes. Like, full the of games character, have... yeah. Yeah, like, and it's not even just... I mean, the Lord of the Rings jokes. was full of jokes. Well, well, and... That's, that's, oh, yeah, that's the reason why I bring it up. Lord of the Rings has tons of jokes. It has characters uh -huh. who are funny and, and funny moments. There's no... Co no contrast. It's all plays... It, it's, it's all dour and serious... Play. And yep. land. But it's, it's not, not very even... interesting because there are stories that don't have much levity at all. There are stories that like are very serious strictly. Um, but in this case, there's nothing of there's nothing of real value in that. Like that you you sacrificed any level of um, you know, uh lightness for nothing. Like <laughs> for you know, for yeah, what did you gain empty. from all that? Nothing. I want to like because it's not even just the fact that the, the existence of jokes in in Lord of the Rings. It's the the way they weave them in is fucking phenomenal. Like it's, organic. It, it's not even like the the joke in and of itself. I think is pretty good, but the way that it's contextualized and placed where it is in uh, in Two Towers when he says, uh, "Would you like me to describe it to you, or should I find a box?" Um, Gimli's fucking reaction and then his laugh. <laughs> it's one of the best laughs of I all I fucking time. love that moment just because it's it's it seems to me Ghibli thinks for a second, motherfucker, what did you do? Ah, <laughs> that was great. Legolas says like, it with that smirk on his face, his yeah. fucking elf smirk, and then Gimli is, he's down for it. They're they're at that point in their relationship now where they can joke it's about great, yeah, other. like, he can yeah, make the, a the fucking short joke. The key there, though. Exactly, because that's what makes the joke so much better. This is part of the better. ongoing, constant relationship and the development of those two characters and how they interact with each other, from the massive antipathy of the Fellowship of the Ring, to the point where they're starting to be at ease in each other's company, to the point where they are starting to make jokes, to the point where they're best friends at the end of Return of the King. Like, that that's an earned payoff. If you, and, were, no, if you were just randomly inserting that without any build-up in that scene at Helm's Deep, it would seem crass and cheap and like you were just doing Marvel quota humor. But they've actually earned the payoff by building these characters out first. Whereas like, if I think if Rings well, of Power would even line is start doing that, it wouldn't work. Dude, the, you, the, the bro it, ship it, the between of... Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli is fucking great throughout the trilogy. It is incredible. When when we don't get that much like a huge amount of time with them, really, as a trio talking, but it's very efficient. Yeah, you could you pull so much from how it progresses. I mean, Pippin as a character, like pretty much all of his funny lines and everything. It's just him being him in a situation he's clearly not familiar with or used to. And then even by the end, he changes into a different character, but he still has that element of his personality in him. That never goes away. So his kind of humor sort of changes over time. <clears throat>
But that, that, what I just wanted to bring up there was just like not only are the jokes very much present in the original trilogy, if I'm calling it that, the Jackson trilogy, uh, it's the, the they have so much purpose in the script. This this is just dour. This this whole show, it's just been eh, and it's not like not even with purpose. You know that you can watch. Uh, they can they can be media that's built deliberately to have a very low and difficult tone to consume sort of thing. But this, uh, they are trying to have highs and lows in this. They even do have what I think they would call jokes. <laughs> but like it's a struggle for us to call them jokes. Um, it is. It is why the depiction of the dwarves, as I think Fringy mentioned, is it, that's why that sort of works. Even the Harfords in the first two episodes until they become evil, um, that also <laughs> kind of works because at least at <laughs> least there's some kind of charm there. There's some personality. I think the key to that is sort of can you imagine them actually enjoying themselves off screen? Right. And you can imagine no. that with Duran and Deesa. I think you cannot imagine that with. I can't Pretty imagine much it any with other them, character. Yeah. Duran and right, Deesa. Right. I Deesa is a character I I, I like. Um, she almost seems out of place in this world. Yeah, um, a lot of people have been commenting on this, I, and I think it's just the actress is she's she. I was about to say jolly. I don't know if that's offensive. <laughs> like, it's just, just, she's, you can't call fat people jolly. I don't oh know. God. I don't know the rules. Yeah, like she has like a. I. It is an actress playing a role as I like. Well, I. I like her in terms of her personality and how she like behaves and she seems uh, maybe it's directly as a result of that but she seems so out of place like you like you could like talk with her and have conversations with her and like she has a she just se she seems so out of place because no one else really is like she is and it's not that I can't believe her I do believe her it's just it makes everyone else seem out of place almost as an inverse like you're the only real person in this show, and everyone else is just a skin walking, weird talker. Especially the elves. Especially. Anyway, um, we're 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 even. Oh, oh no! Is that what's next? Because yeah, she what's she basically that? she tasks Elendil with uh, personally watching over Galadriel. It's whatever. Mm. And then they take us back to the Southlands. This is where we start to get all the information. And this, this is, where, I mean, twenty minutes in, and we've really only done the Numenor intro. So long they take yeah, with everything, and we didn't gain a, much. Twenty minutes is a whole episode of The Simpsons, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you must go by Simpsons whole, time. You you can tell a whole story in twenty minutes. You know, you can tell a whole and story if, shorter than that, but like in twenty minutes, you could tell a story. And if we cool. kept this pacing, which is really slow in terms of like plot stuff happening and things progressing, but if all of these, but if but if that twenty minutes was just oozing with different characters and general competence, I would be totally fine with that. I would be totally engaged if Gladriel was a good character, and if everyone we met was like a good, well written character, I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll listen to him talk all damn day. Exactly, do that's. Pretty much what House of the Dragon is right now. It's been it's been five hours, and there's been what you would probably call a ratio of like ten to one talking to action, but they're able to carry it because the talking is getting more and more and more and more tension filled, more and more betrayal, more and more secrets, more and more all this stuff that keeps building up, and everyone's getting characterized, and everyone's got like getting louder and angrier as time goes on. Just like oh shit, this is all coming to a to a head at some point. Woo! But um, here. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, like uh, I was about to say, like the first criticism I've got for this this scene is the dialogue again. So we see this big old trench. We we're not getting the wide shot yet. I'm gonna wait until we get that before I unload several bazillion criticisms. But we have our character, and he's walking through here. He's he's like lugging something with a friend, and he says, "Huh, this is how they escaped our detection, and it's how they shield themselves from the sunlight." Allegedly, I don't, like mm. I don't even. Like, why do you hate me so much? Like, surely that was for me to be able to figure out at least vaguely. But you just have him say all of that to a person who obviously knows that? Like, the person who was kidnapped before if, him. If you felt like you had to, like, insert that line, like, if you needed to, then there's way better ways to do it. Like, an orc could mockingly talk to an elf slave and say you dig faster you don't want the elves to see us and then this laughs like that's it's the reason and it's an orc being mocking to an elf that's already better than just the the this the character just saying it out loud 
because we don't gain anything else. Nothing is multi-pronged. It, nothing serves more than one purpose, I feel, in this show. But th this is the point at which these purposes start really contradicting themselves. Like, every line of dialogue in this contradicts some previous part of the setup. It's That's getting like, real bad, astonishingly yeah. bad. So the, he's so I'm already conf slightly confused with the timeline, because I don't know when the elves before him, including to, um... the Tower Warden that we're supposed to care about, I don't know when he was captured. But he was. I don't know but, how they were captured. Well, that's, but that's so. That's the thing, right? So the, he says the, these tunnels are how they've been uh, evading our detection for so long. Next line of dialogue: They've been ransacking villages all over the Southlands. Like you might, well, would the elves have spotted that? The elves are incredibly this, fast yeah, th and they have watchtowers. Well, all none over of the, the place. people escaped. You did that with perfect capture rates. No oh, one escaped. God, Nobody so was just out in the fields while it was happening. It's so bad. No one noticed. Well, you see, rags. Whenever someone goes to to inspect, they jump down into the holes themselves and get kidnapped because they're dumbasses. That's what's happened. You That's see? true. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Well, luckily they have people who care about them very, very deeply who would be we, really um... concerned about their absence. So we rewind, zoom out, and just picture for a moment: where is okay. this enormous trench? Is it? It's just the Southlands. Okay. Where is it in reference to our main village? Like to the to the left or right of it or something, or it goes directly through it, or like, because when they show the us Lord the wide shot, had a there there was an advantage to I guess what you're talking about in terms of like spatial relations in the show is quite confusing often. Even as much as they use a map, it's still kind of confusing the way they present it. And in the Lord of the Rings, for the most part, it's a, we're going from point A to point B, so you're going along the way. It's not mm -hmm. as Preminent in the story that you need that but here it's just like we're just sort of here but we're trying to stay hidden and we're in the southlands but not that part of southlands like we're, we're, we're further away but they haven't found us yet i guess and there's not like mountains between us uh, so or, or maybe there is that's the thing i don't know there is a really obvious waypoint that they could have just thrown into the shot to establish at least a rough sense of location because mount doom is there that you can see it in the background occasionally. That's where they are. It would have been just a simple, quite subtle way of at least giving you some hint of place. Wait, the Southlands just... are Mordor? Yeah, Southlands become Mordor. Hey, oh. hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for us to get to that scene. That's going to be great. <laughs> I legitimately didn't know that. Well, you is... did, you did, because oh, no, it's that, in the episode. Problem, right? Because it's. Oh, wait, are that, you saying. You, that should have been established by this point. I, but I thought Mordor was a different place real. than the Southlands. I thought they were going through the Southlands, but it was the, um, distinct from Mordor. The symbol, the Sauron's mark, the symbol, that is Mordor. And then yeah, yeah. on the map, it's, it's, the, it's called the Southlands. Um, oh, okay. I thought. I, I I guess I just thought they were different places. We'll, we'll go over all of that when we get there anyway. Yeah, but but that, that's the show's problem as well. I was about it? to say that I think that's indicative to a degree of the show's issues, but I mean. It is because I think of Mordor as Mordor, I guess, and I know this is a previous, but I just, yeah, I hear the Southlands, and Mordor didn't. I guess I didn't put South and Mordor together because it's, it's more fine. It's, it's west fine. so or east, so I don't, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we we are to believe that because this is the thing. There's, I'm not even kidding. There's a fucking laundry list for this scene, and ev with every few seconds we push forward, we're gonna have so many problems. I'm. I struggle. If I, were, if I were doing a video so I, to break this down, I don't envy you, uh, little platoon. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the way to talk about, like, all of the issues here chronologically would be difficult, because I'm not sure which one you pick first sort of thing. But it's like, yeah, so logistically, I have no idea how this is supposed to work. I have no idea how the elves have missed all of this, this in enormous operation with how sloppy and stupid the, the orcs have been. Uh, it would seem... With how long this operation has been going on, it was just lucky that the orcs attacked the village the very day that the elves decided to leave. Which after I, seventy-nine I, years, yeah, that's, that is insane. What a coincidence! <laughs> like, yeah, if it was one insane. day later, this entire plot thing wouldn't have happened at all. Or at the, the very least, the elves off. would have found this place. Uh, with or they would have people. had to come back if they were told. Or if yeah. this was a day before, then all the people would show up while the elves are there. Um, as mentioned, mm -hmm. his his friendo and their boss. They they've now been captured. And they've been here for God knows how long, and nobody seems to care. No, like we got three elves missing, and apparently... on the day we called them back, and they didn't make it back to Elfland. And if you go back so to we... where they're posted, everyone's gone, and there's holes in the ground. <laughs> like this, I don't know. Well, if you go back to where they're posted, you'll find all those people. 
Actually, well, yeah, if they'd gone back on a timeline that we'd expect, they would have found the village, and then they would have been able to find out what's going on. And at the very least, if they'd gone back to the Elf Watchtower, as you said, they would have bumped into the people, they would have found out what's going on. How is this not happening? Because it can't ha If it happened, it would ruin everything, so we can't have that happen. They find out no matter what. Yes. Maybe the, maybe the elves are like Harfoots, and these elves that got captured, they just fell behind. And so, fuck them. <laughs> oh, also, yeah, I think God. they've been there... They've been, how long have they been there in total, the elves? Was it since the war ended, or was it long, uh, shorter than that? Yeah, yeah, so this is, so, they, so they've essentially occupied the Southlands because the Southlanders, by and large, not universally, but by and large, uh, sided with Morgoth, and so the elves sort of inevitably had to go and take the fight to them. So they established these watchtowers to keep uh, track of the, the movements of, of Morgoth's forces, and then later on they sort of established them as like an occupying force. Um, I think episode one or right? two says there's four or five watchtowers just in this particular region. Right. And then, of course, you remember in uh, the two towers uh, when they're trying to find the hobbits and Legolas can see for tens, if not hundreds of miles because elves are incredibly farsighted. You combine network of watchtowers with incredibly farsighted elves, you'd think they would have spotted burning villages because we're told that there's a whole load of them, not Maybe just the one, over but the they've horizon. been all of them. Well, they did build one of those watchtowers on the side of a cliff, which made very little sense tactically, but there we are. But multiple burning villages, and then it also turns out later, huge burning trench thing. Just It's just that they've just forgotten their own sort of setup and the lore again that they're trying to hark back to or forward to in the case of the Lord of the Rings, because it would be really inconvenient to the plot if they actually remembered any of this stuff. They forget the things that they make a big deal out of. Mm -hmm. They make a big deal about the elves being here and the humans not liking them, and that's like a thing. And then it's not. Then we just forgot about it. We or we don't care anymore. That thing served its purpose for that scene. It's done now. It's finished. We don't yeah, have to they, worry um, about it anymore. They forgot that earlier as well, didn't they? Back in the, the Numenor scene with the first sort of dialogue exposition dump. Sorry, when Galadriel is explaining to Halbrand that his people are not like the people of Numenor. And then she gives you the exposition about how his people all sided with Sauron and he's from the Southlands. But you know, it's as though he doesn't know this. But the little teenage brat kid well, in episode been, one, he does know this. because Well, it's supposed to have been about 2,000 years, so it should really have faded it, in the memory. But the teenage yeah, guy in the episode yeah. one, he remembers it like it's yesterday. But Halbrand doesn't remember it at all because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do the exposition. So it's, yeah, like you say, they, they just forget strategically. It's strategic amnesia and it's it, very, very annoying as this goes on. They don't realize that these things are, you're, you're kind of investing whenever you make these kinds of world building choices yeah. and whenever you present something to an audience. You can't just, you, you've made the investment. It's up to you to pay off your own investment. You can't just forget about it. It's still there. You can't just undo it. But I guess they think you can. Which is unfortunate. I would have liked some consistency in the way people behave. Then again, consistency would rely on me sort of understanding a lot of things, which it's, so many things seem contradictory. It's hard to know what I'm supposed to latch on to as being the thing that's real. And so with all of that out of the way, we can get to all of the other problems that we get immediately. <laughs> so like, they're, they're, digging an, they're digging this trench. Okay. And then our little team are like, oh, bother. We've dug ourselves into a tree and then uh, this guy they're, they're like boss man he says um, yeah, can we just pause home you you think that would be something that you would see coming and would go around you know it's pretty Why big was... tree like I, I, trees I, have I, a tendency you know, to be rather I'm tall and prominent did you dig the trench in a minute like surely it took a while I'm gonna have <laughs> to know? get like... the shot because now that you've said that the, the, for anybody who hasn't seen this episode okay they've bumped into a tree and unfor I'm doing this on purpose, you should all pull up the stream for this. They have unfortunately bumped into a tree, chat. They're digging How their could this have happened? miles and miles long trench, and then someone has accidentally leveled the- Oh gosh, unfortunate. They're I hope someone out. got fired for that blunder. So, when you see this shot, I'm pretty sure I just started laughing. <laughs> like, it's- this is- this is cartoonish. This is cartoonish. I don't know what else to say. Like- also, what's the point in hiding the trench if this is what you do to the fucking woods? Exactly! What are- Like, what are you- <laughs> Well, at but least they don't see our just, tunnel! It's like- it's the, Just the, the totality of it. We need to hide our tunnel in this barren field, but oh no, we happen to run into the one tree that's destroyed. 
what why don't we why don't we just ha leave the forest and stay in the forest <laughs> Do you, it do seems you think like we're wasting a lot you know, of work here? How much fucking Just time it would take? The that was there. All of the resources it's taken to create this stupid. Tri Why? What is the point? What is the plan? The, 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 look how open and obvious tree. everything. Remember, remember, Elfman is like, oh, this is how they evaded our detection. It's like, who is who are they <laughs> evading? Who the fuck yeah, are they evading? Weird. We will evade their detection in this barren smoking. <laughs> We're burning yeah. a, They burnt all down all the trees except this one, apparently. Except this one. <laughs> it's so I stupid. Just, like, just dig into morning it. coffee at the watchtower, and they're just sitting and said, "That looks. That looks a bit different. What happened? What happened to the woods <laughs> over there? Ah, that's not our not our problem. It's, it's always don't worry been about like it. that. Probably. I don't know. I don't care. Yeah, it's always been like and that, as we know ourselves. It's winter. Oh well, you know, like. It's such a like, oh, you know, guys, when you're digging that trench, make sure you don't hit the tree. And it's like, oh, fuck. Oh, he hit the tree, didn't he? Cross That's the one thing we didn't would. want to happen. I told, I, you that <laughs> I told you that yesterday and the day before that and the day because, you know, it took a few times. It was the like one thing, trip. guys. You fucked up yeah. the one job. Who Just avoid the, the giant this tree. And look at look the tunnel bends. You can see it kind of. It's like twisting. It bends it right towards the well, tree. So what's really interesting is you can see they have started digging around it. There's a little. Can you see the little indentation toward the the yeah. left of? Well, I guess mm -hmm. their left, our right, um, of the tree. It's like yeah, just move. it's already curving around your big trench. Fuck it, just keep going. You'll curve around the tree. Just like, around. To, to are you like really tree. concerned aesthetically about the the <laughs> look of your tunnel? With this like one you have someone who's just it. like an interior decorator orc who's really an interior decorator who's upset about the exterior tree. <laughs> well, yeah, because they're gonna. I um, just go. Why are you just go around it? it. <laughs> just why go you around it. it. I just can't believe it. It looks real. like yeah. It looks like you hit the only it, it iceberg a, in the ocean. Is what it this looks is like a cartoon image. Is what this is. It this is. This is a cloud image. It's it's a cloud. I can't believe you they're can't... ruining the character of the orcs. Look at this, right? You go this train. It's like it goes. It's like fuck me. This is like like several miles of trench. How didn't you see the tree? <laughs> Why did you cut that one down while you were cutting all the other ones down? Why did you leave this one tree up when you cut down all the other trees, only to then bump into that tree with your tunnel? And avoid all the other trees? <laughs> like, because How the other ones, you, manage... you cut them down, they still have their roots, which would still get in the way. But if you avoid them, fair enough. But then you fucking drive straight into the one that you haven't done anything to. It, it's hard to explain how stupid it is. And yeah, that's what uh, Gogo just said. It's, it's all the cloth too. They just they just get that. Or they got a cloth supply, I guess. Maybe it's. Uh... They've got a guy. I, I want to see that guy. The guy. Wait, you don't cloth? How do, cloths are knit? Like animal skin? This is, is it? Or... Be a stupid question, isn't it? I would be. I'd yeah. more. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to believe cloth before animal skins. Because think about how many critters you'd have to kill. Exactly. This is what I mean. Like whatever they're doing, I I just there is a there is one orc out there who's knitting, I guess, or doing something. I don't know. I was about. I to assume say, orcs do, you, do, do that you sort you of busy cloth? work. In which case, is there? A, I I want to see the 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 orc who's just sitting there in his little rocking chair knitting together. <laughs> oh, I'm a grandma orc. I'm just knitting to keep He's the like, boy safe from the sun. In the tunnel, we're gonna She's need a hundred more blankets. Just well. like right all the way, don't you worry. <laughs> well, it's that where you've like, got like you... all the little level one, level two noob orcs who are in like the the starting area, and they're all just grinding and killing all the animals, and then they're selling on the produce from those animals, and someone else is turning them into all of this material. They're actually just grinding for experience, and it's uh, been useful for yeah. the economy because they've created yeah. cloth as well. And there was a guy who was like, go take down that tree, and he was just like, oh, I need a toilet first, and then he forgot, and it was like, ah, oh, you fucking, you're the only one, you just left the tree up, so now we're gonna have to get one of the elves to do it. Which, yeah, let us continue. So one thing I forgot to mention, there's a line where the three, our three elfmans, who, it's funny because there's so many other characters here technically, but they're the only three that have, like, lines, because they're the three we know, and then I put no in quotations, because one of them is like the smelly guy, or was caught, or said to smell. And then the other guy who is just like, I hate all of the Southland men. And then our main guy, who his characterization is, I love girl. 
That's all that I've got for all three of these people. <laughs> There's nothing else about him. But one, I think isn't one of them, we we are only introduced to him in this episode, the guy who we're then meant to feel very sad for in a moment. No, no, he, no was, he, he, he was Smelly Friend. Guy. Smelly Friend, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh I missed him. Yeah. He's well, that's, that's why it was memorable. so meaningful when he died, because I remember when he said, like, oh, you smell. And then he was like, no, I don't. He smells uh, himself, and he's like, nah, so... I don't smell. It's very funny. I can already imagine, like, one of those, um, I don't know what they call it, but you know, like, when he dies, like, it goes black and white, and there's, like, a montage of all the time they spent together, and it's just that one scene, <laughs> like, in black and white. You just white. play the whole scene, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be a montage, in slow motion. it's just that one scene. <laughs> uh... No, they talked for ten seconds at the watchtower before they walked in. Yeah. Where he's like, yep, romances are doomed between our species for some fucking reason. But uh, he says, if we, if any one of us can make it home, we can return in force. The implication being, like, yeah, had any one of them actually managed to make it back to the elves, they could have actually done something about all this. So our our main elf man, had he not just jumped into the hole in the hopes of doing something, and then failing to do that and getting caught, like, had he not decided to do that and just gone back, which, by the way, would have worked, because the girl went back and she that made was... it fine. Yeah, I think that was literally one of the things I said was, you, no, you need to go back and tell everyone. Also, everyone said it was, it, if you die, it was no then... reason to go in the hole. No reason. You, well, you... He, well, there was totally a reason to go in the hole. However, when he found something in the hole, he got afraid and ran. Is that a good reason, though? Like, to, to, to just... No, it's not, Mahler. It's <laughs> like... a terrible reason. It, it, it makes me wonder what you wanted to have happen. I want to go in this creepy hole, but I sure hope I don't run into anything. So oh why no, are I you ran going? into something. Blah, blah, blah. If you remember, they actually gave you a really well fleshed out reason because they're standing on top of the hole and she says, you don't know what's in there. And he says, that is why I have to go. Oh. So actually, it was incredibly well explained. Wow. And I don't know how you missed it. Oh my goodness. He He's has not to know paying what's attention, in there. Clearly. Go. I'm like the orcs with this tree. <laughs> He's like, oh no, there's monsters in the hole. He's like, yeah, oh no, probably. Yeah, probably. I thought it was friendly I rabbits that dug the hole. I didn't realize it wasn't it was. friendly rabbits at all. It was they orcs. Were very I was so wrong. Rabbits. He's just oh, like, that's what he's orcs, picturing yeah. in his head the whole time moving through it. These wonderful, cuddly rabbits that are all going to surround him and be happy about things. And there's an orc, and he's like, no, it was orcs. No. no. Oh, I, this. Oh no, the orcs did all this. Gosh. I thought it was friendly rabbits. Oh no. I hope my girlfriend cares about me. Yeah, and so you just you alluded to it earlier, but yeah, there's a line where it says, um, they'll sweep the enemies from this land like salt from a table. <laughs> and again, you're like, like salt wait, from like a table. salt from a table? I mean, <laughs> like, all the So you take your hands and you sweep all the, the salt off the table. Yeah, why, How often do you just, you just like, fuck it up with your salt, just doing? tossing it all over the table? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like gritty, and some of it'll stick to your hands and everything. Yeah, I just. There's so much salt on the table. Salt on it. It becomes yeah. like a saying that you sweep it off the table. Oh, there's so much good. salt. Oh, it's it's like it rains. It comes from the sky. There's salt day every month, and it just <laughs> pours down from the sky. We can't explain it. And all of our tables get salt on them. All and it happens all the time. We gotta sweep it away. You all know, this you fucking often, salt. You often sweep dust off the floor. Or like, you know... No one does that. Guess, we sweep well, so, salt from the table. Free. But I was even going to say, though, imagine that was the line where he said they'll sweep the enemies from this land much like we would sweep dust from the floor. We'd be like, okay. Oh. So you'd move, <laughs> it, you'd move it somewhere else? Well, I don't no, even know what you mean. It, like, you're going to put... There's no... You're gonna, well, at the there's no finesse. Least, like, no, there's no finesse in that, but at least it's like, ah, I, I, it's shit, but like, I understand it. Yeah. Whereas here it's like, it's shit and I don't understand what the- Oh yeah, no, this is, this is definitely one step, step up from like a, what was it, spring rain washing the, the bones from a dead car, whatever the other <laughs> awful one The was. rock looks down, okay? The rock looks down. <laughs> what was the really awkward analogy? It was, I, I remember, oh, I don't, it's kind of like the, that other thing I was talking about. The, like the funny bit. I can't remember what the funny bit was, but I almost like remember there being a bit that was funny. And it's kind of like this wasn't there was a terrible analogy, but I can't remember which one it was. Like a particularly a bad analogy. Them, so. Yeah. Uh, well, think yeah, about maybe it. Maybe I'm just thinking back to the. Oh, the particularly bad analogy. In this <laughs> it's like, yes, the one that's. Right, that's why I said particularly bad, not bad. Uh, 
particularly that's, now, bad. That's true. I guess, what does it mean for something to be particularly bad amidst a sea of badness? <laughs> oh, it's, it's even badder than the it's bad It's even thing. badder? Yeah. An extra it's, layer it's of bad. The it's like a, it's, it's a, like a tunnel. The sea is bad, always right. But not really a tunnel. It's more of a ditch. Um, they Yeah, why did they stop? Why did the orcs tunnel properly when they got to the villages, but they're not tunneling properly here? They're just making they a They want a trench. Let them have they're it. They're getting more ambitious. They, they oh, want... Yeah, they want the other thing is, more if the orcs, the orcs know they can't go outside very easily in the daylight, so why are they why are they even having the elves dig the tunnel in the daylight? Wouldn't you keep them locked That's up underground yep. during the day and then have them work throughout the night instead? But then Plus I thought in the previous episode, work at night. yeah, exactly. But I also thought in the previous episode the orcs had been digging the tunnel themselves anyway because you had the weird mole man that comes out of the floor. So oh, yeah. why are they even well, using the elves? Well, anyway? it's just it's just. I mean, I guess you well, want to use them for slave labor. I was actually going to say, so you don't have to do it. That makes sense. That does make sense. It's not, they're going to fuck that up in a minute. <laughs> We've kind of already talked about <laughs> it, but hey, because um, this is this scene is so bad. But um, they bump into the tree, and he says, um, "Felling a tree will slow our progress. We will go around." Now, if that's true. That taking down this tree is going to take way longer than just your standard digging, then yeah, really the orcs would. should just be on board with it. I don't see why they wouldn't be. Yeah, unless of course, of course they really longer. hate trees because trees represent nice things. Well, I mean, look at it does look, look, at look at like them. they like, hate trees. Look what a they've lot. done for this field. Like they, look they, at all these unnecessary dead anti, trees. Yeah, they are also, against nature. Yeah, this is the thing. It's like, the orcs just fucking they're hate trees. All right, gotta get rid of the trees. Fuck them. And it's like, oh, okay. But he follows up because that's that's his like attempt at being let's say reasonable. But then he gets desperate. And he said, this tree has earned its place in these lands. And I was just oh, like... Now they're definitely okay. going to cut his <laughs> I was going to say, do you really think that's going to be compelling to orcs? Like, come on. Long before you, you didn't... crawled up from wherever you was you came from or wherever the line Yeah, you, you didn't tell them, like, oh yeah, we, even if we cut it down, it actually doesn't change anything for us because it's it's the bottom of the tree that's in our way. Like the, the top really part of the tree is actually not in our way, as, as it seems. <laughs> It's all of these yeah. roots that go into the ground, and chopping those up will take ages. Let's just go around and dig, because dirt is nice and soft, generally. Um, also, like, when it, because he says, like, yeah, he says the tree earned place here. What about all the trees you cut down to, like, build your whole civilization? Those, we, trees. <laughs> those trees <laughs> didn't <laughs> fucking earn their place. They okay, did earn yeah. right. This is a meritocracy, and they failed. <laughs> and the whippersnapper right trees... Flavor. What does it mean to be a whippersnapper tree? <laughs> yes. Oh, I think we all know the we all know the answer to that. So we could move right along, like a a, a tree with like a skateboard and sunnies. <laughs> Just like man, this this orc yeah, is radical, real. dude. How intimidating this orc is with his little whip. <laughs> the chap, it really, the chap is, it really is a little whip, isn't it? It is a little whip. It's not a He's really it's proud a of his whip. whip. He just loves He's whipping. Very, look at that embellishing that he does there at the end. Look yeah. At that. Stylish. He's liking this. Wearing, isn't it, isn't he wearing a snake skin? I, I don't even... What is yeah, that? I, what is that? Yeah, you're right. That's like a reptile. That, I think it does look, look like a reptile skin or something. Reptile. Holy fuck, Did, what is I, out here that, that is, that's <laughs> shedding that? Let's yeah. go home. I don't want to be here anymore. Is this Australia? Yeah, like, what the fuck? Yeah. Hey, look, all right? They're not that big. Well, crocodile. Actually, wait, yeah. <laughs> crocodile's like four meters long, so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I just thought that appeal was funny. It was, just, it was just like, the tree should not be cut down because it's earned its place. And you're saying this to like a creature that couldn't give or less of a fuck. Cut down like, many trees. He yeah, was, he's like, cutting oh, down the forest with reckless abandon, you it seems. You would have been better off just saying, this is going to take long. You understand, we have to cut down the tree and then dig the trench, or we can just dig the trench elsewhere. Yeah, like, yeah, and yeah, fucking with all of its on. roots, like, this is going to, this is fucking, we it's don't want to do this. Us, guys. Yeah. Yeah, he we shouldn't have said if you cut down this tree, you'll get even more XP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he you probably shouldn't have made it sound that. like you will literally cry if you cut down that tree. Like that's probably not what you should tell the orcs. You should <laughs> yeah, be like the emotional appeal to the orcs is probably <laughs> not the best move here. You're you're a Galadriel level statesman, I see. Yeah, you're right. This tree sprang from the earth long before you crawled from wherever you. It's just like shut the fuck up, dude. Look at the ball. 
You're, just, you're not ready to 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 take them on, but um, yeah. Anyway, so there's a little bit of a little bit of flemage going on here, and it's like, you know what? You've impressed me with your aggression. We're gonna reward you with water. And every human oh, on gosh. the fucking planet was like, they're gonna do something. It's a trap. They'll they'll do something. They're gonna punch you or or do something. And then they do something really fucking weird because they don't. You might think, person listening right now. Like, oh, the orcs are fucking with him, so are they gonna, like, beat him up? Make an example of this, this guy who is the one who is, like, refusing to take his orders? Yeah. No. Kill or beat him up. They are not going all. to make an example of him. They are legitimately gonna give that guy water. He enjoys it. That's nice. Like then, water. they will allow Elfman, our main character, to have some water, too. That's nice. And then, Smelly Man is gonna have some water. And, um, they... They slit his throat. And it's like, what? Why? Why? He didn't... That guy didn't do anything! Like, what was... Yeah, he wasn't... So it was the... You get the wrong... Maybe they think all elves look the same. Except the black one, they can tell the difference between them. But surely you want to get rid of the guy who's... Like, the ringleader, so to speak. By the way, I just want to say... No, just... Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, the cut was so just harsh and death-blowy that you can, you can almost barely see it. In this yeah, shot. I don't believe they killed him. <laughs> it looks like a scratch. It looks like something literally anyone can survive. Oh, it looks like a flesh wound, and it doesn't help that there has like no blood too. Um, it's gotta keep it too. Clean. What are they? What's their age rating? Are they allowed to show it, or is it they are not allowed? Oh, I think you do see age. blood in the next shot, don't you? When he well, you see a bit of the blood. blood but the kind of basically, if you have a, a oh. cut that small, you're gonna need a lot of blood to convince me it was lethal. You know, but they don't yeah, have to it... either really. Because there's not a lot of scenes where you'd get a lot of blood, so it would be a way to remind you, like, yeah, like shit can go down in this show, just so we're clear, mm -hmm. just so you don't forget. Um. So not only are they punishing a guy who didn't do anything, but they've just wiped out slave labor for no reason. Oh, this is really yeah, stupid. Of... You're being, you're terrible at being evil. <laughs> just FYI. Have you seen the tunnel, Mahler? Or sorry, the ditch. <laughs> the very bad. <laughs> do thing. you see them bump into the tree? Well, like, so the reason. <laughs> Whoever was steering that time, what will become apparent, I think, by the end of the episode is that they were just looking for reasons to get rid of these other elves because they didn't want to deal with them narratively. Like they didn't oh want to fuck! I thought you meant the orcs. I was like, really? I didn't get that impression. No, I thought they were... no, no, no. The, the, the orcs are just stupid. But what I mean is, like, <laughs> from a writing standpoint, I think that they just didn't want to deal with these guys. Well, yeah, they um, so they want to be really sad for our main off. character. Um, but the problem Even is they I don't didn't know who the, the guy is. Who is he? Isn't, isn't that crazy though? Man. You'd be like, oh, we're we're gonna kill two of our like if you're if you're set to write and you're like we're gonna be killing two of our our main character's bestest buddies. Uh, buddies. Uh, yeah. at the three hour mark. Can you make that matter? And it's like three out. Of course I can. Three hours. Exactly. That's like. Dude. Movies. Meanwhile, what have I got to tell you about these? Like, it's like, this guy's dialogue, the one that's on screen right now, before he dies, like, the, the all he told our dude in, like, episode one was just, men are bad. <laughs> it's like, okay? Yeah, like, we're just not using our time effectively at all. They didn't even... It's, it's, yeah. They didn't even do He's cringe, right? Like, they could have done, like, ah, do you remember all the time we've spent here? All the stuff I've trained you? How much we enjoy each other's company? Aren't we great friends? You know, like, we would be making fun of that, too. But we didn't even get that. We just got, no. I hate men. Men no. suck. And you're like, okay. And then he dies. <laughs> he dies. <laughs> There's no sense of, like, we need to survive. We need to bide our time and wait until we can escape. Maybe I mean, it's like, do we do we risk darkness where it's harder to see? But you know, uh, but, I mean, they, they sort of they try to because I mean, he's basically just in this scene as exposition elf anyway. But so the, the, there is the scene before they leave to go into the, the clearing where they start the digging again. When he says, "The minute one of you can get a, a view atop that trench, you know, make a run for it and yeah. get to the tree line, and then you can escape." So like, the, they they include a little bit of that, but it, I mean, it is so perfunctory it's that it's bad. almost it's unnoticeable. Great. Let, let's let's escape. Here's how we'll do it. Go. Oh, we'll get to their escape. I fucking hate that too. <laughs> so it's, it's, not like a, it's it's not like these elves. You you're an elf, and I guess you're like a warrior or a ranger or whatever you are. And your plan is to, like, you could have come up. I I guess we're gonna be saying it a lot. You could have done something clever. But you well, didn't. you would expect them to do something clever because. Yeah, like the battle-hardened warriors. 
I'm trying to get a shot of this axe. We need to talk about this axe. Oh, I love this axe. It's hilarious. It made me laugh. I Shad isn't here to confirm, okay? But I'm pretty sure your leverage on the actual axe head is going to be all fucky because of the way this thing is built. Why would you have an axe like that instead of just a normal axe? Which looks to be like, what this thing used like, to be. With a little, the gap in the middle. Like, well, it's like it's... Structural integrity of it axe, looks like they have like, a normal axe head, or at least vaguely normal, and then they put another axe head on top of it, which is... Yeah. There's a reason we don't do that. No, so like, now there's yeah. a big open... It's, it's just so that it, it will look evil. It, yeah, That's I think that is literally it. It looks like an evil axe. It looks like an evil axe because it's probably not as good. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> this is just a normal axe that they made or found and used because they don't care. Like, like the, the orcs just might not give a shit whatsoever what it looks like. Maybe they have a distaste for elvish stuff for whatever reason, but... Well, but sh I guess if we presume that el uh, orcs don't really care what they look like, you'd think that they would be, like, purely u utilitarian. I guess, rather yeah. Rather than doing this bullshit. This is like <laughs> well, they're they yeah, incredibly is, experienced yeah. at cutting down yeah. trees, so you'd think they'd have the bestest yeah, axes exactly. for that. I guess this axe, maybe it broke from all of the tree cutting and they just didn't feel like... Like fixing well, yeah, it. Yeah, because it, it's. I think they're trying to give like a makeshift, makeshift vibe about it. But uh, I mean, I ain't so buying it. It just looks silly. No, make. That's a that's yeah, a that's a great misspeak. Because. <laughs> <like, laughs> <laughs> hey guys, guess what? You didn't know this. This is the first time you've heard of this, but. Those plushies that me and me and Fringy have, they're actually there's literally one day left. One yes, you have to get day. Them now. Get them now. Don't procrastinate. If you haven't got them, right. you need to get them now. now the because time. Don't forget. Links should be in the description. I swear to God, if they're not, like I said, it's really easy to find with your little Google. You type in the name and then makeship, and you got it. It's uh, if you pick us both up, you get the ten percent off. Is your last chance to exactly 26 hours remain before yes. you can never get them again. Well, you might be able to get what them again them? one day, but I'm pretty sure these ones will never be available again. Um, so, you know, they, they, they're cute, they're cuddly, and uh, I mean, mm -hmm. wouldn't you like to grab one of these? Look at, look at him. Look Here's at them. Goo. Look at them. Look at they, them. He's got cookies, he's got goo. Look at how happy mine is. Look at how mischievous. Imagine how happy they could be in your home, watching movies with you, yep. playing games with you. Who knows? TV shows, talking about that media. Not in the description. I fucking it keeps resetting on me. <laughs> it's something about the the way that it works when you set up a new stream. It's annoying as hell. But like I said, I'm sure you'd be able to figure it out if you if you're truly looking out for it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, just letting you know. Just 26 hours. I'll probably throw in another reminder before we end the stream, but I have no idea how long the stream's going to be at this point, considering we are... Uh, Man. <laughs> we're, we're not even halfway yeah. through episode one. Like I said, this is this is a very different vibe than the coverage we had for episodes one and two. I feel like three and four are just much worse. Yeah. It's just so many more issues. Um, but hey, we soldier on. So, Elfman is going to cut down the tree with his flume axe, because he doesn't want anyone else to get hurt. But sadly, Smelly Friend is indeed dead. And, uh, there's a very emotional moment here. That's, uh... Oh, should have leaned down. I actually saw somebody on Twitter saying, yeah, to all the people who are cr criticizing the show for not abiding by the law, you've got an elf crying because he has to cut down a tree. This is literally the most Tolkien thing ever. So, that just <sighs> makes me think... Um... <laughs> I have, I mean, that does that cancel out every other thing? Even if that were like respected as being like one hundred percent, I don't even know why you would even bet. I thought you were gonna say that they were like, look at this incredible scene with he's crying over his dead friend or something. But sure, he no, cuts no, no, down no, a tree. No, he he cries dead. about a tree. Cry. That's that's very Tolkien. Much Tolkien is seen when he cries over the tree. You think apparently. he would have just been bawling from the hundreds of trees around him that have been burnt and destroyed, as opposed to just the one he's cutting down? But. Fair enough. Uh, uh, you do yourself a favor. Don't turn around. <laughs> oh, I told you not to turn around. That's a good reference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back to Galadriel. 
Mm. Um, she's escaped. The scene it opens with basically just saying she's escaped. And you're like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Look at this cringe, guys. It's like, where's Gladriel? I don't even know. I'm gonna have to pause just because you know how it works at this point. My God, the the Halloween EFAP movies have been driving me nuts with that. By the way, still in copyright hell, trying to get them saved, and it's like the the days are actually closing in. So stressing me out. As soon as we're done with this episode, I'm uploading the next uh next attempt for one of them. There's two of them that are fucking around, but um yes, anyway, look at what she's up to. We we I, I feel like that she's lucky as fuck that's not being spotted, but hey, she's escaped. Yeah. Somehow that happened. Um you know what though? It's better when it's off screen because we can imagine something that made sense. They show us yeah, how she escapes next time. And it's one of the most infamous infamous scenes in the uh, in the show so far uh, that I was going from Twitter. Even CJ uh, tweeted about it, who I think wasn't finding the show to be that horribly bad, but I think he uh, he he broke a little bit seeing that scene. We'll get there. That's episode Ooh, yes. four. Um, yeah, she's she's running around. She's very smugly like, haha. Look at look at that. She jumps down right behind one of the guards who's looking for her. Just like, how are you? What exactly I, about what you're I, doing I, is? I dropped my wallet. <laughs> oh, what <are> you? <laughs> I mean, this isn't. It's you. I don't believe that she's able to pull this off. I'm seeing this. I'm just like, she's only pulling it off because the world says so. It's like, all right, fine. But hey, talent, right? Um, yeah. But uh, Elendil finds her. She's like, ah, oh, damn it. Because he's uh he's a smarter than the average bear, I guess. And then we get dialogue, unfortunately. Oh, this oh, is honestly one of my least favorite parts of an already incredibly shit show. It's just yeah. how seamlessly they move from he discovers her at docks to immediately she knows exactly where the plot needs her to go next. So off we go. Uh, yeah. No. So he's like, it would be wiser okay. if you stole a different ship, dumbass. And then she's uh, oh, he says. Scene. But I've been charged to look after you. And she's like, we both wish you'd never brought me here. Which I thought was hilarious as a lie. It's like, wait, it's you wanted to that, die? Right? Like, yeah, Zoe's like that's, suggesting. It's gotta be a lie. It's okay. Again, it's we've we've gone past a lack of gratitude into outright, I wish you didn't even do it. Yep. You've gone full circle. Um, And again, uh, you, it's funny you say that, Rags. It's like, she's about to go even further than that. Uh, so she's like, I'm just gonna leave, and he's like, oh, I'll call your guards, and then she's like, well, I'll kill you, and she actually puts a, the knife to his belly. Uh, Which just seems spiteful and mean instead of productive. Yeah, you but could I'll fucking say you. that. It's just the fact that you just said, though, that, like, you know, she's gone one step further and said, I wish you'd never save me. She's a step further into, I'm going to kill you now, <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, Galadriel. I, she uh, just thinks, like, there's never this concept in her mind of, I've bitten off too much. Or I, this is clearly an obstacle. I can't just charge my way through. Um, you see this whole harbor with all these people, and you're wearing this, and you're an elf, and that's a big deal. And a lot of people probably know who you are at this point. So, in fact, they almost, they absolutely know who you are. It's kind of news that you're here, and you're just gonna leave, like get a ship, sail it out to sea, get through the harbor, get through the, like, what is your plan, woman? Well, and stuff like this, by the way, whenever I see people who are like, you know, oh, you're just hating on the show, Gladriel's fine. I'm just like, seriously? How do you think this is fine? Gosh, she's like one of the worst protagonists I've ever seen. And I don't know why I mean, they wrote it this way. So far, yeah. I actually think Ray Palpatine has got more personality to her, at least in The Force Awakens, than Galadriel she's has in this show. Almost track. certainly. She's less right? painful to watch, because Galadriel's such an asshole to everyone. I don't think when Rey's life was saved by different characters that she tried to kill them for it. <laughs> like, you know, that didn't really happen. I, um, they surprised me every scene with Galadriel. I'm just like, you you really want to write her like this? Okay. I, yeah, someone just said, maybe she's Sauron. That'll be the twist. <laughs> <sighs> oh, Galadriel. Your younger years were, um, let's call them formative. Yeah, and I think, by the way... Younger years. He says, like, you know, you kill me, you'll be in super jail, essentially. And then... Um, what a great show. 
And then she says, uh, who do you think you are that you can speak to me like this? Like, losing my mind, seriously. Absolutely losing my mind. The guy has been charged by the fucking queen to look after you and tells you, if you try to escape, we're going to put you in prison. And she's like, well, then I'll just kill you. And he's like, if you kill me, you'll go to super jail. And then her response to that is, who do you think you are? <laughs> this is not how human beings what talk the to fuck i this lose my mind people... listening to this i can't deal with it it's just it's not how sapient individuals speak to one another like you you are smart enough to understand what language is cool you will not this is bizarre it's bizarre and i hate it <laughs> what am i supposed to like that's the thing if ask someone what am i supposed to like about galadriel and don't say determination because that's a pointless answer that doesn't mean anything all right, but actually try and give me some. What about her? Should I just not even like, not hate? I don't know. What are they going for? I think the, the, the problem they've got is they've got the premise for a personality, but they haven't actually given her the personality to go on top of that premise. So the, the excuse for it is, well, you know, she's, she's never known anything but war and her brother died, so she's on a revenge mission. And I've heard people genuinely say, well, of course that, that, that explains why she acts and thinks and believes and, and emotes the way she does or doesn't in the case of emoting. But the, the, again, that is just premise for character. That, that, that isn't character itself. You do have to do more with it than that. You have to build on that somehow. Yeah. And you can, you can have more than one note when you're doing that. So, okay, she, she's on a revenge mission, fine. But show her being vulnerable occasionally or cracking a smile occasionally. She's not just this sort of Terminator-like focused machine who just has one goal and she will kill anyone who gets in the way of that goal. That's all she is. That doesn't really make for a protagonist anyone can like, especially when she's so objectionable to characters that, to the extent the show has done any work with them at all, are actually kind of all right. Like, Elendil is fairly pleasant. He's, he's nice enough. It just, she's asking I want to be to like disliked. Him. Yeah, I want to like him. But that she's like to be I really want to, well, there's a lot of characters. I, I want to like a lot of this, but I can't. Yeah, they don't let me. They keep fucking up every time I'm like, okay, I can work with... No. In fact, literally this. So, I like this line, I think. I can't trust anything in this show, you see. He says to her, My daughter runs fast, my son runs blind. You remind me of both of them. I was like, huh. Yeah, I okay. thought that was all but, 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 like, see, for a second there, I'm like, huh? Do you, anyone remember her response? It is... How no. I run is none of your concern. <laughs> I wasn't being literal, you fucking. She idiot. literally, she took it literally. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's like Wonder Woman. She does the thing that Wonder Woman does, where she's like, "I am no, uh, I am no." Bro, what kind of response is that, though? Like, I don't oh, belong it's like to your you. Business, how I run. It's like, do you run blind? <laughs> like, do you just run with your eyes closed. Like, is that something you do often? Could you imagine if I want like, to run blind, I will. Thank you very much. He's like, oh no, I didn't mean I didn't mean my my children actually no that uh like, no, I, you're very stupid. He's like he's like I, I, elves are I, can, ex I can explain you're incredibly stupid. Um, it's like, like Drax in I, Guardians of the Galaxy who yeah. doesn't understand what a figure of speech is, and so it has yeah. to be explained, like, like, it will slit your throat. Galadriel yeah. actually has the same level of awareness <laughs> of, of figures of speech. That's something. How is that even possible? Like, she's been alive for can so you... long. Exactly. How do you go it's... through life without, like, figuring this out? It's the Thor issue, where if you're going to have a character who's lived this insanely long time, I expect that those years were filled with experience and learning and perspective. Yeah, I mean, and what was the fact would... that real people who lived for a lot less time managed to figure these things out? And you've got more of that. Oh, that's someone just uh, said in chat. That's the line you were you were mentioning, Rags. The um, Stephen Wolf says this one is mine, and then she says, "I belong to I belong. no one." That's it. That's the one I think. <laughs> that is, she does a Wonder Woman line. Yeah, because because Stephen Wolf's like, "Oh no no no, I I mean, I just mean no, I'm like, gonna... not like you belong to me. <laughs> like, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna fight you. <laughs> like you're mine to fight." <laughs> The shot kind of hangs on her face for like one or two seconds too long. Like a lot of shots yeah. in that part of the film. It's like. Oh, well, yeah. So some, you know, there's there's interpretations. Of this is like, what if she means she doesn't? She's she's suggesting it's none of your business how I conduct myself. Like that she means it in this it, 
running with the same meaning he, didn't he does. Say it was conspiracy, and, though. He just said you remind me of them. He didn't say it like it's what none of his do. concern is is like so. But yeah, like it sounds so fucking funny because it just makes you think like yeah, she, she actually says, thinks he's talking about her running around. Yeah, and if, and, and if as you said, the idea was to give across that it's none of his business. He would say like no. It actually it's is literally my business. my business. I've been told it's yeah, my business. Like, kinda, he just my says, business like, I am being paid to look out after you. Like, it's, yeah. yeah, like you, you're this is the point in the story where we pump the fucking brakes on her attitude and she learns to get a grip, as we say. And he is the one to, because he is, I, I want to like Elendil. He needs to be the one who, he's got a great voice. And he has a, a decent amount of presence to him. Yeah. So he could be the one to be like, yeah, you, you need to chill, sister. You're not, you're not just better than everyone else, and you can't just do everything you want all the time. Yeah, because around, you know, it. He could have, but but instead, it's kind of the opposite happens. He still, empowers like, her fucking behavior. Still, yeah, you still have problems with that because I, I agree. If it were, if it weren't Galadriel it who was in shit. Galadriel's position, then it might work. But otherwise, you'd still be in the position then. I agree that works narratively, but you would still be in the position where a man who is at most, what, two or three hundred years old is acting as father figure to a woman who is two or three thousand exactly. years old. Exactly. It doesn't old. fucking make sense. You know what uh, you were saying earlier about, it like... It would have to be a product of their personalities. How they, um, how they characterize a lot of people in this. Like, you know, you were saying about the how she's she's been a soldier, soldiering is all she knows. She's, she's like not clear on how exactly some of the things work. It sounds as childish as, like, you know, my character is a fireman, and he's like, oh, what's his home life like? And it's like, well, his kid is like, yeah. oh, Dad, there's a spider, and he pulls out a hose and just fires water at it, and you're just like, what, you, what <laughs> the fuck? It's like he sits down to eat in his full fireman outfit, and you're like, why? It's like, well, he's a it fireman. It has consumed his very life. That's all he knows is fireman. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the prestige. Total, total dedication to the craft. <laughs> so, when he goes for a shower, he gets the fire hose, and it's like, Burning, melting all of his like because of how high powered it is. This is like this is what it means to be a fireman. This sort of by extension, his teeth, he gets the hose and shoots it in his face, <laughs> right in front of his face. And he by extension, you are kind of saying hose. you're kind of saying Galadriel is actually worse written than Fireman Sam is. Yes, because yes. at least he has he has variety. Yeah, and he's not the fireman at home. So that that's that's encouraging for a billion dollar production. Yeah. Fireman Sam has more characterization. This um the the nuanced version is uh Game of Thrones. You have the whole criticism of Robert Baratheon as a king being shit is that he's a warrior first. He doesn't know how to be a king. That's not as stupid as he like someone goes, you know, where should we put the shipping lanes? And he goes, attack it with a sword. That's what I know. <laughs> shipping like, lanes, not in my kingdom. <laughs> kill it. Fire! It's that his kingdom just slowly falls into disrepair because he focuses on having tournaments that he enjoys. He has loads of feasts he enjoys. He loves practicing with his weaponry and seeing people do different, like, kind of stressful challenges in re relation to sort of war games and stuff. Meanwhile, like, really important issues he tries to leave to other people he doesn't care about, and it all starts to fall apart gradually over the years to come because of his values and his approach and how much he just doesn't care as much as what would be considered a good king. Um, and, and, you know, and it. it a lot of people consider it leaves the realm wide open to being manipulated by other people who are far more ambitious, let's say. Um, that's what you're looking for when you want to try and say one approach or one career has like infected a character's ability to sort of better uh, approach other scenarios. This doesn't work for Galadriel. You can't make her retarded in terms of being able to speak to people because, what, she's fought too many orcs and she's forgotten how that works. It's like, that. that's... That's embarrassing. Just well, stop I mean, it. Even, even is that actually their goal, or is that just like a really bad defense? I that can't tell, Fringy. That's the, the problem. I don't know what their goal is for a lot of this. That, that's why it yeah, seems well, so bizarre. I mean, I felt this way after we talked about the first two episodes, and I still feel this way. I don't see what the idea behind this show was, other than we are going to do a it. Ring show. We're going to make a show, and we're going to have to set it during this period because of right stuff. But you need to figure out a story to tell. Like, the, the idea came after the project. Your show feels. needs a story, though. <laughs> Your show does need a story, yes. And figure By it out, way. because this is happening. Can you imagine that? It's like, we want a show. And it's like, what do we put in shows usually? It's like, stories, I guess? And he's like, well, ah. CGI, yeah. there's acting, like there's actors, and things. costumes. Yeah. Yeah.
and, and someone's like catering he's like yeah yeah we'll have, have to have catering for the show and we we get cgi guys to do that maybe we'll have some swords and it was like yeah swords that sounds really good and someone was like well could we have trenches i was like harry that's madness why why would there be trenches and i was like i don't know we'll come up with a reason I'm like fine we'll put in a trench somehow uh, regardless of the consequences. even certain of the reason for choosing Galadriel as a protagonist, because you, you're, you're hamstrung by her history, which, of course, we've already established they haven't accounted for properly anyway. Uh -huh. You're hamstrung by her age, by her place in the world, by her title, and by the fact she can't die. So you've got, essentially, someone you can do... Of course, you can do infinitely more than they've done with her, but you, you're still very limited in what you can do with her because of... The aforementioned. So, uh, if they're inventing stuff anyway, I don't really understand why they didn't have her as almost like the mission giver character, or an important but ancillary character, and just invent a new protagonist, a younger character who has these attitudes, which is of accord with their age and their experience, who can then have room to grow, more room than Galadriel has to grow, or at least less time to have grown implicitly. I don't really see why they've decided to do this other than name recognition. Well, everybody remembers Galadriel, so let's just use her because reasons, I they guess. They wanted to have, I, I think it's just the the thing we're in, the, the, a lot of it is the trend of, you know, we have to have women warriors. I think that's become very prominent as a thing you have. She's very it is. strong, very powerful. She needs to have a sword. She has to kill. She has to engage in combat because those are the things that are more important than what she was before. Because I guess in some people's mind, if you're not doing that particular task, it's like you're 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 in a lesser role. If you're not doing combat, then whatever you're doing isn't as important. Yeah, there's no such thing as power without action, basically. I mean, it, but it's it's still you could still have accomplished that goal. I mean, I think it's a stupid goal anyway. But that you could still have accomplished that with a newer character and a younger character again, someone who could be younger and so more tempestuous and so less respectful of of the people around her. You could still have had Galadriel Did in the you role say that tempestuous she's familiar. On uh, I probably did, yes, I think. I mean, because there not? is a tempest inside of her. I, oh, God, I shit. have literally never <laughs> heard that, that before. Reason. <laughs> it sounds pretty cool. Is that, a, is that a real thing, tempestuous? Yeah, tempestuous is great. I was about to say, that's more a, people that's a need cool to word, use tempestuous. Yeah. yeah. That's why I asked, because with Gladriel, like, did you specifically use that word? <laughs> if I'd remembered her line, I would not have used that word. Im but thank you for, for making me feel bad about my nice No, feel good. He, fit in. he fits in with us. He's feel okay. tempestuous. Tempestuous. It sounds. <laughs> it makes me think of incestuous because they sound so. You similar, don't hear the so, innuendo. Incest often does yeah. produce tempestuous children. Tempestuous oh, incest yeah. is my is that's my fetish. Tempestuous incestuous. Tempestuous <laughs> incestuous children. <laughs> so the scene. So, <laughs> moving on. Yeah, moving on. The famous scene that a lot of people made fun. This of. is the famous scene. Oh, the God. famous scene. To be fair, this shot I thought actually looked really cool because this slow mo shit, you know, I'm just not that one. <laughs> it's um, uh, so I think CJ put out a tweet where he said, "Why did they do this to her? That was really mean." And I, I think what he what he means is just like it's just she's looking a little um, she, it's, it, I I I don't think she's an ugly lady. I think she's she's pretty. And, I don't think she looks ugly at all. Um, this shot isn't uh um, what's the, what words am I looking for here? Like it's Glamorous? not. Yeah, uh, not flattering. Um, that's the one. Flattering. Probably, I mean, it's yeah. not flattering. I don't, I don't know. I guess I don't see it. I think she looks. I, I guess maybe because my mind is like, oh, she's riding on a horse and smiling really broadly, with so she's not gonna look like she's still in a studio. But I. Oh, you mean like that? You think that it it just feels more real than basically anything that you've seen in it before. Like in the uh, kind of like I don't I don't think yeah. by any means she looks unattractive here because I know what she's doing. Um, I think she looks awkward as fuck. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's, um, I, I know what vibe they were going for. Just... They didn't crack it for me, I guess. I, I guess it, my I my issue isn't awkward. with how she looks. It's like the the this scene existing. So this is the most <laughs> well, we've seen oh, yeah. as an emotion from her, as far as I know. Um, she likes riding like horses. I guess she's like this is where she belongs, free and out there and travel. You know, she's not like other girls. She's like Nori. Nori would be yeah. on a pony. 
And I see where you're coming from in that yeah, we actually see a facial expression, which isn't just anger and bitterness, which is a, a change, <laughs> I guess. She's like, she's I will give you that. Yeah, yeah, I will give you that. But she's... on the other hand, I don't, I mean, okay, not to be harsh about the actress, I don't think she has a particularly nice beam about her when she's smiling that broadly. But also she's very fixed and she's rigid. And I don't think she's done I justice wonder... by how slow-mo the slow-mo camera is. I think it would have looked better had she had it not been as slow as it was. It looks lovely for the flowing dress and it looks all right for the horse. It's when we sort of linger too long on her face at too slow motion, which makes it look rigid and kind of pained. Like she's kind of wearing an expression like a bit of the saddle well, she sat like on that the, she shouldn't scene, have sat on the, and it went somewhere it shouldn't last. have gone. It's just, it looks like... kind of forced and awkward. And if it, it had been... It, very forced, yes. This, yeah. it stands in the slow-mo mm. in particular. I don't think we've really had that in the show. And to see it used so gratuitously here seems strange for mm. this. You know, you're making me think now. I wonder if it is that, uh -oh. like, when you have a scene in, like, you're drawing out what would have been, what, less than half a second. You're, like, drawing that out to a much longer stretch of time. And maybe you just need, like, more of the real time look of a character to, like, fully, I guess, get the expression as it's meant to come across. And, and maybe yeah, it would have been cool to watch it go from, it. watch it go from that, that resting bitch face to this face. If we watched that happen in real time maybe that would have been she's more writing, but she's starting to smile yeah. because yeah. it's like ah this is more like what i'm well, she's like hmm. fighting with herself for her want to be sort of focused and driven but also the fact that she's finally enjoying herself for a change i genuinely think though a lot of this problem just goes away if you, you speed up the slow-mo a bit yeah. so that like, you can compare this slow-mo <laughs> shot with any of the ones used in the lord of the rings trilogy and there are a lot used in the lord of the rings trilogy they are not this slow-mo and some of them are facial expressions like when gandalf uh, falls from the, the bridge of Khazad Doom, and yeah, you see Frodo the slow mo like, on Frodo. Oh, shit. Yeah. But Frodo, it's, it's not as slow mo as this is. He's more expressive as a result. It doesn't look fixed but, and rigid and weird. Yeah, and, and his voice humans echoes. Just, things yeah. get dull in the background. Humans yeah. just don't look natural when they're slowed down to like 0.1 in, of a second. In a sense, it's like, an, you know, when you have like those awkward pauses, like when it pauses on an awkward face, it's kind of like you've, you've kind of done that here. You've like <laughs> almost paused on an awkward moment and extended it. Well, Whereas, it would have been yeah, maybe, better. Maybe if you just played it in full, it would have like yeah, because there's plenty the totality of the performance and like the expression. There's plenty of time to make hmm. use of, as you as you highlighted. Because like the, the, I would have said, filmmaking wise, the whole reason they do it in Casa Doom is because there's such a small amount of time for that huge moment that's happening to react to it, and so by by extending hmm. it out with slow motion, the audience can really feel in that moment everything Frodo feels and everything Gandalf's probably feeling yeah. as well, and the rest of the fellowship. There's a question of. It's sort of like dramatic timing as well, because you have the really hectic chase sequence, and then you have the the almost the stillness and the real tension of the fight with the Balrog itself. Yeah. And then you have that sort of terrible release that comes when Gandalf seemingly at the time at least dies. Um, so it, it sort of it has a payoff. I think that's the other problem with this scene as well, is that it's not, it, there's not really a purpose for it. It's not serving much of a dramatic uh, purpose. It, it's simply there because they can do it, and they think it looks pretty to have a slow-mo dress. It, you kind of have to earn, I think, slow mo scenes as well as you as you earn any other kind of payoff in drama, and it, they haven't done that either. So, it could have it could have been nice, I think, just maybe sped up. It could have but... been nice is a really good way to describe a lot of yeah. I think we <laughs> yeah we said at the top of the show. Um, <sighs> I why they should have had they because they have this scene of them going out to this very very far off place which is odd that it's so far away from you know the city and all the records and stuff are there it seems like something you want to keep close by but that's all right um they go to this place and they're riding and they're going through the countryside it's very lovely they should have them arriving at the tower and then they both get off their horses and she has this smile on her face and everything and he hasn't seen that from her yet and so he talks well, about he, it he's he, like, he mentions reaction, it right? like that. yeah, yeah it's showing him acknowledging it sort of thing yeah cuz this is this is not typical for her to be like this clearly and then you could see her sort of you know, collapse back in on or close the the uh the armor again over her old yeah. sort of expression um because well, she's it yeah. portrays fragility and, and insecurity so you know just in a facial expression change of expression you portray a lot of her character in the way that they don't do yeah, oh, my, my emotions yeah, have what, been noticed i'm oh no what's more Are there, or, or more there maybe she actually opens that. up a little bit and explains why she's having such a good time it's like oh i'm finally free or I used to ride horses back in da 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 or or da da oh, oh, well, yeah, While they were riding their horses, they could have had a, yeah. a good dialogue, but oh well. 
No, not not, my, I not guess I might have been like... They wanted to have that gallop. It, yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, if they're riding real fast, it'd probably be difficult. And they shouldn't really be in a hurry. You know, like, yeah, they don't need like, to be... Like, why would they be... They don't need to be going yeah, that just fast. Go. I, just, I don't know. Well, yeah, like, that some, could be... Why, why someone might have mentioned... Talking ...on the horseback, you know? Maybe she really wants to get there fast, and he's like, slow down. Well, remember, well, she has, well, she's her, broken her, out, though, hasn't she? She's broken out of house arrest to do this, so it's not just... Broken, broken in quotes. Well, yeah, it doesn't, does it count as he's broken out if she's her. with him? Because he's now in charge of her, I guess right? he's okay with it. Well, yeah. I'm saying that he's yeah. been given the charge of taking care of her personally, so if she's with him, right. she's still technically not, have, having broken out, she's still in custody. I guess, yeah. So. Though, as we know, later on, <laughs> uh, Queen's not happy about this, uh, this particular... Oh, God, um, we're getting so close. This, gone to. So just... FYI, we're not even through half my notes for this episode yet. Like, I, there's Hard. so much just... shit to come. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll we'll just keep moving. Now it's it's whole brand scene where like, so he's like, I want to do forging, and then this this dude is like, you can't forge without a crest. Now, th if we're playing a video game, okay, Rags, we talked about this extensively. We did talk about this. Y your whole brand, your player one, you walk in and you're like, forge your own weapon, create the sword of a thousand truths. And then you're like, okay, cool. And then it's like, how do I do it? And it's like, you can't use this forge, you gotta have a crest. And then little objective marker, you must just, how do you get a crest? And he says, you can get a crest by the local guild if you can pass the tutorial. Blah, 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 blah. And then you go over to the guild and you talk to the guild master and he's like, would you like to try the tutorial? Because they all have the same accent. And then it's like, yeah, okay. And you press A at the right times and you hammer and he said, congratulations, you passed level one. If you can, you know, forge a thing within this time limit into these degrees and you'll unlock the crest for level one. You get your smithing skill to level 50, then you'll be awarded a commendation for the guild. And that's... That unlocks even Here's more your diploma. And... Oh, good job. Just... Yeah, and good like, job. Yeah, you, I you did are it. now and then... an apprentice. If you make it to, you know, a crafter proper, then da 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 da, whatever that rank would be, you know. Normal, normal, normal. Now, if I was playing this game, let's say I was streaming it and chat's there and, and, and I'm Holbrand, he's like, you need to go to the guild and get yourself a crest or whatever. And then I go, hmm, maybe I can steal a crest off somebody. Now, I, I, would, I would expect you guys in chat to be like, wait, what? But that's not going to work. If it's you... obviously not what he meant. <laughs> like, it, it, obviously, he didn't mean that. But uh, secondly, you're, you just arrived at this place. You're, you're like brand new. Everyone even recognizes that. You can't just steal someone else's crest. They'll be like, so, so how did you get this? And then that, there's just going to be some guy without a crest. It'll be stolen. And they'll just be like, wait, did you actually say, yeah. pass it in a few seconds since I last saw you? You just, you, you now have one? It seems like you probably stole it then. Like, you're not going to get away with Holbrand it, is my point. Holbrand thinks that it's literal. I, I guess Holbrand thinks that literally I just have to have this crest and I can get a job here. Not the obvious implication that you have to earn your place in the guild and the crest is just a symbol of you earning that. This guy is so fucking stupid that he takes it literally. He has his own Wonder Woman moment here. This annoyed me. <laughs> because what Holbrand was what almost okay. Idiot. He was like he was like this character who clearly is out for himself, but he'll do a couple of the thing with the, the knife was really stupid. But, that was really dumb, right? But like uh, but there was this thing here, right, where he's like he's getting heckled by this guy. He's like, Ah, oh, you're friends with elves, you must you must be lame. And then he's like, You're gonna take all the things from us, and then he says, yeah, I'm gonna take your women, too, and then they're like, ooh, you did not just say that, you're about to beat him up, and then he goes, wait, I'll buy you all drinks. Our women but us. And they're like, oh, okay, buy us all drinks, and then they, like, just hard cut to him, like, laughing with them and having a great time, and they're all drinking and stuff, and I was like, for a moment here, I was like, this is, this is, this is okay, good. he, like, this yeah, he, he yeah. almost made several enemies, but then he made friends out of them, because he just, he, he gave them drinks for the hospitality he's been provided in a city that's not his when he was dying, it's like, this, yeah, okay. This is, this is like what a normal person might do. For a brief shining moment, we had something that someone might do. Unfortunately, yeah, look closely, see where my cursor is? See this right there? That's the crest. Look at Holbrand's hand. Oh, 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 looks like he's got a big old honking claw on that. Like he's trying to get it off uh, with everyone watching. And, really uh, and with the assumption that it's just something that you could take off. 
like yeah, it's not like, pinned to I'm you. Gonna... It's it's got to be pinned to you or attached to the no the little sash no. thing, right? No, sure. it's, it's, imagine it's, how awkward it would be. If it's Velcro. It it's yeah, like, it's a couple of couple, couple pieces of Velcro. That's it. Numenorians invented Velcro, which allowed them to create a successful civilization. But then he would have heard it right next to it's his ear. Different from Velcro <laughs> in the real world, though. Right next to his ear, though. Even if it was Velcro, it's it quiet <laughs> Velcro. It's, it's very, very, Velcro. very quiet. Never get out of it's way of Velcro. Sound. Yeah, yeah. Also, maybe he got him drunk enough that he didn't even notice, and no one else noticed. They're drunk too. Everyone's drunk. That's a good excuse for anything. <sighs> it's just bad. Like, why are they so stupid with everything they're doing? Why can't they just do anything properly? And, and you know what's really funny about this is, like, my big criticism, Rags as well, as well and I think several people are just like, you're not going to get away with this, Hellbrand. He, the, the show agrees. He doesn't get away with it. He doesn't get away with it for even a minute. He, uh, he walks around the corner, and then they all confront him for stealing the crest. Immediately. Like, oh. So Hellbrand's just an idiot, then. That's just, that's just in-universe. He's just a fucking moron. Why did he do this? It was never going to work. And the show was like, nope. Why didn't you go and just earn a crest? If you are talented with a forge, and the crest is given to people to signify you can safely use one, go to the, and this go is to the something guild, you want to is. do as the craft. Exactly! Just go to earn the fucking crest! He plans to stay yeah. in Numenor. What is the point in stealing one, when obviously everyone's gonna find out? Go and earn one! I'm sure it's not that hard. Do you, and, yeah, do you think it'd be interesting to go to, you know, the guild and say, hey, I'm from across the seas. You haven't had someone from across the seas. They don't, they don't come by often, I guess. I'm not sure what the world building of the world is, but I, I have my own take on things, my own distinct styles. I'd love to mix them with your own. I could create some really amazing stuff. And I'm skilled, very skilled at the forge. And, hey, it might make you look good if you take me in and I become a member of your guild, right? It, plus, I'm just really skilled, supposedly. Start his life, meet a lady, forge is there, is daggers it, all day to get that skill higher. There's a really tedious reason that they don't do any of this, of course, and that's that they really, really want to speed up the Numenor sequence and get out of it within the oh, space of two episodes. I thought it was because they wanted to get him in prison. I, well, well I, no, that, but they, they, they couldn't have him work his way. It's, yeah, there is that as well, but that's because yeah. th that, that is a quicker way of getting to the desired end point rather than you know, it would be if they actually had the confidence of telling a long story that you could sort of string out over the course of multiple seasons you could have spent much of a season in Numenor not the two episodes that we've got you could have had him actually yeah working his way proving himself as a smith delivering those subtle sort of calls forward to Sauron much more sort of spread out but also much more definitely um you could have done all of that and it would have been interesting and then you're actually building towards something like his realization is you know he's worked to achieve the payoff he would eventually have but because they don't they they really do want to speed things up which is bizarre given how empty the rest of the show feels but there's they're going through you know like hundreds if not thousands of years of history by doing all of this and to get to the endpoint that they could have built up to over the course of three seasons as opposed to one but I, I just don't think they had the confidence in telling a long story even though they do have five seasons so they, they want to speed up these important events when they really shouldn't and somehow still manage to make the rest of it feel slow and, and empty well they don't know how to write emergent personalities so mm -hmm. if you have from the point we meet him in all of his conversations, like we see him looking at the forge and interested, it's like, okay, he's interested in forging or blacksmithing or whatever it is. You could have him talk about like what he used to do as a kid, maybe in a conversation that pops up, or he notices, ah, oh, that's very fine craftsmanship on that sword. Is it such and such kind of steel? And you're like, yes, it is. I, you, how did you know? Is it, like, it's very interesting that you know, or I appreciate that someone can recognize the, you know, the metallurgy that something like that, where he, mm -hmm. he has this knowledge. And so it eventually comes out naturally in some way, instead of forcing this plot where he has to steal a crest. Which, by the way, I was going to say, what I think of that they wanted to get done as well is to put him into a fight where we can feel like, ooh, that was dirty fighting. Ooh, this guy, he's not, he's not like Aragorn, where he fights people and it feels good. This felt, this felt a bit more, ooh, because of course yeah, it's uh, a, setting the groundwork for how he's not a good man. There's a darkness in him somewhere. A little spooky. It's like an What's evil tempest. What's in all of him? It's very dark inside. Um, so, yeah, this was all just annoying. Uh, and then he gets into a fight and like beats them all, and then he gets arrested. 
Woohoo. Who could have foreseen this happening? I know, That's right? It's just like my uh, choice. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Before he delivers the final blow, I think to the last guy, he says, "Call me Hullbrand." This is like okay. <laughs> okay. That's kind of that's yeah, that's kind of cringe, bro. Not yeah. Lie. I could picture the guy on the floor with like a broken nose, be like, "Why did he say that? Like that was just stupid." Like, I don't. Know. Yo, I don't even know who you. What, what was I who supposed to you? think? You stole yeah, like, from me. I don't know what, why. Are you? Why did you do? We helped you. <laughs> Literally, who is whole brand? <laughs> like, what? what was I supposed to think with that? That he's like, oh, I go by another name, but I can't tell you it yet, and it's way cooler. You just wait. It's brand hole. Whoa! Oh that no! Hole for short. We're at, we're at possibly oh, we're the here. biggest problem in the whole oh, four episodes gosh. now. Oh, we go. No. So. Yeah, they say the king was loyal to the elves, but now he's just in a bed. But this was a place that he made sure was kept safe and and stuff, because the the townspeople were like, "Boo! This place was elven place. We don't like this place." And uh, he's been brought here because uh, he was. I can't remember the reason. Something like, I think it's just elf stuff, and she likes elf stuff. I think it's it's not too complicated. But looking around. And um, the, she shows the mark of Sauron to like the librarian here, um, and he brings out something for them to have a little look see at. And Immediately, I, it must be said. There's like, like yeah, 30 it doesn't seconds take long. Between, that you have this whole massive library, one incredibly rare symbol. You don't even know if it's in the library, but no. Thirty seconds later, just after a little bit of character dialogue is allowed to take place, thirty seconds later, on cue, on shuffles librarian back into the set. Um, and um, yeah, and then it just gets so much worse. Well, yeah. So to be, I'll try and make this as clear as I could understand it. They say that there is an account from a human spy who escaped an enemy dungeon, and he drew a symbol in order to recall the tower's location in which he escaped from. So just, just a repeat, sort of. They would have had, I guess, a Numenorian who was taken to somewhere. And he was tortured and, and kept in a thing. And then when he got out of there, he was like, I need to write something down, like a symbol to denote where I was kept and where this tower is. And it's uh, it's the sigil. It's it's the mark of Sauron. It's like, oh, oh my god. Oh my god. And, 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 and she realizes, Galadriel, that uh, it matches a part of the map. It's Mordor. Oh. Dun, like dun, a, dun, dun. Like, the mount. There are many issues with this. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he even start? Um, Jesus Christ. So she concludes from this that uh, Sauron has been doing this for a very long time, and like the whole idea here is to 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 build up his forces. And to do it in secret, but to simultaneously draw orcs in, and they will be directed here via that clue, being that the mark represents that part of the map on Middle Earth. And she the learns all orcs this. Orcs know that. There's an inscription alongside the the little symbol. So the spy's account also said, I think That's I've actually got the direct quote. It speaks of a plan, a plan by which to create a realm of their own where evil will not only endure but thrive. A plan to be enacted in the event of Morgoth's defeat by his successor. Matters are worse than I imagined. So uh, there is like seventeen things wrong with this. With it. Is, yeah. If you wanted to start, I guess like chronologically, the problem would be right back presumably a couple of thousand years ago when the spy's actually in the dungeon. So has he just been, he was sort of chilling out there and he had access to a map, presumably, in order to be able to get the rough shape of Mordor to mm -hmm. write down yep. in the first place. But also he either overheard or he found something just really conveniently written down by the evil guys explaining their it's evil like Halo. plan. It's, it's, yeah, there are more competent Bond villains than this. And then, so this is somehow makes its way back to, to Numenor, where it's kept for more than 2,000 years and doesn't decay or disappear. Just in order for Galadriel to turn up and see the reference, and she just happens to have seen the map behind them on the wall anyway, so that's cool. So, But 
how do the orcs know that that's a map reference unless the orcs have a map? The orcs knew because the elven like, scholars exactly did not. They don't have <laughs> exactly Google the orcs Maps. Knew. This is not how this works. The fucking ditch digging orcs who hit the tree, they knew what this symbol meant, but exactly all of the, the elves, elves did not, didn't. all of everyone the men did not, didn't. no one knew. Um. Yeah, so Works we're gonna we're gonna have like to just that. keep talking about our issues with this because I don't know how in the world we could possibly cover them all, but we'll we'll sort of we'll just keep moving around because I was just gonna say that so this this human spy did he write all this out and then it got sent here or did he he got out and provided this to them right so like why is it vague why wouldn't he be like it's literally this part of the map right here and then write it it's down in words the South yeah, That's like he can, he can do, he can do coordinates. He can be like this part of the. Why write a symbol to be like this is the symbol to represent the landmark in which I just I escaped the tower. Or just so like, draw what, the what? map. What? Yeah, just but if you if you're familiar <laughs> enough with the mountain range, then just draw the little mountain range. Why? And everyone's like, oh, that looks really. Oh, wow, that's just the mountain range. That's a location. Exactly. They would have had names. They, like I said, would have had, you can build a map, you can then just draw a little crude version and draw an X. Like, what is this bullshit where you draw like an artsy version of the symbol of the mountains? What is that? Why are you doing that? You're making it more are complicated. To, yeah, are you trying to help us? Are you trying to, like, get us to a location? Why are that, you being, this is like the, the cryptic lingo of symbology. And then, just tell us what you want. If you're telling us, that this has been enacted since the day Morgoth died, which, correct me if I'm wrong, well, that before, was hundreds... It says, it says it's contingent in case of his defeat, so it's before he dies. Even. Before he dies. So you're so, talking uh, thousands it is of years? Thousands, thousands of years. I think it's like 1,500 to 2,000 years. Jeez. Didn't she say we've only found two of these sigils in total? Yes. Well, the how it, entire her, brother, that, her brother, the altar, and here. Okay, so how the fuck are these supposed to guide the orcs? <laughs> like, what? Well, if the orcs ever find her brother, then they'll know In case they, they grave rob her brother, they'll have a direction <laughs> to Mordor. I seriously can't, like, this was blowing my mind. I was like, why did you write it this way? This is so stupid. The, the other sigil they found was in, like, a, a fortress keep place. It's like, wh yeah, why is like it a there? Stone altar the with weird far north magic. of the world as well. It's, like, as far away from Mordor as you can get up in Faradwaith is the other one. But then Random Kid finds one on a sword in a basement, so there must be more of them lying around. So how didn't she find it's one? It's in case the orcs find the sword. And then sorry fucking dumbass. He's like, yeah, it's to direct the orcs here. It's like, don't you think that'll direct everyone to know where you are? Why would it only direct orcs? He's like, cause only well, orcs because will recognize only orcs the mountain know. rage. Especially only orcs have maps. <laughs> you carve it on the brother of a main character. You think maybe the elves might have noticed. I can't. It's and unbelievable. Is there only stupid. one map? Did, did no one else at any point in Linden or any of the, the elven cities, did they not have maps? How did she not because she doesn't even need to be here to gain this knowledge. She needs to be anywhere with a map, basically, and just have that brain click moment. It's a location. Okay, well, I'll just stick it on the map there. It's clear. Like None of this actually needs to have happened. There are so many like simpler and shorter ways of reaching this same point. But for some reason, we, we've gone as far away as we can possibly go to find the knowledge we need to get as far away to the other direction to get back to the Southlands, which she should already have known was evil, because bearing in mind as well, she already knows that she wants to go to the Southlands because she already knows that's where the orcs are, because Halbrand told her that on the raft in the last episode. So there's, she doesn't actually even gain much new knowledge from this entire stupid shit show. It's just, it's, oh God. It was a lot to take in, and it was so quick. <laughs> like it was like this is yeah. true, and it's like what? This was presented so matter of factly, but it's so dumb. Like that's the this show's really dumb for a show that is trying to be very grandiose. Oh, look at us! Look at our flowery language. You see, the stone looks down into the darkness. Oh, aren't we? It's very very clever. This show's dumb. Yeah, this is the kind of show that a dumb person might watch and think is very smart. Frustrating, um, but I suppose we'll move on. Great, we got that mm. as part of our fucking plot line now. Why not? Oh, that's fun. Yeah, that's fun. We're having fun. We're all having fun here. It's all crazy. <laughs> hey guys, remember the the Harfords? We're going back. 
Oh, the Harfoots. I can't oh. believe just for the sheer sake of scenery, new new people. I'm glad the to really see new people. Weird musical transition that takes place here as well, because it's like this really sinister choir music that makes you think is the it Harfoots the dwarves now? Because it sounds much more like the dwarves. Uh, this musical cue, but no, we're back with the Harfoots, and yeah, we will find out that they're evil momentarily. Yeah, we're almost there. Um, so they're singing the the chanty song, which uh, whoever came up with this, whoever wrote this song, uh, props to you, great stuff, talented work. Uh, if I can just share the lyrics with you guys, it's uh, yes, nobody okay. goes off trail and nobody, right, nobody walks goes alone. Off walks alone. Okay, what's the next one? Oh, no, that's wait, the whole song. Nobody goes off trail. Nobody walks alone. Okay, got it. So the next next bit. All right, that's the song. Nobody walks off trail. Oh wait, so they just say it the one time. Then it's really just more of a slogan. Um, well, it's like they, a, it's they, like a they, good they... thing to tell them before they go out. Like, remember, everyone, stay on trail. Don't walk, you know, don't walk alone. And everyone's like, yeah, mm. remember, it's like buddy system, right? Hold up your buddy's hand in the pool, and yeah, that's good. That's fine. It's Don't for a little abandon slogan. your friend while they're drowning. Hey, we're gonna get to all. That's the only fun thing we have to talk about. Nothing else happens <laughs> in, in the half of scenes. Like it's good god, nothing happens in these scenes. But yeah, they're all having huge amounts of fun, and, and they just keep saying nobody goes off trail and nobody walks alone again and again and again and again and again and again and again. It's just uh, like, oh my god, please stop. Those are the only not, two yeah. lines you could come up with. Like you couldn't think of a just like a third one. <laughs> yeah, there's you, it can't even rhyme. Like you can't no. come up with other lines about general. Like this is generally how we survive. Let's make a song out of it. You teach our kids. We could we could dance and sing, and we'll have a gay old time, and we'll remember it because it's like a song. With. But it's just this one line. Nobody goes off trail. Nobody walks alone. That's the best they could do. I guess. Yep, that's the best it, thing It's do. bizarre, isn't it? Like, you have all of these... Mm -hmm. Like, they cl a lot of effort goes in this show, clearly. And you couldn't be like, yeah, just maybe, like, make an actual song, that's not just the same one. thing repeating. Let's, uh, that's, let's that's like, the that's the draft for line one. Yeah. Maybe we should add more than just one line that, you know... And, and also, is it's not very optimistic when your song is just about things we can't do. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I just, uh, but it 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 makes a sp a special amount of no sense when the next things happen. Like the, this is their yes. big old song that nobody gets left behind. Essentially, that's what it feels like they're saying. But nobody no. walks alone. We're here. We're it, and it would make sense because we're a small, tight knit community. Exactly. Everyone knows everyone. We've grown up together. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the one scene I like. Well, I was gonna say, do you want to? Just one very quick gripe I had, because it's established in, I think it's in episode one, isn't it? That there are hunters around in their near vicinity uh, much earlier in the year than they were expecting. So they're all slightly on edge, or they're supposed to be, and they're thinking of migrating to get away from the hunters. If you're like a hyper-secretive little village dwelling bunch uh, of yeah. gypsies, do you think you'd really be going around shouting and chanting and, you know, just generally yeah. making everyone know exactly where you are? It just, that seems a little bit incongruous. So, uh, Rags, why don't you tell everybody what you liked about this scene? This, uh, I like this scene. This one little, this tiny little moment that I liked. This is Sadak and, I think, Marigold. No, oh, Sadak is the one Sadok's outside. The, <laughs> yeah, Letty Uh It's... How come it doesn't cut to her? I wish it... I, these two, I forget the name. I think her name's Marigold. I forget what his name is. Maybe someone can... Dad. The Brandyfoot, Dad essentially. Character. Dad... Mr. and Mrs. Brandyfoot. And he, as you recall, he, in a comically presented fashion, really, like, twisted his ankle or hurt himself while he was putting up the, like, the, a tent pole for the festivities that everyone's enjoying. Uh, yeah, he hurt himself doing that because no one else fucking helped him. And so he's inside their little cart and he's sitting down. He's like, oh, no. And she and she she's really worried. Your foot's not better and we're going to migrate soon. Oh, my goodness. You're going to get like, are you going to get left behind? What's going to happen? She's very concerned, obviously, about, you know, her husband and getting left. You know, it's, it's weird that we have to have this conversation, but I guess we do and I just sort of talk to each other. And he's like, no, 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 no. Brandyfoot's ever been left behind. And he sees that she's really, really distraught and worried about what might happen if that does happen. And then he cheers her up by telling her she's great. 
and um and, and he talks about how they met and i really like the acting here and the expressions and it's just like a small little intimate moment that i really enjoy that is unfortunately just surrounded by horse shit it makes it <laughs> tough to enjoy the scene but i i like this in total isolation yeah because that's the With only way that laughing I would... and expressing and it's great because when I watched, I was just, I was just unbelievably distracted by what I thought was a lack of information. I don't know what the stakes yes. are here. Why is everyone so worried? It's like we can help this guy out. Yeah, he sprained his ankle or whatever, but who cares? That probably happens a lot. Yeah, you guys can look everywhere. after him, of mm. course. And and I didn't understand yeah. the gravity of the situation. But no one did. So I made this apparently unwise prediction in, in the video I did on episodes one and two, where I said, well, because you know the reason he twists his ankle is because. Brandy, of what's what uh, names? What's the main irritating young hobbit's Nori. name? Nori. Nor, Nor, Nori, Nori, that's the one. So she's out gallivanting, and then that means she can't be at home to put up the tent. So he does it for her. So he twists her ankle. So I assumed from this that well, he can't walk. So they will all stay in place too long, and then something bad will happen to the camp. Like they'll be attacked by the hunters or the wolf that they trailed in episode one, and like her friends and companions will be killed, and then she'll be driven out on this adventure she never asked for and it's sort of like this this realization an ironic realization of the, the what she is always sort of wanted to go out on an adventure but to really understand that this is a darker and deeper and more tragic world than she could possibly have imagined so i just assumed something like that would happen so it would be yeah they would be stuck in camp something would go wrong most people would die they'd be sent off i assumed that would happen um and so i wasn't sort of jarred by a lack of information in this scene because it's still sort of comported with that but no, 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 no. I was about was, to say, what you just came up with was way more interesting, that she gets her wish, but it's like a monkey's paw thing. Like, yeah, you get to go on your adventure, yeah. but it's your whole family died or something like that. Yeah, and it's a consequence of her like adventures as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly complex as a narrative thing, but it's, it's tried and tested and it works for a reason. I, and, and I think it would it's have fit with the character Skywalker, that... Though. Yeah, Why? Yeah, I guess so. Because... She would get her adventure, and as a result of that, they the, the parents died. Whereas, no, no, like, no, the no, parents no, no. He's saying it. he's saying by having looked after Gandalf, they all die, and then she gets outcasted and goes on her adventure. I thought that's what you were saying. Yeah, because this is the reason that he gets her dad gets injured in the first place. Is yeah, because yeah. she's out looking after. I refuse to call him Gandalf. I call him Steve. But she's out like looking. Oh after yeah, him. you're right. I I forgot that that because that's dumb too. So I forgot about it. The fact that yeah. it's Nori's fault somehow that he hurt himself, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. which also makes no sense. You're right. I, that was so dumb. I didn't even there. remember. So I thought there would be some kind of you know payoff based on that because you know that seems fairly important and it's a it's an obvious thing to do and it, it actually gives it keeps their character as a community consistent because they all voluntarily essentially sacrificed themselves they didn't know that was happening but you know they voluntarily chose to stay in place rather than running off and leaving people behind uh, how wrong I was um, that just seems like it would make sense but, but <laughs> no yeah well I don't know if they would want to take the I think maybe for tonality's sake, they want to try and keep the Harfoot stuff more lower stakes and lighthearted. But then but they get un uh, unfortunately. So the, I mean, but yeah, the, but understanding the situation is that is not true. That is it. Like the yes, yeah, so, but I don't know if that's the, that's the thing we constantly talk about. Was it their intention? What I'm pulling from this, whether it's with characters or with plot, so it's very strange. Yeah, because I don't the think only... that they, like, as we'll see, I don't think that it's their intention to make the Harfoots like horrifically villainous as a people. Right, my That's their intention. <laughs> That's not their intention. <laughs> my so... additional question: He says we'll make it to the Grove. Now, if this place they're migrating to is very well known and understood in terms of a location, then. Them falling behind doesn't mean they can't make it to the grove necessarily. They just get there later. And if if the implication is well, if you're on your own, you're much more uh, you know weak to bandit attacks or something. It's like true, but you're all pretty weak to anyone attacking. Yeah. Really, um, it might even be safer if you're not part of the big group. Yeah, because you louder and more easy to spot. So yeah, I'm just saying like, but because uh, we'll get to all the other issues. I think it's the end of this episode. We can talk about how fucking insane this whole thing is. But 
the fact that he said like you know we'll make it to the grove it's just we know where it is it's just this is gonna take us a bit longer because i got a bad foot or whatever because he also says we'll we'll go to the front of the caravan so oh and that doesn't make any sense either because does that okay, so does that mean that they don't ever overtake the person in front because if they, if is, they refuse to is. overtake the person in front then what's the point in this entire it thing is. Well, it, it's because if you're, if it's all about being left behind, then being at the front is the safest place to be. Well, no, no, no you, that's you, not what I'm saying. What yeah, I'm yeah. saying is that, okay, let's say, let's say that they put them at the front of the caravan, okay. but he's still injured and slower than everybody else. So he will fall behind eventually, and or then he, he will be left behind pace. anyway, unless he sets the pace, in which case they refuse to go faster than the person in front. But then if they refuse to go faster than the person in front, what's the difference between going faster than the person in front and faster than the person behind? Like, there's no reason. It's literally just like, it's almost like a ceremonial position. Like, if you're in the front, well, no, no, it isn't. Because if you're in the back, like, actually, it's almost like a status thing. Like, if you're in the back, you can be left behind. That's why you're in the back. We don't mind losing you. You're Mm -hmm. in the back. That's why if you fall behind, you're not slowing anyone down if you fall behind if you're in the back. Because fuck you. (laughs) <laughs> it just to be fair though, I mean, it doesn't even look like it would be very easy to overtake people when we see the actual road that they're on at least at that point um and and if if there's because he wants to be at the front it's just like you should just get a couple days head start mate that's probably the best way to do it honestly but um is it well I mean, rags would know i think for the familial resemblance but i think it's true of, of wolf packs that the older and the slower member of the pack goes at the front and then the rest of the pack refuses to overtake or leave it behind, which which actually makes the Harfoots less civilized than actual wolves, according to makes sense. what we see on the screen. Uh, it makes sense, yeah. I uh, yeah, the the Harfoots almost seem like this this they're semi foul uh, like yeah they're they're yeah they're, they're dirty and grimy, sure, but you're like you know they're not miserable. I, I guess you know this isn't so bad. I suppose if you lived as a Harfoot, you know, assuming you didn't get eaten by a wolf. Yeah, but then then it's just like no, being a Harfoot's fucking shit, mate. And I, because I, I rewatched it after the the end, and then because you get that scene with Lenny Henry giving the sort of the emotional speech about the people who died uh, and the people, oh, that puts yes. an entirely different complexion we'll on that. Because then you realise that most of these people didn't oh, we'll just randomly there. die; they were just yeah. abandoned by their kids. Yeah, well, well, in fact, there's only there's only one thing I wanted to mention before that, and it's literally the there's one scene between the one we're on now and that, and it is this this scene that is actually uh, sixteen hours long. And it's where Nori is trying to grab a piece of paper. It just, sorry, 18 hours, I think. It Maybe is, even 20, does, I'm not sure. It, it could be. It's anywhere between 15 and 20 hours. It just keeps of, of going yeah. forever. And it's totally and unnecessary. Ever. This You have so many better things to spend your time on than with this. What the fuck are you doing, show? This, like by the way, is the comedy. We talked about episode one and two. Yeah, it's supposed to be comedy and like... Like I even said, light footed, light hearted, <laughs> but um, it's just like, just fuck, do the thing, go. Why are we spending so much time on this? We don't know who you people are. And no, you're fucking around with the book. But like, oh, will she get the paper? Will she not? Will she? Will she? I was just like, I can't remember any of the names. I don't care. I don't even care. Well, this is the highest the stakes have been in some time, rags. Okay, <laughs> like we. It is. Will she get that paper? This is- this is probably the most tense moment of their entire lives. Oh yeah, uh, that scene does finally end, and then yeah, they start doing this like sort of, I guess the last night speech where we're all celebrating how much fun we've had in this glade, and he says like as much as you know it's it's fun that we're moving on to new things, better things, we have to remember those we've lost, and he starts like reading out the names of all the people who I guess have fallen off the Whoa. trail. Whatever that means. Are no longer <laughs> with no longer with us for one reason or yeah. another. Yeah. Well, so he says, in life we could not wait for them, but here now I welcome or we welcome to our circle, and then names a whole bunch of people who've died. And one of the things he says is, stuck in the snows of the mountain pass. It's like you left him, didn't you? You, you <laughs> totally you did. Oh wait. wait. Did Stop. they say an avalanche? No, one was a mudslide. Stuck so in I guess the they're snows. Off the he just, yeah, one was just, just one was just bees. Yeah, one was bees. I guess the bees, bees. killed him. Bees I guess they him. had an allergic reaction to the bees, I suppose. It could be that. Could be that. Yeah, the, I think the worst one is stuck in the snow, because that just sounds like a guy was stuck and they left him. Yeah, like, <laughs> he, he, he's like, oh, damn, I'm stuck in this really deep snow. And it's like, guys? Give me a hand. Right, guys? No. And then all he can hear in the distance is, nobody walks alone. <laughs> nobody <laughs> yeah. goes off trail. Yeah, 
And then he, he says stuck stuff. in the snows. He got stuck in the snow. Yeah. It wasn't like an avalanche. It wasn't that oh. something terrible happened or there was a blizz. No, he's stuck in the snow. You imagine, which is weird. I don't know how you got stuck in the snow if you're in like a group. Well, like, maybe it, seems like it could be as simple as just yeah. getting real cold, Caravan. real tired, and then he went, stood a little too deep and was just like, oh, fuck, I'm, you know, just give me a hand. And they're all just like, nah, man, every man for himself. <laughs> fuck you. Imagine the house. existential dread that you would go through as you're sitting there freezing to death alone. And you realize your entire community, you your friends, yeah, that you've grown up with. A little shanty while they leave you behind yeah, to die they all, alone well, in the cold. Well, hey, to be fair, to be fair, you will die knowing that in their celebration at the end, they'll have a moment where they say your name, how you fucking died. And then everyone raises their glass and says, we wait for you. Well, so it gets, it's, you it, it gets better than that, it's right? Like, it's they... like posthumous trolling. Yeah, it kind of is. Posthumous trolling is an excellent <laughs> way to put it is posthumous uh, trolling. They name we wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> they name that guy, and then the snows, they name the landslide one, and the bees, but then they have like four names in a row, and they don't tell us how those ones died, and I was like, were those ones just too controversial to have written down? Like, one of them falls over, it's like an old man who's like, help, and they're like, oh jeez, what do we say about this one? It's like his walking well, stick broke, it would... like, I don't know. Yeah, Sardock... Sardock felt really bad writing, we left them behind after every name, mm -hmm. so he just doesn't bother anymore. He got bored. Imagine if you're one of those people who he's just too tired to list Stephen in full, how they abandoned you to death. And like... Abandoned this, you they're, to they're, death. They're, they're crying. Like, they, they, they're very sad, and they're crying fault, that guys. these people got you left behind. You yeah, it's help. like, well, you're not... You start to wonder, it's like, are you all just bought in that you cannot help someone if they fall over? Like, that is just... It's against a natural order or something. Yeah. It's that it's just forbidden insane. by some weird religion you Nobody have. walks alone, except you are entirely on your own, and if you can't keep up, then fuck you. If you are not t within ten feet of another <laughs> Harfoot, you are dead to us. The whole point, I thought, of this group and this society is everybody works together because alone you can't do it. But it seems like their ideology in terms of abandoning people is you must be entirely self-sufficient. If you need any help at all, you're no good to us. And look how this one died. Look at this one here. She she ate the wrong kind of berries. That sounds like a, that sounds like a fuck up that doesn't happen often. Like you no, tell everyone. No, what, that's, it wasn't people, that. I, he ate her. I, <laughs> it was a cover story. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what the code is. Like, oh yeah, they ate the sunshine yellow berries. Oh yeah, you don't wanna also you don't have a name for it. You call well, them the sunshine. There'll be like a particularly plump half foot. Everyone's looking at that that one and then one, and then Sardok is like we're having berries tonight, and several of them are like, oh. Which berry? Oh. <laughs> that, that explains why Podge is the only one who stays behind with the Brandyfoots, because she's the obvious candidate, and she must know that, because she's partaken of the half-foot flesh before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you eat too much half-foot flesh, you yourself may end up becoming their food, because you get too big. How it works, <laughs> it's a cycle. One of the big issues, I mean, the, maybe the issue, it stems from an attempt at a unifying culture. So by, by the way that they speak of things. The ancient Egyptians, whenever someone died, they would say they've gone west, right? Someone dies, they've gone west because the sun sets in the west, mm -hmm. right? So that's where, you know, the, the day ends of the west, the sun goes away. It's like death, the pyramids and everything, all those sites for burial on the west side of the Nile. Right, it, it matches their culture, and it's in, it's intuitive. You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So, if you are making a a Harfoot culture, and it's about, you know, like staying, you know, staying together as a group and moving and traveling at times, and so your your language is, oh yes, we to to remember them, we say we wait for you, and no one gets you know left behind, or when someone dies, we say they were left behind, or dying being left behind means you died essentially. That does not mesh with the culture that we've been presented with. No. You want to have lingo and you want to have this unifying concept that's prevalent in this culture, but it doesn't actually match what the culture does and is. There's yeah, a huge you, it, It's like that, that poetic symbolism of the Egyptians married with the sort of the cold, bloodthirsty brutality of the Aztecs, which is actually what we've got. Just complete nihilism about your own community. Um it is, it is, it's, it's sort of, well, it's Darwinian in a sense, isn't it? I mean, every time they move, it is literally the survival of the fittest, or at least the, the death of the least fit. It's, which is 
pretty much the same way. Almost same weirder thing. than that. I don't want to talk about it yet because we'll we'll have it for the final scene. But the nature in which they fall behind is very curious to me in terms of all the issues that come with it. In terms of thinking about how all this works. Um, this story is almost like it's set up to be the first act of a story where Norfoot realizes the truth about her culture and has to rebel against it and change it for the better. But I don't think we're doing that. Like this, unironically, is one of those stories where you mm. learn about the seedy, evil underworking of what makes your civilization function, and then then a character has to go and try and set that right. So then Nori's got this page, and this page is taken out of a book that Sardok has drawn the constellations as he's seen them. I don't understand how that is helpful to Gandalf slash whoever. He's he's holding. Because this page is just the constellation he drew out with fireflies. That's it. There's nothing else. So I don't know why well, that's useful. Can, can we pause just a second there? Because um, I, I think... I, I When he describes the person who was killed by bees, everyone laughs. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they probably ate him. <laughs> they, they remember the taste. <laughs> they remember the meal and the sauce that they used for him. They had honey. I was like, that's... That's, I imagine dying from bees is horrific, you yeah. know? It's like a terrible way to die, especially if you're small and bees are larger by comparison and there's a swarm of them and you just get stung and stung until you just fucking die. And they they all chuckling when when that's brought up. It's like, I don't know, man. That seems really mean, like, fucking disrespectful, honestly. They marinated him in honey or something. Maybe it's close <laughs> oh, to that. No. You, get, you know what they say, you catch more bees with honey. Jesus. Um, That's fucked up. <laughs> I don't even know who Blovo... His name was, like, Blovo... Uh, it's a fucky... It's it's one of those flute names. I gotta... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Blovo Bulgerbuck. I don't course. even know Blovo Bulgerbuck. Blo Bol Blovo <laughs> Bulgerbuck. And I feel bad for him. I feel worse for him than these fuckers did. And they lived with him. Yeah. Literally laughing at his demise from bees. They, they didn't laugh at the one who got well. torn apart by wolves. No, that's not as funny. <laughs> he says, we all loved him. He said, we all loved him, but he was an idiot. Look like, oh, how the man died from bees, guys. I don't know. Yeah, there is it? Laughing. Are you an idiot? If you, I guess maybe he, it's like a, a, he's put his hand in like honey and then he gets eaten by the bees. So they ate him. It's obvious at this point. They yeah, that's they ate the dumb one. Yeah, because it's fine him because this. he was an idiot. That's that's yeah. The like they put him in a little stew pot and started heating it up, and he was like, "This is a bath." And they're like, oh, "Yeah, God. it's a bath." Yep. At the festival, they do IQ tests. They see who they're gonna. And wipe these are out just next. the survivors. Oh my God! That's it's the a, true from, survival we've, of the fittest. We've added from cannibalism. We've also added the execution of the mentally ill. Yes, the, the charming society. The Harvards are wonderful. So, Nori's still in that wait, page. Wait, 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 before you go on, the, the last, one of the last names, he mentions that someone, he says, Ma Hambly was making a sculpture, dot, 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 and it goes back to Gandalf. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck happened? It fell on She her. died when she was making a sculpture? <laughs> Dude, you know what happened? It was a big sculpture, Sardok walks past, nudges it onto her, and it fucking falls and kills her, and he goes, ooh, whoops, guess we're oh, eating berries tonight. It was a tragic <laughs> yeah. accident. It's a shame, yeah. It's tragic. Gotta like, make what? use of I... the flesh. <laughs> it's so obvious at this point. There's no hiding it. Um. Anyway. So yeah. Nori's uh... got this page, and you're like, "Good job, she got it." This is the next step in the getting uh, Oldman what he needs to get, I guess. And she just fucking throws it down on some random table. And it's like, don't you want to put that in some way more secret? It's very important to your goals. But, you know, okay. And fucking, I guess Gandalf was watching it. He just goes and grabs it and starts looking at it. And then he sets it on fire by accident. <laughs> and I was just like, fucking hell. What, this what? plot is clunking forwards. She gets the book, or the page. She sets the page down on a random table in the camp. She happens to stumble into camp, go to that table, picks up that page, which has what he needs, take it to a fire, and have it light on fire. Like, none of this... Like, it, it makes logical sense, right? But it doesn't... <laughs> it can happen that these you know, things it can, can happen. happen. You know, so good, good on you for doing that. But this is just coincidence and convenience clunking this plot forwards. 
mean, it's duplicated setup as well. We've literally just had a sequence with a map of swords, which is discovered. Um, and that leads the way to the next part of the plot. Here we are again, another map of sorts, which is conveniently discovered, moving on. It's almost as though they have no ideas at all. And it takes the so only way long around that... for them to do this as well. It's never quick. <sighs> they take 10 years to get these scenes done. You're just like, ugh. If, if I were trying to be, if I were being like really, really unduly optimistic on the part of the writers and their intelligence... I would say, you know, maybe what they're eventually going to do is to try and make some kind of point of the symmetry between um, the Brandy storyline and the and the Galadriel storyline. You know, you've got these two female characters who are rebelling against the the sort of the cloistering and stifling uh, upbringing that they've they've had to suffer in the societies in which they live, and then they have these, but these simultaneous moments. But well, I don't know because in a way it's the same because you know Galadriel is is constantly rejected or at least uh, her her theories are denied and dismissed by Only... the upper class of Elven society, whereas Brandy is also denied and dismissed and her aspirations. People still sort of you know look no, no she's away given she remember she's given centuries of being able to look for it. And she lives this very expansive life where she's this revered general who controls troops and she goes on these big battles and everything. And she's had all of this time to do all of these things. It doesn't work for her. So that because people don't really believe her at, at this one point here, based off of a shocking lack of evidence mm -hmm. that she's being stifled. No, that's a fair point. Yeah. Maybe, oh, maybe, maybe it's I'll, one I'll... of those what like the, the writers want us to think that instead of remembering oh right we've established that she has this history and she's yeah. been doing all these things for many 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 lifetimes worth of you know adventures yeah what i mean that, that was just... sort of like that was the foundation of, of the theory given that they've they've basically pretended as though the thousands of years of her existence until this point haven't actually occurred so you know, we are going from as though episode one is sort of year zero, basically, like past events don't matter for character or for plot, really not that much. And so, you know, when we're first introduced to Galadriel as the adult Galadriel, then she is, you know, she is rejected by the rest of her society in the sense that her troops all abandon her. She goes back, she tries to convince Elrond, who rejects her theories. She tries to convince Gilgalad, who rejects her theories. This is all, you know, this is the strong and the independent female character who is you know, having these ideas, and we, the audience, know that she's right, so, you know, we sympathise with her against the stifling conformity of the menfolk. And you see the exact same thing taking place with the Harfoots as well, albeit on a very sort of different scale. So if I, if I were trying to say, you know, being as kind as possible in my estimation of the writer's abilities, then maybe they will try and make a point of this symmetry going forward, notwithstanding what you said about the fact that it doesn't actually work because of Galadriel's past experience and all the rest of it. But we'll every see. time I find myself in the position saying, well, yeah, okay, maybe the writers are going to try and do this thing because that at least wouldn't be terrible or it wouldn't be completely unadulterated shit. They usually <laughs> end up letting me down anyway. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that, um, I've even seen some people try to, I don't know if they're memeing or not. I feel like it's a meme. But like, I was going to make the joke. It's unfortunate that Gandalf comes across the one fire in the world that's hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, of course, uh, it wouldn't have burned on the cold ones. But some people are like, well, yeah, there you go. That explains it. You know, he's not used to hot fires. It's like, okay, so you would have detected a hot fucking fire before setting this thing on fire. And are you telling me he actually doesn't understand what fire is? They didn't, like, are you serious? Like, It's not like a basal... Does he actually of, think fire is cold? And then, to... you know, it, 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 but look at this shot, right? Like, like, he should be shocked with it already. He should be like, whoa. Why is this? Well, I mean, if you're that close to a fire, you could feel the extreme heat coming yeah. off of it. Fire's gonna be, you know, super. He will feel hot. it well before, and and yeah. So the, the it's dumb as fuck. He sets it on Gandalf, fire. He is supposed to be the the Maya or the wizard most closely associated with fire as well. So like, I don't think this is just a third age thing because he gets the ring, the Elven ring, which is the the, the fire ring. Um, Nenya, I think it's called. Um, the ring of fire. Uh, kind of, yeah. He yeah. fell into it. Um, but it's yeah. so he's he's supposed to be have more knowledge, I think, of fire even at this point in sort of you know his history. Um, I think though that the, the fact that the he's the wielder crash, of I, the flame of Arnor, is he, he is not? of Arnor, yes, yeah, exactly. So he is. I, I think they were trying to tease that as kind of is this guy Sauron? Because you know, when you see him in the middle of the meteor crash site, it does look kind of like a fiery eye. The last time we saw fire that gave off no heat was in the northern fortress where Sauron once was. Um, 
I don't, I think it's, you know, it's incompetently done, but I think they were actually trying to, to tease that possibility, however ineptly. But now, now it gets to the point where at some point he will have to learn what fire is, and apparently just hasn't done that yet. Yeah, I, I just, it's tiring. Okay. <laughs> like, we need to have it so that he bursts into the scene. That's the other thing I didn't even fucking mention right now. Have, has Nori told him to stay secret? Or does he just not give a shit? I don't know. Wait, wait, no, wait. Could Nori tell him to stay secret? Well, so apparently he does understand what she's saying. I don't know, though. Like, it's so hard to follow. He says... He, he, he says friend but, and Nori, but I, I don't know what's happening. So, like, maybe... Hmm... She, we, we should have had some setup where he wants to keep going with her back, and she, she motions him to stay here. So when she doesn't show up, maybe, maybe because she has to help with festival stuff, she tells her friend like, "I haven't visited him, you know, like all day. I've been, I've been busy. I, I'm worried if he'll come looking for me." And then he actually comes and looks for her. He doesn't just randomly happen to stumble in at just the right point. You actually, dare I say, set up that he's, he might come looking for her if she doesn't visit him. It's um. Moving on. I mean, it's a, I just it's a little bit like just there's not uh, it, barely anything is happening, and the way they do it is so incompetent. The writers, I mean, like there's so little for you to have to achieve in these very long scenes, and you still can't do it. How do we get it so they accidentally stumble across the stranger, as he's called? Like, well, we'll have it so that he stumbles across the page that she put down for no reason on a particular table, and then you'll try and read it with the fire and accidentally set it on fire, get spooked, and then run himself into a tent and get up and reveal his face and everyone will see him. It's like, what the f- why? Why any of all of that? If you already had it so that he was just gonna wander out because he doesn't seem to care if anyone sees him, then you've already got your answer right there. Just have that happen. You can have one of the fucking Hoffers just notice there's a huge man over there. No, it has to be more interesting than that, right? It has to fall over and go, whoa! whoa. Anyway, that happens. And, so, um, yeah, that, that and, happened. And, and everyone's like, ah! And then he's like, Nori? And then it's like, oh, no. And so there's a big, I guess, town meeting. And it's like, you've lied, you've stolen, and you've... Uh, you know, hidden away a spooker, big old spooky Tolman. And they say, by our laws, she has to be badished. And then Sardok is like, yeah, but she's young, it's fine. The actual uh, weird it's... random word is decaravaned, is the term. Decaravaned, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be a whole um, family too, right? Not just her. Yeah. yeah, I assume it would be a whole family, the whole fa God, um, what a fucking stupid so society. <laughs> you banish people if they... So, because you... What exactly? Like, what is actually what she's being punished for? Is it not That's telling so them that there's someone? Is it bringing him to camp? Because she didn't bring him to camp. No, and and no. and um, she actually says he was lost. He was hurt. Was I supposed to just leave him? And they don't answer a question. Maybe. But well, because the answer is yes, leave him or eat him. You're That's what we do. To leave him. According yeah. to the rules of this society, yeah. That's what they would do. They probably have it on the books that you're supposed to, can, like, you know, kill him in his sleep and eat his flesh. Like, that's what you're supposed to do, Nori, and you <laughs> fucked up. You didn't stay on the trail, Nori. <laughs> when they found him, they didn't just jump on him with little knives and just skin him alive. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, like that scene has this awkward cut where he's just at a rock now and they're talking and he's not tangled up in the tent anymore. It just cuts. So I that would have been interesting to see how all those things resolved in between scenes. Um, but that's why we didn't get to see it. It's like during saving minors. We just don't, we just cut away from that. But an, a, a better writer would have th thought, huh, Sardok, right? You're in charge of all these, you're in charge of your people, right? You're trying to allegedly keep them all alive. Um, how interesting that, it, wouldn't it be neat if you had this non-threatening, sort of dim-witted, but friendly giant, essentially? who is just with you and wants to be your friend yeah. helping out. That would be, especially if you have this brandy foot, maybe we call it broken foot, broken foot, and his family might get left behind. And that's like one, two, three, four people, something like that. So like, what if he pull, you know, there's no gears do not spin in anyone's mind. No, nope. there's no, it's just, nope, you brought someone back. You're, um, you're banished. I guess this you're before. Young, so you're not. 
And it was like, if you fail this this test, if I win, you'll banish from all dwarven lands. He fails. Well, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh. Okay. What? What? This was like a full-on rule. Glad we had that theme. <laughs> What's the ah, this has hurt my brain. But, um... Yeah, like, the, that's the conclusion, but you're like, so is, is, was all that pretty much worthless then? It's like, no. Sardok decides, as punishment, they will go to the back of the caravan, which is the one thing the dad didn't want to happen. How unfortunate. And then he's like, whoa, 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 Sardok, don't do that. And he's like, ah, leave me alone, I'm going to sleep now, bye. And it's like, oh, shucks. Oh, okay. I and feel I'm gonna like be honest we with continue you. to discuss this. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Jeez. If you told me, let's say it's us four, we're all family. And I, I've broken my foot, and I tell you, so Sadaka said we have to go to the back of the caravan tomorrow morning. And it's like, oof. Um, that means we're probably gonna die, because we'll be left alone, and then we'll... Well, we wouldn't probably die, because we'll fucking... whatever. Might anyway, let's, at let's night just... Out of yeah, because they will eat us, but... You know what, let's, <laughs> let's go with it. Let's, let's say, because that seems to be what this village believe. You'll die if you're left behind, right? So let's just go with that as the stakes. It's like, okay, fuck it, let's get ready right now and start going. We'll be ahead. Whatever. What are they gonna do? Be caravanners? Yeah. yeah. Well, we were a part of the caravan one way or another. You're going to have to fuck it. And you know what? I'll be slow because of my broken foot. But, I mean, if we get a good half day's start, then uh, we should be ahead of them and they'll catch up with us maybe. And what are they going to do? They're yeah. not going to kill us. They'll just have to go past us. I don't care if you but send me to from... the back of the caravan. I'm staying at the front, bitch. Even from the tribe's perspective, this is, this is like the world's shittest trolley problem. Yeah. Do we send them away or do we leave them behind? It means exactly <laughs> the same thing. There's no difference between those two things. Well, shit, so, it's a trolley problem. And if it True. is your family's life at stake, you should be protesting a bit more, I feel. You need to Agreed. be like, no, like this is this is me and my family's like lives, essentially. We, we have got to discuss this. I'm not going to well, yeah, not a, have a conversation. Hey, Sardok, you seemed really concerned in episode two when you found out I'd hurt my leg sorting out your fucking festival. It seemed like you cared that I might be left behind with all of my family, and now you're actually facilitating that by putting me at the end. And why? This seemed pretty arbitrary. You were just like, fuck it, you're in the last now. I, I, meh. I don't know. That's just the way it is. And he's like, okay, cool, so I'm not gonna do that. And you're not gonna be able to stop me unless you kill me, which, you know, fuck it, whatever, if you have the balls. And it doesn't, like, it doesn't accord with the earlier conversation, the one that Rags said he liked, which I kind of agree with, you know, with the, between the mum and the dad, when they're really, really worried about the prospect worried. of being left behind. Like, worried is probably an understatement, but, they, you know, they are concerned to be, uh, at the prospect of being left behind. And then when this argument sort of comes to fruition and then comes to an end, um, and the mum takes Nori, I can keep forgetting her name, I think it's Nori, Nori aside, mm -hmm. and then she, she tells her off as she said, you nearly got us kicked out of camp. I was like, well, no, but I did get us put to the back of the camp, which was the thing you said you were scared of in the yep. last scene. So you shouldn't just accept it, really, as you're going to start in, in that interpersonal thing. Like, you should have, what, where is the fight here? What happens at a stakes that we just are set at up stake. in the previous yes. scene? If you care about your wife, yourself, your kids, you... and the threat is them all dying as a result of this, like, you need to be, like, you need to be raised in hell. And think and about where's old... that emotional appeal of to everyone else? Like, are you just gonna let us fucking die? Think about all the lot of them are. They must have known Sardok for ages, and they must be able to just walk into him and be like, dude, this is the first thing that's ever gone wrong. It's a guy fell out of space, dude. Like, this is, this is a pretty weird scenario, and our daughter decided to try and look after him, and what? You're gonna kill us? Because of this? Seriously? Like, yeah, you're gonna punish her for the same kindness we, allegedly, are showing to each other? Like, like this that's is, weird. What are we, then? Like, Sardog, we've been your neighbor for, like, presumably decades? I don't even decades. know. Decades. Yeah. It's gotta be decades. Like, are, I you, mean, are you really doing this? Bilbo, and, yeah. and you looked like you didn't even know why you were doing it. You just went, uh, back of the caravan, bye. I was like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Just stop. Just, just don't do who, that. Who elected you? <laughs> yeah. I did. <laughs> uh, seems bizarre. It is bizarre. This culture is strange. I, I get there's a, that striking contrast between, between the close, intimate community where everyone knows each other from like from birth to death. You know everyone. And the death of a member in this kind of society is like a, a tragic thing to happen. And then you contrast that with just this casual, you know, you're going in the back. You brought your fucking dead. You broke you. you not even broke, but you sprained your ankle? It's like, we're not waiting for it to heal. Fuck you, you die. And your family <laughs> dies too. And then we eat you. And then we eat, we eat the berries. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the other um, bizarre thing is that there's no word on the crazy long man. They don't do anything with him. Well, they, because we cut from we cut that scene where that might have happened. But we if they even if, like even if they did cut that scene, what were the repercussions of it? Nothing. We, we I don't know. Like the, they just over yeah. here. They're all like scared of him. They don't want him anywhere near them. But they didn't say anything about it. He's just literally four meters away from them looking at them and they don't do anything <laughs> just like there he is to be, to be fair four meters away to them is like 60 meters for us that's so true it's a safe distance it's a mean, safe distance but, but it's, the other it's, way around, it's so or? much more important that they have the exact same argument with nori again the mother and nori have to have their yes. you're being too adventurous for a not hobbit it's unnatural for a not hobbit to be so adventurous why can't you just be normal the tallest milkweed gets snipped or whatever the fucking metaphor is like that is evidently having that played out for the 12th time much more important metaphor. than seeing what the consequences of having steve in camp were i mean it's just ugh. Well, yeah, yeah why says, would you um, cut the tallest milkweed we, you you cut them at the bottom right well so but just, just for yes. that though she says we don't need we friends can. we need to survive and her response is without friends what are we surviving for mm -hmm. and then her response is our way has kept us alive for thousands of years or, or a thousand years or whatever I'm just like not all of us. Not all of you. I'm. Like, I'm some very. Some of us got fucking stung by bees. Well, I'm just. I'm just confused because like survival, but like like we pick surviving over friends. Like isn't isn't the whole idea here that you're su you're a community that supports each other? Mm. You're not just yeah. merely no. surviving. Not that... these utterly ruthless people who will just leave behind anybody who's a mild burden. Because you seem to be getting along, like, if, if the idea is to present to me as an audience member that they live a very perilous life, they have not done enough work to convince me of that. Because they seem to be getting along really well with moderate amounts of, not really even moderate amounts of care taken to, though, keeping themselves hidden. I mean, you guys are having this big old party here. Like, I just, I don't, it's, again, it's that disconnect. I don't believe what you're telling me is the case based on what <laughs> you've shown me. The tallest salt gets snipped for looking down. <laughs> the tallest salt gets. <laughs> um. Yeah. So she says to him, "Um, there's a reason he's here." And she's like, "Do you think you're special? You're just a child." She's like, "I'm not special, but he's special. I can feel it." And I, I, if I were in the scene, I'd be like, "I mean, he did fall from space. That's like he yeah, probably is fair, special. <laughs> it's not. It's not just a feeling, sweetheart. <laughs> he fell from space." <laughs> Be, we yeah, would have they, known this if we went and checked out the crash site, which is in walking distance, but we didn't. Now, um, as for the whole, the tallest milkweed gets snipped. Um, I was talking to Frankie about this. What is milkweed? Yeah, uh, the idea that like the 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 prize flower is the one that's gonna sort of attract the attention of the gardener and get taken. Yeah. Is uh is actually something I appreciate, but I don't understand what the fuck her mum is talking about here. I don't because understand. Because that how means they're gonna cull. She's going to cull her own daughter, if well, that's so, the thing they're going for there. Well, we... it's, so the, the whole point of the, the saying of, like, oh, the, 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 the one that stands tallest, it's, it's that, like, by being prominent, you, like, draw attention, draw to, attention yourself, to yourself, including negative attention, and mm. people who might vie to... Well, exactly, but how does like, that relate to this? Power status that you, that's what I'm saying. Like, in, in this case, what, what, what is she doing that is equivalent to that? Attaining, like, status... And she tried to remain enemy. a secret. An entire but like you guys are yeah. and to be fair, you guys are having this big old party running around exactly. dancing with torches and singing. You guys are being the I tallest know. milkweed. Well That's yeah, like you. what what by helping somebody else for like no apparent gain other than to do a nice thing, what exactly does that have to do with drawing attention to yourself so much so that it puts a target on your back? I think like, I mean, maybe mean? I'd guess the metaphor's being used well, inaccurately, as all of them are, but I think it's it's supposed to be a little bit broader than that. So it's not just it's broadly speaking drawing attention to yourself. Now you can draw attention to yourself simply by being different, not necessarily by trying to attain status. Um, which, of course, that's what the metaphor is supposed to convey. But I think the way they're using it is simply making making yourself known, like differentiating yourself from the community is what they're talking about. The metaphor doesn't work though, because I mean, again, if the tallest milkweed gets snipped, is what they're going with. Well, in this analogy or this metaphor the farmer or whoever is snipping the milkweed is the community around her so the mother is implicitly saying or almost explicitly saying i will kill you the community will kill you if you yeah. carry on doing this you are, I don't you know are linking 
you're you're linking prominent acts of selfless kindness to a thing that you should not do. Yeah, no, because that's not what the community does. The community no, not this community. This community is like, well, I, if you die yeah. of bees, we will laugh at you at your funeral. Um, have you? Because uh, a little platoon. Have you seen Game of Thrones, the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, funnily enough, because uh, I, I was again, I was talking to Frank about this. One of my favorite scenes from all of Game of Thrones isn't in Game of Thrones. It's uh, it was a deleted scene. I don't know why they deleted it. It's a really, really good it's, scene. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it this this comes up, and I just want to I want to talk about it because it's just a perfect counterexample. But like, there's a character in Game of Thrones called Grand Maester Pycelle. He's very old, and he walks with like a super hunchback, and he'll do things all the time. He'll literally talk like this. He'd be like. Oh, hello, sir. Good morning. How are you, you doing? And he'll be like, oh, I forgot. And he'll be holding like a message for someone, and he'll he'll like wiggle his hand trying to lift it up, and he'll pass it to him. He might drop it and go, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but then you get a couple scenes where he's alone, and he's fine. He can walk normally. He can talk normally, uh, even pretty fast. And uh, there's there's just a great moment. I think it's the end of season one. Where um he puts his clothes he's like he's like sprightly he can he's full on walking around everywhere and stuff he puts on his clothes and then he like simulates the hunchback and then starts walking out of his room really slowly because that's <laughs> yeah, the really act know. that he puts on the scene I'm talking about is Tywin has arrived at King's Landing and he's getting everything fucking in order because it's all a mess and he meets with uh, Pycelle he pulls him out of the uh, the black cells I think it is because uh, that's where Tyrion put the maester and um. Uh, that was in the show. It's not in the show. Um, I wish it was in the show. Uh, Tywin's like fishing, I think, and I'm pretty sure there's symbology there for the fucking uh, uh, the Catelyn's house stuff. There's so much good shit in Game of Thrones when it was good. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, he's t Tywin's like asking him more and more questions about how he's been operating that are kind of like, in a sense, fishing for plot holes about the decisions that Pycelle has been making. And he eventually starts going like, "Oh God, Lord, oh my Lord, I did, I did, I did, I did." And he just goes, "Did this act work for like anyone? Seriously?" And then he like pauses and just goes, "Well, works for a lot of people, yeah." And Ty was just like, "It's impressive, honestly, but like you know, not working for me." And then he's like, "Why do you do this? Like, what what is with this whole like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm a little old man, don't worry about me." And he eventually says like, um. The tallest flower in a garden. If you're, if you are the tallest flower, you're going to get plucked. I just want to live in the garden. He says something like that, and obviously the point is that he just tries to come across as not too important while actually like doing things he wants to do, just to be able to stay alive. He doesn't annoy anybody. He doesn't create too many ripples, and that's just how he managed. Unassuming yeah. old man. Don't have to worry about him. Everyone is. Oh, it's, it's that's just old man Jenkins. He's fine. Just, he's exactly, and he, everyone tolerates him because he's just the yeah. old dude. He's fine. Don't worry about old him. Man, just it's not bothering to appreciate anybody. the fact that a Game of Thrones deleted scene is yeah. better. <laughs> better than <laughs> every <laughs> single scene in Rings of Power that made Yo, it into the final cut. It's unbelievable. Can you imagine how bad the deleted scenes must be from Rings Fucking of Power? Hell. Or maybe they cut the good ones. Maybe they could have done that. They could have cut all the good ones. <laughs> and um. Uh, yeah, it's a great scene for Tywin, because it shows that he sees right through the fucking act immediately. Yeah. And it's a great scene for Pycelle, because you really get a good insight into why he does a lot of what he does. And then you have the, the analogy that works really well. And it's so funny, when she said it in this scene, I was just like, what the fuck are you referring to? Like, is it literally, because as you, as you guys have already pointed out, the community will destroy you if you continue to do nice things. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> What? Meanwhile, what Pycelle was kind of referring to is a lot of the people who get killed in King's Landing are the ones that are making the big power plays, the ones that become a problem for people, the ones that are doing this, that, and the other. He's just a kindly old man. Who would care about him? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was really surprised, but I, this, it's just... It's consistent. These writers keep doing this. They keep coming up with these different ways to try and analogize or create metaphors and they're always embarrassing and you get confused as to what the point was as opposed to just using normal standard english you, you guys just do that you're not very good at it but, but do that because it gets even more difficult to like decipher scenes when they don't Another bees. <sighs> yeah <laughs> well we're up to four I... hours by the way <laughs> like I, I I prefer the hobbits from the Shire. 
Oh, you know, yeah, I could agree with that. I think. Actually, after spent, I would just what a lovely place to live. That's like oh, yeah. ultimate top tier. If you had to live in a fantasy setting, where to be? The fucking Shire. Give me the Shire any day. I'll li I'll live in the Shire. Absolutely. Yeah, it'd be pretty neat. Growing flowers and pumpkins and just having a good time with all your buddies and living Great in your company. cozy house. Oh, give me that any day. I will. I would not be a Harfoot. No, I don't want to die. I don't want to be I eaten. Want, I don't want to be killed <laughs> by who I thought were my friends. Every person who dies is just like, it's like Mufasa being chucked off the canyon wall. Where he's like, brother, help me. And they're like, no, actually, no. they leave you behind. By the way, I was just no. I was looking through my notes and I it's just the conclusion you all had as well. It's just, I put, don't be a good person because you might die. What the fuck is this? What does this mean? <laughs> what is this? It's such a bizarre lesson to give your own child. And I don't know if it's the intention to make the Harfoots evil. I don't, they I don't are. Know. I don't know. I don't Lots tell. Of... I can't tell what's a legitimate fuck up and what's just a terrible decision. They blend uh... together like salt on a table. <laughs> Oh, it's like lots of people, like, they have problems following thoughts through to their conclusions. Like, most people have that occasionally. But the writers of this show, they can't follow a thought beyond step one. Like, there's no connotation from what they're saying. Like, I don't think, it, I genuinely don't think it occurred to them when they drafted that stupid metaphor that, you know, even to think what that means, what, like, what are the parts of that metaphor? Who conforms to the different parts? Who is the, uh, the milkweed in this scenario? And who is the person doing the cutting? I don't think they thought about it. I think maybe they had a vague idea that they wanted to portray the Harfords as like a more primitive version of the Hobbits, which of course they are. Um, and to do maybe something a little bit more brutal with the world they're set in. I don't think, though, that they realized that they would, by doing that, turning the Harfords into cannibalistic, nihilistic, masochistic bastards. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, I, don't, you're not, I don't think they thought it. You're not making the Harfoots make a tough choice. Like, we really don't want to no. do this, but our survival's at stake. Where you, like, understand it, this is just an outright act of evil. Yeah. It's, we, we get this in media a lot, because a lot of media is shit these days in particular. We don't know where the incompetence, like, begins and ends. If the writing is so bad throughout, we're not sure if it's just a really bad decision that they decided to go with, or if it's a legitimate fuck up and they didn't intend for it. Because they both blend together. They're often indistinguishable. Oh, we're back to uh, Isildur and Elendil and the girl. I forget her name. Um, <laughs> off and um, screaming. Why is she... <laughs> Um, so this scene we find out, like, Isildur has nine days before he completes his captain flames or whatever, and, uh, he wants to defer. That's bizarre, when you have nine days left. And, like, he just sort of announces, he tells Elendil this, and then he's like, what? And he's like, did you know? And then the sister's like, yeah, I know, because I listened to him. And I remember thinking, like... Not like what? you, Dad. I, uh, like, some of these scenes, they can go by, and I don't, like, sort of... Uh, think about them, because I'm just like, whatever, that scene's over now, but I was like, wait a minute, so like, to translate, this is like your kid telling you they're nine days away from completing, like, university, but they just want to not do it for a year, and then go back to it, when they nine days left, like, what? And then you're like, wait, did, did other family member know about this and not tell me? And then her response is, well, yeah, you're a shitty dad who doesn't listen to your son. It's like, what? But, That's not the approach I'd take, Galadriel. I mean, other lady. It's I like it's it's like she's she's trying to like meme a bit, but it's like I was just told my son like wants to fuck off from his whole like education slash career, yeah. and and you're Did like you poking at me for, for not seconds. being a good dad. Like fuck you, man. Like what what is this? Like <laughs> I'm, I'm busy, by the way. Like I'm a really busy guy. I'm like a sea captain, and I have so much semen underneath me that I have to keep tidy. <laughs> and I'm just gone, and I'm doing missions, and I got this fucking elf. Like I got shit to do. Could you not put me down here when we're having dinner? And then they make him say, "The past is dead. We either move forward or die with it." Oh, Which... for fuck's sake! It's just. Do you remember, Elendil, how in the previous scene you were in, 
you went back to a library and looked up the past and it was incredibly useful. <laughs> yeah, this line is fine for an appropriate character who thinks that and acts consistently with it, but coming out of your mouth, it seems odd. I fe it really felt like they wanted it for the trailer and this because they didn't feel natural at all in this that, conversation. That, that's most of the scenes, Mahler. It's for the trailer. <laughs> if you watch the show through the lens of imagine the trailers, oh, man, wow. So many amazing scenes. Um, Story-wise, it's shit, but if for trailers, mm, gold. Yeah, Daughter Lady, she's made it into the Builder's Daughter Guild. Lady. Okay, and Isildur, obviously he wants, he doesn't want to be Sea Captain person, he wants to go to Middle-earth, I guess. No, he wants to go Do to West Numenor. Or, or... He doesn't want to go to Middle-earth, he wants to go to the west of the island, which is where his family comes from. That's why Elendil says, uh, leave the past behind, the past is does dead. Does he say why? It's time for the Jedi to die. Um, no, I don't think he does. We'll get and that. I not knowing next the character's season. motivations makes We'll get it, it next season, Rags, Jesus. Next oh. Season. <laughs> But, like, that's something that should be asked. He's like, oh, if you don't want to do this, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to go to the west end of the island. And I'm like, why? It's uh, what, I see, What's I over there the, for you that isn't here? Your family's here? feeding something. It's supposed to have a sort of guessing, and it's supposed to be this dark past, because they, they share, he, uh, Isildur and Elendil share a bit of dialogue when uh, Isildur says something along the lines of, you know, basically, I won't uh, recreate your fuck-ups or something. Like There's an implied dark backstory and a dark association between um, Elendil and, and West Numenor, which is why he's much more down on the idea of going back than Isildur is. But there's hardly any of that, so there's not really enough to make anybody do anything other than say, huh? But And then, again, because the show doesn't pace its events properly, even if you were minded to be intrigued by that and to ask questions of it, you don't have any time to do that because we're about to get, like, three massive exposition dumps that are much more important than that, after which you'll have just forgotten that that was a thing. So the next time you see a sealed door and you wonder why he's doing what he's doing, well, you've already forgotten what the West Numenor thing was about because you never knew what it was about anyway because they gave you nothing to work with. It, all the relevant information in this episode just comes in the last ten minutes and it, it's just, <laughs> again, terrible writing. Yeah, we get loads. Characters of... don't do what they should be doing. And if it's for meta reasons, then that's not an excuse. Characters need to be like, if you hear your son say, I don't want to do this thing that I've essentially been set up to do my whole life, you should be asking why. Yes. What's over for you <laughs> yes. elsewhere? That's like, I'm your start. son. I, or, I, or like, I am your father. I have a very personal interest in your thoughts right now. I need to explore this basic shit um and so that's that scene it was really long too <laughs> they're all very long bit. she's um it's i'm sure it's gonna be relevant in later episodes and i really resent that it will be but she's been flirting daughter sister whatever she's flirting with the son of our Farazon, who's the chancellor isn't she throughout this episode mm -hmm. and i'm sure that that's gonna go places it's just Oh, sorry. I really that's, don't care. That happens in next episode, actually. Because oh, uh, is that the next one? Oh yeah. shit! Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. No, I don't, yeah, I don't blame you either. It's, together, yeah. it's tough to keep track because it's a it's a mired mud. It's yeah. There's no there's no like anchor points to the show. We're like, oh, that's really cool. I really like this aspect. You know, everything else is shit, but at least there's this one thing I like. And this show just doesn't have that. There's no well, plot so, line or character that you care about. We do it again, and I'm, I just get so triggered at this point, because it happens all the time. Hullbrand's like, my people have no king. And then Galadriel is like, your people have no king, because you are him. And I was like, wait. So they do have a king. So they do have it. Like, that's, 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 Galadriel, that doesn't make sense. It's, 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 and also, how do, how do you know this? Well, I found a thing in the library off screen because I don't think we even get shown her finding this particular that was piece a really of paper in the library. Trip. That was just, a really just, productive trip. She gets back, and then the writers decide, oh, f we, we forgot to do that while we were there. Yeah. So just, just pretend that it happened. And if we pretend hard enough, people will just accept it. So now she knows because she found a symbol in a different book that she wasn't even looking for. And now she knows that. He's the king of the Southlands. I, th I think or there's a at really. Least she has the symbol of the king of the Southlands. There's a real good chance that they did film that scene, but they ended up cutting it because when they put it together in the moment of like the big reveal of Sauron, the, the choir rising, and then they were like, also there's this. And she was like, <laughs> oh, wow, I, I, that's well, the thing I saw on that guy, huh? Do it first. Just <laughs> reorder it. <laughs> yeah, there's loads of ways they could have done it, but no, they're just like, fuck it. She looked around a bit longer and she found out 
There is a symbol that means that Halbrand is very likely the king of the Southlands. Or whatever. Woohoo. Um, but I got even more triggered, because maybe there's something that I'm missing, but like, he says, my ancestors swore, to, swore a blood oath to Morgoth, as, as a way of saying, like, you know, we're irredeemable, or us a lot. And then she says, my ancestors started the war, come with me, oh, and both of us can redeem our bloodlines. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean re redeem? The elves, redeem. What, did, what did the elves do wrong? They, they were trying to save Middle-earth. Ah, but this, this is, is this is one of those things that again it, it's relying on foreknowledge that it hasn't equipped you with. So unless you've read the book, you you can't you literally can't though. The show doesn't tell you any of this. But so the, the point of that is when the, the war against Morgoth is obviously nowhere near as simple as the show makes it out to be. Um, the elves don't fashion swords first to go to war against Morgoth. Uh, they fashion swords to use against each other. Feanor is the guy who creates the Silmarils. He's the person Morgoth sort of corrupts and incites to rebel eventually against the Valar. And when Morgoth arrives in Valinor and destroys the trees, or rather Ungoliant destroys the trees at Morgoth's bidding, Morgoth then steals the Silmarils, which we've only had one mention of in episode two. And Feanor made them. He's very jealous of them. He also kills Feanor's father. So Feanor is incredibly pissed off about all of this. And he wants to go to Middle-earth to get the Silmarils back and take revenge for his dead father. And he in, sort of uh, approaches the Valar for help, and the Valar preach caution. They don't like Feanor very much anyway, because he's been quite rebellious. So he says, well, fuck you guys then, we're going anyway. He goes to, he takes his entire house and the entire Noldor race of elves to the beach, um, where there is another race of elves called the, the Teleri elves, and they're famous shipbuilders. They're the only famous shipbuilders on the entire island. Wow. And they they go to ask the Teleri for their ships so they can get across to Middle-earth. The Teleri say no. And so the Noldor, which is Galadriel's family by implication, it's also Feanor's house, massacre the Teleri elves. So they kill, it's the kin slaying is what it's known as. So they kill their own fellow elves. The first ever time any of this happens in Valinor, it's a massive scandal. Then the Noldor, including Feanor, Galadriel, all the rest of them, when they leave, they are banished then from Valinor. They're not allowed to go back. The Valar prevent them from doing it. So when she says... In this scene, we can we can mend the history of both of our households. We can redeem both our households. She's referencing that, but the show has said nothing that's, about any of it, so we don't know. If we're just that's the show. that's yeah, incredible. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah, now that nothing. He's quivering in chat from like, the Lord of the Rings expo. There's there's that nothing in not, the show for this. Like not, yeah, there's it's... nothing. Like maybe the writers forgot, but we're just gonna have to be honest here. The vast, 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 vast majority of everyone who watches the show. It's not read that book. Exactly. That's just I mean, the reality of it. That, but, and then that goes for I, Marvel and comic books. That goes for like but, these most people just don't they, they haven't read that thing. Yeah, you, you can't just name drop shit with no context, especially if it's I mean, no, even a few people have read it reasonably, relatively speaking, read the Lord of the Rings. Even it's not an easy book to get through. But if all the people who've read the Lord of the Rings, like maybe 10 percent have read the Silmarillion as well. Like hardly anyone really has read yeah, the Silmarillion. Yeah, that's me. It's very not tricky read it. to get through. So you can't I read just, Lord of the Rings, not Silmarillion. Yeah, but you can't just name drop shit in the Silmarillion, which has massive connotations and consequences, and then do nothing with that. You can't just say, well, that's self-explanatory. It, it's not. There's so much history that you've ignored in the show. No viewer, realistically, is going to have this knowledge, or very few of them will. So what the hell is the audience supposed to make of a line like that? And is the show going to go and backfill the information as it's done with everything else? And, and Possibly. But it's not going to be very satisfying if we get 30 seconds of exposition from Galadriel in episode 7 to explain what she's just told us in episode 3. It, uh, it's, uh, the, and the I don't even think that... I don't even think that's really appropriate because the, the way the line is delivered is as though we have the information we need to understand it. She's like... It's said as like a kind of a cool, like, yeah, we... You've just told me that there's, you know, there's evil in your in your history, and as we know, there's evil in mine. So we, you know, we, we're in a similar. And I'm just like, wait, 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 what? Like, what? What did the the way they introduced everything in the show? The elves seem like the cool kids who've done nothing wrong. Like, you 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 need to you need to let us know about this context because she says it so casually. And I was just like, I don't I don't remember any of no, the. Like, what did you what did you talk about this? Like, then, if they just bring it up. It's not, you know the way that they do it in shows usually, it's just like, if, if someone said like, oh, you know, the elves are amazing, and then she can like look down, and you can be like, hmm. And then another episode, they're like, oh yeah, you know, you got nothing to redeem in your history, and then she's like, uh, don't speak of things you know nothing about. You know, so and we go, oh, so it's something that, no, she says it here, as though it's something we're already aware of. And it's just like, that was confusing, because, yeah. yeah. 
It's such a fail. Have an intro <laughs> episode one has an introductory monologue, the only purpose of which is to establish this stuff. Yeah. And it mentions none of it. So the only way around it is to do, as you say, is to turn it into this sort of unspoken of tragedy in the past, which no one really wants to address. Understandably so. You hint at this darkness in the past. You don't assume everyone already knows it, which is the approach they did take. Um, it just doesn't make for compelling narrative. Most people will just be confused by that. Galadriel coming to uh, Behole in the dungeon, right, and telling him that we have to redeem both of our bloodlines. It's like if you if you start a new job and you meet Tim, who works there, you're like, hi, Tim, you're like, hi, you. And then you go to work and things are fine and you get along well enough. And then the next day he comes to you with a knife and he cuts his hand and he says, we are blood brothers now. Yeah, it's a pretty intense <laughs> development they've had uh, when... I, I guess they're trying to justify this because he gave her that knife back, okay? But she likes him. He's charming. The Shut easiest up. way to an elf's heart is through her knife. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, yeah, it does make some sense, actually. Yeah, that's yeah, one it of those, does. It's, it's one of the... I'm sure that... <laughs> it's too small for this show, okay? Up, <laughs> one thing, too, that I think is interesting is that the... Does this show want us to think that men suck and elves are great? Um. Well, so the problem is, I, I was going to go with the whole, like, the people they want us to think suck do, you know, suck, and the people they want us to think are great also suck, so everyone just sucks. Yeah, like, you, they've screwed up, basically. <laughs> you could say that, yeah. They screwed it up. <laughs> they have um, aired. And it doesn't end there, by the way, because, like, uh, the seed ends with him saying, you're stuck here and you have no army. So, like, you know, how could she possibly an active plan? And she just goes, that's all about to change. I legit oh, was like, oh my god, what is she gonna do? <laughs> is she gonna kill everybody and tell them, like, under threat of death she must follow follow her into battle? Or I legit have no fucking clue what she could possibly do. And the next episode doesn't help in terms of how we get from here. Oh. Yeah, like, you know... No spoilerinos, technically, because we like going through these as if the people uh, here are, aren't watching it, so they get to be surprised. But yes, by the end of the next episode, she will indeed have an army, and she will be leaving here to fight a war in Middle Earth. That's a th that just th it just sort of happened. We you know we'll get to the the how. It's not good, <laughs> but like not, the it, keep keep that plot idea in mind with what it took to get the riders uh, to, to get the soldiers of Rohan to come to Gondor's aid. Just think yeah. about, like, maybe what it takes to get an army to go fight another. It just maybe is a gentle comparison between this show and the Lord of the Rings. That's cool, too. What they did <sighs> was very cool. It's almost cruel to invite that comparison. It's, it's yeah. almost like, it's like it's abusing rings of power just because it's like, it's like beating a cripple. It just doesn't, it's not good. Yeah, Rex, stop beating the cripple. <laughs> No, carry on, because it's really, I would never, it's really enjoyable. I'd never beat a cripple. Also... I'd fucking put him in the back of the caravan and let him get <laughs> eat by bees, eaten by bees. <laughs> and um, laugh at him. Green Regent visits a bedridden dad dude. I don't, I don't remember if anything significant happens there. Um, she gives, just gives the audience some exposition. She says, it's what, what we feared has come to pass. The elf has arrived or something. I think, the, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. What we feared has come to pass. That's the show. Yeah, we'll get more on that actually in the opening of the next episode. But here we are, the famous scene. They are at the back of the caravan. Famous they are unable to pull their cart very well, uh, which was interesting. In that, um, I don't know. I wonder the reality of this. It's like so. So yeah, there's a lot to consider. Maybe I can get the wide shot better show what we're dealing with here. It's like, yeah, so you can see here, right? That's where they are. Caravan's there. So they've they've abandoned them, pretty much, already. Yeah. That's what great. a bunch of assholes. No. What a bunch of terrible people. I hope they all get eaten by bees. I need you to understand, there is a lot of people in this caravan who are just walking. Now, I'm not saying that that means like, you're not exerting any, you know, stress at all. You are, you are. But I mean, they're having a good time. Are, they're laughing. They're having. We're having a great time. We the, love it. The big reason why the Brandyfoots are not going to be able to make it is because one of their family members is not up to full strength. He's at like what you could call half, or maybe even a third. Whatever. Yeah. So, you know, you guys have neighbors, presumably. 
you might be like, well, we've got, you know, three sons, and the dad and the mum and maybe a daughter or something. We can, you know, old, old Benny here, you go you go help the the Brandyfoots. You take the position, because, like, they've helped us out. Because they're know? our friends, yeah. yeah. We've known them for decades. We grew up with them, and we, we, we don't want them to die horribly in the wilderness and be eaten by bees. Um, this is just baffling, and it shouldn't happen. And you should never consider the Hoffords good people after this. This is horrifying. And and I was what? Just um, the reason looking. why he's hurt is because none of you jerks helped him while he was trying to do all the work yeah, in the town. Yeah, he got. And now he wasn't. Like, he's yeah, condemned to death. Him and his whole family. Because he tried to help entertain be... the town or village. Yeah. Exactly. He got hurt helping you guys. It's not like he was him hauling around, fucking off somewhere in the wilderness doing something he shouldn't have been doing. And No, he got hurt helping you guys for your stupid fucking festival where you laugh at people who are dead. Yeah. And ah, it's prophetic. I guess he should have known better. There's another dark element to this as well, because, you know, Podge is using her, like, lugging her caravan on her own. I think the implication is, and I might, it might even be said in the show, her parents are amongst the list of the dead, which means in that earlier scene, she is sitting there and she is listening as Lenny Henry reads out and does posthumous trolling about the fact that they, and probably including her, ate her parents. Yeah, so I actually don't need, now that you've said that, I want to just recognize, like, yeah, she's just pulling her own car, I guess. What the fuck is the wrong with this community? <laughs> Twisted and wrong. I, I think it's just one of those, an example of what happens when you're a really bad writer. It <laughs> yeah. seeps into what you write. And so now like, you might not have wanted it, but you have written a, a little mini civilization of evil, terrible, cruel people that I, I, I can't care for. The thing is, is that you, you, can, you could retain the core concept of like a caravan that's moving around that has to make difficult choices uh, when like people in their community fall very ill or like when Get really they old. actually do something that's like a serious breach like yeah with the choices, elderly they should they should have a system know? for this because of old people you we're not going to leave grandma behind like, we like grandma we're going to carry her on the well, car like, i guess can't... what i'm saying is the scenario that you could put forth is one where their choice really isn't great where like yeah where you force sardox to make it a tough decision yeah, and maybe, like, you know that there's imminent danger, right? Like, maybe you see the tracks of, like, some cr critter that's not very friendly, and, like, yeah. somebody is seriously ill, and you just don't have the resources to take care of them. And it's like, well, do we keep trying to take care of them and potentially endanger everybody else here, or do we make the really difficult choice to actually leave someone behind? Rather yeah, and even then, leave them behind where... with, like, here, we'll, we'll make yeah, a place like... for you to hide out, we'll, we'll leave you some provisions, we'll try to come back but, yeah, later if we can. Rather than just walking off and leaving them to die. Like, when the difficult choice comes, if it does come because of the scenario presented in the story, you see, like, just how compassionate they are. Instead of, you got hurt because none of us were helping you, and your daughter was helping another person. Uh, because of that, you're all condemned to death. We're gonna leave you here. To, and the worst part is, it's like, we're gonna let you try to keep up. We're gonna, like, yeah. entertain the notion yeah. that you can continue Dude, to be part of our society. Look at how and jolly the whole family. Be on the horizon. Look at how jolly the they family. are, abandoning them. Yeah. It's nuts. Exactly, yeah, they're laughing, having a great time. Like, what is this? Like, am I meant to like these people? <laughs> like, they're, they're horrible. I forgot, did we get a scene of uh, Broken Foot, like, telling his family, you've got, well, I guess... No, he's a give me a moment to get my breath. Yeah, they're still just sort of. Then he, then they get interrupted by the. They're like rushing. <laughs> this, is, this is our chance Meanwhile, to abandon them, guys. Go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Fuck those guys. Fuck, fuck all five of them. That whole family. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I just can't believe it. It's it's terrible, and it just condemns the harvest to never being likable. This is a yeah. permanent blotch on their record. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? It, it's basically like, just, it's, it's, it's virtually murder. Nori helps someone and she gets punished for it. 
And not in only that does she get punished, her whole family gets punished too. A new family yeah. established yeah. that in universe she is being punished for being a good person and she shouldn't. Yeah. What is wrong with like, this? Like, yeah, Nori shouldn't listen to any of you. Your 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 entire like culture is terrible. She'd be like, I don't want to be in your caravan anyway. Your caravan sucks. You guys are psychopaths. I don't want to be any part of that. We're gonna go with this new guy from the sky and we're gonna do something. The fact that they can't even be evil, like, with some recognition of how bad they are, that they do it, like, smiling gleefully. Uh, what, smiling they gleefully? As opposed some... to smiling <laughs> unhappily. It's like, the, South Park, a... the South Park episode with the Christmas critters. You could like, they're really, really cute and oh, cheerful, God, and then yeah. they just start pissing in people's eyes sockets. And then that's Happy tree what friends. They, they are Christmas critters. It's, yeah, so, not much else to say. Uh, they, they fucking put their two remaining brain cells together and think, oh yeah, the big tall guy, he could probably help. And I think the best part of this is that they hear noises and they like get spooked and then he like turns up. And the thing about it is, it's like, wait a sec, the carriage like moves he? as though something has gotten out of it. And it's like, was he hitching a ride this whole <laughs> time? Steve the whole there's way. no way there's room in there. Like, well, yeah, I was confused he, at first as well, because it does up, shake like he's getting out the back. If he killed up in there, which I think is what is the, the suggesting is happening, and I can't fucking believe it, because that means he slowed them down and didn't help. <laughs> it's just it's an asshole. They would have been fine if he hadn't just been ah. snoozing in the back of the damn caravan. I think, I, Art, I so I guess what's going to happen is they're going to use him to pull the cart. He's going to catch up to everyone, they're going to be like, see, he's really well, helpful he's, after all. And then they put him the to cart. work. And then they're like, ah, how can we use this poor Sam to advance our interests and goals? Well, they, they're like, well, if he's going to stay, that, well, it, it should be, he has, Sardok has the thought that he should have had. I was like, oh, he, I guess he's, he doesn't seem to be that dangerous, actually. He just seems to be like a lost old man in the woods who thinks that Nori's his friend. This could yeah. help us immensely if he's just looking for a place to hang out. Dude, well, we're going to have that scene where Sardok is talking to some random uh, about, like, did the Brandyfoots make it? Did they make it? Are they here? And it's like, no, no. And everyone's like, oh, no. And then they, they, they look, they're like, wait, wait, what's that? And they squint and they see in the distance, there they are. They've made it. And the creepy old man is doing it. What? And then, yeah, it'll cut to them being like, I guess he can stay. I, I, I guess so. And yeah. everyone will be happy and we'll love the Hoffoots. What a great and wonderful community. And we'll, We're going to get we'll, that yeah. montage of him putting up all the buildings and he's doing it so easy. He's putting up the big awning and no one breaks their foot. And he just does everything so great. It's like, wow, he's it's amazing. He's like the giant who helps us out. And the thing about it is, like, when we review that, we're going to be like, you know when he's saying, like, did they make it? It's like, why are you asking that as if you couldn't have done anything about this? Like, oh, what a shame. I'm good. You can walk back the trail. Like you could, you could get everyone you want to get to wherever they go, and they'd be like, "I'm gonna go back and help them." But no, no, they're not gonna it's entertain a, that either. The whole point is like, where, where's the cutoff point before they go back to help? So like, they get to the destination, they look back down the road, and they see them maybe I don't know, forty feet away. Well, that's fine that they've made it. Okay, eighty feet away. You know, they're, they're still in sight, so they've made it. 160 feet away. Do you, do you just walk back a few yeah, we feet can't just to see find them. <laughs> where they are? Or is it just out of eyesight, out of mind? And that's they're it. They're like, oh, dead. we can't even see them, but we can hear them screaming for help and begging <laughs> us to come and assist them. It's uh, really, really close, but I can't see them. So they want it to be whimsical. Down. It's just terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not whimsical at all. <laughs> this is not whimsy. No. This is not whimsy at all. This is not whimsy. I would, God, I would be so furious with the, the stupid-ass Harfords in general if I was here for any of this. If I was just a part of a different family and I was like, I'll help them out. Yeah, they've got one dude with one bad foot. We just need to give shocked. them one healthy like, person. That's what? it. Help them out? Like, what do you mean? And you know, oh, I could help pull their cart. Like, no, wait. they have to die. What? They Is that to, allowed? They have to die. They have to die. They got left behind. We don't know what... The, we. It, mm. You don't want to live behind two. We have to wait for them. them to die, then collect the corpses to eat. That's that's the rule. Yeah, like as as they're we dying, have to eat the just, berries. Man, it sounds like a horror movie. As they're there on the ground, like writhing in agony, the whole just blank faced staring. You have um, <laughs> as they're dying. You have Nori, <laughs> who's like 
Nori's rattling breaths as she's like slowly about to die. All of her family are dead around it, and then like there comes yeah. Sardok, grabs one by the foot and drags them away, and he's like, "I'll come back for you <laughs> later." This is like, <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Like, I, 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 no, I like the idea that they, they are not allowed to kill them themselves. They do just stand around and wait for them to die. Them. Yeah. Like, yeah. As long as it takes, just in a circle, days at a time. Totally glass eyed. You're good, yeah, just just at them. Smiling <laughs> you know? vacantly. It's like when Joe Pilato gets ripped in half in Day of the Dead and they're just like. Yeah, they just they just they just tuck in. And the thing is, like, uh, I could picture if all of them were on their last breaths, the, all the Harfoots, Brandyfoots, sorry. And then the, the Harfords show up. They would all be smiling. They're like, yep, we didn't make it. Feel free to feast on our corpses. That's how this works. Thank you so much, guys. Sorry we couldn't make it. Off we go. Oh, they're dead now. It's an unwitting horror movie that they've created. <laughs> yeah, like someone just being like, you know, sacrifice me to the gods for the greater good or whatever. It's just like, ugh. And the episode's not even over. Oh, God, this is going to take ages to talk about. This scene's terrible. It's the one where they try oh, to escape. Dude, it's been... It's nearly five Oh my hours. god, we're yeah, we have the whole episode. hilarious escape scene. Oh, oh my god. gosh, you're right, this isn't the end. No, and this. we got a lot to talk about as well. Dude. Oh, we do. What, what are we supposed oh, to do? There's too much for we're us to cover. We're supposed to soldier forth. <laughs> All right, everyone, order your pizzas and grab your drinks. We're going to be here talking I don't, about I don't, this. Yeah. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I don't think we'll be able to do Super Chats tonight. It'll be either the next episode or Super Chats. We can't be doing both. Um... I don't. I, well, we'll see what chat says about that. I'd be curious. I don't know. I think they're going to vote for the episode, probably, aren't they? Those bastards. I have to figure out because the thing is, next Wednesday is another bonus EFAP episode. We we we've got that much shit to do. We've got that many episodes planned. Oh God, I didn't expect this to take this long. The first two episodes we covered went way quicker than this. Well, we were done with the first two episodes by now. Because there was, yeah, there was so much nothing, but now that we're starting <laughs> to get some, I get payoffs, you could call them, eh? or things to, I don't know, this one's more thick. It's thick, it's still boring, but it's thick boring. I just, I like the fact that the first two episodes is basically, why aren't you doing stuff? And then when they start doing stuff in episode three, it's, why are you doing stuff? Stop it. It's all terrible. Stop doing stuff. Exactly. Just, no, too much stuff to cover. Well, I think I summarized it with the title of the stream. I said, Rings of Power continues to exist. Like, that's a problem. We have to stop it. We can't. Keeps existing. Well, may as well get started, eh? So, we're <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah, that's right. Keep in. to it. And is this seriously how this fucking scene opens? I couldn't even remember. Yeah, they're all, like, giving glances <laughs> to each other, like, we go do something now, this is gonna be it. Here, here it comes. Time for a prison Legit. break. Look at this. It's like, what, what is happening here? What is... What? what? Did you go... <laughs> like, what is that? The guy wasn't even facing you. You could have just wrapped the chain around his neck and broken the neck or strangled him. Instead, you try and whip him. Ugh. This is the point where I started to laugh when he's this fighting I mean. with the chain. We have to go so slow because this is all so fucking bad. So you, you get that whip, and I guess that orc is just done. He's out. You know, that, 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 that's going to that's gonna get... And then you he whips someone else, and down goes that orc. Stop whipping with the chains. It looks so stupid. Got him again. Oh, oh God. Why? This isn't even the part that I remembered. Like, this is, this is not the part that I want to be critical of. Whipping people and stuff. But yeah, so they start grabbing the hoods off the orcs that are currently, like, slave driving them to make them sizzle in the sun. And I'm starting to wonder, like, does it kill them or does it just hurt them? No. It's not supposed to do either of those things. They don't like it. Like, they're scared of it because in it hurts them. Originally, the, the, there is no sun and there is no moon in Middle Earth. So when the Valar, having lost the trees and lost the the Silmarils, they decide well, we need we need to give some light to Middle Earth. So they send two of the two of their number two of the gods up, essentially to the heavens. One forms the moon. One forms the sun. Um, Melkor or Morgoth, who creates the orcs, didn't anticipate this. He fears it. The orcs have never known anything but darkness. They don't like it. It weakens them. They don't see well in it. But they're not fucking vampires. They don't fry to death in the sun. Or they're not supposed to. <laughs> well, they do now. 
Well, they do now, but then again, but also they don't do now because, like, sometimes some of them do, and then some of them don't. Because earlier they were standing out in the sun with only the helmets and the clothes on, but the faces weren't frying. But in this one, if you take the helmet off, then they fry again. But then later, if they they're out in the sun, they they don't fry. They just sort of moan. you are correct. And they then, are very inconsistent oh, on it. Nothing makes sense. Um, check out this. By the way, this guy's going to strike Elfman, and. It looks like with the amount of force that's coming in with that, that, that chain there, that, just, that ain't stopping him. He would have cut right through that arm. But uh, obviously the action. He actually does hit him on the shoulder there, from what I'm seeing. It looks like it's connecting. Um, he, sh he should... What I'm trying to say is that when you try and block with a chain like that, there's going to be enough of an... Uh, not elasticity, but enough of a um, slack that, yeah. that it's not going to be able to stop the sword in time that it's going to cut the arm for sure. Um, but it's okay, he got him. Because he's, he's Elfman. He's our main Elfman. He's going to be fine. Uh, oh, God. What happens next? I remember hating everything about this. So, yeah, everything they're all... Is, yeah, I hated it, but it did make... This whole scene was hilarious. I laughed so much during this whole thing. It was so silly that I, I couldn't help myself. I was cackling like someone in a straitjacket. They all the orcs like it was really nice have been defeated except one, and so he's now ran off to go and like do the equivalent of you know setting off the alarm. Like the the slaves are doing a thing, and then our our collection of slaves here have lined up all of their chains to make like a a singular point to break, and they're all just you know hitting one after each other, which to me is like this is probably the 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 most okayest part of all of this that it's like. The way they've done this is that if they break any one chain, it'll represent like breaking one slave out. It's like, oh, okay, that's probably pretty efficient. Yeah, this will be like a, a, a constant thing. This is almost like our ticking, you know, clock, our bomb that's going to go off in a sense where you could see progress happening. We're trying to rescue everyone. So they're going to stick with this concept. I think that'll be really cool to see. Yeah, no, um, for establishing focus, on, stakes, yeah. focus on one chain to break one chain. So you, you so, at least freed someone to either defend you or the to thing run is, off and get help. Technically speaking, they should all be aware that is what they're doing. The top chain will break first. Uh, all the axes are hitting that first, so... But it's going to be... Surely the impact will be lessened by the fact that it's laying on multiple other chains. Well, I, assume... I, think it'll, I think it'll help because otherwise it would just be on dirt, which is going to give a bit more. And I think oh, yeah, the yeah. chain are probably the, a good idea here. Plus they can focus all their... Everyone could just keep going and going and going. Either way, it seems to cut... But then, like, one girl runs off, and while the rest of them seem to still be chained. And so I was immediately like, no, continue. Break all of your chains when you've got the maximum amount of power, which is everybody with those axes and swords, right? You oh, don't just have I... one run off whenever you break one. Oh, no. Oh, you and I read this differently then. I thought she was just running to save her own skin. Really? Yeah, that's what I got. Oh, so, like, this is bad that she's doing that. Like the, the, the yeah. from the point of view of the characters too, because I thought this was part of the plan or I, something. There is the dialogue no, I, earlier in the scene though, when they says, "As soon as one of you gets a chance to go over, yeah. go make for the tree line and go and get help." Oh wow! So she so instead of oh, this is what I mean. Okay. I mean, it, why not it, it's make dumb most in this context? Make but... most use of your resources when you have the maximum amount of axe power or sword power, whatever it is. Break as many of you out as you can until the very moment the first set of orcs start to come to get you, and then all of you scatter and try and get out of this trench. If that's the plan. Instead of drip feeding elves to the orcs to stop you. Exactly. They, they, the best thing that can happen is the elves come one at a time. So, like, this is a terrible idea, especially because um, you have no idea what's above that trench. You're just hoping. I mean, I guess our elf dude saw above it earlier, but still. Have, yeah, I you guess. You don't know what's going to be up there right now. So... Especially with alarms going off and stuff. But what I don't understand is that this lot are elves and villagers with, with weapons that they seem to know how to use. And then Elfman, our main Elfman, he should be able to take out several orcs on his own, I would imagine. Especially when you're in the sun and they fucking hate it and you're free of your chain. He seems like you've got... We'll, we'll get to what actually happens in a sec. But my point is just that focus on breaking everyone's chains. Then you have all of you as warriors, essentially. And then... If you really want to go up the trench, go up the trench. But I would probably recommend you got a shit ton of slaves. You can set up a revolt. All of them, you know, just your standard, you wrap Something your chain you around. 
Um, you, 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 you can... All the people who are currently chained up can basically help you. They'll be limited in their helping, but they can help. They can throw things, they can wrap their chains around some of the captors. If you've got six guys free, you can start a chain reaction, you might even say. <laughs> um, so, there's lots of ideas for the plan. But that's what they do. She just runs off and then she gets killed. You're like, oh. And, and then they all start getting, like, grabbed. And it's like, man, if you just continued your fucking plan of breaking the chain, but oh well. Well, if, and that is just, like, a plan in the most generous sort of sense, because the, the element in this show that you could have is an interesting one of your plots turns into, like, a prison break. All of these elves and whoever it is, it could, it could be men, elves, everyone you've got, right? Escaping their bondage from these orcs, right? That could be an interesting side plot. We can learn a little bit about orcs. We can learn about some of these people under pressure, like the elves and whatnot, and how they talk. They formulate a plan. They think about it. They talk to the other prisoners. How long have you been here? Where are you from? And that's the, here's our plan. And like, and they come, they come up with a plan. And then we finally, after a while, see that plan executed. And yeah. it could have been so much better than this. And if you wanted to have that scene where you could have had the this, this, this clump of survivors, this big group, um, actually escape and make it to the trees and they're being pursued by orcs the whole way. So you can have your action scenes in your tension of oh, who's going to die, who are the orcs going to get, um, how can they make it back to essentially civilization while they're being pursued and it turns into a long like chase sequence you can cut back to, to break up the more monotonous elements of this uh, production. You can always go back to that chase scene, which is exciting um, and the stakes are high, so you you could you didn't have to knock out all the elves essentially here. You could have staggered them out a little bit better, probably wiser narratively. Yeah, because you course. need to keep Don Lemon needs to stay because he obviously has to be brought before the guy that they are going to again try and persuade us is Sauron later on. So he needs to stay, but there's no reason, as you say, that they can't actually have... You could even leave the question open. You wouldn't even necessarily need to show much of the chase. You can leave the question open. If you free a lot of the elves and they all manage to make it out except for him, A, it's a noble sacrifice on his part that he's enabled them to escape. B, you then have the intriguing aspect of, well, did they make it? And sort of the implication would yeah. probably have to be that they didn't. But again, that would have been, that would have been, as you say, much more sort of enjoyable to watch. They probably could have saved time doing it. And they wouldn't have had to introduce, well, the thing we'll see Well, later. dude, imagine he did, like, we did actually care about all of these people. They did get over that trench. He sees them escape, and he had to make that sacrifice, like he said. He gets taken in, and then they release him with a message. And he's almost confused, because he's like, you know, why why release me? Well, basically, he's just, he's, he's, he's let out, and he's walking through the, like, orc-controlled village, and he just, like, sees all of the friends that he thought escaped are all just strung oh, up as shit. an example or something. That, yeah. See, that would be amazing. Wish they'd done that. They didn't make it, sort of thing. But again, like, it even if they did that, of different things. it would have been frustrating, because, again, we don't know any of these people, but they've had plenty of time to for us to get... They've had so much yeah, time. Yeah, these guys don't... They don't like die heroically to defend our main elf. They don't. Well, they don't really speak and act in a way that I really get to learn about their characters and personalities. Though of course that's something that should have been established before we got here. We don't. It's just the way they did it was terrible. It, I don't tell anything from this. Your, exactly. Opportunities. The opportunities before them. Yeah. For like potency, narrative potency. And, yeah. Instead, yeah. we're fucking around with these slow-mo scenes and just all kinds of stuff. I also it's have an editing criticism. Wasting time. Oh. So, yeah. Lady gets... Uh, they break the chain. She sees that. It's acknowledged. She starts running off. This is the plan. Get up that trench. Oh, she doesn't make it because someone threw a sword at her, I guess. And then they all go, holy shit. The orcs are here. How didn't we know? Like, we probably should have been paying attention to that. To, apparently, in the time it took for her to go from that circle up there to the top of the trench and then get killed, they didn't They didn't think to check if the orcs were here yet. This was a surprise, I guess. Oh, like, so okay. Yeah, she didn't. No, neither She's, did she, she yeah. Didn't either, no. And then there's a I feel pull. Like I'd be looking. They show us an orc pulling, and some dude gets pulled, and he gets dragged into the abyss, essentially. He's like, blah! And it's just like, oh. And as that's happening, the pa camera pans up to all these orcs who are pulling chains. And you're like, wait, what? Oh. So that guy got pulled into into the place, and then these guys are all pulling as well. So is that all our guys are caught off guard then? They're all on surprise, right? And it's like, no, they're in the middle of a tug of war. What? 
I when did they do the tug of war? Yeah, oh god, I remember. Oh, oh, that's really bad. Like, that is, uh, yeah, I guess that's really it, bad. Now, yeah, all of your chains were in that like star pattern on the ground. Like, I. But now we're all you, here. That's really I, bad. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty bad. I guess they probably filmed a more coherent action scene, but they edited it like shit. Well, and they cut it. I guess. I guess so. It's like that She-Hulk thing, right, in episode one, where you clearly cut stuff. Yeah. And now, like, it's hard to follow. Because it seems that something that's really important in terms of these fights and communicating a fight is making sure that people know what happens, like, in between, I guess you could say, the focal points. Like, if this is the main thing that we're doing right now, we need the, the shot that shows us what happened. Otherwise, it's just difficult to keep track of what's going on. By the way... Pretty sure the girl to the right there, she's an elf, and the guy to the left of main dude is an elf as well. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, if that other girl that got killed was an elf, it's like, if you had five elves with weapons, surely you guys can take down at least a few feel, orcs, right? Yeah, like, when you're you here, so? we, can, we can probably fight them off extremely easily, because there's five of us, and they have to funnel towards us And then anyway. you've got a shit ton of villagers as well, who, yes, they're not necessarily trained, but they know how to tackle someone, you know? Yeah, they can help you. Just, you. Yeah, absolutely they can help. And even if they can't help, then, I mean, I mean, they can do something. Here, here's a sharp stick, or here's just pull this chain, or do this, or go and g get weapons for us. We're elf warriors, get weapons for us. Go pick up some weapons. Yeah, they're just doing this tug of war thing, and obviously the stakes there are that they pull them in and them get... they're doomed. But if they pull the orcs into the sunlight, that might give them a victory, and so then it might hurt them a little bit, I guess. They're wearing clothes though, but main elfman is like, I have an idea. I will jump up the chain and slice down the the wooden beam that's holding he the thing. And on you're right, he jumps on the chain. Yeah. As they're all holding these chains, he like runs on the chain instead of the perfectly good earth. He runs on these chains, yeah, flies is, up, and then... It is funny. Because, like, they all have their sun-protective clothing, but it just doesn't work anymore as soon as he reveals the sun to them. You know what I mean? Like, it, they've all got yeah. the stuff they wear when they go out in the sun, but then the sun hits them, and they're like, ah, no. Some of them just, their hoods just come off. It's like, put the hood back on? I don't know. Uh, Good God. Also, this thing's flimsy as fuck. Yeah. yeah you could geez. cut one thing one and the whole beam. thing comes down. Yeah, like I um, guess I could forgive the. Orc I thought the whole point but, of this hmm. was to have a really good canopy that protects you from the sun. I thought that's the whole point. I guess of they didn't think about someone hitting that spot yeah, with yeah, an yeah. axe, yeah. but I guess like, your prisoners. You, uh, yeah, I guess it is kind of high up, but like even then, also, I, I guess I'm curious how it. he knew that would happen because he seems very confident that this will uh, happen when he hits the no, axe there. I guess you got no other options, right? Like you might as well give it a try. He was. They had plenty of other things he could have been done. Wow! Well, yeah, it's true. That's chain, right. I have a um, <laughs> okay, okay. You guys got to see this. All right. What is that girl doing? Is she hitting the dirt? She's yeah, missing. she's not hitting she's anything. Not hitting <laughs> she's... Oh no! <laughs> Dude, you had fight. Nah, come on. 500 million dollars. Come on. What's the, you, you dude, what's the, the guy in the back on the screen? right doing? He's picking up a stick and then just hitting the floor. He's just <laughs> hitting the ground? Or maybe he's hitting his chain with a <laughs> stick? I don't, I don't see any chain. Is this is a stick, like, Rags. Sorry. What's a stick going to do to a chain? No, sorry, maybe sorry, dumb. sorry. I, <laughs> there's a guy trying to break the chain with his head. He's pulling it apart with his head. He's trying to break it apart. He's trying to pull the chain's apart with his hands. <laughs> Maybe I can just pull this chain apart with my hands. Oh my god. It looks as well like the other, the other dude on the left is just hitting his own leg with the fucking knife. Oh the guy, god. Look at the guy on, a, on the- yeah, the guy on the left is just sort of- he's got just like a stick? Yeah. You had this in the god. editing bag, you're like, yeah, this is good. <laughs> Humans in this show are actually retarded. No wonder they made it still. with his hands! Uh, Look at uh, all these barbarians, <laughs> compared to the elf organization, these fucking barbarians just trying to pull the- like, they don't know what metal yeah, is. Pretty sure <laughs> the guy in front of as well. Like, you were swinging that- that sword really close to that guy's arm. I he is! Say. Is yeah, so yeah. she looks like she's about to hit the guy's fist. Like, she's about to crush What's it with her hammer or whatever is that is. Why is this like, fist there? Too? 
I don't know. He's holding the chain, but is he trying to rip it? Like, what's he I doing? I don't know what anyone is doing in this scene. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> you filmed it. You saw it happening. <laughs> what are you and doing? You, <laughs> it's literally like you a joke it scene. The, you it's like it a your squad versus game. my squad. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have to put this in, but you did. My team versus the enemy team. You could have <laughs> this cut this is shot. Your team. You legit didn't have to have this shot. You could have left it out. But you did. But you left Actually, it I'm in. Almost getting like. Monty Python peasant vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fighting in the dirt. You have the elves, the civilized, organized elves. Ching, 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 ching. I did, they dude, got I legit. All planned out. And then you pull to the humans in the dirt and the mud, just like trying to pull the chains apart with their hands oh, or hitting the dirt itself. Swatting their own ankles with sticks. I yeah. don't even know which is my favorite. They're all so funny. You can't hit their ankles, they'll get left behind. I think it's the guy trying to rip the chain apart. I think that might be my favorite. That's pretty fucking funny, honestly. <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm particularly <laughs> tempted by the guy with the stick and he's found like an ant he wants to kill or something. He's just like... <laughs> he really I he's like how casual he end. is as well. He's so casual. Yeah, he's, he's, he's just like, eh, you know. Where is the director saying, guys, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I know you're extras, but goddamn. Well, they told them to do this. Right? Like, <laughs> I, I, like, I, like, well, or they told, them, they told them to just generally do something, and they didn't fucking care. Like, at what... <laughs> Like, like, this is obviously the this, director's fault. Chill. It's also the fault of these people. Oh, for come being on. So they didn't spend stupid. that much money know. on this. This is a cheap be fair, they, are, they are probably like they're, they're Amazon warehouse workers on the <laughs> shift. That's probably what they're doing. That's true. Do you, want to be an extra, do you want to be an extra in the Amazon movie? Like, <laughs> I do just want to go home. No, yes. you're going to be a fucking we'll extra. Take you outside. Yeah, this is what they have to do on their toilet break. This is. This is it. This is just this is just footage from the Amazon warehouse. <laughs> it's an actual escape attempt by the workers. <laughs> they just put it into the show. <laughs> All the peasants in squalor in the mud trying to break their chain so they can <laughs> leave work and go home. I just <laughs> like just as well. Put it in the show. You know, the lady there, she was probably like, I, I think I missed my chain again and again. And then they were like, we'll fix it in post. And they just like CGI her arm over or something. <laughs> like, but they ran out of money. <laughs> it's so funny. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, it's just, I'm just watching it. In my eyes. See, she caught me because I was. She was like, she's almost the center of the uh, the camera. And then I was just like, wait a minute. She's not looking at There's what other things doing. happening. <laughs> <laughs> if I just pull really hard, the chains will break. That's how that works, right? It's like, oh my god. It really is like Monty Python peasants just randomly <laughs> stacking dirt or something. <laughs> The guy with the big stick looks so, like, <laughs> bored. He's just like, eh, I'll give He's it a like, shot. I guess I'll escape, I don't know. <laughs> if this works out, that'd be great. I guess like, I could go his... home. Uh... Oh, man. What, what is this? Oh, what are we doing? I don't even think that guy has a sword. I think that's just a stick. It's unclear. Like, I'll try and find it. A... I'll try and see if I can... Is he uh... in, like, does that... Prop in another scene, it maybe? It looks like a dagger of some sort. I think sort. it's a dagger, but it's... Yeah, it is. Is it? It's very, it looks um... like it's got, like, little, um... You know, like, the ends of a rope where it's got a... How much I describe it? Yeah, it looks the like it's got a bunch of, a of rope. frays on the, uh... On the, kind on the, of. Um, on yeah, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's like a root and those are parts... It's hard to tell. I, I want to find this prop in another... He pulled the tree root out and then started bashing the homemade his chain with the tree root. knife thing, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna... Hmm. Change to maybe I want to get I want to get to the scene and <laughs> it doesn't help that the elves look just like identical to everyone else except for the pointed ears. Elves used to have this sort of like they looked like a yeah. different race than humans and now they're just they're just humans with pointy ears. Like you you can you can't look at a crowd and tell who's who anymore. Every every species is so incredibly multiracial. It's kind of weird. It's sort of you have to ask how much money does it look like they spent on their hair? <laughs> and if it's above sixty dollars, they're probably elves. And if it's under sixty dollars, it's probably men. But it's not a, a cast iron guarantee. How much do they spend on this moment? Is what I want to know. Man has not invented shampoo. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. So that's happening, and I don't know what the orcs would be worrying about at this point. Like they'll probably kill themselves if they get out of this trench. So. Kind of solves its own, solves the problem itself. 
But yes, he's like, get the wog. And it's like, oh my god, they're gonna release oh a big wolfy doggo on him. It's gonna be scary. Um, and so obviously, they don't want to work together to kill this thing. They want to attack it one by one incompetently, because that would be the probably the best thing to do, I think. And yeah, yeah the really, really, and I hate this. I mean, the warg fight was hilarious, but it was very dumb. What do you think about the look of the warg, by the way? I like it. Awful. I really? like it too. I like it yeah. a lot. Absolutely. Oh, it I, looks it looks very much like an animal. It looks like a beast you could find out in the wild. It's got like dog elements to it and I I actually really like it. It looks like I a totally, pug that's just spent three generations just, breeding with its own sister. That's fine. <laughs> that's looks, fine. I think this looks like an appropriately less evil sort of beast creature. I I I dig it. Um, I could believe if I went into the spooky ass fucking woods, I might run into one of these creatures. Oh no! See, like, okay, maybe for a still image, I'd agree, but yeah, I, I'm yeah, but it's always very much put off right? by the movement, like, which it, it's it always. Like are we it's... talking about? Oh, like, are we talking about its animation quality, or are we talking about its design? Because uh... I like the design a lot. I'd have to see the. Well, everything in this whole fight is is weird from an animation style, like the way that the elf flips through the air and everything, but. See, I'm, I'm I'd have to... very cool on the design, and I very much hate the animation. So yeah, but I mean, I, I... I think the animation is always what betrays like these effects, isn't it? Like you can, it seems like it's not. Uh, it's not that it's not difficult. It's that it's very much possible to create something that, like, as a still image, looks pretty photorealistic. But then once it starts moving, it's like ah, it's not real. Like you, you know, it's not real. I'm, I'm overall, I guess. I think it's what they chose to animate it doing, which is getting it for me more than the animation generally itself. They oh, have, I, I, oh, he's got four nostrils. But it's, it's, like, the it's absent in the way that it's moving. Like you can see it now, right? Like he's kind moving. of, he's, yeah. He feel like he um, has any. Heft. Like he doesn't have any weight or heft to him. Yeah, whereas like the Balrog looks heavy. Like he looks. The like Balrog a does look heavy. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, there's an easy compare, compare it to the wags you saw in the two towers. I mean, that's that's what two thousand and well, yeah. I wasn't. I didn't want to invoke them, but I way prefer them to this one myself. But yeah. I haven't got much to say on exactly why. I'm not fond of this I, uh, myself. Uh, he's, in he's, terms of just the look, I think so. He uh, he's given off weird vibes to me, but I'm, I'm struggling to explain more so than that. I haven't got much. You think he's given off. Edgy, the hedgy vibes. A little bit, yeah. Um, with the, sp <laughs> the the little spike. Is he wearing like a spike collar? Oh, uh, well, that's not his be. fault. That's the orc's fault. That's not his fault, exactly. Yeah, Mahler. Just like it's not Shadow the Hedgehog's fault that what he's the ultimate life form. <laughs> yeah, he didn't ask for this, Mahler. <laughs> he just happens to be the ultimate life form. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think. If if we took away all like the bones that the orcs put in its hair, because the the orcs are you know they're they're sensible about that that sort of thing, you know. But uh, yeah, I I like legit like this creature in terms like of like too. being a ferocious beast. I don't want this thing anywhere the fuck near me. Well, that's not that's you know whether you want to keep him as a pet, I guess is a different conversation. Yeah, in in its incarnation, I, if I was his like we, if you had a nice warg and and you got along, he'd be great. You know, he could. And plus, this is clearly a warg not in their ideal form. Like it's got it. It looks like it's you know it's it's like orcs kept it. It's not it's like it's been eyes green. are pointing in different directions. I know it's great. I love that. Okay. Because that means it can keep track of two people at once. So yeah, yeah. man. But I, I like the idea that it's just sort of they're looking off into somewhat different directions. Well, there's a good chance it's been has it been tortured possibly or fucked with by the orcs? Probably, uh, to in some yes. degree to make it like angry and upset and agitated. But like, most um, of the really evil creatures as well have sort of come about through like long periods of I guess you'd call it selective breeding, or in this case, not especially selective breeding, or maybe even overly selective breeding. But like, I think this is like an, a prototype wag. So this, this is what is the royal corgis are going to become now. <laughs> Those fucking sex bots are back. No. Are they? I what thought they I got rid of them because I found a really cool way to stop them. Damn oh. you. I hope they don't. If they start turning up more often, we'll have to keep track of what emojis they're typically using. When you said those fucking sex bots are back, I had to look at the screens. Like I don't remember those in Rings of Power. <laughs> and then the sex bots come back. Um, 
So yeah, anyway, the wog anyway. fight begins, and it's so awful. It hurts. It's so funny. It is so... Um, <laughs> I was thinking to myself, like, oof, yeah, this this could be tough. This could be tough. This is, and she immediately grabs a spear, and I was like, first of all, what the fuck is wow, a spear doing fair. here? Like... Yeah, where did that enter the... Right here, the, next play? to all of you prisoners? I just don't know hmm. why there's a spear here, but yeah, there's a spear here, so let's make yeah, use of it. It's like, now, uh, and I was thinking to myself, like, you know what? That's a fantastic weapon for this animal. Like, absolutely. That's good. You Even can plant distance. it, but oh god, <laughs> like, just idiot. God oh, damn it! <laughs> this is one of those like, <laughs> did you just want to die? Was that what that was? Like, I what? guess this elf had just had enough. Oh, charge at it. You hold the spear, like, really close to the, I guess we call it the pointy end, right? I don't know the spear anatomy, okay? The head? But like, the head of the, the spear? Tip, yeah, the, pointy the head of the spear. The tip of the spear. You put your hands real close to it and then charge it. Like the salt of the tip. Well, yeah, if I, I'll summarize with, with imagery, right? So she pulls it out and then spins it almost and then starts running toward it while spinning the spear. What are you doing, yeah, what woman? What are you doing? And Why then, are you, what are you oh shit. It almost looks like she's. Well, now she. Like, this is not the way you should have used this weapon. Dead. However, at not the very least, possibility. from this moment, you could be like, if she aims it right, it still will do a decent amount of damage. Look at how close. Nope. She just missed. It looks like she deliberately moves away from him. I guess the problem is. Yeah, like, what happened there? What yeah, was yeah, that? What did you. Well, you're yeah, acting you... against nothing, so like, I guess, yeah, I don't know. Like, like I don't part know of what the point of a spear was. is like a spear is also kind of a repelling weapon. So it's not yeah. you're not just trying to stab the thing. You're also trying yeah. to keep the thing a long fucking way away from you. If Which you're is holding what I'm it thinking right if I'm looking next, at the damn thing. Yeah, like that's like, what you would do away. if you, you do it with charging horses. You do it with even charging elephants. You would do it with a charging dog. You don't want because the closer you are to the tip of the spear, if you go wrong or if you miss it or even if you go too deep into the thing's body, it's head is going to go right past that tip and bite you in the face and you don't want that yeah. to happen so you hold the spear further back you keep the animal away from you even if you don't kill it on the first go at least you've got leverage over it and you can keep it away no. so it can't kill you but think, no think about this as well like you're the one with the weapon nobody else really has any like proper weapons thanks for losing it like you know yeah, she's, I, she's got like, the best weapon yeah and she wastes it yeah um, but it's and, more and to apparently you could just and this thing doesn't seem to be particularly resilient to hits. It, yeah, you know, it's like many beasts if you hit them with a weapon. Yeah, yeah. But dude, a spear down um, its throat that might just put it out of commission. Doesn't it get one shotted later yeah. anyway? Yeah, like, I'm sure someone throws something. You could throw the spear at it, and it would be you could all right. I mean, it's still she not like. She it's a bit of a missed. gamble. Yeah, she probably would. But I ain't throwing that thing. I'm like, this is staying I would in just my do the forever. normal human care. thing. Hopefully, it lunges at you. You put the spear right in its fucking head, and then down it goes. There's some like anti-cavalry spears and things. You'd actually sort of you'd almost yeah. like jab the end into the ground, and you'd yeah, brace yeah. your foot against it, and then you sort of hold it there. And then you've got the extra leverage and the extra strength as well. The one thing you don't do is hold it at the tip. And the one then thing you don't do is fucking it spin it around like a off. retard when you're running toward your enemy. <laughs> what is she doing? I hate it. It's so annoying. But the thing That's we have to keep in mind. Flourish with weapons all the time and like quit. You have you are in a very dangerous situation. Your life is in jeopardy. It's not the time for showmanship. <laughs> no. Leroy Jag is indeed. Now, look at this. <laughs> First of all, the people at the really far back, I don't know what they're even doing. I, I, I don't I don't know what's going on there. Maybe they're just trying to get on with the job and be like, we're not a part of this revolt. We're chill. We, we want to be... I'm trying to pull my chains <laughs> apart back here with my hands. Don't mind me. <laughs> yeah, that's what they are. However, on her right, looks to be a guy with a chain, but plenty of slack, and he's holding a weapon. Remember, he, he would have used that to break the, one of the chains along with everyone else. To her left, Elfman. He's also chained, plenty of slack, but he's also got a weapon. The same weapon that he used to break the uh, the wooden... Uh, <clears throat> big pillar thing. Uh, and then yes. another guy behind him, who uh, presumably also has a weapon that was just one of the ones he used to break it. Point being, within one meter of her, we have three men with uh, weapons absolutely capable of just fucking up any normal animal. You she goes down right in front of them and gets just chewed on for a good, like, 
five seconds. This infuriates me, because it means that all of them just let... Do you see that? See the guy? He's running away. He's running away. Look at him, he's out of the Help frame. Help your friend! Help your friend! Now our main character is suddenly on the floor when he was standing. Okay. Oh, he is, yeah. He felt he was so shocked by that that it just knocked him off his feet, like salt from a table. And he's grabbing a chain and he's running off to go and, like, set some kind of weird trap. Where was the third guy? Don't know. He, he had other... Th he's got other things to do. Oh, look at that spear laying there. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be cool. that I, I would be grabbing that thing the fucking second I could. That thing is my tool for... That is my path to salvation. Yeah, it's so this shitty-ass editing. Look connected to what, the, the, how did the chain get over there how i don't it, i don't know why the chain is in front of the wall yeah that doesn't make sense yeah, how does it have the did it have that chain before when it entered into the fray i don't think it did what is wait, this guy doing it didn't wait let me I'm check a, i'm gonna give you my arm <laughs> <laughs> what, what even i don't even know what to say about that that was just weird yeah, he enters um, with the chain, or I guess she enters with yeah. the chain around it, and and now suddenly the chain is in front of it? I think that they're trying to argue that the momentum of it crashing into her swings the chain from behind it to in front of it. Oh, oh, that doesn't work. Not really, and you kind of have to look out to do that, and then stupid main character is like, I'm gonna tie it to the tree instead of just killing it. You could have killed it here, you had the chance. When when an animal is eating your friend, it gives you a great opportunity to just shove an axe in its head. Oh, also, there's, another, there's a continuity error for where the, the spear falls. The spear does not fall there at all. No, no, of course not. If that not. spear would have become something important in the future and someone picked it up, that would have been an issue. Dude, imagine how shit you all have to be to not take this opportunity and to not try and help your friend. I just... God, I hate a lot of them. But yeah, seriously, I have no idea how to describe this. The the wog is like running into the camera almost, and then this guy just sort of walks in and almost feeds it his arm. But it, like, yeah, I don't know. seven seconds when it was chowing on the first chick. So what, is, is he actually holding a weapon when he's charging in there? Yes, but because he seems to actually push his weapon out of the way of its mouth as opposed to shoving it into its mouth when he's running at it. So weird. So both dead. of these people deserved it. I wouldn't have tried to help them. But <laughs> got, a, got a weapon. Oh yeah, it's too. He's not quick enough. Oh, oh, he's got he's got the sticky thing from the chain. That's the thing. That's the one. I think that's the prop wow. that they use. Yeah, I I think that's the one. I knew it would show up again. I love I love seeing familiar faces. If only anyone had done anything, you know. If anyone had done anything yes does it have the, f the the fuzz stuff on it i think it does it's hard to tell hey this is the closest you'll get to gore in this two i guess people yeah two people have been eaten and while both of them were chowed on you didn't do anything you're sitting there pulling it towards you with a chain instead of well so funnily enough he yeah. is doing at least one kind of thing but there is a guy here who is standing around doing nothing right now and we're gonna see him again in a sec I don't know oh, what. Captain Man. Yeah, Captain Man. He's just—he's just, he's just yeah, not doing anything. Not present. He has been out of out of frame, out of mind. So you might be thinking, "Aha! I've, I'm grabbing its chain. Now what's this? What's this thing gonna do?" It's like, well, Wait. we're gonna come Around. to you, right? <laughs> like I if don't that you could do this. I think that it's way stronger than you. Yeah, I'd think so too. Uh, you can't pull this thing back. But you know, uh, not a great idea anyway, because he's gonna he's gonna get you. He'll just he's... turn around, and then pulling the chain doesn't really achieve much other than hasten your death. But he's got a plan. He does have a plan. Yeah, you check this out, guys. It. Here it comes. This is a pretty cool thing he's gonna do here. He's gonna jump, and like, look how close this is. He easily could have died here, and it doesn't how... even. <sighs> It looks like the the wog kind of is it would have missed even if he had done like a normal jump, or just How like went to the side. Trip? He should have just gone to the side. That's what any normal person would do. And I guess it it flies forwards and uncontrollably so violently that it it yeah. just crashes away. Yeah. 
Because Look at the way it folds. It's so funny. She goes, whoa! No! How could this have happened? Also, we get to see it fly into the tree twice, so that's cool. Question, why did they clear all of the dirt out of the tree and not the tree when they were ordered to take out the tree? Because, um, don't think about it. Like, why is this? Because, like, it can't fall into the roots in a sense of it being becoming like a cage if there's loads of dirt it, there. You know what I mean? So they cleared all of the dirt from They cleared out the- which would have taken way longer than just clearing the whole thing out. They took the time to clear- like, clean out the roots, but leave the-, the but What? Not chop the wood as they went. What? It's like, what? Oh, yeah, and so he, like, traps it by wrapping the chain around, um... And so the awkward thing that's happening here is, like, we have Captain who's like, you know, Oh god, I gotta choose between helping you with that thing, or freeing myself and running away, I guess. And our main character is like, go, just go, do it. And um, the most annoying thing about it is it shows Captain Guy getting up. Uh, like, that's the first time we've seen him. It's like, what did he do in he this fell. whole scene? He just sort of awkwardly fell over and didn't do anything. You know how, you know how, you know, you know how, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And you might think. You know, oh, on a either I help him with the warg, or I or I free myself and run off. However, it is tied up. I could just kill it with one axe stroke to the head. Yeah. Oh, you and then, got that spear that's laying right oh, there. Oh, you got the spear too, yeah. And then we that's could maybe both pages. get out. Yeah. That would be crazy. I do care about my brethren, allegedly. And now he's going to start... Hitting his own chain with his axe again, and it's just like, why didn't you guys, like, it just reminds me of the beginning. If you had just continued to hit all of you guys, you could all have been freed. Said that weird shit with, like, first person who breaks out, go, I guess. Uh... And the wog really is actually, like, completely fucked by this weird chain tree cage thing. But the orcs are coming back out with their friend, their, their good old makeshift sun protection that didn't work for no reason temporarily. And this is the thing, it's, um, it's what Lil Platoon was saying, like, the sun is clearly on their limbs. And their face. Which apparently burns them in other scenes, but doesn't hear. Like, good job, guys. Yeah, I feel like they would just constantly be going, ow, 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 ow. Yeah. And I'm not going out there. I'll just shoot them with a ranged weapon, a, a bow. I, why did we do this during the day? What the fuck? Adar is retarded. Adar is kind of retarded. But yeah, this is this is very tension filled, uh, terrifying. Absolutely. Even uh, we don't even know what may happen. Who knows? Just oh god, I hope they can make it. But then they pull. Oh fuck! I forgot about this. Uh like as it was happening, because it's done in slow mo. I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, like yeah. Basically, everyone dead. on the planet would have collectively said, "That's a twig." You might be thinking, I... "Wait, what?" <sighs> so let me you show you, chat. To... I gotta show chat, all right? One sec. So you got, they pull his chain. He sees that they're doing that. Yank. I need you to understand this, okay? This is a good <laughs> image. That is a twig. Well... Look how easily he grabs it and breaks off. If you don't know, a twig is basically like the weakest part of what is still like the tree's, I don't know, core components, not the leaves. Like the end point, okay? You can get some leaves on a twig, but a twig is often used to, to represent how weak a thing is or thin a thing is. To kill people, he uses leaves. She's like, you know, someone's as thin as a twig or as, as like, breakable and shit as a twig. This is what happens with this twig. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> yeah. This must be the most embarrassed orc in history. It's like, how did you die? Die a twig. by twig. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> twig. <laughs> He's up there, and he's like, "How'd you die?" He's like, "I was, I was attacked by a savage elf. I, I was, I was ambushed. Yeah, yeah. That's, like he's gonna lie about it. He's not gonna tell the truth. He's not gonna tell the truth. That would be. It's a twig. It's a twig. What the <laughs> hell? 
and they try and make it so epic. Why didn't you make it like a big branch or something? Like a really sharp Fuck branch? Fuck it, dude, just have yeah. it be a weapon. He saw a weapon on the have floor. It be a weapon, yeah. Look at that twig! This- him. this orc is like, ah, the twig, ah. oh, the twig. <laughs> It has a right to exist, ah. <laughs> So they bad. embarrassing, I guess. Jeez. Oh. It continues, oh, look, he broke free with the weird broke axe. Free. It's like... Is that the weird axe? I think it's just no, a... Weird axe is like a double. Or is that just a Yeah, it's a, it's a... well, it's... Well, such a regular, regular axe, I guess. Walks yeah. standards, I guess. And so yeah, he's he's broken free, so it's like, well, I guess I'm going over the trench top while well, uh, you know, goodbye, friendo. Your sacrifice was not in vain. Because the warg escapes as well, and it's like, oh god. And he's about to die. This is it all over? Ah! And then he uses the spear <laughs> in a way that you won. It was that easy to kill. Yeah, and it's not yeah. even yeah, it was, actually. Just, yeah, just to look at that again. That wog goes down right away. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. awkward, actually. I guess, uh, I guess you you hit it in the side with a big old spear, I guess it just it just goes down. I guess it can happen. Hard to tell. Like, I want to see how big the blade is. I mean, it's not small, but at the same time, where that's gone in, that thing is thrashing for a while. But no, it just yeah. instantly dies. As though it's been hit in the head. Yeah, because the spear's got those weird little splayed things at the end of the tip that stop it actually going in any further. So it, if anything, it should just be sort of maimed and angry. Very That's, angry, I can't, yeah. I can't say, yeah, it's, it's weird. I, uh, it shouldn't insta-die. Uh, There's no way. Like, they should have done more. But yeah, our main man elf here, he's just done all the fucking work. And he doesn't even get to escape. He's still chained. Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our dude, he's, he's off, and hope you know, as he said, if he gets out there, then we can help. bring back a huge amount of everybody, but... Oh no! You fool! Why are you standing there? You gotta run! Stop appreciating the sun, you weirdo! Yeah. Gosh, go! Man. Oh, it's so nice up here. Wait, wait, <laughs> up in there. Why, would, why would Main Elf, if he clearly still has a, a chain attached to him, why is he trying to climb up and out? I guess I to guess make to sure that he's okay. Yeah, just to see. Well, you know why, right? It is a cinematic sort of, course, of thing, but yeah. yeah, I guess for yeah, him in universe, he just wants to see yeah, that he like, managed to pull it off. Yeah, he's okay. Yeah. Also, you know, Boromir tanked. Was it five arrows before he went down? I think four. And Maybe four, and then the fifth one finished him off. This guy's got one in the lower abdomen, so like, I can understand the shock, which would probably stop him, but he sort of turns around like it's... Well, for it's dramatic same. effect, he knows that the yeah. camera is behind main elf man's shoulder, so he needs to turn around to reveal it dramatically. <laughs> turn around and reveal that all of that work has been for absolutely for fucking nothing. nothing. What yeah. the hell was the point in that? Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you are absolutely right. When you were this desperate, you're going to pull that out, break it, or whatever, and start just keep running. Yeah. I think but he, he just, just gives straight up. He's just done. Maybe it hit him in I the spine. I, I'll cut him some slack. It, it's an arrow in him. That looks pretty bad. Oh, no, it would yeah, be it does bad, look pretty but bad. if you're I agree. desperate, then. And it's not in a um, particularly bad what? place. Is it a yeah. lung, maybe, is punctured? I guess that's quite bad, actually. I, that's so. right. <laughs> that might not be at all the lung, yeah. For reacting this way to having an arrow set up. Go inside. Just, no, I, I just wound. find it amusing the dramatic turn. That's all. Dramatic like, turn is clearly a dramatic. <laughs> but as for being, I still, I would still push harder than that. If, yeah, I, um, uh, the only reason why I would l allow this maybe is that will allow that it hit the lung, and that could be enough to to stop him. But if this thing had hit him in the gut and it was as deep as an arrowhead, yeah, I think he would snap it and start sprinting. Uh, and you'd even get an adrenaline boost theoretically from that. Um. No, I, 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 it doesn't, I can believe that this is it for him. Like, yeah. I can totally believe that. I believe yeah. it's it for him. He just could have, like, tried harder. I don't know, I, like... I don't know how much I want to judge right? somebody for how hard they try when they've just had yeah, an like, in the been, chest. If the alternative know. is dying, you'd want them to try well, quite I don't, hard. I don't know that there's a, a matter of alternative. Like I think that, I, I don't think he gets to choose on this one. I think, uh, I think that's it for this guy. He's, um, yeah, like I said, yeah, if like it's the lung, I'll give that to you. But if that was the gut, I'd ref I disagree with you, hardcore. Yeah. Um, it's his. It's but look at where it is. Like it's over. 
Well, so do you, do you agree with what I said then, or no? How... Uh, like, it, well, it depends where it hits him in the gut, right? Like, it depends on what it hits, surely. Like, if it um, goes through his blood or something, like, that's probably it for him. No, yeah, I'm not saying... Well, so that's the thing about the gut, right? It would be... It could very well kill him. Um, but, like, getting hit in the gut by an arrow to just dead stop you, I that that's that's what I'm assuming the little platoon is referring to. Like, it well, seems like he's yeah, just like, well, I'm out. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I, I get what you mean, right? Think about, like, he's running across the field. He gets hit in the chest with an arrow, and he just stands totally upright and still in the field. It feels it like would... he'd fall over, or, like... I don't know, because, like, uh, the, the force of the right? arrow, uh, that force of an arrow at that distance wouldn't floor you. You, would, you wouldn't be knocked back particularly. I mean, the shock of the impact would probably stop you. That's kind of fair enough. But I guess what I'm saying is that He's no Boromir, so you know I'm with Boromir. <laughs> um, on he could, he could have I guess carried all I'm on. saying is like I could, I like I think this killed him. Like that's you that's know what not, I mean? Like I'm not pay attention. That's not the actual criticism. It's the okay. Um, right. So what little platoon I assume would prefer, and I would also prefer, is that he can like when he when he gets up over the trench, you can see him running, and then he gets slower and slower and just falls over, and you can see an oh, arrows in him, like, and you're like, ah, oh, shit. We, well, the, we, you remember, we had the, we had the long yeah, slow-mo, drawn-out slow-mo sequence earlier for the random guy who we knew nothing about. Why not do a Boromir reference here? Why not have him shot once? He turns around, you know he's gonna die, he knows he's gonna die, Don Lemon knows he's gonna die, but he's gonna fucking well carry on trying anyway, and then he gets shot again as he tries to move away. Make that slow-mo. Make him at least try to get further until he literally physically can't get any further. And then you sort of, you've dragged the scene out a bit, but you've also played up the emotional value and the desperation value and the sadness value and the payoff that you get from that scene. Like, my only criticism really is that it's just, it's a little bit perfunctory. Like, we got a long extended slow-mo sequence for a random guy we didn't know. We know this guy a little bit more. This is the culmination of a big fight scene. You could at least have him try and carry on and then get Felled finally, and then you get the payoff of the desperation. Like just give him more of a, give him that chance. It's the thing that like the first thought of just this is so obviously done because they want him to to do the titter around you. Oh, there was an arrow in him. No, right. But it's like I, I mean, I totally agree. Right, like him just going up. He's just standing out in the field, dramatically turns around to reveal an arrow. Wait, the second arrow came from the other side of the trench, then, did it? Also, let us yeah. note, while it happens, the incredible accuracy of these arrows. Yeah, yeah, they did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, there, these are some I'm top, they've got some tarp, they should get a promotion. Tarp turn. Turp Because that's turn. the thing, when he goes over the top, it's unfortunate he didn't notice them with his elf eyes, because uh, if he did, mm -hmm. he probably would have been able to avoid the one or two archers. Uh, probably. At least have a chance. Mm. Well, if he's really skilled, he could have actually caught one of the arrows in Oh, yeah. Do you think yeah. could do that? Do you it would think be so really cool if they actually arrows? had that in yeah. the show. I hope they do. Wow, if they could, <laughs> if they had that kind of dexterity and skill, that would be... That's useful. Wow. How about that? Not likely, though. This is, a... this is what's known as foreshadowing. <laughs> very, very <laughs> subtle. <laughs> but yeah, once the wog is dead and he gets back up to start running, I assume you would have seen them. They're pretty... You know, overt standing over there. Um, but I guess he didn't, and then he walked a few steps forward, got hit, and he was like, "Ah, I'm out." So, uh, very sad a, end. A character that we know n virtually nothing about dies in a very stupid well, it, scene. And, let's be know. more honest, right? We know that he hates the Southland men. He thinks that they're he's, evil he's, sons of bitches. That's what he's we know. Bigoted against them. I don't know about hate. Yeah. He fucking. Certainly what do you mean? Isn't that this? He's got a hyper prejudice toward him. He um, hates them. I, I guess it's like he might not per he might not hate them, but you could be like bigoted against someone without like hating them, right? Like if he believes that he's no, th those are different things. I think he hates yeah, them. Yeah, like it's like people of a certain them. generation in England might be a little bit distrustful of Germans for the whole Nazi thing, for example. I mean, it's basically the same thing, right? Elves, uh, men siding with Morgoth in a previous war. That's what we call men Elves phobia. Have lived, uh, men man phobia. phobia. This show has man phobia. The show does have man phobia. It has, it has good writing phobia. It has, it has, it has writing phobia. Yeah, yes. well, writing <laughs> phobia in general, yeah. Phobia. But, uh, it's afraid, terrified of good writing. Yeah, it's definitely a moment of like, oh, there he goes. And then you just think of, again, we do the whole black and white scenes of all the time we've spent with this man. And it's like, 
Fuck, people don't even know who this is. <laughs> they don't even Arvo's remember which one he was. I'm... Argio for strings over the, over the montage of the black and white shots and just make it really sad. It's you remember the shot, but you know, it's still sad. Back to Lord of the Rings, we just have any music playing. Oh my gosh, this Remember so the time oh. where he said, don't trust men because the... Their ancestors were dicks. Remember that? That was great. What else? That? What else that we was, got? He came up the tower. He he was the one who climbed up that one piece ladder. That was really yeah, man. That ladder. That ladder is yeah. literally more interesting than this character. The fact that that ladder was one piece. That was a one piece ladder. A ladder entirely in one piece of wood, and he climbed up it. And that was the most interesting thing relating to his character. <laughs> but that time, he climbed the one piece ladder. Because, like, this could have been so much better in terms of, like, the whole idea they're going for here is that this grand and just horrifying prison escape where they almost get sort of to the to the end several times, but gradually every single member dies, and even the last one dies right at the finish line, and our hero's dragged away back into the... It's like, oh, what a, what a horrible... How inept, though. How, like, horribly bad they did this. Why, and then, of course, no did... development anyway. If Adar wanted, well, I guess we'll get to that point, but yeah, the, if, if, if you think about what they wanted to accomplish with this whole sequence of them being captured, imagine all the different, because all you have to do is we have to end up with Elf Buddy's dead, main elf gets back, uh, and we learn just to, we learn that Adar wants to do the thing that he's already doing. All right, that was helpful. Um, just imagine all the ways that you could end up with those, you know, those things happening. If you were to essentially have an episode for it, there is um. There's one other thing, which is that you could reverse the roles here and have Don Lemon die and this guy survive, Ooh, and brilliant. it would have pretty much the same emotional weight because, despite having much more screen, well, much <laughs> yeah, more screen time, a bit more screen time, you know virtually more. nothing more about Don Lemon than you know about him. So you know there's what? No, like, I don't if, care. If they had done well, it, my comment would unironically be, "Oh, I thought they were going to go to do so with the girl." Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, it, that's it. That's all I've got. You have other guy elf coming back to her, right? And it, it would just be interesting. It would be a legitimately interesting subversion of that's what happened. Because mm -hmm. I don't, it's, I don't it. care about the relationship between uh, Don Lemon and the lady. Like their their relationship is virtually non-existent. I, I, I've I've essentially just been told through hearsay that they have a relationship. I don't know anything about these characters. Well, they like and each it other. Is not enough. Allegedly. Allegedly. This is all. This is like. This is all allegedly. Oh my god! They they fucked up the continuity of the blood coming out of his mouth. They did. So, yeah. They reverted like, to it coming out of his left side. It's not quite. I think it goes from being on the right to then in the middle. But he's in makeup. Surely it will care. That will carry on through the green screen. Yeah, like it's, it doesn't match. Look at these two pictures. They 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 get, they got close, but they didn't quite manage to do it. You're right, actually. Yeah. What? But surely you actually just... shoot these two scenes on different days, maybe. How? Like, did, like... Is that what happened? It's already fitted everything, and we're here on the dirt. Let's just film them both. We're here, anyway, man. It, I mean, legit, look, it would I'm be just like presenting it as a possible explanation. I I don't know how this happened. I I, I would know. legit just be like, guys, anyone got a photo of when we did the first shot? I can compare. They go, no. It's like, no, <laughs> nothing. Because <laughs> none of that. No, was... It's actually yeah. You can tell it's it's off. It's not quite right. They fucked it up. Yeah, but the first like, one. The first you... one is like. Jesus. And I yeah, this is absolutely a dick a pic. I just find it funny. They could they did they clearly recorded it in two different shots where he just was standing and then fell over. It's like maybe you could just do it in one. <laughs> like what is <laughs> wrong with you people? Why why clean him up between these two scenes? Just get just it keep done. Him the way he was. This happens seconds after in the story, so just keep him the way he was. Surely he'll find it annoying to have to have that put on twice. I I don't get it, man. I like the idea that he was summoned back to the entire set for <laughs> one whole day just to lie down in the dirt and have some... The reshoot, thing. like... Just, just <laughs> reshoot the one <laughs> shot where he's lying on the floor. We didn't and quite he's... get that right. Twice. <laughs> like the arrows. <laughs> like the arrows. Um, Here, is that it? Does the episode end at that point? Let me see. I think so. I think, I think we've so. suffered enough, okay. Like take him to Adar, right? Yeah. Which makes me think it, yes. Well, they were gonna kill him, and then they're like, "Nah, this guy is clearly super cool. He's going to Adar. He gets to live. 
<laughs> everyone we'll let else this innate player deliver the message instead of someone who's going to be less antagonistic to our cause. Like, let one of those dirt farmers over there. They, 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 the camera just pans over and they see these these friggin' troglodyte barbarians trying to pull the the chain apart. And it's like, just send one of them. <laughs> They're still doing it. It's like, <laughs> don't worry about them. They they'll never do it. They think that we like to give them a bit of hope. Like, oh, we're gonna get you one day. Maybe you'll be able to pull the chains apart with your hands. Yeah, maybe. That is it, though. That The episode does indeed end at that point. And this might actually have oh, broken the record ooh. for EFAP coverage for ratio. It, it might have. I'm not sure. Then again, uh, I was thinking of a 40-minute episode. It is an hour, so maybe not, actually. Multiverse of Madness is still probably the record holder. Because that was two hours, right, that movie? And it took us 11 to cover? <laughs> Close, though. It was just so much to complain about. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It really was. God knows what we missed. I'm sure there's plenty. This thing is probably thick with issues. Um, I feel I feel like something should be said, like in totality, about that episode. It's really bad. It's um, bad. Quite yeah. Bad. Take a minute silence just to mourn <laughs> For what might have been. Well, you can take a minute silence because I have to pee. So you can do that. <laughs> that's a very go. respectful way of marking the minute silence. Well, while he's doing that, I can say, "Hey, everyone! Look, the time has gone red now." On the plushies. That's terrifying. Oh, it has it. Yeah. Oh, boy. The you urgency that means. is now. They're warning look. you. They're saying, look, do you really want to go without a cuddly, happy, fluffy, floofy plushie? I don't think so. You best hurry. No story. But uh, seriously, though, it's really Good fucking boy. cool that we're, you know, rounded. We're both at 1,500 sales. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really awesome. That's really um, cool. It's a, it's a crazy amount of fluffy, cuddly, mutuallys and frongos that are going to enter the world. In the world, yeah. There's a factory out there who's ready and waiting to make a whole bunch of us. Looking forward to it. The Rags one, I'm pretty sure, is still on the way. I was hoping that they might have a bit of a crossover in the timeline, but I think his still isn't ready yet. But it's uh, almost what I gather. Less than 24 yeah. hours, I know. It's terrifying. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, now, question... A little platoon, how much, uh, I don't remember, how much time do you have? You've been here for six hours, how are you, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, fine. Well, honestly, I'm living the dream here, because I, I actually, I've been listening to you guys for, what, two years, I would guess? Oh god my god, damn. really? Um, Neat. Oh, yeah. uh, not at the same so, time, okay. Honestly, this is like, well, yeah, not consecutively, obviously. Yeah, I was about um, to say, that's <laughs> fucking insane. I mean, I, I'm down. committed, but I'm not quite that oh, wow. committed. Oh, wow, alright. But, uh, but no, like, no, you guys are the reasons that I started on YouTube, like, nine oh. or ten months ago whatever it was so like i'm living the dream being here so fuck the oh, day job but i'm i'm happy to be here as long as you'll have me here oh my god now oh, that you said well, that it makes me feel like we really we'll should those words. do everything we can to cover well so the uh Fringy, how much time do you have so yeah i got like two hours <laughs> about two hours are you comfortable with the idea that you may not be able to complete the coverage that you get two hours uh of we've yeah, we, we've uh, we, we've done that before, right? Where someone's had to step out, so that's that's fine. What's funny is like on. if I had yeah, like Mahler and I will do it with new Fringy. Yeah, <laughs> he's not even green. That's uh, I don't know if he counts, but I guess so. But I was just gonna say it's funny in my head. I was like two hours, like surely was it? No, no, it, it, we oh. won't be done with it in two hours. We won't. I no, no. Why? But... It took it took us like six hours. <laughs> <laughs> we could we could make a big dent in it. We can definitely make a dead to it, yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, I'll talk more again about these Lashushis as we go as well. But I feel like this is probably the, the EFAP to, to mention them quite a bit, because uh, this really is the last chance. And I was, I was mentioning as well, any idea when yours is uh, maybe making his way to the world, Rags? Do you know? As far as I know, email sent today. As far as I know, it should be about fit. All the revisions and changes are done as oh of the last God. email i sent all righty okay cool it's looking um, fantastic i agree uh well then no time to lose let us begin no coverage time to lose with the, present. Of the rings of power episode four which by the way i never even talked about it but um uh, this was the day I was supposed to watch and collect notes and, and consolidate and have a chat with Rags while watching episodes 3 and 4. And uh, the PC like... got fucked yep. between 3 and 4. 
Yeah, right. I was about to say, where'd you go? We're about to, it's ready to start up four. And you're like, oh, my, my PC broke. <laughs> That's how I sounded. That's how I sounded. And, and then, then we had yeah, like a 40 minute phone call like... where I was telling you like what had happened, but then we just sort of drifted into complaining about Rings of Power for a very long time. <laughs> like we were just, everything you've heard us talk about for the past six hours, like a lot of it was mentioned already. Yes, because I had not seen episode four, so we only talked about episode three. Exactly. And we talked about the evil Harfoots and how glad you're the bitch. Yep. It was very really fun. Fitting that your computer suicided after watching Rings of Power. <laughs> Suspicious, you might even it. say. Uh, I put up with some shit, Mahler. It said, "I put up with a lot of shit, but this this crosses <laughs> the line. No it more." It really has. Like when this thing retired, it deserves to go to Valhalla or something. Like this it thing really is, does. Like, it's it's been through a lot. It Feel has rendered it. some shit. It has. So where do we even begin? Uh, our our queen regent is is doing a baby party or something. I legit have no idea why there's a bunch of babies there, but she's she's chilling out with some babies, and then like there's a bit of a, a bit of an earthquake, and I think she says that's just that's just Numenor stretching or something. Yeah, it I was like what? That's the earth. <laughs> it's like the earth. Yeah, we're we're on an island or a, a mountain, and sometimes it needs something. It's, it was just, it, I think they wanted to make that sound kind of fun. Like, yeah, everyone stretches in the morning, so do islands. And you're like, I don't think so. <laughs> like, but, all right, whatever. Uh, but then there's a giant tidal wave, enormous tsunami, and it engulfs Numenor. But so, like, like, you, you remember that one short piece of exposition we had in the last episode where it's mentioned that the Valar gave the island to Numenor? Um, yes. You think that one short piece of exposition is enough to prepare people for the fact that the Valor actually drowned Numenor deliberately as an act of will because the Numenorians attempt to invade Valinor because they don't want to die and they think that the Valor are withholding the prospect of eternal life from them. So the Valor... Honest, I am so fucking lost right now. I was going to say, none so, of that. <laughs> none of, I, I was just like, you, I don't know what any of this means. This is the point though, right? So, because it's borrowing so selectively. So what she's being given at the moment is this prophecy of the end of, of Numenor. And Numenor does indeed come to an end. It gets flooded. It gets drowned in the ocean. But it gets oh, drowned nice. in the ocean because the Numenorians themselves attempt to invade Valinor, which is the place we saw at the beginning of episode one. Uh, because they believe that the Valor are withholding the prospect of eternal life from them. The Elves have it, the Numenorians don't. So they try and invade. This is all under Sauron's influence. He basically eggs them on to do this. Um, because he's been captured and brought here and he corrupts the mind of the king. There's a whole war before that which we don't have yet. So he corrupts them. He persuades them to invade Valinor. That leads to the entire in the entirety of Numenor getting flooded and destroyed and the world being torn down the middle because it was flat until this point and then it's made round by God himself. All of that is essentially the backdrop to the prophecy vision we get in the beginning of this episode. But Wait, none of so... that would be apparent to anyone unless they've read the books because the show hasn't <laughs> explained any of it. Because I guess the show is just trying to tell us like there's this foreboding cataclysm that's coming and that's yes. enough for now. But like, how will they possibly get to that point and make it make any kind of sense without doing a little bit more than one brief expository thing where the Valor I'm just mentioned? Oh, don't worry. I'm sure they're going to give us plenty of all the necessary expository dialogue. <laughs> it's right unbelievable. Before it happens. This, right this before is... it happens in the same episode. Because we, we've, we've said for such a long time that when you adapt, you can make all the changes you want, you can tell your own story and stuff, but mm -hmm. the recent addendum we've had to all of this in order to like sort of help explain our position to people is like, however, when you sloppily adapt and take random things, it's like mm -hmm. it just causes a minefield of contradictions because you're not taking the other things and you don't understand why the other things were there. Yeah, it's a, this it's is a, a massive a, contingency problem here because they're borrowing later versions of events. The, but they've they've discarded the earlier versions of events, which would make those later events make sense. So they have this this massive gap in contingency, which they haven't yet shown any indication that they're actually capable of filling and substantiating. So you just get this random prophecy of the death of Numenor at the beginning of this episode. And as far as the audience who's never read the book is concerned, well, that's well, it's just basically the apocalypse at some point for some reason, maybe who knows. But that's it. Yeah, because uh, you know what's funny, by the way, is that. I didn't even, because I don't know about this stuff. Um, 
So when I saw this, I was like, oh, it's like a metaphor. She's having a vision. It's not going to be a literal tsunami. It's going to be like, it represents no. the fall of blah, 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 through blah, blah, blah. But I was like, oh, no, it is a literal tsunami. It is a literal <laughs> like... tsunami. But it, but it comes after the, like, Sauron is captured after a massive war in Middle-earth. He's brought there. And he starts corrupting the king, and he turns all of the Valar, over, sorry, all of the Numenorians over to worship Morgoth. There's blood sacrifices, there's human sacrifices, there's all this really, really dark shit that happens. And because of the way the show has messed with the timeline, maybe they'll do some of it, maybe they won't do any of it. You can't really know, it's, there's no reliable guide anymore, but they will have to do something, otherwise it's just random apocalypse. Well... Uh, as as Gogus just sent a meme, I'll try and get it on screen a sec. Well, but I'll you know I'll just say what the meme is. It's funny. It's envision for a moment. Actually, I'll I'll do it myself technically. Okay, so this this big old wave is coming in. Uh, get rid of the copyright cover. There you go. Just pause at this moment where everything is crumbling. Just imagine the words: the sea is always right. <laughs> it's just oh. like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, this is a funny show it's also annoying as fuck I can't decide which I find is the more uh, prevailing what, more fucking in the show, annoying or funny I think it's annoying I because Rags I think Rags would probably say funny but like uh, I don't know it's complicated I don't it, know it that I laughed really that shows. much while watching it I think um, I found it mostly annoying yeah yeah well, oh, hmm. No, I found it mostly boring, actually. <laughs> That's um, going to be the dominant emotion, yeah. Yeah, as opposed, yeah, I it's it's rarely funny. I would actually say it's funny to talk about. But yeah, I think that's what's I, happening. Is I'm real like the most fun I've had so far is that fucking moment where everyone's trying to break their chains. That was hilarious. I didn't even see that on my first watch through. All my second, you missed that while watching it. But when you go through it slowly, you just find these little golden nuggets. You know exactly. It's like, mm. We're living up to the name of this them. fucking podcast, I right? Every goddamn yeah. frame of pause. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, oh, fuck this episode. There's so much <laughs> stupid shit. Um, he's doing the thing. Yeah, so uh, uh, I keep forgetting his name. I, I want to say like Farazar, Faz, Phasmazar, Fam. Oh, uh, uh, I've now forgot. Al, uh, Al Farazon. Farazon, is that it? Okay. The beardy guy, the, the guy yes. with the big bushy beard. He's, uh, he's talking to his son and he says, the son's like talking about trying to be clever and he's, he's like, cleverness is a small man's ambition. I would much rather you are wise. It's like, be wise, Thanks, don't be clever. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? Thanks, like, Clarifies things a whole bunch. It's like, like amateur dramatics Game of Thrones. Yeah. It's, it's a little budget bit. Game of Thrones. It, it's so... Um... Yeah, it's funny that though. Budget. <laughs> yeah, cost yeah, more. Budget. <laughs> it costs <laughs> more. So much more expensive. <laughs> it's, um, and once again, we've got a reference to compare to. And it's from uh, season four. And it's a really fucking good scene. It's when uh, Tywin is teaching. Uh, fuck, why am I forgetting his name? Tommen? Tommen Lannister? Well, Tommen yes. Baratheon. Um, how to be a king. And he, he asks him what he thinks are the most important parts, and he says, uh, piety is one, and he explains, like, what happened with a more religious king. Uh, strength, and he, he's got the warrior king, and, like, Robert Baratheon, what happened with him. I think there's, there's a third, uh, aspect he tries to go for. Uh, like, rule, uh, not cruel, rule with fear or love or something, be respected. Um, he tries, like, a bunch of them, and then, and then he says, uh, you know, like, what, what is the most important thing? And Tywin says it's wisdom, and the wisdom to know what you don't know, and to have people to help you where you're gonna have gaps in knowledge and stuff. Justice, that was the third one, yeah. Tywin offers, basically, that there are serious weaknesses in each of these as core elements of, like, what's most important, but wisdom being a grounding force is, like, the best one. Then you compare to this scene, and he's like, don't be clever, be wise. You're like, what the, oh my what the fuck am I supposed to <laughs> what's it's, Oh, it's insultingly shallow. It, Game of Thrones is... I mean, if you compared the books, like the source material, the Silmarillion, I would say overmatches anything George R. R. Martin ever wrote. But compare the shows and how faithful they are and, and how intelligent they are, intelligently they're written... It, there is no comparison. Game of Thrones, certainly, like, in, well, until season four, 
is it's so much it's a different universe from rings of power yeah. these are writers who actually understand what they're talking about of course they're borrowing liberally from the source material but understanding basic things of human nature and philosophy and rings of power gives you fucking this Ugh. and you know what i've kind of undersold the scene as some people are pointing out uh tom is actually the one who eventually says wisdom and like Tywood, Tywood just goes yes. Like he's really happy that he came up with it on his own. So it's it's actually one of the more endearing scenes to Tywin because it looks it comes across as though he's trying to um, sort of prepare his grandson yeah. for ruling. In, he, in... he has a couple of those, right? I mean, like some of his scenes with Elena Martell are kind of endearing in the wrong way. Like Tywin is the one guy you'd say he's not unambiguously an asshole. Like he does have some kind of values and principles. Um, yeah, you'd you'd expect a a, when everything chills back down, when there isn't a war, when there isn't people to kill everywhere, that he would probably be kind of he'd probably have happily like have a bit of fun, uh, uh j just like you know jabs at different people or whatever. Yeah, him and Olena have some of the best scenes as well. To be fair, all the Tywin scenes like are just top notch. Thrones. Oh yes. Well, Rags, we, we're talking uh... we're talking about it because there was. Uh, there was a quote in Game of Thrones that, that it talks about wisdom and why it is important. It's a really good scene. They do it in this yeah. show where he says, don't mm -hmm. be clever, be wise. Love this line. Yeah, I love it. It's so... <laughs> oh, that's what the writers were told uh, before they started <laughs> like, writing. Oh, okay. like, Amazon was like, don't, don't be clever, be wise. And it brought us this show. I, I really... I hate this line. It makes no like sense the way you i feel like if you're gonna tell me that you have to really explain yourself like wait 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 what do you mean like that, that i shouldn't be clever and that clever what, what they say cleverness is for uh like, cleverness is a small man's ambition i am i just don't not, get it i am not in agreement with that it's just I am not stupid because that. most people oh, would intuit being clever isn't too far away from being wise like you need to tell me why they're meaningfully separated yeah i mean it's possible to meaningfully separate yeah. them but the show doesn't do that i mean there, there's a massive difference between them if you you know care to delve into it but the, the show the, it's kind of ironic because in, in this sense the show is being clever not wise that that's the irony of of the writing material they think this is a clever line to speak that's why they've included it it's not a wise line to speak because it actually doesn't convey truth. It's a kind of sophistry. It sounds, it gives the impression yeah. of verisimilitude. It's the idea that what it's conveying, it, it just seems truthiness. It, it has the seemingness of truthiness to it. That's all it is. That is the definition of cleverness and not wisdom. It's sophistry is what the show's entire writing methodology is. Um, so it's kind of ironic that they should actually sort of try and refute their own sophistry in their own dialogue and thereby prove their own sophistry. It's like Unless um, they're trying to set this guy up as being wrong, or I, that he's a bad person, well, so, and so by linking his quote to him, it's like not a good quote to follow. I mean, I would go as far as saying I'm pretty sure the writers of the show are like being clever is like like low level sort of just oh I did a kind of smart thing here while wise is like planning everything in a big old thing and, and being fully aware of everything that's happening and knowing how things will come, like, clever is like, again, with the small man's ambition, it's like, clever is like this, the, the small version while wise is the big version, or some bullshit like that. In the same way, by the way, that if they said, don't be, don't be like quick. Tactics for strategy. Don't be quick, be fast. You'd be like, what the fuck does that mean? But you'd be like, quick is like, is like smaller and, 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 and you know, shorter term, while fast is like an attribute you have as, but, you know, like, you could just make shit up, because this really doesn't necessarily apply, but, it's like TLJ, where the, the work is done on the viewer level, to, to what the fuck he means. It's it's like the, the evil version of when you can infer stuff because of how well the characters are characterized, you can talk about what they may mean. This is this is when they use that power when they've got, they've given you nothing. And they're just like, yeah, hopefully you come up with it, because we don't know. <laughs> it's like, it's postmodern art, basically, in dialogue. You put something on a page, on a sheet, on the screen... You put it on the wall, and then you invite your audience to pretend that they are very clever in seeing what the meaning behind it is, even though actually the real meaning is that there was no meaning behind it whatsoever. That you're, you're just inviting the audience to pat themselves on the back if they think they understand the line. But there's no actual meaning behind the line itself, so... Oh yeah, no. asking someone to explain what that means, they wouldn't be able to. Or they would invent something that is totally all within their head, and they're just attributing that to what they heard. When that was all inside from the get-go. 
Yeah, it's not to say that you can't possibly draw meaning out of what he said, it's just that they needed to do a better job than that to make us feel like this guy's actually got something to add instead of being like just a vague person. That's the thing though, as Rags just highlighted, it's like, oh wait, are they characterizing him that way? And it's like, I don't know, Rags, I can't tell. I don't know, <laughs> like, I yeah. don't know the difference in the show, it's impossible to tell. Oh, and then we get to the cringe scene. Which oh, one? Which they took which our jobs? Those? They, they, they took, took our jobs. They did your jobs. They took our jobs. You know those elves on the other <laughs> side of that gigantic ass ocean or whatever? They took our jobs? <laughs> the one of them that's here? The yeah, one no, the, yeah. Like, to, to get it, yeah. To... Oh, I felt like as soon as the scene starts and he talks for like five seconds, it's like, oh, they took our jobs. It's so like... fucking stupid. To just the obvious highlight yeah. here is that he's rallying a bunch of men to feel threatened by the growing elf population. They don't tire, they don't age, they're better than us, and they're gonna do what we do but better. And it's like, right, okay, okay, okay. okay. Evidence? It's like, well. There is one elf here. She hates this place and wants to leave. And she hasn't <laughs> taken any jobs. She hasn't sought any job whatsoever. It's in fact, it was the human who tried to take your job. It he was a human. Yeah, you're right. And what? he was he unsuccessful. Like <laughs> he was never could have worked. It's so the, it's so deracinated. So the the whole idea behind this that these guys <laughs> are like. The, the embodiment of the King's Men, which I think, is it the King's Men? Yeah, the King's Men is, is one of the two factions. These people are loyal to Numenor and they reject the Valar and they reject the Elves first and foremost. They hate the Elves because they think the Elves have been promised eternal life while they've been promised death, which they believe is, is, is a great travesty, even though the Elves and the Valar themselves try to persuade them that that's not the case. So in the law version you have this deep philosophical unhappiness and unease with their own position in the world that's what gives rise to their antipathy toward the elves and to the valor and that eventually leads to their own destruction because they they succumb to hubris event essentially but in this it's, it's literally just they took our jobs even though none of them are here but that's it <laughs> And then, then you see why people who've read the book and love the law get a little bit irritated when they see this put on screen because it's like you've got gold and then you've got a part of shit. And we've gone for the part of shit, but it's been dressed up as the gold. That's kind of why people are getting a bit irritated by the way the show kind of borrows bits from yeah. the, myth the mythos. And the Dude, it's, it's, it's almost so more shallow. frustrating when it does that, right? Because if it were a clean just break and nothing was connected to the, the original source, you could just be like, whatever this monstrous show was, whatever, fine. But the fact that it, it implies that someone writing this read something... But they just didn't seem to give a and shit to adapt it properly. This is what they took from it. Exactly. <laughs> like it's like, oh, that's even more annoying than someone who just didn't give a shit at all and didn't touch it. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, oh. the whole point of the the Numenorians and the Kings Men is, is essentially it's the political manifestation of of the underlying myth that underpins the epic of Gilgamesh, for example. Like the biggest, longest lasting human myths in the real world have been this quest for eternal life. And this is like the political approximation of that. This is Tolkien's And ironically, the show the makes thing. me want to die. Yeah. I know. And I wish they would hurry up and die. But... Clever. I wish, they, <laughs> I wish everyone would die, starting like with the perfect. Way, as they were writing the story and they're like, oh, Galadriel shows up in Numenor and they don't like elves. I mean, it's only natural that some of the people on the island would start to question it's, whether she's going to take taking their jobs. jobs. <laughs> gonna, it's it's really weird future. that they simultaneously. <laughs> well, they, they want to do two things right simultaneously. The they <laughs> they show pretty much every race and group in this world as being multiracial in an extreme racial harmony right amongst themselves which is already very strange mm -hmm. and then they also want to have one elf shows up absolutely unacceptable this will not stand the guy like, i don't know you guys seem like you're really well adjusted to different looking people but the, guy, the guy who did the speech a human tried to take his job literally tried to take his job take the symbol of his job off of his shoulder and i bet like, the elf told uh, him to do it yeah he, she's behind yeah. this yeah because you, you know, know they are i know you, galadriel looks like somebody who wants to take this guy's job specifically oh yeah she's she'd she'd be the best blacksmith Oh, it's, like, it's, like, it's the bicycle <laughs> yeah. man meme, though, isn't it? It's like, 
he, he's cycling along and then another human tries to take his job. So he jams a stick in his own wheel and says, fucking elves. It's like, it, it doesn't make sense from a world building perspective. There are no elves to take your damn jobs, you hick. Stop it. Yeah, like, I... Is it, is it simply because an elf showed up on the island? Like, one elf. That, well, like, that to, the prospect to... of jobs being taken is now a thing at the forefront of his mind. So it's, it's mentioned in the previous episode that they have been turning away boats. So the, the implication is sort of, like, plural. There have been num a number of boats that have attempted to land in Numenor. The problem is, like, we're never given a sense of scale or duration. Like, is this a red is this a frequent occurrence? Do these happen, like, dozens a year? Or is it, like, one every decade or one every hundred years? We, we don't have the world building to underpin why they think this. So I think it, it's it doesn't... a consistent problem in the show, actually, is, like, I don't, I don't know the timelines here. To me, it seems like the, the, the Hobbit story the pace at which it's going can't be tracking with the pace of this story. Like, the story that we're seeing here surely has to have taken place, uh, like the Galadriel Numenor one, has had to have taken place over a greater length of time. Because she sailed all the way out, jumped into the ocean, got in the raft. Like, surely that took more time than the couple of days that we've got for that story. And I'm not sure that that tracks to the, uh, the story of the Elfman either. Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm struggling to figure it's, out it's when all really... of this is taking place. It's really weird, especially the, yeah, because like, like the Harfords and the um and Don Lemon's guy. So the Don Lemon's character, seemingly at least, is in the sp it's in the span of one day. It, at least that's yeah, how it seems. Like, maybe two. He leaves tops. the tower. He goes to meet his wench. He finds the sick cow. He goes to the village. He gets captured. But in that time, Galadriel or not Galadriel has left Lindon for Valinor, which is like thousands of miles of ocean has Actually. rejected heaven, has been attacked by Cthulhu's gay fish, has been rescued by random raft, has been rescued by random ship, has been taken back to Numenor, all in the same span of time. Uh, and also, when she got taken back to Numenor, rode all the way across the island to, well, not across, but a good distance, uh, and then back, or at least she's on her way. No, wait, she's already back. Like, yeah, all in the course of a day. It's No, these are taking place at different points in time, but the show does not do a good job of establishing very clearly the relative time at which these stories are taking place. And I don't think it, yeah, I don't think it does a good job of, like, even f giving you enough information. It's astounding, like, how little they manage to achieve, given how long these episodes are. It's kind of remarkable. True. But yeah, it's... But I think this is a problem with the placement of information. Again, it sort of it comes up in the end of the last episode, the fact that nothing happens and then everything happens in the last 10 minutes. All the consequential information is packed into the last 10 minutes of an episode. But mm -hmm. if you spread that out... And it doesn't feel like you're all... building to it. it, it no, it just, doesn't. It like, hits you. It's not like, oh, you don't get that that tantric or that that, 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 that tension that comes, oh, something's going to happen, something's going to happen, and then it all just, boom, happens. It's just like, oh, I, you, you're like surprised by it. I yeah, guess all the things are happening like, now. You're slumbering on the sofa, and then eventually, at the last ten minutes, you sort of bleary-eyed wake up and half pay attention to the um, massive amounts of stuff it just suddenly decided to throw at you. It's not how you write screenplays. It's, no. I, uh. And then Faz Razmataz does a speech to get them all feeling better, and I've summarized it in my notes as him saying... Elves can't threaten us. We're awesome. It's just one elf. My friends, trust in me that elves will never take our helm. Everybody have some drinks. That's that's the speech. Okay. So like I get don't worry, they won't take your jobs, alright? Yeah, instead of just <laughs> telling them the obvious reality of like, well, they, they, there's no elves to take your jobs, guys. There's one elf <laughs> like, here, and she's not trying to take your job. She's like, kind of nuts, she, honestly. You have I mean, no she idea. Seems she's, in prison. <laughs> she's in prison. Like, she's, she's currently in job. prison. Oh no! Wait, wait, wait. She's not in prison yet. She's about to be. No, she's she's escaped. Oh wait, from right, the right. Well, she wants to leave really bad to the point of insanity. She wants mm -hmm. nothing to do with us, as it seems. By the way, it seems like he prepared it ahead of time. The whole drinks part, because like he says it, that just. <laughs> just people start delivering oh, yeah. drinks. And it's like, just oh. like I assume he did, right? So don't worry, guys. The one immigrant we have wants to leave. So I did, this is what I mean. Fine. Isn't nobody, that the idea that this was planned? Nobody could take this seriously because of that. Like it was, it was, it was absurd. Uh, I, it was getting memed to hell and back on the internet. It was this, um, and the and the scene 
where she was riding the horse. I'm trying to like like yeah. the, the ones that were just popping up. I was just like, oh god, what are we in for? What is this? Like, and it's like, yeah, the context doesn't exactly help. It's such a weird scene. But this, you see, this is wiseness in action, where you just the wiseness in action, where you go up and say, "Don't worry, guys, they're not going to take your germs." <laughs> but see, like, yeah, okay. I don't, because I wouldn't call this wise. I would call it clever. That yes. you have came across, yeah. even though apparently this was planned, you came across this guy making a speech, you essentially co-opted that speech, spun it into something that got everyone to really, really like you, and then gave them booze. That doesn't come across yeah, as that wisdom seems to, clever me. to me. It seems, yeah, it seems very clever that you were in able fact, to do that. In fact, it's essentially clever, isn't it? Because you're essentially manipulating people. Well, cl cleverness uh, is, is, kind of, is yeah. cleverness is like value neutral. Cle cleverness is amoral, so it, cleverness allows for immoral yeah, acts. Yeah. Essentially, cleverness yeah. allows clever for politics theory. to exist. Politics is by definition you call it cleverness. cunning, maybe. maybe. Cunning, cunning, and cleverness. Yeah, they're, they're all yeah. those synonyms, I think. So, so Al, like uh, Al Farazan. R. Farazon, not Al Farazon. R. Farazon, I think is his name. Elf Farazon? So, th this will build towards something because this is the guy who must, I think, come to challenge the Queen Regent at some point and take her authority. And so what we're seeing is that his, his yeah. building towards. He does it with racism. Yeah, yeah no, he, he's essentially he's the Trumpian populist type figure here. We've got the Trump immigration rally and we have the Trumpian figure who is owning the crowd he's actually he's playing to the crowd he's giving the crowd what the crowd wants to hear that is cleverness personified i but got that will um, have an impact later on obviously. definitely got that from the scene that the whole scene the scene's whole point is look at this guy's ability to control a crowd you know he's 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 going to be pretty popular with these guys right and i'm just like yeah no i got that i just i wish you could write dialogue better that's all i've got <laughs> like yeah the, the, we took, i took ah uh, sorry i just it's, it's, yeah, yeah there, <laughs> Well, it makes sense because there are there are millions of undocumented elves pouring across the border every year, and it's so I mean yes they have they have every reason to be concerned. It just it's makes so, sense. It's such oh, a they're bringing lambus, they're bringing pipe weed. Some <laughs> of them probably are. That's how it goes. Yeah, and and uh, it's it's just that that they keep showing that guy. He keeps ending up around all these events. You know the. This guy, he was in the the main hall when when the the uh, Galadriel first arrived, and then yeah, he like was the, the one that. Guy. Well, he's he's like one of those. No, not he's that like guy. One of those minor characters that just is like around. Yeah, the... you know, like always sort of around. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about the guy who, like, he was in the main room, and then he ended up being like, you, guy who was with Elf, and then he got beaten up, his crash was still, and now he's here trying to rally everybody. It's just like, who who is, why this yeah, guy? It, and you'd think. Like you're the way, the way you'd want to write it would him getting beaten up by the guy for for his crest and everything like that would somehow inform this, but it just it only uninforms it. Like it doesn't if help anything, at all. Those South, if anything, those Southlanders are terrible. The only interaction I've had exactly with has been terrible. And the Minorians that's... like they wouldn't care about the racial component in the sense, like it's like no, it's those <laughs> the, those people from the Southlands. Them not because they're men, it's because they're shit. Try to fucking kill me and my friends and take our job. Literally, <laughs> we've said it. It's fine. We'll move on. Yeah, <laughs> Benny's been. Benny's going to be out of commission for like four yeah. months. He can't work. We got to pitch in. Um. And, and then the, these two again closer. I guess that obviously this is going somewhere. I don't really yeah. care, but you know. <laughs> I don't care. He seems nice. Sure. <laughs> I, I get. He seems nice. That's so. Uh, that's that's a. Co I'm complimenting the show that they have a character who seems nice. Yeah, he seems oh. all right. He's, oh no. He seems like a nice guy. All right, what's up next? Muller, Galadriel oh. versus. We're doing this again. Yeah. Another scene with Galadriel and the Queen Regent, yeah. and the dialogue is so hideous. Uh. So we open with. I guess I've got it like summarized. You vex me, elf. You steal scrolls while your friend hurts my people. Like, More people should say vex. Vex, yeah, is, vex a nice is kind of a cool one. Yeah, vex yeah. is nice. It's like when you when you just threw in a deracinated so, there. And it just, oh, yeah. That's when you gotta <laughs> Hell yeah. slip those in. Pull it I find it vexatious when people don't use the language correctly. Oh. oh. So, her response to that, right? So, so what she's just been told is you steal scrolls and you hurt my people. So, like, if I were Galadriel, I'd be like, so I need to clarify why those scrolls were stolen. Stolen, quote-unquote. I don't even know if they were stolen. Whatever. You need to talk about how important it is, that, that, what they represent. Them. And then simultaneously be like, 
you know, if she knows the story about her friend getting hurt, it's like he was attacked, to be fair. But then, if you know the full story, he stole the fucking crest. There's not much defending that, is there? Anyway, Galadriel chooses to respond to it with, That man is the lost heir in exile. His men are leaderless. You need to you need to help the men of the Southlands back his people to beat Sauron. And I'm just like, back the fuck up. <laughs> Jesus. Prison. There is so much you have to explain. You can't just go like, oh, he's like a king, and you gotta go help his men. What? It's a massive assumption to spoiled. begin with. Yeah, she she doesn't even know it. Thinks... He's denied it. <laughs> The only reason she thinks he's the king is that he's wearing a symbol that he himself claimed he got from a dead he man. He stole, and he's like, tried to steal things. It. We've seen him steal things. Like, what was... <laughs> I was... Maybe he just likes stealing. It's like, Galadriel, you've shown how idiotic you are in so many ways, but this is a new one. You are believing in full that he's absolutely a lost king to the men of the Southlands. You have no reason to think this, and now you want her to, like, send everybody in Numenor to war? To help him get his pe what the fuck? The only thing that could possibly be worse is if the Numenorians agreed to it. But we'll get they there. Would never well, do of course, that. They, yeah, they would never do that. Incapable. She just no seemed. Evidence. She really seems incapable of understanding anybody else's perspective ever. Like she can never fathom that somebody might disagree with something oh. that she proposes, or it's that they her life, she's never needed to. I would like if I were her advisor. Uh, King's Hand, if you will, or Galadriel Hand, whatever. I'd be like, right, we're gonna want to try and get her to suggest an army. The second we do it, it's gonna become very clear what we're after, right? So the way do we do that? First of all, we need to set up the Sauron shit. We need to get clear that we have strong evidence. That's the whole reason we're here, you know? That's, that's, that's why we're here. We, we know we're not gonna play with assumptions, because she'll never believe us if we do that. We know we were a part of a big old elf thing, and we found loads of evidence, and, uh, you know, we, we were sent back, because, uh, our, our, uh, watch was done, or whatever, but Sauron, you know, I found strong evidence in your, um, libraries, or whatever, you know, it's, it's, this is where he is, and point to the stupid sigil, point to the blah blah blah, and be mm -hmm. like, he's gathering forces, we've already, we know for a fact he's annihilating villages, and, you know, he's, he, you know about the war, you know about the histories, it's like, he's coming back. Now, I'm hell-bent on trying to stop him. I understand if you, you know, don't care because you're on your little little island, and that's great, that's fine, you know, I'm sure you guys will be fine, but not forever, you know, if you don't, if you don't give us a hand. So, all I'm asking is you allow me to leave, and maybe with a couple of guys, they can confirm Sauron is back, th th there's a threat, and go back to you, and then, uh, you know, you'll know the threat is real, and maybe... Yeah, send with me men that you trust, hmm. and I will convince them and we'll come back and we'll prove it. And like, you know, I know this is a lot to ask. I know there's a lot to, to bet on me, but like, <laughs> like this is no coincidence. I brought this sigil to, to you guys and you guys got it in your own records that this is evidence of a, of a, a man you used to, you know, have. He's a spy. And even he knew that Sauron was building his forces uh, the second that, even before Morgoth died. Like this is, a, this is all stuff that's pretty compelling, to, at least Yo, to some Paul, degree. What if, she, what if she said, I mean, you pulled me from the ocean. And after all, the sea is always right. Uh, <laughs> she like she she notices an aspect of their culture and uses that as a way to convince. That would be them. interesting, though. We can't do that. That would be that would be in yes, which is why it's not in this show, because that no. would be interesting. You're not seizing. This is, yeah, They're none of the dialogue there. is ever interesting, and it's so sad because we've had four episodes of it, which means we're never gonna fucking get interesting dialogue, are we? It's a it's a strong no, pattern. Well, I think that we've it's been established at this point the the manner of dialogue that's gonna be in this show. Nothing's gonna change dramatically. Not fair. Anyway. <laughs> um, it's, it's it's not really, is it? <laughs> there's, yeah. um, there's another. It's a slightly. Only slightly, I think, more convoluted way, but it accomplishes the same thing. So, and it, again, it fills in some of the world building gaps the show has left for itself because the Numenorians are supposed to have settled in Middle Earth for a while by this point. Of course, the show likes to pretend that they've not visited for, for a very long time. They're supposed to have established you know, colonies the there. The world. Oh, well, exactly. It makes no sense. But they're supposed to have colonies in Middle Earth. So, if you were taking a longer approach to this, right. And you were staying in, even just in Numenor, you could have Galadriel saying like a, a couple of different meetings with the queen because she has to mend the relationship she spectacularly ruined in the last meeting they had. 
you have to mend that relationship. Yeah. Have have a couple of different meetings and say, look, I've learned that this great threat is arising in the Southlands, for example, and being dismissed and rejected again. And then the scouts or, or the, the emissaries or, or the people they have in the colonies that are placed in Middle Earth begin to send news back that something is indeed wrong in the Southlands. That feeds back to the Queen, who then takes a different look or a different approach to what Galadriel has been telling her. She maybe comes to her own realisation that maybe what she's hearing is correct. That fills in a lot of world-building gaps about the Numenorians' relationships with, with Middle-earth, but it also explains how the Queen Regent can come to this conclusion of her own account rather than just being essentially bitched into submission by Galadriel, which is what we get over the course of this episode. Oh god, I hate it so much. But yeah, you're right. And yeah, the, there's so many alternatives and it's like they they desperately try to avoid anything interesting anything that anything accurate to what these people should be able to say and think about because like i said she it's not even a response when you say you've stolen shit from me and your friend is attacking my people you don't just go send your armies to help the men of the southlands it's like I'm, 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 no 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 i'm less <laughs> likely to do really that now. address like were you not what listening? does that have to do with what I just said? Like, yeah. like, but second, like, not like, hear what I just said. Nothing to do with what I said, but also, what? <laughs> like, which yeah. I, no. Uh, but no, yeah. I, I, I will, I will not, I will not send you an army, bitch. But the thing is, like, it annoys me that she. You could argue her response is is accurate to what you'd think about it as a character, but it's not. It's still not satisfactory to me. She, she basically says Numenor has chosen another path, as if to say. Yeah, we could help you with the war, but we're not going to. We're when, doing like I said, something else instead. She should be saying something like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Like sending an army. And can you please address the fact that the guy is in jail? You're stealing stuff. But no, just that's what I mean. And then, because like I'm trying to summarize it in my notes as well. But uh, Galadriel's just like, "Okay, let me talk to your dad instead." Uh, well, what oh the my queen God. should have said was, "Noticed, oh, the thing you want us to do." That that seems to work out really in favor of what you originally wanted, which was basically a free ship back to Middle Earth. So I don't believe you. This is what I, this, yeah. you come back tomorrow with a new story about how there's the Sauron. Da 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 da. It's like no, I want. I know what you asked for first. You're just trying to fool us and get us to give you what you originally wanted. You Obviously, are, I don't believe you. You're absolutely right. Because why the fuck wouldn't the Queen Regent be like, I'm sorry. Did you just say, like, an evil force is about to take over the entire world, you want me to, an army to, to attack it with, with you? And she's like, yes. And it's like, you didn't mention this yesterday. It doesn't <laughs> sound very urgent. It <laughs> it's like, really? Like, it's oh, like... you just found about it today on a little trip you took with this guy that who isn't doing a very good the job. Elf Fred. Yeah, the elf Fred. Alendil the elf Fred. We can't trust him. Yeah. God, it's so terrible. He had one job. Um, but then, like, as if the further the impression we have of Galadriel as essentially fantasy Karen she demands to see the manager yeah which is uh, just it's oh uh, god everything about her is written to be as subjectionable as you could possibly imagine so I'm just this is what happens she says let me talk to your dad and she's like no and then Galadriel as she's like walking away is like you don't have the authority I require or something like that and then in response, because they're catty as hell, they don't actually have conversations. They just want to outwit each other in the conversation. The Queen Regent says, what authority do you have begging for scraps in a tempest? Which, I guess, sets her up to say, I have a tempest in me. Oh. And like, oh, the delivery, man. I think, Freem, when we were watching it, didn't we like cringe? I mean, it is pretty cringe-inducing, gotta say. And no offense to now. yeah, no offense to Morvid Clark. Oof. Uh, let me let me play it. Actually, I'll play it even with audio too. Oh, fuck. What an incredible service you get on the stream. There is a tempest. Oh fuck! It's all out of work. sync. God damn it. Oh, no. Um, I think there's even a gap after she finishes it, and the camera hangs on her, and you're just like. Ugh. Trailer shot. Or are you a castaway, <laughs> grasping for a handhold in a... Yeah, are you a castaway grasping for a handhold in a tempest? I don't even think that's a particularly well-written line. I don't like any or of it. Or are you a cat grasping for a handhold? I don't know. It, it, yeah. It has, it has an internal consistency that a lot of the metaphors don't. I'll give it that. It's just to set up... What Gladriel says. That's the only reason they squirmed that way in yeah. that word. Yes. Tempest. There is a... 
Tempest. Oh, God damn it, VLC, you're pathetic. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid copyright, but by doing so, it desyncs the video and audio because it, whatever you. St Ugh. Maybe I can get away with. Oh. Or are you a really? castaway, grasping blah, for a blah, handle blah, 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 blah. There is a tempest in me. It swept. It's me that little glare after it as well. Ah, oh, so awkward. Yeah. That's the best I can do, Chad. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe it's just a consider it a reprieve, maybe from the cringe. She, uh, you get to like imagine this, the cringe in your head. Call it a micro expression. I don't know, but it looks like the actress even felt she had uh, bitten off more than she could chew with that delivery at the end there. Like, a very small thing. She, like, she was expecting to do another one, but they're like, no, that's great. Maybe. <laughs> um,. Yeah, and then she says, uh, uh, she ends it with saying, I will not be quelled by you, regent. And it's like, what are you doing, Galadriel? <laughs> so, Galadriel, literally, yes, you will be. It's, uh, so I have a feeling this is, this is a Return of the King reference. So when Gandalf yes. is before Denethor, he says, uh, is, the authority is not given to you, regent, to deny the Return of the Voices, King. Uh... Authority is not given to you Stuart. to deny the return of the king, Steward. Stuart. It's fucking That's great. That's such a good line, and this is such a terrible one. By this comparison. is such a terrible one, because tactically this is a fucking hideous decision. Like, what are you <laughs> thinking? Yelling, you're yelling at the person I mean, just who the... has, like, all of the power in this situation. Yeah, whereas you Gandalf no power is, like, purposefully, purposefully putting the words king and regent, or so king and steward next to each other in the sentence. Mm -hmm. It's so, and oh. like the scene in Return of the King, he's you know, like, a, I, he says, I will not bow to this ranger from the north. When, it, like, he's trying to like dismiss and uh, trivialize how important it is that Aragorn could return to give Gondor Last, a king. Uh, and like Gandalf's almost Lord fucking pissed off that a fucking steward would even deny the, the literal return of the king. That's just what the line's about. This one is just like, that's really clever interplay as well because this this is going for interplay like the interplay between them has been consistently whenever they've shared scenes together the whole thing about um, you're welcome to try I don't need your welcome you're outstaying your welcome but <laughs> the whole thing is about is supposed to be interplay but you compare that with the analogous scene in Return of the King the authority is not given to you uh, to deny the Return of the King steward. Um, I will not bow to the Ranger of the North. Uh, this this uh, last of a forgotten lion, long bereft of lordship. Like that, yeah. it, it's it's aiming for exactly the same dynamic, but one of them is very, very cleverly written, and the other one is incredibly awfully written. And it's almost again, it's almost it's almost unfair and cruel to put them side by side because it's it's like comparing Shakespeare with with a child. It just doesn't work but that's what they're going for so they're inviting the comparison I think you're absolutely right yeah that is totally what they're trying to evoke um the irony being of course that she feels much more like denethor here than gandalf oh yes the desperate clinging to any sense of authority that she absolutely does not have or deserve why do you want everyone to hate her <laughs> like why are you writing her this way stop extremely unlikable and spoiled I think the, the 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 reason is is going to be the payoff. They have this one payoff in mind. They want her to be this way all the way through until the point at which the one person she's come to trust betrays her, which is Halbrand, of course, when it's revealed to be Sauron, and of course she's accidentally helped the one person she was attempting to fight against all the way through. And that that's as a premise, that's a that's a creditable idea. The problem is that you can't just have premise and assume that everything then follows. That's all you need to fill in character and personality. You need to do clever things with that. Yes, that's what you want to do. But the question is, how do you want to do that? And if you're only going to make her this one-note, one-toned, objectionable, cold, frigid hyper bitch, then no one's going to want to actually stick through the series. Yeah. I don't want her to succeed. Together. I don't like her. No, I, I, I would be happy to her. see Sauron beat her. That yes. would be great. Yeah, Good maybe Sauron's Sauron. a little more reasonable. Sauron is like this underdog who was actually having to use like ingenuity and some level of creativity. Like, how am I not going to? I'm just going to prefer him. Like, he's going to be more interesting. <laughs> At least he's got some charm, for God's sake. This would be like if she went against Thanos in Infinity War. You'd be like, I don't know. I feel like there's just no reason for me to pick you over him. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs>
Uh, it's like at least it, the halberds are or whatever. Like he he's still um kind of an, he's made annoying decisions as a result of just being in this show. But there is a mm -hmm. good chance that he'll end up being like my favorite character because when modern shitty writing tries to make you hate someone, they like they inadvertently end up, yeah. Yeah, make you. It turns out they were actually the reasonable, correct one that I sympathize with, <laughs> even though you tried to write them as the opposite. You're just that shit at your job. John Walker is like the best representation of that. John Walker is literally who was. I was right about to say John Walker. Uh, and he's probably going to get ruined in Thunderbolts. Woohoo. Probably. Everyone's going to get ruined in that show. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone's going to get ruined in everything. <laughs> this yeah. is the fate of the Christ, world. We got him as he is. There is a tempest in May. Calm down. Everyone's got shit to yeah, do. Yeah, that's your problem, is that there's a tempest in you, and you need to fucking chill, you psycho. Yep, and so she ends up in prison. Lol. Too and that's, late, but... Don't feel satisfied by that at all. She won't be there for long, and my god, that scene. Oh. Just you might be asking as well, wait, did they put her in an adjacent cell to her companion? It's like, yes. yeah, of course they, they did. did. Why wouldn't they? So now they Yay. can freely communicate. Yeah. Numenorians are very smart. Prison. And you put them in the cells next to each other instead of in, you know, any other Different one. prisons. I assume that it's yeah, a whole city. Yeah, even across the room, room I would it, settle for. That'd be better. You know? I was just thinking about it again. <laughs> like, in her head, did she honestly think, if I insult her and her authority, <laughs> then she'll listen to me? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, my problem was I didn't insult her good enough the first time. <laughs> and yeah, what are we to make idiot. of that? That she clearly doesn't care... <laughs> Either she thought that that would help her, in which case she's a fool, or she doesn't really care if she insults somebody and it, it when it's the end of the world. Her ability to save the world, yeah, which is worse. Um, so we have to settle <laughs> for she's just dumb. She's just that's dumb. better for her. And to clarify, like <laughs> better for her. Someone, if they wanted to try and make the argument against Gandalf, it's like it's not going to be useful to threaten Denethor's authority, right? And it's like, well, it's reality is kind of what Gandalf's commenting on in that moment. He's like, you cannot stop Aragorn coming back. And, and Gandalf sees Aragorn unifying the world of men to be very fucking important. Like, you literally also, cannot stop that from happening, steward. Some and also Gandalf it. knows that he's a, f he's a wizard. He's a wizard. Well, yeah. yeah, but the, the, there's a subtler reason as well, which is that Gandalf is, in a sense, playing the room. Gandalf knows what Denethor is and what his character is and how low he's sunk because of his despair from the visions he saw through the planetary. Gandalf is is establishing himself as the authority on behalf of Aragorn in that scene, which is part of... It's, it's like the first, um, the first instance of him creating for himself the power to command the troops later on when Denethor yeah. has abandoned his position and responsibility. So Gandalf is kind of acting as King Regent in that scene. And he's deliberately playing Denethor down in a way that he knows he must feel that everyone else in the room also recognizes, whether they acknowledge it to themselves or not. So like the, the subtleties in that scene as well, which is just... Uh, it's it's an un, it's almost an unfair comparison just because it's so overmatched. But it, it, there are many many reasons for Gandalf taking the line that he took because some thought went into him taking that line. No thought goes into this. It's just Galadriel is a bitch. That's it. So she gets thrown in prison because that's where the plot needs her to be. The end. It, Temporarily. Uh, the plot needs her to be in prison now, not being uh. thrown in prison after you threaten the life of the queen in, in yeah. front of her court. We're not going to throw her in prison that, for that. She doesn't need to be in prison. That happens prison every day. Yet. It's fine. She did it metaphorically yeah, almost. She already implied we it, right? Very, it's different. We have fine. a very libertarian free speech policy in the royal <laughs> chambers, luckily for her. It's, you know, these things happen. You take the bad with the good. It's part of the, yeah. To be honest, dude, we should be thankful that when she said, I have a tempest in me, the queen would go, well, so do I. Mine's bigger. So fuck you. you know, like, <laughs> no, mine, I've got a bigger <laughs> tempest than you. And Elendil's just like, I have a Tempest. Yeah. I, I sometimes have a Tempest, yeah. I'm cool too. I had a Tempest the other day when my son said he would quit being a seaman. <laughs> to be fair, that's a little bit of a Tempest. It must be the most interesting life has been on Numenor for so long. There's this crazy elf lady rocks up and just starts threatening to kill everybody. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, why not? I'm gonna, cement, I'm gonna cement these feelings they have for the elves with, with horrific efficiency. Ugh. <laughs> They're all the Numenorians are like, I don't know why we ever thought about this about elves in the first place, but we were right. <laughs> I always loved um, that aspect of Denethor's story, by the way, that he had a Palantir, and that I feel like one scene that would have made that like definitively in the story for the films would have been a lot better in terms of helping yeah, us understand it. Yeah, it would have helped out. 
Instead he, of just he alludes just sort of to unstable. it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you don't. You never get more of an official sort of word on it, or, or even a scene. Because I, I, I just, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of where I'd even put it, or maybe, maybe I wouldn't at all. Maybe eventually I'd be like, you know what? I don't want to touch those films. They're so bloody I wonderful. Think, no, I, I would be reluctant to touch them. I think the way you would do it is when he learns of Baromir's death. So I think I don't know if this does happen. I have a feeling in the book he when he's is holding the split mm, horn. Yeah, well, he discovers the horn. The horn yeah, he he holds the horn later. But I have a, a, I have a feeling in the book he gets a premonition of Boromir's death, and then that's confirmed when the split horn drifts down the river toward him. Right. So if you were to do it in the film's context, what you would I think do is the point where he reveals to Gandalf that he's learned of Boromir's death and he has the broken horn on his lap. Um, that's when you would say. He might just a single line of dialogue, even to say, "And I saw this coming." Essentially, that's all it really would have taken to reveal that. Well, okay, there's a reason he saw this coming. Of course, that relies on the extended edition stuff, though, because I think you would need references. We're, we're always talking extended it. editions. With of us. course, it's Those the only acceptable. Yeah. Only, oh yeah, yeah. You're oh, yeah. always <laughs> talking about the extended. Yeah, because when you've seen Saruman with the Palantir, then immediately another reference to the Palantir makes sense. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing the theatrical cut, maybe it wouldn't so much. But because um, you can infer it. Uh, when he's like, do you think the, the the eyes blind? I've seen more than you know. It's like, but the thing is, if you don't know from the book that what he's kind of referring to there, I think any normal just person watching might not think that. They might be like, oh, I don't know how he's seen it, but he's seen more. But does than... he have like a castle or court thing or, or some yeah, spies, dark magic or uh, spy? Uh, yeah, something. I don't know. Yeah, but, but he okay, said, he's seen, got you connections. Know. But, but then, if more. a friend said, oh, well, it, in the book, it's actually it's it's, it's he has a palantir. It's like, oh. Oh, and I just, I really like the idea that Sauron has been, you know, and, and, and the influence of the Palantir has really brought him further down than he already was. Yeah. Oromir's death just yeah. it crosses that line, yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, we, we're, we're fans of Lord of the Rings. Uh, I'd say we all We really of us. like the Lord of the uh, Rings. It's really fucking cool. We, all, we also really like the ring, Amazon, it, the Amazon's the rings of power. It's very mm. good. It's very <laughs> powerful and emotional. And well, I, I, I mean, I can't enjoy the cast of characters and how. Can't even wait. Just the relationship of the family, uh, faith, hope, um, it's, um, emotion, and a, a journey, uh, believing in yourself. Um, that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, beautiful and diverse, terrible as the sea and. The sea is always a right. treacherous as the sea, yes. sorry, but uh, of course the sea was, is always right. So there was a tempest in my heart, but it was quelled by the quality of this show, and <laughs> now I'm. Could the sea I'm be wrong sometimes, happy. though? Maybe no. Okay. No. Not no. even once. Every everything's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. <laughs> oh, could you imagine <laughs> trying to feed these lines to like the sea is always right? Aspiring, I don't even know. Just just some some person who's learning. You're like. The sea is always right, but it cannot commit treason, and it will point you to the to the light if you I'm look up. Still so confused by that. You'd be like, "What the fuck am I supposed to make of all that?" <laughs> it's like, look, just don't be clever. Be wise. I like how I think it's really <laughs> like, interesting how funny. they. Uh, it, it's really clever, I guess you could say, how they took Galadriel being tempted by the ring in that one thing and just turned that into her whole character for a show. That was it. That's an interesting creative decision. Yeah. Um, and you know what, as well? If you can start combining all the advice, like, don't be clever, be wise, but also don't be good, or don't be too good, because you'll get snipped, and then you'll don't get washed from the good, table, like salt. Washed from the table means Only the good all, boys of your, all of your friends will abandon you to die. It's, like, you collect yeah, all like, of it up, and you're just like... Because you might die, too. <laughs> Don't, Don't be... help your friends, or else I will exclude you personally. Yeah. I will, I will, I will disown if... you. Some sometimes being selfless, it, sometimes it doesn't work out for you if you're selfless. So just don't. Just don't. Fuck don't, it. Don't be a gambler. <laughs> don't be a gambler. Don't gamble on love. Listen, Nori, you you didn't know this before. I'm telling you it now. You've got to stay on the trail, okay? It's like, mom, it's really I don't easy know what to the fuck that name, means. Nori. No reason. Stay on the trail means her. be evil. <laughs> it means <laughs> never help people. But how do I know that the trail is <laughs> Because the trail the... looks upright. <laughs> 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 because then Sardok just turns to her. Do you know why a trail uh 
floats. <laughs> the floats. <laughs> you know how a trail floats and the not trail scene. The not trail. <laughs> because the trail is, is always looking right. Up and the not trail is looking down. God, they were so and proud just, of it's themselves. It's a recurring thing everywhere in the show, regardless of context. <laughs> And we, we, like we said, we're, we're barely halfway through. There's still so much cringe to come, I imagine, in the next uh, four. Yeah, and that's even just right one season. Everybody. Think of the other seasons. Why yeah, would they do I, this? I, I, I'm trying not to. I know, it's cruel. Cruel and unusual. <laughs> it's not fair. Oh, so this, anyway... This, this legitimately, watching this show would be prohibited as a death penalty treatment in America. You can't, in like, actually... No cruel, cruel and unusual, cruel and unusual punishment. punishments. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't let people watch Rings of Power first. They just get bored. <laughs> yeah, ex well, boring people to death is a cruel and unusual punishment. Death is normally a bit more interesting than that. They're like, no, put on the Snyder cut, please. <laughs> oh. Anything but this. Uh, Yo, four hours of this, four hours Snyder cut. Hey, actually, there you go. Oh, shit, four yeah. episodes. You know, we're at the same. You know, who wore it better? Mm. That four hour time <laughs> the four game. hours better. I don't want to have to think about answering that question, Rag. Don't make me. Or Snyder cut. Hello? Wait, did you say what would I rather rewatch? Would oh sorry, your your voice did tism for a moment. Um, the would you rather rewatch these four episodes or the Snyder cut? Well, so the problem with these questions is I'll always pick the one that I'm less familiar with, and it's going to be Snyder cut right now because they come too close. So it would be slightly more interesting because I'm I've forgotten a lot of it, you know. Especially if I'm watching it with friends. Holy shit, we can laugh at it. Okay, all right. Okay. If I was right. fully familiar with both, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Oh, yeah, it's tough. I might. I think I'd pick the Rings of Power I'd rather watch. I think there's enough little... Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd just be watching for maybe little bitty things, like little cool set stuff and some cool props. And the, that two-minute conversation with Broken Foot and Marigold. Um, you just wait for that one scene. We could, we could make <laughs> we could make fun of how the the fat Harfoot is just doing that weird standing pose at the crater. And, yeah. And whenever I and whenever I see the people beating the 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 dirt or trying to rip their chains off with their hands, I'll be like, oh, oh no, that good was, that good was moments. Fun. That was fun. Yeah, and then in the long intervening moments, you can catch up on some sleep. So it's. Actually, Rings of Power is quite good for the health. Maybe yeah, very maybe, therapeutic. Yeah. So we're back with the seal door on his little, uh, <laughs> little seafaring exciting. adventures, and he fucks up the right. thing with the rope, and the same problem we saw happen before happens, and they're like, "Oh my god!" Blah, blah, blah. And it was the thing we kind of mentioned all those hours ago, and I suppose we'll mention now is that <clears throat> this error is spotted by the sea master person, whoever, and he's like, ah, you've done that so many times in life that you couldn't possibly have done that by accident, so therefore it's you're fired. Obviously contrived, he says, I've seen you do that hundreds of times, this must have been deliberate, you're off the team. Like, no, you saw him do it in the last episode. <laughs> I don't understand, yeah, it's okay. so weird. Maybe he was looking a different way. Well, so that's the but craziest he, part. He, wasn't, he saw it, um, he saw it all, oh. If uh, they they show that he wasn't looking at him, and then he, this happens, and he gets he's like looks over there, and I'm like, oh, what the fuck? So it's like, had you shown that he was looking at him, and so he saw him deliberately fuck it up, that would make so much more sense. Yeah, yeah, you have the scene of Isildur and his buddies pulling the guy back on the ship, and then the the, the focus changes, and we see in the foreground the ship master captain watching this, like, hmm, and he's then he goes the back time, to his normal yeah. task because everything seems to be back on track. That sets up that he knew he paid attention. He paid attention. So here's the problem, right? The problem mm -hmm. is that off the top of our heads, we come up with these ideas that they, with their bajillions of dollars and God knows how long of planning, didn't do. And he uh, state. Now you're things. making me think as well. Like Isildur could look over, look around, look around, like, oh fuck, was was that it? Have I fucked it up? And the captain's like, no, to carry on. And then once everything's over and they land and they're all like going back to whatever they're up to, he like stops Isildur and he's like, um. You know, whatever's going on with you, like it's it's putting your your mates in in uh, danger. Your and... mind's wandering, boy. I've seen so it's, it's not even that, like minutes. goes like even serious to the point of just being works. like, I don't really care what it is you're working through. It's 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 getting to the point where it could like kill your 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 teammates. So you're out. It's as simple as that. I don't like whatever you're working through. Whatever deliberate shit is happening. It's just like you're you're unsuitable for this. Uh, 
There's no way I would pass you when you're like almost killing people on purpose. Yes. You're you're putting other people's lives in danger. You need to sort your stuff out. And maybe he he give he puts a silder on a break essentially. He's like, You're a very talented sailor because he has to have a pirate captain voice. Mm -hmm. You're a very talented sailor, Sildur. <laughs> uh, but your your minds are wandering. You need to take a break and settle your issues. I can't have a weak link on me ship. On me ship. Yeah, that's how I say it. You are and a then, weak link that, on my ship. And then when when uh, Isildur's father learns about him being sort of like put on leave for a moment to sort things out, that's when they can have their conversation, not just, you know, that would that would give him a reason to, you know, and, and, and it would. Do you think they're ever going to do that with the fact that, well, I guess we'll get to it, how Isildur gets his friends fucked over, but. Well, yeah, that's next. An idiot, basically. That's I next. hate him. Um, He's dumb. He's a dumb, stupid idiot. To be fair. He is a dumb, stupid, dumb, dumb. But um, that part of it is bizarre. This, this, this guy is like, Isildur, you, you clearly sabotaged this. You're blah blah blah. Okay, you're out. Also, your two friends there are out too. Fuck it. It's like what? You're just like the Brandyfoots. Collective punishment. <laughs> <It's> like, what? <laughs> what? But why? Yeah, it's just like, like actually, just... why? Like we seem to be really good sailors. Like, sorry for knowing him. It doesn't. Uh, it, I guess. Like, I can't even remotely understand what that's about. Why did you fire them too? What did they do? Like in the first instance, though, he's distracted. He doesn't do it deliberately. He's distracted because he's passing West Numenor, which is the the place he has this. Here's a voice, in inexplicable his name. desire to go to. So. They must have sailed in this region before. It, it's not impossible or even implausible that he's been distracted in this way in this area before, but the guy took no notice, paid no attention to it when it happened previously. It, it's so jarring. It's such an obvious we need to move up the plot along moment for him to suddenly say, I've seen you do it. You did it deliberately this time. You and your friends are off. It, it's so overtly an attempt just to press things along. It, it's uh, subtlety is the enemy of this show. It just it just doesn't understand what character writing is at all. And then his friends are understandably pissed, but even Very still, pissed. they they don't know how to write dialogue. So the friend is like, "You're sorry, fuck you. You've ruined our lives." And then Isildur is like, "It's just I just I wanted to to get out of it." And he's like, "You didn't even earn your way out there. I did. I've been trying my whole life." And then Isildur is like, "Oh, jeez, oh man." And then the guy goes, "All you ever do is brood and blubber about your dead mum." It's like, <laughs> "Wow, dude." <laughs> what? Does he? Because I <laughs> first of all, I, I yeah, guess I I'll take your word for it. I haven't heard that before, but we'll take yeah, we we'll have to take his word for it. I just, I was just like, did they just want to elevate, like, escalate the nature of the conversation? Just, he just said, because like, if I was the other friend, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I kind of hate him too for getting this fight. But what are you doing? Like, oh, fuck you for caring about your mum having died. Like, wh what are we doing? <laughs> What's happening? What? I guess he's just super angry. Which, yeah, I guess he should be because he just got booted off the course for no reason at all. I, it's, it's so hard to just have any investment in any of it. It's all so nonsensical. You're just like, oh, okay. Why? We're not going to get answers on why. It's just happened. Get over it. Um, we need to know his mum was dead. That's why. Thus, you can find better ways. <laughs> you do you think that that would like be that. something that comes out of their conversation before with the family there? The dad and, and the two kids? That, yeah, I mean, that yeah you, you, that, you'd that say pops it, up the easy thing is just, your mum would be proud, you know? That's an easy way to open that up. And then, and then you can talk about it, whatever, but yeah, I don't know, man. <sighs> Back to uh, our main man, Elf, who is chatting with good old Mr. Adar. Finally. We, we still get, like, many minutes of time code of him walking toward him, because how else it are we going to fill these scenes? <sighs> It is egregious. Yes. And then we get a very strange moment where uh, Adar is pretty much getting teary-eyed over an orc dying. Um. Okay. All right. Turns out they were misunderstood the whole time, but all right. Or it's just he just he just really likes orcs. All right. I guess. I mean, uh, don't you? You're great. I, I guess so. What's not to like? What's yeah, not that's to true. like? Very true. Um. So, uh, let's talk about a couple things in this conversation, but the main thing is that he's going to free Mr. Elfman with a message for the, the people in the, uh, in the tower, 
in the in the watchtower. Oh. Okay. Um he says you've been told so many lies that run so deep the roots and rocks believe them too. Like I, I guess I can understand what you're trying it's to say there, but line, still. I suppose like I get it. Yeah. It's really that's a really deep lie. I'm then, getting what you are saying. Like, I understand your analogy. Um, and that, that's, that's all I got for this scene. That's it. That's, that's the, <laughs> well, uh, um, the, yeah, the weird orc funeral killing thing. Mm -hmm. Strange. Uh, okay. And this scene goes on. It takes a while. He talks about, like, where he's from, right? Where were you born? Yeah, Where are you from? It's the kind of I thing remember where, there, there were flowers there. It's it's like you, you, you say like, oh what what where are you from? You're like, oh fifty first street, and then you go, oh, next to the chippy, and it's like <gasps> to imply like, how do you know about that? You must be how you, oh my god, Adar is like an elfman and he's why is he oh like, my god, such mystery. Such mystery. Like a box of mystery. Yeah, yes. I'll wait to pry it open. Uh, a riddle wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a mystery, or however it goes. Fringy knows. Mm -hmm. An enigma wrapped in a fringy. Wrapped in a in, puddle. What, what is that? I'm trying to visualize what that... Oh, hi, fringy. What, what does it mean to be wrapped in a fringy? I don't know. I guess you'd be the authority on that, right? I yeah, don't you know, one... know that that's... I don't know. I don't think that's, so. That's why you're here. What do you mean you don't know? What? That's the only reason that I'm here. Wow. Yeah, for All Simpsons right. references, that's that's why we... Muller and I had a whole conversation where we weeded out candidates. We had a guy who was really, be... really good with Family Guy references, and we were like, that's fine. Kind of looking for a higher caliber. Yeah, uh, we're looking for yeah. It's definitely <clears throat> some. We had a guy who was really into BoJack, but I was like, nah, it's still too low tier. We have yeah, to go gotta go higher, higher than that. Uh, oh yeah, Simpsons. Yeah, and so you knew the Simpsons stuff. So we're like, you know what? That settles it. Fringy's gonna be the one. When do we break the news? And uh, I think we said did it on the anniversary of Simpsons being now created. Is the yeah. time. We we wow. brought you on a few more times to talk about the Simpsons. Uh, it does seem to play well so with the what, audience. So what, what is the what is the implication here? Is is what I'm why why bring it up now that that was your motive? Well, see this guy on screen right now. He kind of reminds me of Homer. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what? <laughs> 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 he does. <laughs> He's the Homer. I agree. Person. Is it why? Yes. You know that that hat he's wearing is not like a bald head, right? <laughs> That's not true. At That's all. ridiculous. For you. Particularly, look, this is this particularly pale. Head? He normally wears a hat. Him. That's why it's so pale. This is why you. He normally does have a hat on. This is this is the low budget of the show. That is a bald cap. It's just not looking great, is it? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, shave me hair. He's also a sea oh, captain what? for this. <laughs> shave me hair. I'll do no such thing. Million dollar. I'll put on a cap. It's painted white. Um, like, someone said he looks yeah like yeah I, I I'm just not seeing the Homer Simpson I'm just not seeing right. it that's okay it, it surprised us because you're the Simpsons person that's yeah what, I, mean, I am the Simpsons person you'd think you would so get anything, it more my, than us my but... statement on this should be the authoritative definitive not, and conclusive not really because the three of us on the panel we think it does and you're the only I, one who does that is so just what, pure that, Homer okay, Simpson okay well I'm glad that you admit that the three of you are needed to match my claim Oh, and it's it's um, not matched. Simpsons, you misunderstand Simpsons. it. It's not matching. We we heavily outweigh you in the court of over overmatch is the word. Yes. You're so so yeah. what is so okay? I mean, look, you're entitled to that opinion. You're allowed That's to nice. feel that way, but oh, we yeah. all know the truth, which is that when it comes to conclusive, you know, three of Simpsons truth. decisions, I am the arbiter. Hey, you're changing the picture. I feel you're like this is representing it, it very. <laughs> over the picture. This is like exactly what you can see. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Free. It's like it's... look at that. You've drawn out a picture. <laughs> look at what you've done. <laughs> you're can't draw a picture of a That's a forty-year-old right there. He actually looks like Bart Simpson. Not I can't keep the you mouth. Tell us. Giggling on that. the lines, you and he pulls the line fucks up. You all saw that. He drew. <laughs> he, he was drawing Bart. 
It is like he's smoking a massive draw- spliff now. <laughs> it does, yeah. The woman's hair, yeah. The top. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm glad I stuck around for this one. Uh, th- <laughs> there we go. I feel like you now you can see it, Friggy, right? As yeah, a Simpsons that's fan. So obviously, Homer Simpson. If we ignore many aspects <laughs> of like how this drawing doesn't map onto the face here at all. Oh wait, sorry. Yeah. I can see it important. now that like, I put the hair in. You can see it. Hair. You can see it now. What you mean? You put the hair in where it doesn't exist on him. Yeah. What do you mean? It's right <laughs> there. It's just that's I made it more prominent. So now, yeah. See, he can understand now that he can see because that's what me and Rags could see. It was also you've drawn it inaccurately. Homer's hair on the top runs from left to right. You've drawn it like front to back. I don't know what you mean. Well, yeah, it's underneath the cap. It's under the cap. That's what the hair would be on the cap. When he puts so, it on, he slides it over. Yeah. So when he puts yeah. the hat on, the direction of the hair changes. In your yeah, opinion. absolutely. Yeah, when he drags it the, the... From, It changes from <laughs> left to right. To I don't know what's hard to understand about this, Brady. Oh, is it because I haven't colored I'm in just... the pupils? That's probably it. It's probably it. It'll it'll pop instantly when it... Yeah, and I didn't connect the eyebrow. That's probably one of the things holding back. Now you can understand it. I'm just, I just don't see the resemblance. I, I mean, the lip it. is a little off from the original, but I'm sure you don't mind that. Like you can, you can, you can envision. Um, I mean, I need to envision because the drawing isn't exactly. It's not exact. I, I agree, but I'm glad you agree finally. Like it's, it's, it's a broad sort of. Yes, approach. if I, if I totally use my imagination <laughs> and completely invent an alternate like scenario where the character looks totally different, then yes, I can see Homer. Excellent. There you go, Rex. We got it. It looks exactly the same. Gorgeous. Yeah, some wait, people can did, sort of fully understand it. Are we now. watching an episode? Oh, that's not actually. Oh, it's my. I thought yeah, that was yeah. actually Homer for a second. I, I was actually going to say I should probably take it off screen. A, People are going to start joining the stream. Like, why are you reviewing Simpsons? We're trying to do fucking Rings of Power. Yeah. So. It is. It is odd though, because he's he's so fucking uncanny, especially when he it really moves. Is. Look at him when he's moving. Oh, when he moves, especially. Yeah, just the way that he carries himself. The animation is yeah, so much better that, than the walk. Yeah. It, 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 I don't know how they do it. They must have hired someone who worked on both. Because we were talking that, at the beginning of the stream, like 2D animation or 3D animation, animation in general, and how it can make you feel a lot. Like he's integrated just perfectly. Because this is these are all real people, except him, obviously. But it looks like they're interacting with him and shit. It's cool. Um, that, I think like a lot of the money went onto this. Obviously, cameos and stuff, jangling them keys. I'm hoping they just do something with him though, something more significant than he's just here. Um, what else happens in this scene, though? That's, 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 that's what we're here to talk about. The scene where they, uh... Oh, yeah, they're realizing they've got no food. Now, that's the thing you suddenly realize, of course. <clears throat> I have many issues with this. It I pains me. Well. It gives me the big brain pain. Um, we discover just sort of through a casual line of dialogue, they've got, like, another village is pouring in. Basically, like, all of the surrounding villages have been collecting up into this tower. But apparently none of them are bringing food. Everyone's leaving their food behind. It's not even a matter of, because this is the thing. You might be thinking, well, they don't have any, right? And if you move out of your village, you know, what are you going to be? All your tools for food making are all back there. And it's like, well, most villages would have some form of storage for food. Um, Later on, we learned that they took the time to scatter all of the food across the floor of the room before they left. So it must have been deliberate. Well, I, maybe the, no. That was just salt. They swept it off the table. Oh, that was. Oh, of course, yes, yes. That was for the. Gotta do that before you leave. Is for good luck. Um. So this was annoying to me because, as far as the timeline goes, I was like, "Haven't you guys been here for like half a day? How are you already starving?" You run out of food. Did you the not think that in did, your? <clears throat> it was like well, when Homer was on the rock, the real <laughs> he Homer, ate and he ate all the peanuts. <laughs> the flanders. You gotta eat them like this. Nom 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 nom. Nom nom nom. Nom nom nom. That's what happened. I think this show, this is, it's like one of those things that makes me think, this show wants me to think that men are shit and elves are just the best. Well, um, Men are too stupid to bring food with them. I don't even know what the fuck they were thinking, because yeah, like, this is the thing, you might be thinking, I, I implied with my description that they have chewed through their entire rations, it's like, no, they didn't bring any, they left no, all they their brought, food. They couldn't, they couldn't prioritize the food over the linen, you know, you needed those bed sheets. <laughs> and the I can't covers. explain how fucking stupid that it is. Would, 
They, it would be a great comedy sh uh, comedy scene to <laughs> yeah. have her have her being like, "Well, what did you bring?" And they just have like random uh, shit. They have like farming equipment and I don't the, like a pile of the shirts. Bed linen. I really don't want to dismiss that. I feel like a stack of bed linen just sitting in the corner. Just <laughs> they, just have, them, they just have they just have buckets of dirt. Old he just old sketch <laughs> where like uh, the, the housewife um, sends the husband away shopping, mm. and he comes back. And she says, you know, did you get the stuff we needed? Did you get, you know, the, the beans? Did you get the the rice? Did you get this? You know, this is even better than that. And then he just brings out this random list of utter horseshit that they have no conceivable Stop need of. Stop tormenting me, it's... Waller. I'm not doing Stop nothing. Stop it. You're no. tormenting me. It's uh, it's absolutely it's absurd. Torment. They have like a, a food storage, just an entire thing. They didn't touch any of it. And you remember the visual from episode two, I want to say? They're all very slowly walking away from the village and they've packed up loads of shit. They have like little like wheelbarrows and carriages and stuff. And it's like, none of you wanted the food? No, <laughs> Is there no fat person among you that was like, oh, I'll, I'll carry Bring the food. Bring some snacks like for the, the road. Food. Yeah. I don't understand it. Um, and it, and it's obviously because it's like, what are, what are we going to do with this plot line? It's like, I don't know, they need food. Like, ugh, but they wouldn't need food because they would have stacked up ahead of time, right? They would have known this was going to happen. We later find out, by the way, they can't hunt because all of the animals in the area have either run away or they're dead. And it's like, why wouldn't... You know what? You guys should just be moving away. This is just... This place is going to... Yeah, why did you stop here? Keep going. This ain't a good place to be. It's terrible. And the orcs are like, they're not that far away, you know? Because they wouldn't have, because surely they didn't come here expecting to find elves, right? No, I don't even know. Because what was she would have obviously, she would have told them that they're gone and they would have probably said that, hey, we're leaving. So they wouldn't have come here expecting elves. So they just came here because, why, why did they actually come here? For safety? I don't know why you didn't draw this guy on the left as, like, Mo. You, you drew the other two, but... I don't know how to draw Mo. Believe it or not, those are actually, like, really badly done drawings, but they're, like, the best I can do from having drawn it several billion times when I was a kid. I don't know what... I need to see a well, picture of Mo. Well, you are drawing with a mouse, which is kind of tricky, so there's that. They are not um, beautiful also, drawings, I will admit. I... You don't know how to draw Mo? Oh, well, without seeing a picture of him, I think I'd, I'm trying to... I I don't know if I could. I don't think so. I, don't, I couldn't. I can't remember. What about, um... What about, uh... Hmm. I'm just thinking of, like, secondary characters that would be easy... Principal Skinner feels like he'd be an easy one to... to the draw. thing is, it's bizarre. I can picture him fully in my head, but I... <laughs> the second I try and draw it, I feel like, oh, what am I doing? The main thing I remember about Mo is his, like... Big He's old, got a very uh, big old a, Billy a sort of uh, afro thing, doesn't he? He's got yeah, like and, and fine afro. What's that? Oh, we'll see. You gotta, you gotta like aim it upward more so with like Mo's Mo's face. It's it's all right. You could. I know. I know. I know who that is. It's, he's the bar guy, right? He's the bar he guy. The bar yeah, guy. Yeah, it's him. Oh I know. See, God. I know. See. I, I, I I I I was figuring out if I could like draw Mo from memory, and I just started drawing Barney for some reason. I with put the in, guy's like, the, teeth the guy's natural hair, you could just turn him into Patty or Selma because they're basically the same. But he also has kind of got the haircut. Mm. Sorry, what were we talking about? Was it Rings of Power? I don't. Know. Oh, we're talking about we're Homer in the castle, power. but we're oh, looking yes. for any escape from it. <laughs> it's why you see Homer Simpson in this man who doesn't look like him at all. He looks very He looks, man? Very, he looks is, like suspiciously is, it's, similar. It's, it's warping your mind. No, I, I think that I, Fox I agree. The guy with the paranoid delusions. The guy with the potatoes doesn't Fox look like Homer. That's fair. I think to look into like legally, like, like stolen inspiration from Amazon. Honestly, yeah, the, well, the guy on the right is the Homer guy. The guy on the left. I'm not saying the guy on the left looks like Homer. Oh no, he looks like Mo. Yeah. Well, to yeah. be fair, Fringy pointed that out, and he's apparently yeah. the Simpsons. Oh, no, expert, I, so. I, I said, Fringy got I this said one right. Why, yeah, I said, why didn't you draw him like Mo? No, so, no, I'm saying I agree you, with you. He does, does look he like looked, Mo. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. That that would be the first thought right. that you have so, is he the, looks so much like Mo. Why would you not Marge. draw him like? <laughs> the light, uh, not Marge. The lady <laughs> there is Bart. I was gonna say the, her hair is way more Bart than Marge. Come on. Um. Yeah, and also because Marge wears like a lot. 
a lime green dress, and this is a very blue dress. Not to be confused with her blue hair, which is not naturally blue, is it? Wasn't that... Isn't it, like, naturally brown? But then she dyes it blue? I can't remember. That's some of that... That's some of that super duper Simpsons lore like, there. Oh, like <clears> ninja? Blue. Um, oh, I don't. Well, I imagine ninja's hair is not naturally blue. Oh, oh no! It's, that's like that's no, like saying it's, the it's tooth fairy's not dyed. real. It's, it's a very big. Yeah, it's important if you want to be successful. Well, I'm glad screener, you played that up, Rags. Just to say, Joe. Just like much like this character you're talking about, I know that Ninja dyed his hair blue. That's the most interesting thing about him. Well, this woman hasn't dyed her hair blue. She's just wearing a blue dress and like a I don't know about that. Did she dye the dress blue? Oh, is she a Numenorean well, sailor? Her hair is <laughs> naturally blue, but then she dyes it She brown. dyes it brown just to because she doesn't want to be seen as a freak. She doesn't want to be she doesn't want to be the tallest um, There are plenty of blue head people in the in the Simpsons world, but it's not blue in the same way that blue is in our world. It's like a normal color. Well, yeah, because there was that um what was that? Who's the The Van um, Houten? There's another well, there's them, uh, but there's someone else with blue hair, right? Like, the, the guy, but I can't remember, in the early seasons? Do you know who I'm talking about? There's, like, a guy with blue hair. Do you know anything else about him? Uh... I damn it. I, uh, I'm just trying to figure out, like, who he knew or interacted with. It's Chief, Wig Chief Wiggum people. Oh, of course, we, well, I'm not talking about Wiggum, it's someone else. Um, <clears throat> the guy. <sighs> there is a guy with blue hair. He wears, like, a suit jacket. Um, I'm pretty sure. Oh, Burns' lawyer. Yeah, I think he has No, it's not Burns' lawyer. It's someone else. That's what I'm saying. It's isn't actually it, not Burns' lawyer. It, um... No, we did the Van Houten, so it's not Millhouse or his dad. God, keep up, oh, chat. Yeah. Jeez. Kid with glasses, right? That's him? No, that's, that's... Sideshow mm. Mel's got light blue hair. Yeah, that doesn't that's quite not count. what I'm thinking about either. Gil does not have blue hair. I don't like Gil. He's got gray hair. Gil's got blue hair. Homer. Krusty. Oh. <laughs> no, Krusty's also got the. I I I know that I'm not. I know that there's a guy. Hold on. Let me let me let me, let me see if I can figure this out. There is a tempest uh, within Fringy, and he will he will unleash it. There is a tempest in me, and I need to know who. who it's mandatory has... that every EFAP episode has a Simpsons tangent. So this is all. Uh, this is all planned. All this is planned, a, yeah. all planned. <clears throat> well, it's suitable that we do this oh. with the Simpsons characters on screen as well. <laughs> well, because uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't be thinking of just Marge's dad because because he's got blue hair. Yeah, he's um, he does have blue. Does hair. he show up in early seasons? Uh, when you said earlier seasons, what were you thinking? Like, I, I'm really struggling. I'm, I, I'm sure that there's like, I'm sure that there was a character. Gonna get a but drink. I, I can't. I'm. You uh, is it? Is it? Um. Maybe I was thinking of. Um. Uh, I feel like I've only ever seen. Oh, I was thinking of. That's it. The itchy and scratchy. The guy who makes itchy and scratchy. He's got blue hair. Do you oh, him? The, you, you're not talking about the original creator. The the guy. No, 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 no. Not yeah, the original creator. The, this itchy and scratchy man. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I'm. I'm him. I know him. I think yeah. that might have been who I was thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> it it all lines up. It all makes sense now. We have concluded the mystery. The mystery man with blue hair on The Simpsons, because there are several characters who have blue hair. Roger so Myers Jr. You're saying that's the guy on the left of the shot at the moment. No, no he said Mo. I, no, he's, Mo doesn't I, look no. much like Roger Myers Jr. He doesn't. All right. So, um, we we have yeah we've we've solved the mystery and now, ha! Huh, that's a that's a relief. I was really stressed there trying to figure out who the other blue hat man of the Simpsons was. So they're all mad because they're like, we don't have food. What are we gonna do? And then they're like, hmm, what could we do? And her kid, the annoying kid, he's like, we'll just go get the food from our stores. And like everyone all over the earth sighs and wonders why they didn't do that in the first place. But fine, that's going to be the best option right now. And then it's like, no, we'll hunt. And someone else is like, hunt for what? There's going to be like, the best we can do is like a couple of bunnies. And then I think I was watching it with Rags, and he was just like, why not both? I don't understand. <laughs> just like send people to go hunt, and then also send 
a group of, like, you know, men who are capable with some weapons. Maybe someone who's a good runner as well. You can call for help if something goes wrong. I don't know. Someone to look out. Or, like, alternatively, you bring the food with you when you leave the village. That was us. We, no, we've right shut now. that out as an option. Only smart people do that, and we don't have any of those, so that's a no. But, um, I would say, yeah, okay, so just do both plans and be careful, but no. Absolutely no, no, no. We're not doing that. And then it just cuts to a scene where I guess these two are gonna go get the food from the town village. You know, I was thinking about it, and I was like, of all the people who are currently in the Watchtower, think about it. Let's just say it's a hundred for the sake of argument, because it's like several villages worth, so I'm sure it's more than that, but hey, fuck it. Let's say it's a hundred. Of all the people in there who are close to starving, if you said there is a supply of food that's about presumably half a mile from here or more, and um, the orcs might not even have gotten there yet, and it's daylight, you could go grab it. Any volunteers. Don't you think you'd get as, quite a few people? I mean, as a, as a point of reference, you walk at about Three miles an hour? If you're in a hurry, you could easily do five. And when, when it's daylight? And the orcs, they're pretty it's bad daylight. in daylight. They go, ooh, don't I like that. Don't like it. No, I don't like it. Nope. So if you see them crawling all over the village, you'll be like, fuck it, can't do that. But if they're not, yeah. you'll be like, all right, get a little closer. And then maybe, like I said, send True, someone who's yeah. a fast runner, slowly make their way forward. And if the orcs are hiding, like in a well or something ridiculous, and they go, blah, blah, blah. it's like, oh god, and runs back, and he's like, nope, the place is taken over by orcs, can't go there. <sighs> I just, but no, nobody wants to go get the food, except these two kids. Well, one was a kid, one was like well, a that just, teenager. I don't know. That leads me to believe that they're they really are starving. Nobody wants to go get food. Oh, because like, if I'm starving, <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm taking my fucking chances. Yeah. I would too. Gotta well, dude, food. when I said wouldn't anyone volunteer, it's like I probably would. I'd be like, look, Absolutely. this is like our Here's only chance. Orcs, so. It's food, guys. The orcs like, might kill me. Starvation absolutely will. <laughs> will kill me. Yeah, yeah. I'll take my chances with the maybe, and also because I have like eyes, so I can perceive objects at distances. Yeah, I could look and see if the orcs are in town. Oh, they're not. Let's okay. Let's let's go while they're not here in the daylight. And then before it gets dark, we could we can fuck back off and go home with the food we should have brought the first time. So they get a decent selection, actually, a couple bags of stuff. And then before they're about to leave, he's like, I want to check one more place. You just you wait for me. And then like they stop playing creepy music. And like, he goes in and he's like, oh, there's this bag of stuff on the floor. We grab it up. And then like he annoys us and like, oh, God, oh, what's happening? Oh, geez. And then. Unfortunately, well, the kid first off runs away. He's just like, ah, and then an orc appears, blah, 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 and, and we got a fight. And so he grabs his spooky demon hilt, stabs it into himself to create the sword. And it's such That's, a, like, what the fuck? Like, that is, it feels, he just knows to do it. It's, you saw I mean, some, uh, I wouldn't have guessed. Like, I just thought that sword, I didn't think that a lot of blood makes the sword grow based on that first thing. I'm like, oh, it likes blood, and when it's around blood, it makes the little glow. I yeah, wouldn't have that's... guessed. I, I wouldn't have guessed that the more blood it gets, the more full of a sword it magically reforms. It, that's it, it not at all what I got. Massive leap. So like, obviously, we see at the end of episode two, isn't it, where when he yeah. uh, he has blood on his arm and it drips toward the sword. So there is a relationship that's been established between sword and blood. But and it likes him blood. To, it likes blood, but for him to like me, automa yeah. to make that jump from well, I see it attracts blood. Therefore, if I stab myself in the wrist with it, it will become a lightsaber and grow. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> a big, dark saber, big jump, a dark saber. That's yeah. like, it's a pretty big leap of the imagination, and all of it this is. only happens anyway because a fortuitous cloud happens to come across the sun, which lets the orcs come out. Uh. It's not actually <laughs> nighttime. It's just lucky cloud for the orcs anyway. Yep. And then he actually slices the orc, and the orc is so surprised, he like waddles over to the side, back facing our character, happened. ready to just be killed, and the kid instead runs away. Now you might be like, well, I mean, I don't know, run into the sunlight, I, don't know, I guess I guess that is the bit. I was just like, ah, I don't know, killing him, I would have taken that option, but I guess I can understand if you're just scared and you run off. Yeah, Only... he's a kid. It's an orc. I, he's he cut it and then he ran. That's fair. Um, but then things get weird. Kid yeah. goes out the door. Like, all right, 
Orc is gonna follow him. Out he goes. And we cut to, like, pretty broadly to... Ah, it's so annoying, because, like, there's just no way, even with the outfit he's wearing, that it, the sun isn't hitting him. It, it is. And it's gonna... It should make him go, ooh, ouchies. But it's, you know... Yeah, they should... Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know how, like, you can, it's pretty, even when it's cloudy, like, you can see pretty well. It's because the light still get through the clouds. Like, it's well, yeah, still he, daytime. I guess he it's very, not intense enough. Or well, no, it's but filled. to be fair, he very deliberately prepares his coverings to go out in this, uh, as if to imply this is enough. Even this is enough to upset him, yeah. But fuck it, I don't know, whatever, anyway. So, the kid burst out and immediately jumped down the well. Yeah. And he was lucky enough that none of the other orcs have seen him, who are now clamoring over this whole place. Oh, by the way, actually, what does it mean to jump down this well? Did, it did means you know, he's like, playing like... lots and lots of Assassin's Creed. Yes. Because he knows exactly guess, how to yeah. get the guards. But it's the second time, because like in episode two, when he, he manages to jump from the top of the stairs after lassoing the orc mole, and then suspending it with his own weight. Like, this, this kid is basically a ninja. Yeah. And she has to be an ninja. But, yeah. It's a bit of a why. bit of a mental state thing going on in my head with this. It's like he bursts through that door, he starts running. His first instinct, of course, would be just run home. But you'll see maybe that there's some orcs running around. He goes, Oh fuck, down the well. It's like really? You it's can't just, stay uh, here forever. You it's a really it. bad hiding spot. Go for, you, and you don't know if any of them are going to look down. Maybe just take your chances and run. And run, them, you know? or try like, and sneak um, around the, the, captions, the house. The captions here have kind of given it away. He's hiding here somewhere, splashing. <laughs> splashing, yeah. Maybe a giveaway? <laughs> Man, yeah, he's... I, I was like meters behind him, and he's gone. Where could he have gone? Looks around. Man. Oh, and I can hear, like, watery noises. Can't be this well. Yeah, does, water, does water just like do that on its own, like unperturbed? It just sort of sloshes around <laughs> in a well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, someone, hmm. you know, a, a brick fell into it. I guess it's what I'm like. So he jumped down the well, and I guess he he shimmied like he 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 didn't like jump straight in, right? Because like he doesn't know how deep that well is. He might have broken his leg. So I guess he jumped. He's very in familiar with the like, well, for me. Very familiar. Before, he built like, this well. Got, went down and, and grabbed onto the well, uh, onto that. Trunk. This is the thing, right? Oh, when you're writing this, like, he jumped down the well, and it's like, well, how's he... You can't just jump down, you'll just fall. What's he holding on to? And it's like, a root. It's like, it, there's like, a root? It's like, yeah, there's just a root. As he was falling down the well? <laughs> he <laughs> shimmied he down, the grabbed well. the root, and now he's fine. It's not convenient. Well, there's plenty fine. of roots in wells. Fine, you know? Look, there is no way he got his fine. arm inside that root while he was falling down. No, yes, there no, is. So he must he... Have. He must have used the hilt, the spooky hilt, to fly. It probably has that power. <laughs> he floated. He, by down. the way, if he left the building and just went to the left, he would have been fine. Yeah, that's what I was saying. He could have ran home. He could have gone around the back of the house and then si like crouched and made his way up the hill, and they wouldn't have found him. Yeah. Do the meme in movies where like you just run and then you sort of go to the left or something, and then the bad guy just keeps running forward for some reason. <laughs> And then Once he left away. the door, if he would have just if he would have did that thing where he was standing up against the wall next to the door, and the orc just runs out fast right past him, and he sneaks back in, that would have been something. Well, look, Vrath. His name is Vrath, and he's grunting. Oh, look at this! I'm oh, grunting. splashes onto the camera. How do, Whoa. Orcs, how do orcs get their names? Oh, uh, they choose them. Do their do they have mothers? Do how do like who gives them their name? Well, they pulled out of their pods or wherever the fuck they're from. Adar is like, I'm gonna call you Sklurnch. And he's like, I don't want that. And then Sklurnch that. in the back <laughs> is like, you called me Sklurnch. And like, oh, yeah, that's right. Well, uh, some other guy is like, you know, Sklurnch. Wrath. You're and, Sklurnch. And you got Lutz. And it's like, can I have a cooler name? And he's like, what's wrong with Sklurnch? And he's like, well... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that guy got to be Kevin. Kevin's not even that great compared to Lutz, though. Lutz Kevin's is the cool name. not day. actually that great either, yeah. So, um, yeah, when he pulls that shit on the kid, like, luckily he doesn't make any noise that could, could alert him, and he didn't look down the well. You'd think he might, considering it's just one thing to knock off the list of things to check, right? But, um, unfortunately for Child, he throws the bucket down, and that hits, um, the kid in the head, or at least it, I think it either falls in front of him or hits him. Either way, he makes a noise. He goes, meh, or meh, meh, meh. And the orc is already, like, a meter away. I guess he was walking away and he tossed it in or whatever. But you hear the sound of a person 
clearly come from the well. <laughs> now, to me, that's enough to be like, guys, someone help me out, he's probably in here. Like, you know. But let me check, I guess, on my own, and if I don't see him, then that must mean he's not in there. It's like, okay, orcs aren't this stupid. Like, Jesus. And um, I think what annoys me even more about this, too, is that he looks down and the, the, the water is just still. It wouldn't be. No. Yeah. I don't think they realize and how long it, it takes water to settle, even from dropping a there, pebble in it. There's that element of, I'm concerned enough to, like, try and spook whoever's hiding in this well with my weapon out, and I look down, but I'm not gonna just wait a few moments to see, just in case they're below the water, you know, if, if they're gonna, you know, have them come back up. And to clarify, it's not completely still, but it's way more still than it would be for a whole fucking whole ass human like diving down into it. Well, even if he dropped the bucket into it, it wouldn't be this still. And he well, the, did drop the bucket into it. The bucket it, didn't so. go into it. It, it. it if you can see from this shot, it's it seems to be just above. Wait, the bucket hit the kid and didn't go into the water. Yeah, because the kid. If you think of it, the water and then above that, about a meter, is the kid, and the bucket hits oh, him in the head and is just above it. So then. That's the thing, though, that kind of makes it worse, because that means the kid had to fall a good, like, maybe meter and more, I don't know, because he wasn't in the water, he was up on the root. If you fall, like, a meter into the water, that's making a big sound, and it's that's not recovering. It's a big splash. Yeah, like, it's not recovering quickly, it's like, it's just, it's over. But then, he, you know, magic, he's just like, no, there's nothing there. And the orc is stupid enough to be like, well, there's no way he could possibly hide here, so he must not be here. It's like, I don't know, man, what about under the water? That seems he's like basically, a, he's, he's a level bad. one Metal Gear Solid guard. That's all it it's, is. It's, just... it's the kind of thing where you just, I want to be in his head and be like, hey, Mr. Orky Man, like, if he is under the water, you just need to wait just a couple seconds, just maybe a moment. minute. I mean, you know how him. important this is. He has the magic sword, you know? Yeah, I'm not asking you to get in there. Just watch. See if he resurfaces. Oh, there he is. You got him. Oh, great yeah. job. Guys, he's and down he's here. trapped. He's, he's literally gone. trapped. He can't go anywhere. Yeah. He can drown himself, yeah. but, you know. We've got this poison there, too. We can go get it later. I just fell down to the bottom. Uh, but yeah, very clever. He's he's right in there, and yeah, that's it for his story for now. We're going back to the dwarves and Elrond. Yay! Remember this storyline? Forgotten. Yeah, remember this storyline? <laughs> like, oh my god. To be fair, we when we were doing like a summary of the last episodes at the beginning of this stream, it's like, yeah, it's been an hour and a half, and they're finally showing us these guys again. It's like, huh. You spoil us. Not like we would. It's like, what storyline would you want? Like, which of the main four ones? Um. I, uh, I what's guess... my favorite? No, I... Which one do you want? If you if you get a roulette wheel, you're gonna get a scene from any one of them. Which one would you want? I guess the dwarf one. I guess so. Yeah, because I was like, there's no way it's the Harfoots. No, Galadriel is absolutely insufferable. And then, like, the elf guy with the humans plotline, we, ju we were just doing that. That's pretty bad, too. And it's like, so he, probably well, he is... has no character to know. Yeah, so it's, it's, it probably is Durin slash Disa slash Elrond doing things. That probably is no, the I, most... I may, have, um, I may have missed scene, this scene, but am I right in thinking so you get a glimpse through the window at some point and the construction project is well underway when you see it yeah which now makes us how, wonder I, how the fuck much time has he, passed yeah I, I'm again this the whole time thing with this show as we were discussing it just doesn't make a huge well any sense at all actually it's how did they get this far are we led to believe now that months have passed even though Quite clearly, months haven't passed because the last time we saw Don Lemon, only two days had passed, and Gladriel about four days had passed. Here, months have passed. I don't. It, the show unless doesn't seem to have any idea about how to link its timelines together. Unless they're suggesting that dwarves and elves working together is so good, this was done in like a day. It's just like, oh, <laughs> okay, sure, I believe you. But yeah, I don't know. I just what I saw is I was just like, Are you fucking kidding me? Holy shit! Also, no people in the CGI, it's just background. Yeah, there's no one working on anything. Yeah. Also, That's yeah. Saying, and, uh, the town looks very empty. It just looks vacant. Do you think they forgot to CGI in the workers? <laughs> Maybe it's I, the I, lunch I don't know break. if it's forgot or that there was, like, no consideration to do that. 
you'd think you'd see one guy, you know, at least. Just one guy chilling, like, you know, like yeah. those pictures in the twenty thirties yeah. New York sitting on the thing with a lunchbox. Like, yeah, yeah, like the that. steel beams up there. <laughs> yeah. Also, I, I want to see a story about those guys, honestly. The life I'd, of building this thing. That's way more interesting than Rings of Power. This amazing it magical is. fantasy world is like, no, I just want to learn about the 20s. Just how they did yeah. things. How oh, they did things. And um, judging by this tower, what sort of time? What, what, what time is it? How long has it been? Wow, you weren't we... listening to anything that was said. Fuck you. <laughs> that's, what, that's what me and Little Platoon were just talking about for like five minutes. <laughs> was it? Oh. Right, like, I, I understand. I was, we're we're coming up to eight hours. I understand. No, I was I was I must have been thinking of something else. Having another Biden moment. Them, That's okay. Thinking about them Harfits. It's okay. It's okay to have a little bit of a, a memory moment, you know? Or yeah, something. I was thinking about Harfits. I love them. So this scene Speaking of memory moments, Kelly Brimble has one in yes. this scene. It's very is, weird. He gives us one of the most useful lines when we're critiquing the show itself, because he he's filling in his own background, isn't he? <laughs> And then he says something like, um, you know, I, I'd quite forgotten it until this moment. Like, yeah, that, that's, that's the approach of the entire show. It's just nothing happens until I'm, the writers remember it in the moment. I'm somewhat okay with, I guess, the no. explanation of why he remembers it. It's just Elrond just happens to be in a no. way that reminds him of his father. Why now? It's why wouldn't it be the something... whole time they've been working together? Oh, he's never really looked out that window quite that way <laughs> in <into laughs> quite that <laughs> light before. While... <laughs> Celebrim Celebrimbor was standing in that oh, particular just, place to catch it. You totally looked like your dad at that very moment. Never have you looked like your dad enough before that it reminded me of the time your dad said you'd be important to my work. Like, ugh, it just sounds so shit. Yeah, maybe there's like a there's a painting of him that Celebrimbor or Celebrimbor. Which one is it? Hard or soft? I think I think it's, I think it's uh, hard. hard. I think it's Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor. Yeah, he's a, a portrait of his dad. It purely platonic. And he looks at this portrait a lot, and it just happens to be in that sort of position. And then well, it just gets him thinking. He just he just loves he just loves thinking. Either way, he says that also that he's pretty sure the dwarves are hiding something. Go check it out. And then Elrond's like, it's, oh, oh, okay. It, it's it's like the most generic of NPC dialogue. Yep, yep, like, yep. You look troubled, my lord. I think the dwarves are hiding something from me. Go have a look. Okay. Yeah, I Side will. Quest accepted. Off we go. Yeah, it's literally that. And then cut yeah, to him just with with more flowery language. Sometimes not even. <laughs> like, they don't even matter. Sometimes pull that off. not even. You're right. Um. So Elrond Sherlock's his way into saying Deesa's lying to him about where Durin is, which is true. But she manages to cover by I don't know saying like, no, nah, it makes sense that I'm making this thing because of this reason, and he hasn't taken his favorite axe thing because he doesn't need it because you pry this stuff, you don't mine it out or whatever. And he's like, uh, okay. But then Elrond uses his superpower that um, they really probably should have given us some context for, uh, considering a lot of people would have no idea that Elrond can even do this. But simultaneously, I wonder if anyone's going to bring up at any point, a little bit, it's a little bit naughty to spy on people. Just because you assume oh, they have secrets. Don't think about it. The, the writers don't even, like, that would never have even occurred to them. Elrond is the CIA, or he's, whatever. <laughs> he's, he's looking at your phone calls. Um, but yeah, of he, Elformation Act. <laughs> nice. Uh, he discovers that, yes, they are. I think that the, the conversation Durin and um, Disa have is, like, the most useful conversation that he could have uh, been eavesdropping on. He like mm -hmm. says where the thing is and that they are doing secretisms. And he's like, whoa. And then uh, these two gentlemen turn up. Um, and, and Rags, I think you were fond of the way their mask opened up, right? It was hilarious how the mask just opens up. If <laughs> yeah. You play the, it there just, it is. Yeah, like how did that happen? <laughs> how, <laughs> seriously, do you have like a lever or a string that you're pulling somewhere? No, it's, oh, it's, 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 it's like the Marvel like nanotech helmets. They just intuitively know when you want to say yep. something. <laughs> I wonder off. how they did it on set, unless that was CGI. I don't they... think they did it on set, Rags. I, that's my impression. I imagine that that was something that they... Fuck, maybe they did do it on set, actually. I, it it, it does look pretty good. It opens up so... But it could be CG. I don't know. Yes. It is yeah. kind of funny though. The other ones doesn't too. It's just his. It's totally. Well, no, he needs to talk. He wants to talk, and the other guy. 
Do you like Did that you they have? While you're wearing that, you know, no, they ha they have partial possible. beard armor. It is partial beard armor. You're right. Good to protect. You got to protect that beard, though. If you've been growing that for years, you know, you don't want to be in battle in some. And it's just good to have armor there possible. anyway. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Protects just... protects the thing beneath you. Well, I hope it doesn't your chest and your neck area. That's pretty important. Yeah. You know, pretty important part move... of the body. The fact that it protects the beard that's just a bonus. But can you move yeah. your head? On I was gonna say, it looks like it's attached to the beard. It looks like it's attached to the helmet. Oh, yeah. Because it's not attached to the helmet; it's attached to the chest plate. So I mean, sure? your beard is. Uh, hmm. Well, well otherwise, we otherwise to... their heads are locked in position, which is really. That's what I'm not saying. Convenient. Like, if if it's attached to the helmet, that is shit. <laughs> Yeah, but Maybe I mean, if that's attached to the, ceremonial. well, it has to. But if it's if it's attached to the helmet, it's, you, your your beard armor is going to be bumping into your chest plate when you turn. It's going to yeah. be real inconvenient. But if it's attached to your chest plate, you can't move your head either. You can't even you can't turn your head <laughs> sideways. If so it's you lose either way. Your beard just gets ripped off every time you turn. You're like, you know, I need to yeah, look my like, ah, ah, oh, okay. you wanna, yep, All right, he's over there. <laughs> you just want to bundle it up or something, crazy. roll it up, or maybe stick it underneath your shirt. Yeah, or I guess. Buy it back I mean, around that's, you that's or something. That's hardly convenient. That is hardly convenient. I'm starting to think that this beard armor is not as good as I thought it was. Yeah, rip beard no. armor. You know, you rise and fell. Like, in the yeah, same I moment. guess it depends yeah. on how you yeah connect it. Or beard armor. It's really cool looking. Well, uh, well, really, it might be it's doing neat. a bit of leg work. It's neat. <laughs> it's quaint, if anything. Gimli need doesn't need beard armor. Gimli is fine. Gimli's just cool. He doesn't need beard armor because he's impervious to being. Nobody's impervious nobody to being. <laughs> <laughs> Um, alright, so, Elrond overheard that there's a secret place to do secret things. He sort of just walks down to the entrance to the secret mine where they're mining something that's never been seen before. Already I was like, oof, you're annoying me. Why aren't there guards here? Oh, shit. Yeah. And if you were like, well, you wouldn't want to put guards there because it's a secret entrance. That would imply there's something to hide. And it's like, that's when you have... Old Derek Secret the, the dwarf, who's just like, oh, I'm just a janitor cleaning some stuff up. I'm definitely not an actual god who's just keeping an eye to make sure nobody gets in here and I'm gonna ask you what the just fuck you're doing here. Yeah. That's what you do. You put an inconspicuous dude. He's just sitting down having a sandwich and he's like, oh, hey man, what are you doing? And he's like, nothing. You've been having a sandwich for three days. <laughs> the game is up. <laughs> <laughs> Move along, elf. This is my sandwich eating place. A bastard. Um... And so this part, just, just really, I didn't understand. So he tries to push open the door, because he sees footprints leading to it, which, by the way, great job of your secret entrance by, like, come on. Are the dwarves that idiotic? They'd be like, oh, whoops, we forgot the part where our footprints clearly show it leads to a secret door. <laughs> Whatever. Um, he tries to push on the door. That doesn't work. And then he sings, or s speaks out a song he heard Deesa's children singing earlier. I, that's, oh... You kidding me? Is that where he? Could, I was trying to. I was trying to think where he'd heard that before, because it just seemed like it came from nowhere. But no, apparently he remembered this one specific chant that he heard some children singing, and that just happens to be the password. Like if you if you're gonna do a secret door thing, you might as, uh, do Age of Ultron. Just please be a secret door. Please be a secret door. Please be a secret door. And then oh, by luck he finds it. At least you can play it for laughs. Don't do like oh that some some kids about three hours ago were maybe humming a kind of a tune possibly. Why do they know the secret code? It. Why are they not singing it? What the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you make that the, why would you make it a word that just is distant and not used? Why would you, and why would Elrond think you know what? The code is probably that song those kids that were singing. Like it. what? Why would you it's think It's almost like that? a comedy thing where he tries it it doesn't work and he's like yeah I don't know why that would work. <laughs> I don't know what I was fucking thinking. Bizarre. What? And it works. <sighs> if yeah, it's shit. It's really shit. There you go, secret entrance opened. And then I was like, alright, so there's gotta be guards on that side of it, right? No, no guards. This is incredibly annoying. Um, and then, I don't know why this happens exactly, but Durin detects that Elrond is here, and is outraged and wants to shout at him. And it's just like, how did it you know? How did you... Like, were you just, you just walking by this way anyway? Is this just a huge coincidence? What? You can't write. You just can't. None of this follows anything. You're just having things happen. And so begins 
an exchange that was driving me mad. Because every goddamn conversation in this show does that. Sucks. Durin that opens with being like, You motherfucker, you're here to discover my secret. Which is, you know, that follows along from the paranoia they've had in other episodes where they think that the elves have decided to try and engage this uh, contractual obligation of, of creating that, uh, that, that, that old forge as a front when in reality they're after their new ore. That's what they believe is probably happening. And so this is proof. Elrond is in your secret mine and he's snooping. So yeah, he's like, you're here for the secret, you bastard. And then Elrond says... I don't care about the secret, I just want to know what's going on. And it's like, that... So you want to know about the secret? Yeah. <laughs> like, this is, they, that's what that is. They play on the line of the, the previous episode, and there's one when he says, like, is this the only reason you came to see me? You wanted to find out the secret. And he says, I came because... 20 years is far too long a time to be away from a friend. It's like, well, that's no, bullshit. the whole point of the preceding argument was that you didn't realize that 20 years was a long time. Exactly. So you're obviously bullshitting. Don't do that. He's obviously, well, the fact is, like, he almost admitted, like, what, do you stumble into the secret area without any interest in secrets? Fuck off. You absolute liar. <laughs> and, like, I'm for some reason, Durin no, can't no, tell. It's cool. I'm here because friendship. That's it. Yeah. The power of friendship famously solves all problems, and so... And so, it. as far as I'm concerned, Durin has all the reason in the world to be furious. He already didn't believe that Elrond was here for good intentions, and now he's caught him red-handed in his secret area, having broken in, essentially, because this is absolutely not... Like, Elrond's not stupid enough to think, oh, yeah, I'm allowed to be in here. he's past the door now. So, yeah, this is everything you thought, this is all your fears come true, and Elrond's friendship just like... over. And everyone's like, no, 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 it's, it's chill. It's chill. That's fine. And then Durin's like, hmm. Okay, well, if I tell you the secret, you've got to promise not to tell anyone. I, like, my head know, fell out of my skull. I know skull. you might like, be a spy, but if I tell you the secret, don't tell anyone, don't okay? Tell anyone. Thank you also, I don't get it. Also, I'll, give you, I'll give you a piece of the secret. Wait, we're getting there, okay? Piece by, yeah, we're getting there, step, step by step, because this shit is unreal. Why would you be like, I will now tell you the secret? After confirming he was literally searching for your secrets and has just found it himself anyway. I mean, he's found enough to be able to report back. But all he has to say is like, no, 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 I'm not in your secret room having discovered your secret code because I have interest in your secrets. I'm just here because I'm your friend. And Durin's like, that's oh, okay, I trust do. you. They discover yeah. each other's secrets. I think, yeah, I, think I, I turned right. up two days ago after 20 years because I wanted something from you. And then, I'm obviously just here now because of friendship. But do you understand, like, the reason this is... This is killing me. He's like, you want my secrets? His response is, no, I don't. And Durin's response to that is, okay, I'll tell you my, my secrets. secrets. My what secrets. the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. None of that a, follows. A spy wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> and then Elrond, if he was to be consistent with what he's just said, would be like, well, I don't care about your secrets. You don't have to tell me. But instead he's like, oh yeah, sure, give me your secrets. <laughs> it's like, what did you... Durin, do you need any more evidence? What's wrong with you? He just wants the secrets. That he's like, you gotta swear on the mountain that you'll never tell a soul, and that if you do... Does he say your life is forfeit? I don't even remember. It's, it's along those lines. You know Something what he should have like done? He should have took... He should have taken Elrond up to that special tree and said, you swear on the tree. That means more to you than swearing on a mountain. You're an elf. And so, you swear on this fucking tree. Then the tree comes up again in the story. So he explains what it is. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's an Thank ore. You. And he says that the ore is lighter than something, thread, cloth, something like that. Silk, I think. Lighter than silk and like better than any metal they've come across. Basically, the, just, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the magical metal that a lot of uh, IPs have. Adamantium, for example, or, or, um, or vibranium. You get that special super metal. And this is mithril. Um, he explains that to him. And then Elrond says... Why all the secrecy for that? I'm like, I just want to die. I'm like, what do you mean why all this? It's the most valuable thing ever. Like, <laughs> like, this is a new discovery. It would change everything about all technology. Why would you say, oh, why do I want to keep that secret? Like, I think, yeah, I mean, Durin even says that this has the potential to revolutionize everything. That new wealth, new fortune, new technology, new science, everything. Everything yep, changes yep, yep, because yep. of this. 
I guess the only reason to take Elrond's side in that, though, is because you don't have an indication of its abundancy. So the show hasn't made it clear, I don't think, anywhere, that it's an especially rare substance. Even so still. You could argue that Elrond is at least able to ask the question because for all he knows it might be super abundant in which case there's no real reason to be secretive about it because there's enough to go around for everyone but the show doesn't then go on to explain how rare it really is so i mean i don't even know that you could yeah. say that he could infer that when it's like this is the first discovery of it across middle earth like this like it's obvious isn't it just rare by necessity at that point yeah to their um, it must be well if yeah if they're just now like, he even calls it a new ore yeah, if it must be extremely yeah. rare. If there is a literal it's infinite amount knowledge. in this uh, tunnel, which is incredibly unlikely, uh, it would still be a, like it, it would still be an incredibly high demand. It would still be like a mm -hmm. incredibly valuable thing until it's widespread enough. Like, yeah, and, 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 and the implication is because the the king is very uh, unsettled about the prospect of them digging as deep as they are digging for mithril. Mm -hmm. So it, it must be very hard to get down to. Yeah. The problem is though that the, the, the setup is that. Duran explains that Deesa sensed the presence of Mithril randomly on one excursion down a tunnel, which isn't the most um, evocative reveal you could possibly imagine. No, but um, it, it's obviously it, obviously this is this is leading up to the revelation, the, the awakening of the Balrog. I mean, that's what everyone remembers Mithril from. The dwarves delve too greedily and too deep. Yeah, um, that's where this is all leading. Yeah, the problem is, and you know, that's a massive event in history. In the history of Middle Earth, but unfortunately, the the, the previous episode, um, no, sorry, the the one before the previous episode, episode two, closes with the the literal mystery box, right? So the king takes him down into one of the deeper recesses of the caves, and he opens a box, and you see it glowing, and you think, oh, it's it's Marcellus Wallace's prehistoric briefcase, but you don't know what's in it. If it's going to just be mithril inside that case, which it turns out it is, that's almost an anti-climax compared to what they could be doing because you know they're going to discover mithril at some point the elves have no pre-established keen interest in mithril so all of this is kind of supposed to be teasing the collapse in relations between elves and dwarves hence all the distrust between them but if you go back to the lord there are many many reasons to set up that distrust and to actually break the alliance between elves and dwarves um, there's a fight, literal, an actual war against the elves by the dwarves over uh, one of the Silmarils, for example. You could have introduced that as a secondary or a separate thing. If it's just Mithril, which we all know is going to be discovered anyway, it's kind of like, oh, well, yeah, we, we knew that was coming. So the mystery box isn't really a mystery. Also, it's in the fucking trailers, so it's not a mystery either. Um, the Mithril thing was just a bit kind of meh to me. Yeah. No, I, I I follow. Um, <clears throat> and and this like gets worse thing as as you brought up, uh, but we're at it now. Is that he he's gone as far as revealing the whole secret to Elrond, which is something he was absolutely not supposed to do. Had no reason to actually do it, and Elrond said he doesn't care to find it out either. So this is just incredibly frustrating, and I already know that it's facilitating something, kind of what you were alluding to in what you just said. Because in the next time on Rings of Power. We saw something, and I'm going to get to it in just a sec. He gives mm. him a piece of, of Mithril for no reason at all. In, in fact, I would just be like, if I were Elrond, I'd be like, what are you... Are you trying are you, to set me up? Trap? Yeah, like, yeah. You, are you doing this on purpose? Because, like, why the fuck would you do this? Like, it's such a weird move. And he's like, it's a, it's a token of our friendship. And it's like, man, you are a trusting guy when you have absolute... This is what frustrates me so much about Durin. He's such a fucking idiot. He has no reason to trust Elrond at all. Elrond has been absolutely top-tier manipulator to someone who is just an idiot. He wouldn't have gotten away with all this shit with a normal person. Because, like I said, he wouldn't have gotten back into his good graces at all if he ditched him for two decades no. to a normal person. But, um, uh, not only that then, just, just... Fuck, he broke in, dude. I know it doesn't really count as a break in if they have a key, but like he stole the no, key. You know what I mean? But he, yeah, exactly. This isn't, he didn't just randomly accidentally walk into a place. He figured out the secret code I overheard to get the into password. the secret place. Yeah, like what are you going to argue? Oh, that was all just a coincidence. I don't know. I was whistling the tune and then this door opened. I don't know. <laughs> like, I assumed a locked door was there for me to open. If I happen to have overheard the password, that means I'm, I'm allowed in. Yeah, locked doors are meant to be unlocked, right? That's the whole point. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of that there is a long-standing narrative problem with the show, which is that 
it it has this conception of the point of a particular character, but it's incapable of not hammering that point right into your fucking face. So it's the same thing with um with the Brandyfoot, for example. Like every conversation she has has to be about her being rebellious and, and going against the norms of society every single time, just in case you missed the point. So the point they had with uh, Elrond and Durin is the fractured friendship, but the desire to remake it. And in the first episode when they meet each other, sorry, episode two, that is, isn't it, I think, mm-hmm. when they when they finally meet again, it's actually, it's kind of movingly done. They they portray it reasonably well. They actually have the first, the show's only emotional exchange in dialogue between two characters. I'll agree with you and on that. That works quite well between Elrond and Durin on the lift and they carry it on reasonably well as well so you have the tree that he's planted because the tree is kind of the symbolic representation of this everything you lose when the friendship falls apart but also everything you you symbolically want to recreate or regrow and that's all really good and the show does it really well the problem is it thinks it's onto a good thing and so it wants to really hammer home the uh, the repaired friendship point which is what leads it then to this scene. So Duran immediately trusting or distrusting and then trusting that this is symbolic of the repaired friendship and then the giving of Mithril to Elrond for no substantial reason at all. That's again symbolic of the point the show wants to convey with these two characters. It's not justifiable within universe but like y- it's justifiable from the writer's point of view because this is the point of these two characters. It's just really... It, it's yeah, There it, are subtler ways you could go about this. It, it would have been more engrossing if you had been subtler about it, but they don't trust the audience, I don't think, to actually appreciate a subtle sort of friendship-repairing story, I don't think. Well, I was just going to go as far as saying, like, that is absolutely their goals. I just think their execution with all of it has been really pissed because that was actually one of the i think my favorite moment across the four episodes when durin just straight up rips into him for being a bad friend i was like oh that's cool and then that just yeah, sort of gets yeah. like undone a scene Instantly, later pretty much yeah it's just like oh uh, well, that's uh, lame the, the next scene they play it for laughs so yeah, yeah the whole elevator sequence which is really emotionally fraught and quite well delivered apart from elrond's apology which isn't but then there's a cut to when they're walking in and he says um you know no staying for dinner no making friends it's just oh okay so we have this nice real impactful emotional scene but now yeah now we have to just joke about that so uh, yeah Yeah, and now we've pretty much moved on to the point of like that's all done with like you're forgiven we're friends again yeah, Except, God, what else can you, do? you might be after my secrets. And he's like, I'm not after your secrets. I'm just in your secret room to talk to you about not things to do with your secrets. And he's like, oh, that's great. I believe you. Now let's that? talk about my mm-hmm. secrets. Now let's talk about them. And let's not only talk about them. Let's, Paul, are uh... you describing the events as they happen accurately as being really unfair to this show? <laughs> Is it... That's a good point, Rags. It's very unfair. Look handing... at how uncharitable he's been. Handing Elrond the ore. You only offer him now proof to the other elves and an yeah. actual piece to be able to study. I don't Why know, would you even do if you that? Trust him, by the way. Even yeah. if you totally trust him, he could just drop that shit. Like mm-hmm. he could yep. fucking, it could fall out of his pocket, or he could like put it down on his desk and then forget about it, and someone notices. There is like, no reason only... at all to do that. But no, absolutely no reason. Then, and I'm so sorry to do this. Apologies ahead of time. Next time on Rings of Power, the first seed they show you is Elrod showing the ore to Celebrimbor. Awesome. <laughs> Why would yeah. they choose that? Like to that that's an interesting decision if a meta perspective of what are we gonna show in our coming up? Instantly well, betraying the promise that he made. Critical. Yeah, just to clarify, yeah. he made him promise like on the ma- this is like on the who the fuck cares, the right? Yeah. Who cares? And Elrond he never, swears on like he would the... never say anything to anybody, not anybody. And Elrond in the swears world. on like his father or something. But he's like, yeah, I trust, I trust him though. Don't worry. This is what I mean. Are we gonna get a moment where <laughs> Elrond just says like, yeah, fuck Durin? <laughs> Something, I don't know, is that gonna happen? Or is he just gonna be like, oh no, I didn't tell anybody about your secret, I just showed him the cool rock. I, I, is that a secret? I didn't realize, I'm sorry. Oh, that's we're what still we were staring over. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the secret, I thought the secret was I the cave-in. Misread. Yeah, I wasn't gonna tell him about that. <laughs> I was gonna I, tell him the cave-in, dude. It's I wasn't okay. gonna tell Osha about the cave-in, is what I was, <laughs> I thought that's, okay. Oh, it's I so gotcha. stupid. And yeah, like, he said, he, remember, Elrond's supposed to be banished from all dwarven lads, by the way. 
Well, he is supposed to be. <laughs> He's he supposed to be. The challenge. He lost. Like, definitively. But that just didn't. Yeah, it just didn't. Didn't whatever. even matter. Why did they do that? I don't what know. <laughs> And they uh, they have an Avengers moment here, at least that's how I will refer to it, and you'll know what I mean in a second, but <laughs> he's like, moment. pretty sure it's like, or something, and then and then Elrond's like, no, it's 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 this, that, the other, it's, it's Mithril. And the camera like is really tight on him as well, and it's just like, <gasps> dun, 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 dun. you like references to dun, things. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is the shot, by the way, when he says it. Look at this. It's such a, like, hey, audience, you remember that. You know remember, what remember this the, is. Remember the vest, the, the t-shirty thing, the saves for, that was, that was made of this. You remember he that? Symbolically, yeah. he's eating the member berry as we watch. Yep. <laughs> Ugh. Boo. <laughs> Keep it as a token of our friendship. Oh, God, I hate you. You know that really deep friendship that we, we have? That I'm going to betray one episode two hours ago. <laughs> anyway. Yep, he just straight up betrays him straight away. I don't... I, uh, why do you make us watch this? If <laughs> this was your fault. You could have just had us remain as the, the primordial soup. That's what we could have been. Just amoebas running around. But no. Had to develop us all up and then make this show. Uh, scene with girl and guy. I got nothing for this. Uh, he's wooing her. Next scene. Alrighty. We got us. I, so uh, I, I reckon for that though. I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever seen. Uh, is it Carnival Row? I have um, the Amazon thing with in Furniture Orlando. Row. Uh, furniture, probably about the same quality. Um, Orlando Bloom and Cara Delevingne. Yes. Um, and the, the, there's a, a subplot in there where the Chancellor's son and the daughter of the leader of the opposition um, sort of hook up, and it leads to political shenanigans. Mm -hmm. And I have a really, really strong feeling that Amazon has been trialing these fantasy so fa fantasy shows. So um, Carnival Row. And Wheel of Time has been victim of this test period. And what it's doing for this show is essentially borrowing elements from all of them. So you have the the corrupting dagger, which you see in Wheel of Time. You have the relationship between the daughter of two political leaders, as uh, instantiated in these two characters. I have a nasty feeling that's what they're doing. And so this will become very relevant later. It's just that we don't give a fuck about either of the characters involved in it. So we won't care when it comes to fruition. But I'm sure they're doing this for intrigue purposes and it will actually have some kind of impact. It'll have a great point. consequence, yeah. And we're going to be like, ugh. Hmm. So anyway, Galadriel scene. Yay. Yeah. It's been so long. I was going to say. I've forgotten what she's like as a person. It's a really good scene, too. Um, Sauron is like, you're not battling trolls or orcs, you're battling men. And then she goes, are you, you really were, trying you to instruct me? Run. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck it, everyone knows, right? <laughs> um, she's like, are you really trying to instruct me in the art of war? It's like, uh... You are... You are... <laughs> A dense motherfucker, aren't you? <laughs> every time. Every time. She just never misses a beat. Um, it's yeah, and so he basically says... There's a line when he says, show, show them what they fear. And then she interrupts and says, so I can use it against them. Like, no, <laughs> She's no, a so bad can, guy. She's so, you can, so you can give them what they fear. I say, ah, oh, so this is supposed to be subtle foreshadowing to what you're doing to her, not Sauron. Or uh -huh. actual Sauron. Um, but her in instinctive reaction is just so I can manipulate people and batter the fuck out of them. No, no, just yeah, stop being be such normal. a dunce. It, 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 legit, if he was giving her advice on how to deal with the region, she would just keep asking, like, when do I kill her? When do I slit her throat? When do I kill her in her sleep? When do I, and he's just like, can you stop for five seconds? I'm trying fucking to crazy manipulate person. you. Stop fucking talking. Ugh. Can yeah, you believe um, that he rudely didn't let me manipulate him? <laughs> what a dick, am I right? What I found annoying about this is he's like, you've been trying to get to her, and you didn't realize like what, what was happening when you finally got to her, and she's like, oh, it's when I was talking about her dad. And it's like, well, a lot more was happening in those sentences than just the dad being brought up. Like, you questioned her authority in general. That could have been what pissed her off, not the fact that you're bringing up her dad. Or the fact that you're being so impetulant and she hates you anyway. 
<laughs> it's like, no, we've concluded this about her dad. And it's just like, okay, I guess. I mean, we've got to conclude this act to move on. We haven't got time. I just think it's really lame. We are once again being like, see how clever the the the, the whole brand is and how how neat it is that she's picking up on this stuff too. And it's just like, no, no. The stuff they come up with and it works, it's it's all bullshit. Unfortunately. There will, honestly be, there will be people who look back on this scene at the end of the show once Sauron has been revealed to be Halbrand, and they will say, Look how clever this writing was, because in this scene he was telling her exactly what he was doing to her. Yeah. Isn't this an example of subtle, clever, nuanced, manipulative writing? And you'll think, no. It's clearly manipulative. Everyone saw this coming from about five miles away. It's time. Oh, oh fuck. This oh, this is, oh, my goodness. This is such a great <laughs> no. scene. I love this scene. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Anybody in chat who hasn't seen this, get excited, all right? This is a... This is a this is a treat. This so, is spectacular. The gods are here to collect Galadriel. Galadriel. I should go to roll those eyes. You know? <laughs> and she is, of course, ready and willing to submit because she's a she's a good girl. Or is she? We are about to see something pretty fucking cool, guys. Oh, oh I hope you guys God. are ready for this episode of Batwoman. I'm preemptively cringing. So, as you can see, she had her hands ready for some chains, but this poor fucker, he was like, oh, I'll put up them on, and then she... He took her in she, a word. Yeah. That was his first mistake. I'd lost. Look at these hand <laughs> movements. What's going on? It's so unclear. She, she... Ah! Oh. <laughs> Did you see the guard? He's just like, oh no, I'm hurt, I guess. Oh! <laughs> you got oh, no. me. I should have been a stormtrooper. Oh, ah! I hear the you got me. So, we really need to keep track of this, we're going slow. That guy is just falling yes, headfirst into into her yeah. little cage thing. I don't know why, he just is. A... Well, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go one by one, alright? So that guy's in, he's just going right in. But the guy behind her to the left, he's now falling in too. Oh, 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 and oh, in he how goes. Did happen? Oh, how did that happen? How did that happen? I have no oh, idea. Oh, he just walks into it. <laughs> Kind of walked oh, in. Oh, the misery! <laughs> it's he just walked in. <laughs> oh, the misery! <laughs> he just walked in. Look at him. So it, this is hilarious. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking, but I will. I will happily play it again because there are ways you could do the scene, probably. But just bringing her hands down, just doing some weird move. And I love the expression of this guy. Ah! <laughs> like, <laughs> oh no, she's so strong she's somehow. Terrified. How is she so strong? She's, she's so though. skinny. Just look, but look at that guy. He just goes in. He just kind of like goes in. And in. Guys, oh, he, yeah, he voluntarily went guys, in. He is saw it, this. Is that... He's like, uh uh, this is a female protagonist. I ain't getting anywhere <laughs> near her. Is that Let three? Me in for my own safety. Is that three guys? Wait, how'd the third. Um, it does is look he? like there's another guy in there. Why are you in there? There's no one in there. No, no there's only Why two, are you in there? I assume there's there only... were only four in total. There's no, four in total. So that if there's four in total, then... In... Yeah. No. No, He's in there. come on. Yeah, come that's, on. Where he, that's where he hangs no. out. No. Yeah, no. Yeah, come that's, on. That's no, that, I don't... No, I don't accept that. That's that's absurd. No, that's... see, there's... I'll try and get you a, okay, so a wide shot here. Just a thing. Oh, you're, right, do, I, three you're right! You're right! There's four. Two, there are four guards, so yeah, she sends like four guards. guards. There, Jesus. There is just. I throw one of them, the three of them, like, maneuver and nudge yeah. their way. <laughs> Can you imagine? Three are like, in the... instantly for no reason at all. <laughs> like, they just, yeah, there's look at three them. in one wow. go. Oh my god. <laughs> it, was, it was bad enough. They just go in. in. They just they're walk just in for her. In. <laughs> they're walking in. Jesus fuck. How do you it's direct so this? so bad. Because you'd have to just direct them to just sort of just walk in and well, act as I if you've been pushed in. It's it's kind of like you're on set and you're like, oh, this can't work. And then you're just like, ah, well, fuck it. Nobody would notice. Oh, God. Yeah, then the last one she's dealing with, she just tosses him right in too. So Phasmataz um, is pulling his yeah. sword out. And the fucking other prisoner is like, I wouldn't advise fighting. And he's like, I can't just let her leave. And he goes, you could, if you knew where she was going. Oh my god. Which is like, what? What do you mean? And what he means is, if you know that she's heading to the king's tower, that's where she's going, you can let her go. Because then you can head her off at that place. 
As it's opposed like, to what? Actually apprehending her right here and now in this prison. While he just watches his man get, <laughs> like, shepherded into himself for no reason at all. It's yeah. such a weird scene. And what do you think those men are going to say when they later get asked at what their happens? performance like, review? <laughs> yeah. So right, guys, well, okay. It's, it's like the, the cop comes in and he's like, all right, take, let's take it from the top. Like, what happened? Like, <laughs> like, grabbing his cloak. Well, you see, <laughs> see how did four <laughs> armed guards <laughs> somehow <laughs> end up in cell? I see you've got six years, six years, six years exemplary service, but there's just this <laughs> one incident on your record. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what, so tell me what happened. You, you, it? Well, you understand, like, that when someone pushes you, you don't need to, like, move your feet. You can just, like, keep ah. them still on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, she got as me. a palace guard... We expect you to, to to resist aggression in what, some what ways. What actually happened? What <laughs> actually <laughs> happened? Oh yeah, you to yeah, all. they wouldn't they'd believe be, her. They've been on their so feet. Like, What's up with this? Look, they've been on their feet for twelve hours. They weren't given like a lunch break. It's like this is the quickest way that I'm gonna get to sit down. Like, all right, I still got like another five hours on this shift. If she I just go in. And and sit yeah, down. and then they help her to close the door, I guess. <laughs> Why Actually, wouldn't well, they? Yeah, the, right, look, the door is closing from the inside. It's, it's so fucking from... stupid. What were they thinking? Why were they doing like this? You didn't have. It could have been two guards. You know what? Look you at this. Just... He can grab her through the bars, but he refuses to. Like you can put an arm through, but he just won't. Yeah. Damn, damn um, these! Damn you! You've got me. Key to open uh, it up. How can they not get out? They have the keys. Well, right? yeah. You think apparently not? Of them she's have a key. locked it from outside. The all grunting thing is what I imagine the writers' room sounded like when they were discussing this scene. Does this have an automatic lock? She closes the door and it's locked. Does she not need to lock it with a key? I guess we're just not. closing it. Lock it. No, no, Man, no. Okay. No, it just does it that itself. That's the most believable part of this entire. Like, what a stupid scene. It's this is really bad. Dumb. This is desperate. This scene is desperate to make her look cool and amazing. There's no way that you can have her doing this that's believable. Well, maybe not no way. It would take an incredible amount of skill to make this believable. Yeah, why, why not just have, like why not have Al Farazon or, or, that, or Al Farazon just comes in with one guard that she lobs into the cell? No, no, yeah, yeah at least then I'll complain and be like, they should have had more guards, but that's better than this. Right. Or yeah. you could just have this be like an action scene where she has to like take them all like one by one, and like she incapacitates all of them methodically, rather there than has like to be something. Well, well, I mean, if we're gonna show her prowess as like a fighter, that probably seems like the way to do it. Actually, have her engage in a fight where she beats them through like you know smart basically skills and tactics Finds and ways cunning to isolate and them and then take them out rather than something. And grabbing and, one guy and hoping that the two guys behind you just sort of waddle in to the cell and then you grab the last guy before he manages to attack you and then throw him in. Yeah, inexplicable overpowering of these four men. I just, I don't believe you that she can do that. I don't believe it's, you. You're well, going to so have to do something me, else. For me, it really is the waddling that destroys it. It's, it's the fact that the two guys behind her like kind of waddle into this Oh, I guess we're going in here now. That's the part that does it for me. Dude, it's so odd. Because look at the positioning that they were in as she walked out. How did you move three of them behind you and into the cell? <laughs> How? Well, what was her plan if those two guys weren't right directly behind her? I they, guess but they weren't. Right That's the whole point more. I'm making. They were not behind her, but then they yeah, teleport behind her. That's right. Well, yeah, because if you pause... Nothing like, personal, you, you kiddo. <laughs> Teleports right, behind her. Yeah. Oh, Even oh. close the door. Wait a minute. Oh, also oh, the, door opened, the door. Wait, the door. The door opens the door from the closed. outside. Wait a minute. The door opens. You see that? Ways, the door opens from the outside. Does it? I guess it swings <laughs> both ways. If yeah, I guess if it's just on a hinge and there's nothing to stop it. Uh, but if he closed just... it, it has the automatic lock, doesn't it? How do you but lock then it, it would... then? Like what? Well, I guess I you could understand. lock it at a particular point as long as the she locking just closes it. Yeah, she how is she closing it, it then? Either it, either it auto locks or it doesn't. Totally yeah, because if they yeah. go through it, the door is on their side. But exactly. But then she pulls it and it stops. It doesn't go to be fully fair, the other way. All we have to do to make her seem really cool is to break space and time in the rules of motion. <laughs> that don't really everything. break. It's more so that they break the logic of doors and locks. I don't. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, that in, it's I mean, a form of breaking space, I think. That's true. That's true. It's magically yeah. open again. Yeah, so well, just, just to make sure you understand, right? If you could just oh, push yeah, someone into right? the door and it opens, that means it wasn't locked automatically when you pulled it close. And then she pulls it close and it does auto-lock. It's just and like... what was her plan if if it, if it, they had locked it behind her? She throws them into the door. It's like, oh, it well, that was, that was annoying. Yeah, we it's got still on the inside here. But well, it can't... It was on why the would it be on unless, the inside? Because unless she closed... It, that makes sense. Is she bolting it with that action there? In which case... Wait, if she pulled it, how does it stop? But, Why would it bolt there if the door opens beyond that point? But if there's yeah, a bolt, then they could just read through the bars and unbolt it. I was about again, to, so so I was about to say, first there's of all, they could just the undo it pretty easily. And secondly, like, how did she have the time to get it closed and to do that with four guys trying to get out of there straight away? Like, that and you can grab her! You can she... grab her! No, I can grab the bars. I can grab the bars oh. and go, girl. It's like, oh no, oh, uh, maybe Why? it's a roleplay thing. Why? Why? <laughs> so badly done. Why? You have so much money. You have 500 million. <laughs> anyway. Bad writing. It all counts for nothing. Isildur says, I shame my family. I don't deserve stuff. Next Correct. scene. <laughs> yeah, you're a fucking prick. I hate you, Isildur. You're right. Fuck. We're on to this part. Right. So there's the king's tower. Galadriel fucking scaled the entire thing. I don't yeah. know how. I, I missed this entire bit. So she actually oh. climbed that entire tower. Yes. Yeah, outside in a dress. Jesus. In a dress. How the fuck? Holding up to because I couldn't tell you the answer to you that. You can see her at the top. How did you do this? Without anyone <laughs> seeing you, anyone noticing you. Not to mention the fact that I don't believe it's physically possible for you to climb that tower. No. There's nothing to grab onto. It looks like just sheer edges. Yeah, no. I'm glad to have this opportunity to go back through all these scenes that I overlooked on my first watch and find that, no, in fact, they're actually worse than I remembered them being. That's, yeah. That's great. We did, well, hopefully nobody's confused on how three and four are much worse than one and two. Like, this is pretty staggering. We didn't have anywhere near this amount of things to talk about. But she gets in. Um, I don't know where to begin with this one. It drives me <laughs> nuts. But I suppose we should go with... Faradam's in. He, he knows this is happening. He, he, he knows that she's going there. That's, that's what that line was for. But he's informed the Queen Regent, who's got access to all kinds of guards. So that's all happening, while Galadriel assumes she's got the jump on the King. And of course, she wants to get to the King to be able to talk to him about how, hey, Sauron's a real threat, I need help, give me some armies. That, by the way, is her ace in the hole. She believes that if she gets to this guy, because he's, he's, he's a friend to the elves, that he will just authorize going to war and give her armies. But that, that can't be a thing, because she knows the Queen Regent's title is the Queen Regent, so yes. the king isn't in charge. The king does not have... No. She, would, she should know that very well. The king is lucky to be in this tower... Like he's lucky to be in this comfy bed. It sounds like nobody's fucking listening to him. So this is Galadriel's plan. I don't know why this is her plan. I don't know why she thinks this will work. Spoilers, it does work. <laughs> um, but maybe more pressing is this. Uh, this is a reveal. It's like the Queen Regent was here the whole time. Bum bum bum. Bum bum And then bum. the first thought you should have is like, where are the gods? Elf matched in through the fucking window. She just turns around. The as guards are in the cell. Where, where are her legion of guards? She says she has a garrison, but they're all waiting outside, is what she says. Um, They might want to be inside, love, because Galadriel's already said she's willing to kill you. You might want to get some... And you've, uh, broken into, you've broke out of prison, you climbed into the 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 old king's chamber and apparently our queen's up there too. Oh well, yeah, oh, should we, how many how many crimes has she committed? Like several. All of them. All she's of done them. pretty much. She's, yeah, she's gone this through the book like a fucking checklist. Um, I just... this is so Great stupid. It, it's treated as though the queen regent has has hatched a plan here, like a really good trap, when she hasn't done shit all that's going to be helpful to her if Galadriel uh, just makes a couple decisions here. 
In fact, she might just kill the Queen Regent for annoying her. I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, there's nothing stopping her from doing so. Even though the Queen Regent had the full upper hand here. It's, it's amazing. Um, but then the other question came to mind, in my head. How did uh, Farazan, whatever, how did he know she was coming here? Did he tell her after, did, uh, did Behold tell him after so she left? That was going to be my only guess, was that Hullbrand was the one that told him. But why would because he do he that? Has, how would... I think because he's trying to ingratiate himself with all the principal players. So, but, so eventually he has to corrupt both Galadriel, according to wait, this show's canon, and also Alfarazan, or Farazan even. That's going to have this, this unfortunate effect of making Galadriel feel completely fucking betrayed. Oh, but I think that's the point eventually is she will be and she'll realize she But it's a bit too early, isn't it? But she would have to... Well, oh, I see, I see what you're saying. So she would have to discover that that's the reason he found out. Um, it takes two so seconds to figure this to... out. <laughs> like, yeah. The only other yeah, person who knew yeah. is... like <laughs> I don't understand. This is what I mean. I was like, One either person in the room. They just knew for no reason at all, which is terrible. Or they found out from Holbrand, which means that Galadriel will be like, "Wow, Holbrand, you sold me out, you piece Evidently, of shit." Yes, this is this is complete horseshit. Yes, you're right. I don't understand. Why do they write? Why not just not write at all? Just stop it. Put the pen down. Just enough. Yeah. Because the the king we see here is a vegetable, but the writers can only aspire to his level of cognition. I think that's basically the reason. Ugh. So, she's like, I got you, bitch. And then the bitch is like, nah. Because, seriously, though, bad things are going to happen. And then, I, I think... <laughs> the level, your level of passion is overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, the king is like, sweetheart, I feel ill. And then she's like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> and then, I think... Galadriel's like, tell me about stuff and things. And then she like literally takes her on a little fucking history tour. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. She just yep. gets to do everything believe it. she wants. It's like, who are you? What are you supposed to... Do you remember when she was chewing out a lead deal for saving her life? And now she's taking her on a full tour of her like most secret area of the entire city? Like, what are you... See, if you just the... keeps happening. What is it's happening? <laughs> like, what is... <laughs> At the end of episode two, I might have said, look, she's got some of the traits of a Mary Sue, but she's not a Mary Sue because she's quite clearly objectionable to a lot of people in universe. But by the end of episode four, all the people she's offended have now come to like and trust her and she has not changed one iota. So she basically, unfortunately, and irritatingly is kind of a Mary Sue, overpowered and everyone in the end comes to like and trust her and to show her their deepest, darkest secrets, including in this case, actually giving her a glimpse through the Palantir. It, the logic of not, the world uh, bends to facilitate her desires. Yeah, the world oh, is, is in Galadriel's with her. world. Yeah, it's, and it's so great that she can break into the fucking king's bedroom after having locked all of her captors into her own cell, after having broken out, and she can just get away with all of that. It's insane. Absolutely mind blowing. Um, but then she's like, I have a Palantir. Mm -mm. And then she's like, You should touch the Palantir. And she's like, I have touched them before. You have not touched one like this. And then she's like, I have touched them oh, before. It's like an echo of episode one. What, what's interesting really? is that the queen says, We don't know. There are seven. We don't. The other six are destroyed or unaccounted for. And instantly she says, Well, I've touched one. The queen, and, and the queen that, doesn't feel the, the need to. Be going, yeah, the, exactly. The queen doesn't feel the need to. Wait, wait, wait. What? You know where another one is? This is like the gateway to modern viewing and travel and communication. Are, are you? Are you shitting me? You really know? Yeah, and, and, and it's it, not even a matter of like. It's not. It doesn't have to be that the queen regent believes she could get it. It's just that it would just be a curiosity to be like, this is the only one we're aware of. And then she's like, oh, I've used one before. I've like, touched one. Oh shit! Where? When? Oh, really? What was it like? Yeah. What, was it? what did it say? It, what did uh, it do? Who has it? Is it one of your people who has it? Can we chat? Can we double check? Because just... that would be really useful right now if we could actually we could check in with him and see like what they think of you and all this. Yeah, you'd think she'd show more interest in that line, but I don't even know that the actress was told 
or well, anyone knew anything about anything. I just well, they don't because at this point in history, I mean, the point of the plant is at this point in history isn't really to give glimpses of the future. They are actually used for long range communication. So the elves have, well, I think, all seven of rings. One of them is given to the Numenorians, but the rest of them are with the various tribes of the elves, and they're, they're placed in towers to allow them to communicate across vast distances. They, of course, have the power to do foresight and the rest of it once their sort of central link node hub is broken. At this point, that's not supposed to have happened, but the fact that they've introduced one here, whilst also assuming that the rest have already been lost or disappeared or broken, just begs so many more questions that, again, the show isn't going to have time to answer properly. So why is it that there's only one that they know of in Numenor? What happened to the other ones? Are they going to address that? There I should guess, be many more. There are seven others, or six others, sorry, which they should account for at some point. I guess if you're here on this island and they and, and you stop getting messages back, you just assume, well, we don't know what happened to them. So that's that's lame. <sighs> so she sees the vision of the tsunami and then she's like, oh dear. <sighs> Terrible. Outrageous, you may even say. Awful. Oh no, this terrible Did prophecy. You... That mean that means you must do exactly what I tell you. Oh, this hasn't got anything to do with like, the, the stuff that she's dealing with. I could totally picture it being like, honestly, I don't, I don't give a shit about your little town. Okay, I just need your armies. Give, give me. Um. Yeah, she's like, your arrival is what bring is going to begin the downfall of Numenor. She, she, she believes that about Elf Lady. Elf Lady, like, oh man, that that sucks. There's a line I got triggered by. It's talking about oh. virtue or whatever uh, to, to regain it, I think, or something. And then Galadriel says, your virtue was your ancestors' loyalty to the elves. Yeah, someone's fucking full of themselves. I was about to say, mm. do you understand how vain that statement is? What's good about you is being loyal to my people. It's like, wow. You're, a, you're such a, a fucking bitch. It's, it's amazing, right? Like <laughs> the show is like the elves are, and I and I think that the show is like behind her on this. Oh yeah, definitely. It it's supposed to be, to be like, like kind of a cool line. This is like the pro elves. This is this show is elf propaganda. <laughs> True. <laughs> Which I don't appreciate. <clears throat> so she but says, it's not, "It's not supposed to be." So the elves are powerful. They are strong. They are long lived. They are very wise. But the reason the well, as long as they're not clever. Well, mm. <laughs> but the reason that. the Numenorians get involved with them in the first place is that the elves cannot alone stand against, well, first Morgoth and then more pertinently Sauron when he's established, although in this show he isn't. So the Numenorians are the preeminent power in the universe at this point. They are the most, they are the strongest, the most militarily successful, the richest, the most technologically advanced. They colonize Middle Earth because they are more powerful more advanced than the elves are. They are like the Americans to the British in World War One, for example. Um, it shouldn't. It should not be used as an example of the elves being wisest and best, because the whole point of Numenor is the pride comes before the fall. Numenor is more powerful than the elves, but their pride leads them to error and to uh, and then to um, to egotism and then to tyranny and then to downfall. That's what the whole message of Numenor is supposed to be about, but. As you say, in this one, it's just, well, the elves are the best. Don't you know that? No, no, we deny it. Well, okay, but here, the elves are the best. Don't you accept that? Uh, well, maybe you are, but the elves are the best. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right after all. We're going to give you an army now. So, yeah, we're, we're all on board with you. That's fine. Brilliant. So, okay, Tolkien has been honored. That's a really deep lore. Fantastic. Well done. Men are pretty shit, though. <laughs> they're dirty and you know, skeevy and nasty and they live in the dirt and they try to pull chains apart with your ha their bare hands <laughs> hey, we've all been there we have all been there trying to pull them chains apart man is born free but is everywhere in chains well, Lord of the Rings was like yeah the men aren't perfect but you know they're capable of some really amazing things and this mm -hmm. show's like nah fuck men I was gonna say they weren't successful in pulling those chains <laughs> apart <though. laughs> <laughs> they should have been more of them working together than pull those yep. chains apart Art. So you she's enough men, you can do amazing things. In conclusion, she's like, I'm gonna announce that you're leaving tomorrow and we'll avoid the apocalypse. It's like, oh. Okay. And then I, uh, I was thinking to myself, 
imagine you're in that garrison, all right? You get told by the yeah. Queen Regent, wait outside, yeah. I'll signal. In fact, you know what? You'll probably hear a smash, and that'll likely be her. But you know what? I'll signal you. Come in and arrest her. It's going to be great. I can't wait. It's going to be so fucking good. You're like, oh, Queen Regent, maybe we should be in the room. I mean, when she breaks in through a window, we can just grab her, because what's she going to do? Jump back out? Like, <laughs> I think, you know, I think that'll work. She's like, no, no. It needs to just be me. Just in case I need to tell her about, you know, the law. Like, oh. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll wait until you signal us. Yeah. And she's like, they hear the smash. And they're like, oh boy, she's going to call us in any second. And maybe they hear a bit of like... Rrr, rrr, rrr. Oh, they're, they're on a chat, I guess. Okay. And then he like goes quiet. And then like half an hour later, they're like, is the queen dead? She's should probably we, dead. Should we go in and <laughs> check? <laughs> just like... Just knock on the door. Just letting you know we're still here. The garrison. Yeah. Queen's probably dead. Just, I mean. Oh well. It's bizarre. I thought you were actually going with another angle. Of course that, but also the. Well, we'll get to it later. Just, just carry on. It'll, it'll come up. If the conclusion is. I can't be dealing with you. We got a tsunami coming and I'm almost certain it's because of you being here. You gotta go. If she truly believed that, why the hell did she waste even a second not getting her the hell out of here? Um, because it it's that weird vision prophecy stuff in stories where it's it can be it can simultaneously be something I'm concerned about and also something that compels me to make immediate action for the fear that it will come true. Is like, oh, now's the time we start taking it seriously, kind of thing. There is um there is a parable. I don't know if it's a biblical one or a Greek one. I think it's a biblical one. Um and the story goes that there is a man, he lives in a, a big city, he's quite well off, he's successful, and all the rest of that. And um he meets a seer, and the seer tells him, uh, you will be killed in the city at night in two days' time. And so he panics and he says well, shit, that means I must leave the city. So he goes to stay with his brother in the neighboring city, where he is killed in two days' time. Like, it's this idea that... That's Greek. That That's totally cannot, fucking Greek. Uh, well, I think it is, but then much of the Old Testament is inspired there. No, the Greeks are all about, ooh, if, if, if Croesus attacked the Persians, a mighty army will fall. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's that, it's yeah that that, that's true. But I mean, the Old Testament is, is Greek first and foremost. I, I think it might even be in the Old Testament, but the Greek, well, the Koine version... Um, but the the point being that what they're doing is essentially the same thing. So she has this prophecy where Numenor is destroyed by helping the elves um, or allowing the elves to reside within Numenor's walls. So they say, well, we can't have any elves here. Um, so when the elf turns up, they say, okay, we'll help the elf leave and we'll also give her our armies. And so the the sort of fate accompli is, well, the city is destroyed by virtue of helping the elves i think which is where they're going with this but it, it's not very subtly done and it, it's not sort of thoughtfully done because the a good prophecy is kind of there is foreshadowing in it which allows you to foresee its end before the end happens but allows the sort of the element of, of surprise as well and this one is just well obvious it's so obvious that by virtue of helping galadriel by sending an army to middle earth she is actually ensured the the fate she seeks to avoid that it's so obviously foreshadowed that there's no there's not going to be any surprise when it actually happens and that's kind of this like i like that they've tried the idea i guess but it's it's so overtly done that it's just kind of there won't be any kind of pleasant surprise when it does actually happen it is kind of i like that yeah the intent is good but the delivery again as so often is flawed um, can you in because I'm, 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 I'm not very, I don't. Depending on their, I guess, inter, how they exist in a world, I, I really kind of hate fate and prophecy and destiny. Mm. In Lord of the Rings, that world is a prophecy, just like it's gonna happen. Period. You can't do anything to change it. Um, no, not necessarily. Because, um, so when if you if you take in the Fellowship of the Ring, when Frodo's in Lothlorien, and Galadriel shows him the 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 seeing glass, the seeing water, um, and she says it shows you things that were things that are some things that have not yet come to be. Um, and one of the visions he sees is the Shire 
uh, going scouring. to ruin because it, yeah, the scouring of the Shire, which actually in the book does happen. It's one of the things the film leaves out. Um, I think the the books are slightly unclear as to whether or not these things are determined and strictly determined. But I think I th she says think this is what happens if you fail. It's what happens when you fail, but then again, that allows for the element of choice and volition. So yeah. it's not determined that that's still an element of free will that comes in there. There is a strong element of determinism from what I remember of the books um, in the sense that, you know, so it was, therefore it must come to be. But as in that instance, if you choose a certain way, you might be able to change the history that you've been shown or the prophecy you've been shown. But in the case of the fall of Numenor, that's pretty deterministic. There's not really a way around that. So that it, it, it's biblical in that sense. There are some uh, some events, some elements of it, which are um, sort of loosely determined, and there are some which are strongly determined. And the fall of Numenor is strongly determined. So that that's an inevitability. That that's not going to change. That will happen at some point. So there's nothing that can be done to stop it. It's just going to happen. Yes, and their attempts to stop it happening in this show will probably be the thing which leads to it happening. That was what was going to happen all along. Yes. Oh, I don't like that. It depends how it's played. Like, sometimes you can play it very effectively if you keep the audience on edge. If the audience isn't keenly aware or, or, or uh, pre-informed of what will happen, then you can make it seem still like a choice or the seemingness of choice. The problem is if you foreshadow it so overtly that the audience knows this about 2,000 years before it actually happens. And well, it's clear by the time it happens that there is no alternative to that. Separate from the... the like uh the, the narrative element of it i just like i just i i am not at all keen about in fictional worlds having prophecies that will absolutely happen fate and destiny and that i i hate it kind of i really don't like it at all um so i i don't mean to interrupt your discussion i must part now oh fringy's gotta go um, it was fated to happen that it Fringy. Was, <laughs> it was it we was, did we did say this was gonna happen yeah. yeah, and how many minutes left of the episode are there? Not much, right? We're getting or there. We got another. We're actually made pretty good progress, yeah. considering. Like another twenty well, minutes. Well, well, so oh, god. All right. <laughs> well, uh, short man, eight and a half hours. Eight and a half hours. Dude, it's not even gonna be eight. It's gonna be more than that by the time we're done. <laughs> no, for, we got yeah, it. for you guys. <laughs> Um, but hey, that means that I don't have to talk about the show for another little while. Two weeks. <laughs> What's the next episode that? out? Well, there'll um, be oh, well, it, Friday. We, we, we need five and six, right? That yeah, we'll, we'll do the, two at uh, a time. So. Structure. But I guess before I depart, this will be my final reminder. The Fringy and Mola plushes. Oh. You've got less than 24 hours. Oh, do so it if, now. You want, if you want a little cute, adorable Fringo with his goo, and the mischievous Mubes with his little cookie box. You only got less than 24 hours. I don't know how many exactly, but I could keep that in mind. 20 hours and 25 minutes exactly. Cuddly, happy, plague doctor, and uh, a long man with all of the little, uh, the little tentacles, I suppose. They're tentacles, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I gotta go. Uh, enjoy the rest of the stream. Have fun banters. I'll catch you all later on. Bye 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 bye. 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 Good to meet you. Well, well. So we gotta talk about this line that I hate. A decision based in fear. Galadriel no, says. I'm not done yet. Wait, what? Okay. what? What prompted that whole crazy deviation into determinism or whatever the fuck that was. I was trying to say, <laughs> take all these facts to be true, which they are. She is surprised that the elf wasn't left to die. She is surprised the elf was brought back to be safe here. She suggests the possibility of even the elf being killed, but certainly imprisoned. And she's very much in, in, engaging in all of that. And she concludes here that the elf has to leave because the elf will lead to the destruction of Numenor. Why the hell has it taken her so long to do that? Why has she waited this long to get the elf the fuck out of Numenor? What's going on? Well, yeah, because it's She's been saying that, though, since Galadriel arrived. Like, the first conversation we ha she has with Alfarazon is, uh, the elf is here, this is what you know, yeah. was foretold. Then the, the uh, interrupted conversation with the vegetable father is what we, what yeah. we prophesied has come true. Yeah, get the fuck rid of her. 
But what you don't do is leave with her and an army, because that's... If there is one thing guaranteed to make this from at least a suspicion of determinism to actually determined event, it's giving the elf what she wants. Like That's just a narrative rule. W what are you doing? It, it doesn't make any sense at all. That's what I mean. And it feels like they wanted to establish that she's very anti-elf, but at the same time we need uh, the clues from the, the place where Galadriel ends up going and all the kerfuffle with the, the father, and then she gets booted out. So that we can get all those bits and bobs in there, and then she's not going to be booed out. That, by the way, is part of the reason why we're not going to be here as long as I'd imagine, because that takes ages, that scene. <laughs> and nothing fucking happens, so... <laughs> Plenty of room for me to skip right over it. But anyway, Rags, <laughs> what were you saying just now? Uh, about this line, I hate this line that Galadriel says where she chastises the other person for making a decision based in fear, when that's literally what Galadriel's doing. Is that supposed to have some level of well self-awareness or the writers retarded? What do you think? I think the writers are retarded. I, I think this is Galadriel. <laughs> I think this is Galadriel unknowingly chastising someone else for something that she's literally doing. But the show thinks that she is right in the decision she's making, but the queen is not right, so it's okay to 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 get on her for making that decision based in fear because the show doesn't have the awareness enough to realize anything about its writing. It's a shit line, and I hate it. And it, and she's a huge fucking hypocrite, but the show doesn't recognize it. True. She can't be wrong. <sighs> Good stuff. I don't think there's a way to fix the line. Don't have it. I mean, it's it's either well in a in a good show. Like, Galadriel, if you're trying to bring her down a peg, because she's so fucking headstrong and everything, she has this bad attitude, and you're trying to take get her to fucking take a chill pill and teach her some wisdom and cleverness, God forbid, then she could say that to the queen, and the queen is like, she's like, yeah, well, that's what you're doing. And also, mm -hmm. like, it's fine to make decisions based in fear. Fear is a very natural thing that, that often leads to survival and prosperity. If you're afraid of things and you prepare for those things, then if those things happen, you're ready for it. Or, it, or, or you're afraid of a consequence if you don't act. Like, it's not a... that This isn't a, a productive thing to say that your decision is based in fear. Like, yeah, I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of what's going to happen if we don't do what I mean, what did I you think see the do. vision? <laughs> yeah, did you see? I'm really afraid of Numenor being fucking killed. So, yeah, I'm going to act based off of that fear. A vision of the apocalypse. What do you expect me to feel? Um, I also hate a line that comes soon after that. Or before it, to be honest with you. I don't even, can't even tell anymore. I probably do too. Which one are you referring to? She says, I know what it's like to be the only one who sees and knows. Oh, fuck. That was annoying. I yeah. hate it so much. <laughs> it's That's not so fair. Weird. That is we the writers telling us. Together. Galadriel believes with full certainty that she and the Queen Regent share this aspect. That they know and they see the truth. Fuck off. Like, it's so annoying. Why do you think you're so awesome? Stop. Have some humility. Again, the, the only redemptive aspect of that is going to be if, and I'm sure this is what they will do, they eventually end up playing her confidence off against her. And so Halbrand, again being Sauron, um, plays on her confidence and destroys it. That's like, that will at least partly it will. redeem this, I think. I think their plan for that is to somehow involve her as to setting these things in motion, but they're going to frame it in a way that she couldn't have possibly known, and it isn't her fault. Like, she's not responsible for it. It's only technically her fault. That's the show's yeah. way of having it their cake and eating it, too. It's I was going to say, um, it really doesn't feel like they'd have the balls to actually have a scene where, like, she's no. like, oh my god, I was wrong about everything. Like, I really don't know that they... I have to change? Yeah, they won't. I, I, no. I think this is the problem, because, like, the Halbrand, Hal, no, the Harford scene, when I thought they were going to do something much better than they did, I think I'm probably giving them too much credit in, in assuming that they will take the wise course of action narratively. See, my, my assumption, a basic level, not even an especially adept level of competence, but a basic level of competence would be you've built Galadriel up as being so self-assured, so self-confident, so uh, sure in the knowledge of her actions and her beliefs. And so 
the ultimate payoff of that is when the one person she comes to trust as having her best interest in heart, the one person she opens up to, which is Halbrand, betrays her. This destroys her entire worldview because that's the obvious, and it's just obvious in a sense, in a negative way, because it's, it's a cheap thing to do, but it's an obvious thing to do. That's such an obvious thing to do. The one person she comes to have a relationship with, the one person she opens up to, betrays her. Turns out to be the person that she's been working against the entire time. So that levels her. And then you bring her character back down to the ground and you build her up again as a more knowledgeable, patient, wise well, person. That's to what me, that seems like be. the message is don't trust anyone because the first time you trust someone, they fucking stab you in the back. Well, no, because, oh, uh, yeah... I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that there are other people. Oh yeah, it's not true in reality. Them. But yeah. to from her perspective, if the show wants to say you need to, like, I guess trust people more, and she finally trusts someone, and that person just destroys oh, her. No, no, I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying that the narrative should want her to. The lesson shouldn't necessarily be she should trust people more. The lesson should be should be that she is unwise to trust herself to the degree that she has done so so far. Like the, the most objectionable thing about her is how self-assured she is, right? So if you present one person, one other character that she actually kind of opens up to a little bit, and he turns out to be the very person she's been working against her entire life, that levels her. That means you have to recreate her own character. She has to recreate her own character from the ground up. She has to be more self-aware. She has to be more uh, all-encompassing. She has to be more worldly wise. And that will lead her to a personality which is not quite so objectionable as we've seen it so far. I, I think that's like that's the only payoff to making her so insufferably self-assured as she's been so far. That's the only way you can make it seem like it was worthwhile. She has to be completely destroyed at the end of this season. And Sauron has to come about as a direct result of her actions, even though her actions were designed to stop Sauron coming about. I think that's the only way you can do that. But, again, with the Harford example, I, I can't see another way of doing it. But then again, with the Harfords, I thought they were going to do something very different than they did because, again, it was the only way they could actually keep uh, true to the characters they depicted. So, yeah. So, basically, I think they will fuck it up, but there is a way they could fix it. But they will fuck it up, is my... Uh, yeah, because I don't think thesis. they have the balls to do what it would take Mm -hmm. No, because they would have to level their strong female character, which they wouldn't. Yeah, they'd have to really yeah. totally. Yeah. Well, look at what they've done so chat. far. The amount of victories they have piled on her. Like, uh, I just don't. I don't believe they have the balls to give her the biggest loss in the whole thing. But we'll see. We'll see what they do. Absolutely. If they do do that, if they actually do pull do that do. off, I will. If they do 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 do. If they do pull that off, I will happily do a long video praising the fact that they did it because that that is that's a sensible good writing choice that they would wow, have made if they did that sense. um even, and they've not even that if so they were to get anywhere near doing it they would still fill it with bullshit like it would still be all fucked even if it like i don't uh, yeah. they, they would never i don't believe it but hey yeah, i've been wrong um, before there's a subordinate question isn't there because even if it turns out that halbrand betrays her they could still portray that as her having been fundamentally right. The emphasis could be on her being right. And she's just wrong on the particulars. In which case, we aren't going to be invited to sympathise with her or to understand the fall she's gone through because it won't be portrayed as a fall to begin with. So, yeah, there is a way they could take the right course and still completely fuck it up. There is, but, well, again, there, there is a clear direction they could take which would redeem her character. But, yeah, I... If you were to back on them actually taking that route and put money on that, then you are a fool. But yeah. it is at least there, so maybe, maybe, mm. small odds it will happen. So, back to the oh, watchtower yeah. with the humans. Fuck, sorry. And, wait, what? Sorry for what? Oh, no, sorry, I, I, was, I was ranting, sorry. No, no, it's all good. Uh, no, you weren't. We're here to talk about the writing. That's yeah, why, we're that doing it. We're and we're, we're, we're still anywhere near the cap. We'll be fine. We're going to make it. <laughs> um, back to the men. Man, people in, in the watchtower or whatever. And you got the kids coming home with all the food, of which he's managed to fill like a wheelbarrow, which isn't too bad. But when you've got, like I said, uh, I think hundreds of people here who apparently are all starving. 
Well, I think something. I it's, guess it's definitely it's good. It's just that yeah. you need to make more long-term plans, everybody. <laughs> this is not going to last. Um, but then, of course, they're like, "But where is the kid? What happened to the kid?" Well, he's still in the well. Well, well, well. He and, said, um, well, the guy says he said he'd be right behind. He lied. Yeah. <laughs> said he'd be right behind me. He lied. Instead, he could have just said we were uh, orcs attacked and we, we go ran. separated. Yeah. I don't know where he is. Yeah, there's no reason to lie. Just say like yeah. there are fucking orcs everywhere. I, I ran. I'm. I hope he's okay. But I mean, what do you? Well, what if you remember, do? he's the one that was like, "Oh, leave it out." Nah, he is. He's he's the racist. So he's yeah, a bad yeah, yeah. man. He's already the bad person. Yeah. Man. Now, even though the elves do seem to be pretty racist, I know. But... Well, yes. All the chat are thinking to themselves. How come the elves get to be racist, but this guy doesn't? <laughs> I know, right? You got a hero why, death, why? even though he was racist. Yeah, th th that guy was a racist too. If anything, he's worse than the than the human. The human's on the receiving end of the racism, so it feels a little bit more justified in a way. And the elf is just like, nah, fuck them. They're shit. I came up here on that one piece ladder to tell you that they're shit twice. <laughs> and it's like he's just a good guy. It's okay to be racist <laughs> hey. to humans. Rag, he's got good news for you. When we were watching this scene, remember yes. when you said, I heard an orc grunt, but I didn't know which orc it was. Well, now we know. Orc 2. Orc two. Oh, it was Orc 2. <laughs> oh, right. I love Orc 2. Yeah, he's I'm my glad favorite. That orc 2 was in. Yeah, I'm glad he got some a good speaking role in this. Yes. I'm, I've been rooting um, for him, Orc 2. He's great. So, the sun's down. He's been in this Wasn't well a for a real fucking Star long Wars? time. And that is a cold bit of water in there at that point. I'd guess like four to six hours must have passed, given the position of the sun in the last shot we saw him in. Yeah, he's, he's uh, been down there a long time. That would suck. Uh, it would suck. But okay, um, now chat, you're probably thinking to yourselves like, but why is he coming out of the well now? Well, he chose the perfect time. He just sort <laughs> of comes out and hopes that nobody sees him. And luckily for him, there are several orcs walking around, but all of them missed him coming out then. And look at that. This is such a joke, man. Like, you're kidding me. He was, he was that lucky. The, the, the orcs are right here. In fact, they seem like they're within earshot of someone climbing yes. out of a well. But the, well, again, the writers have been playing Assassin's Creed. They know exactly what movements to make and to where. They know how the mechanics work for a video game. Well, so that's what they base this on. Did you notice that they were very proud of themselves for this scene? Because it's, it's a one -er, but... It's like Yeah, I did notice that. That's right. Yeah. It's like a faux wanna. It's one of the ones I don't like where it's like you've got nothing at risk because all everyone's just walking and they have yeah, to pretend like they don't see him. Yeah, that's that's it. It. There's nothing to lose here. Um so yeah, yeah, god, this fucking part is so stupid. So he's like obviously he's just gunning to get to a position where he can just sprint home. And he's moving around, right? And he almost walks right into an orc. He's like, "Whoa, that was close." Gosh, it would be so bad if the orc was to see me. Luckily, I'm a I'm super wet, so I'm I can slip and slide. Or that would be so funny if he just slid and just went home. Because <laughs> he just gave it. That's how bad the ride is at this point. I wouldn't be surprised. Fuck it. Anyway, the orc smells him. He's like sniff, sniff. Oh, that's pretty sure it's a, that smells like a human. That should be like red alert. The fact that you've just sniffed a person, and he's got the thing they're all searching for. By the way. This is like high demand person. They really want to catch this guy. And they can't find him anywhere. And then an orc smells a person. And it's like, well, get everyone to search the area. Because apparently he's right here. But then he's just like called away. They're like, hey, orcman, we're doing orc things. And he's like, all right, okay, sorry. And just walks off. There's also a slight point of irritation there because the, the captions say orc in black speech, which means that they do speak the black speech to each other so in episode three when it turns out the tower warden who's been captured has learned everything about their plans from them like the tunnels the reason they're building them what they're searching for throughout that entire period he was captured they were not speaking in black speech because the elves don't really generally know black speech and also when they hear black speech it makes them physically unwell but here They've just introduced the fact that the orcs sometimes speak to each other in black speech, but sometimes speak to each other in the common tongue. And the plot decides when it's most convenient for them to do one or the other of them. 
that that I'm yeah, sure that guy who got a, captured knew yeah. black speech back to front. He knew it. Yeah, but then he would have been physically sick because the elves are. But he physically was. Sick he threw up a whole bunch, but he didn't die, so it's all good. Oh, okay. He actually okay. he collected all the sick and then he threw it on the orcs, and that's how he escaped. Oh. Because they were I like, see. ah, gross, and then they had to go to the. Yeah, bathroom. that makes so much sense than whatever the writers actually. Gave I was going to say it's better than whatever they actually wrote. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Um. So. Yeah, he's moving he's moving through, and it's it's so tense. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? You never know. And he thinks he's made it, and then, uh, unfortunately, he's grabbed. It's like, oh no. And I thought, like, so this is over, because there's orcs all around, and you've been grabbed by one, and all he has to do is be like, I found him, you know, I've got him, the, the fucking kid who's got the most important thing we need right now. But, um, no, he doesn't announce anything. He just sort of taunts the kid, like, hey, hey I'm gonna get ya, I've got ya now. And it's just like, dude, you might wanna... wanna mention some people, I yeah. don't know. Sound the alarm? I'm yeah. Not sure up to. But yeah. he's like, you know, I want I want that health or whatever, so I'm, you know what, I'm gonna chop your arm off. Because he's mean. He's mean old orc, and he's just gonna, he's gonna chop his arm off, I guess. And then, uh, it, it does like a cut to to make you possibly be convinced for even a moment that, uh, he was actually successful because the kid is like splattered by a bit of blood. So you're like, oh, you know, what happened? Is he dead? Is the kid dead? Is the kid losing an arm? Like maybe, 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 or maybe the orc has been stabbed. Now, chat, you have been provided with all the information you would need to know who stabbed him. But even if you were to guess correctly as to who stabbed him, you'd have to conclude, like everyone else, <laughs> what the fuck. <laughs> And yes, it does indeed turn out to be. God, it's taking too long. Copyright. Elfman. I don't even know where to begin with this. Okay. Why the <laughs> fuck does yeah, he have his weapons? Do Why does he have his weapons? How does he get in between all of the many orcs we just saw? Send him back with all of his weapons. To remind everyone, the last we saw him, he was like distraught, covered in mud and chained up, and he was about to be released to be given and giving a message to the men in the watchtower by the orcs. Now we see him, he's like all cleaned up, well dressed, and he's got his weaponry and he's saving a person's life in the village. What the hell happened? Adar, did you give him all of his shit back? Why? And then you sent him to what? Walk through the orc village and I guess be like, don't kill him everybody, he's got a message to send. And then he'd be like, okay, why did you give him his bow and arrow and a, and a sword? What, what's that about? And he's like, don't worry about it, we're friends. I like him, he's chill. And then he's like, walking through, imagine being him, Elfman, and you're walking through. And you hear like a, I don't know, someone getting tackled. And you're like, oh, what, what's that? And you walk over and there's an orc that's about to chop the arm off some kid. And you kill him, and you're like, okay. This is happening, I guess. Now it's time for us to run because everyone's chasing. What the fuck are the odds? And if only that were the most improbable meeting that happens in the next two minutes, but it's not. It's not. It's no. only one of the two improbable meetings that happen in the next two minutes. But the, the, again, the, yeah, as you say, the fact he he turns up at the precise moment, at the precise time, with the precise events in in motion. None of this, none of this works. The entire thing is contrived as fuck. But then every important event in this show is contrived as fuck. And there's almost an entire video to be made about just listing contrivances, just one after the other, and you would still yeah. get to probably two hours over the course of five episodes. It's, uh I just, it was unbelievable. I could, I could fathom how this had come to pass, but it did. This is what it, it was, what it is. And now they gotta get the fuck out of here. And they start playing, like, tragedy music. And they go slow-mo, so you assume one of them going yeah, to die. Yeah, this, is, this, this was is bizarre. Some of the most clearest messaging you could get that one, someone's going to die. Someone will die. Absolutely, yes. Or very, very, have. like, oh gosh. Uh, yeah. The music is very sad. It's like Gandalf dying music. And, um... Yeah, this is the part. Check it out, everybody. Arrow is flung. It's about to hit the poor boy, but boom, caught. Also, they miss every single other arrow, just FYI. And and I see you, I see you in chat. I see you thinking. You're like, wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. They're firing arrows at, at Elfman? You're like, yes. But is, isn't he carrying the message from Adar to the watchtower? 
Doesn't Ada want him alive? We didn't tell everyone else, and like, you know, oh. you give this, you give this, this warrior elf weapons. He might fight your orcs, and you know, I, it, I guess, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Ada, you're looking send an orc to tell him to say like, exactly. all right, orc, carry or... this, carry this white flag, and just go talk no, to him and Rex, tell him what just... your demands are. Have an orc, right? Have a little bit of paper. Scribble in little little orc handwriting. Go away. Because that was the message, by the way. That's what we find out <laughs> it is. Away. Go the fuck away. That's what the message is. Get that piece of paper. Wrap it around a rock. Walk up to the watchtower. Throw it in. Walk off. Done. You didn't need this. And by doing this, you've now lost the hilt that you could have gotten. And you've lost a whole bunch of orcs. And for some reason you didn't tell any of your orcs that you actually wanted this guy alive. What a disaster. Did someone come back to Adar to report all this? <laughs> Be like, dude. Adar, I don't know what you're expecting, but I have to report <laughs> I what happened. I have bad news. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Did you believe that this elf was, like, killing our dudes? And we tried to kill him, but I guess, luckily, we didn't get, we didn't, you know, succeed at that? That's lucky. It, that's weird, because we nailed that other elf, elf two for two with arrows. Yeah, we were doing great, distance, man. We, nailed we them just all. can't hit this one. I don't know. He's got Jeez. something protecting him. Some kind of armor. We only had, we only had two spell. good marksmen in our entire battalion. and they <laughs> They're watching the trench. The yeah, yeah, they're on trench. They're dude. watching the tunnel. So, yeah. something to keep in mind, because I'm sure you guys didn't know this, so it's common, common film knowledge that I have. So, we are seeing Elfman and Kid in slow-mo. They have been put in slow-mo. The Orcs, however, are not actually in slow-mo. That's just their regular speed. And that's why they can't catch up. They're just naturally slow. <laughs> they are just that slow. They just can't keep up. It's impossible. But yes, as Little Platoon alluded to, there is a third person here. Who is it? Who is oh this my, person who is, here I, on the way? I wouldn't have... Is it, is it like an... Uh, who could it be? Maybe it's the Balrog. Um, is it... It, the the, what the Balrog? I don't know. No, that would make. I don't know. That he, would make um, sense. But, yeah, yeah I don't know it who makes it could as be. much sense as this. It, it, oh my mm. god, it's, it's her! Lady. What the fuck are you doing out so here? So this means that when she found out, he was like, "Oh, he was right behind me." I'm pretty sure she went. I'm gonna go search for him and hopefully find him. Bye, and everyone, and no one cared. No one went with her, and she just rushed out here, ran toward the village. Almost into an army of orcs, and happened to bump right into them. Maybe he's in the woods at night. I just... And I, I can't him. believe it. Honestly, the only way to redeem the scene is if she runs in, just by chance, during the slow-mo, and she gets shot in the... Well, I guess the head. But probably the chest, so she can die more quickly. Right in more the slowly heart. Even. Yeah, she gets shot. She, she, she turns up in slow-mo... Everything is like really dramatic. She comes to rescue her son and she gets shot and she dies. That makes the scene worthwhile. But, but Does no. it? We, yeah, well, more than we got. At least someone dies. Because we just got rid of a you're character. Saying, well, you, you, I'm assuming you're saying yes. at least have some level of a consequence like for consequence? all of this stupid shit. Yeah, like, but no. Well, I mean, I would still say it's it, bad it, even it, if she did die. There's, um, I think it would be bad because, in the in the sense that, the, how the fuck would she know where in the woods to be at the precise moment to meet them? That's fine. That's a criticism, but it's one of those payoff things. So, like, okay, he has had the argument with her back in the tower hours ago, and she has told him deliberately not to go. It's the same thing with the brandy foot people. She's told him she that he's not allowed to go out adventuring, so he goes out adventuring despite her orders. He runs back fleeing from the orcs, she has come to rescue him, and, and as a result of his own actions in betraying him, she dies. I'm not saying that's good. I'm no, yeah, I understand perfect, what you're saying, yeah. But I am saying it's better than what we got, which is just meaningless. Absolutely. You could, you could call it narrative no juice. There's something there. But even then, though, if that happened, yeah. I'd be like, I mean, we didn't get much time between those two, did we? Like, we got... Yeah, but on the other hand, there are so many characters in this show that we know nothing and care nothing about that we're, it's about killed, time we yeah. some of them off, like just for satisfaction purposes. I'd be happy if the elf guy died. Don't know anything about him. Pointless character. Just kill him. Fine. Don't care. Move on. What do you mean? We're gonna get... They're gonna have a marriage or something. Him and girl. I can't wait. Yeah, oh It's gonna be really we're, great. It's gonna yeah, be they're, they're doing... There's a story in the in the lore, the uh, story of Baron and Luthien, which is the the origin of Aragorn and Arwen's story in the in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Like th this doomed love between elf and man, 
and I'm sure that's what they're doing with this. And so, like, at some point, um, by virtue of his love for her, he will be sent off on an impossible mission. He will sacrifice himself for love. She will probably meet him at some point during the time of his death, and everything will be sad. That will be the end of it. And everything but will be sad. There's yeah. an entire book to be written about the story, story of Beren and Luthien. It's a beautiful story. It's like Romeo and Juliet, but in fantasy. It's beautiful. And I'm sure that's what they're doing, a cheap pastiche off here. But it will be a cheap pastiche and unsatisfying. But that, I think, is what they're going for. So, every arrow misses. It's so unfortunate. They're just not getting them. However, <laughs> our intrepid heroes have made it to a clearing of some kind. And then they're moving through it. It's still pretty dark, so, you know, you gotta run. And then, like, they start to slow down. It's like, wait, what, what you doing? You need, to, you need to keep going. And, like, the kid sort of falls over. It's like, ah, my leg. It's just, ah, my leg's so bad. And Hello. so the woman just starts going, like, okay, let's have a look at your leg. Meanwhile, the elf is like, all right, I'm going to pull out my sword and get ready to fight. It's like, why don't you just pick the kid up? You're an elf. Pick the kid up and get out of here, you fucking idiots. She's not even looking out for his leg. She gets up with her own... She's got, like, um, one of the hand scythe things. She, so their plan is literally to fight this army of orcs, those two. Instead of just picking the kid up and running. It fucking hurts my brain. It always hurts my brain. They also... They, they stop within bow range of the tree line. Which... Yes isn't good. They've had many arrows shot at them already, and they're just gonna hope that they don't use arrows. And luckily for them, no arrows are used here. That is very... I think at the very end some start to come by, which just adds the problem of... It sure say, is yeah. a good thing that the, the two sniper orcs killed that one other guy, but none of them will hit you. A lot of arrows missed you guys. A lot of and arrows so, missed you. And so, the sun comes out, and we've still got plenty of dudes who are in the same fucking getup they had when they were immune to the sun in the in the trench. Mm -hmm. But apparently they're not immune to it anymore. <laughs> and this is like, this kid has the most important item they need or whatever, and they're not willing to brave the sun anymore. But they will brave the sun when their slaves are vaguely attempting to escape. Yes. Vaguely attempting to escape. I just... Accurate view of a plan. Yeah, the, the, then, there's no yeah. there's no consistency like of value in the show that you'd think of all the things that they would want to break cover for it would be that item, but but nah I guess they, they don't yeah. care in this instance because the sun is painful. Just yeah yeah. So we cut to the dwarves. Oh, we didn't even mention. Sorry, we were just rushing over everything. At the end of Elrond and Durin's conversation, there's a cave-in, and they both rush into the mine to go and help the dwarves, and it's like the most interesting thing that's ever happened in this entire show, and then they cut away, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And now, Something interesting was about to happen. Now we're cutting back, and it's post-cave-in, mopping up stuff. Elrond is like, he's not even got dust on him. He's just so pristine, somehow. I guess he got it, he took a bath or something. He didn't go help, maybe? Maybe he just didn't it... help, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that I would be I more in line. Didn't help. Uh, Issa's doing a sing. I don't know why. Like a funeral, it's, it's I thought. Weird because or something. They they say they're pleading to the mountain to let their yeah. miners go. It's a it's a specific prayer to the rocks themselves. And we've actually seen I think it might even be in this scene. Um but we we've seen I think once previously where an equivalent prayer has been sung and you've seen the rocks moving, you've seen Mithril either retreating or excreting from, from rocks. Um, Have we? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I th um, it might even be in the setup for this scene. I could be wrong. But th there is definitely a scene where there is music of this kind playing, and you see a vein of mithril seemingly moving. Um, and that's really? Because I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I don't remember I that. that. I think the only time we see mithril is when Elrond finds it. Well, no, because remember, he um he finds a vein of mithril even yeah, outside the, the secret door. And then once he's inside the secret door, he finds the true vein itself. I'm sure... I, maybe I have just made this up because I, the rest I of the I think he only finds so it in the door. It's fucking boring. But he I'm goes sure... in the door and finds the vein. Yeah. Behind, it's, behind that, it's behind that drape. I, I'm pretty sure that you see something in the rocks moving when you hear this song playing. 
I'm sh- I'm pretty sure. I might have just been inventing it because the show was so devoid of content. But I'm sure. I was going to say I got it. nothing on that. I'd have to relook at this, the scene. Are you thinking of the yeah. intro sequence? Are the dwarves singing to the dust, which makes it form all those yes. patterns and stuff? Yes. No, 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 no. I don't think so. Oh. Um. Really funny, I'm though. sure. I'm sure you get a cutaway to some rocks where some some patterns in the rocks are moving, but it's not the intro sequence. I, I think it's this scene. But uh, again, I might have. Just made it up out of sheer. Um, Elrond sees like boredom. some dust move. Well, maybe that's it. But then again, but that's kind of the same thing, it's right? Just... So the dust is moving as a result no. of the song. Well, I, I mean, it's different than the mithril coming out of its veins. I was gonna so... say, it's, it's a I think different. it's on a step. It's like it's yeah. like you could argue she's rumbling know, yeah, the rocks. Here, yeah, and the dust is moving vibrating. here because of vibrations, not because it's like yeah. actually like what you're describing with the mithril vein sounds a little bit more involved, you know. Maybe, but then again, uh, I would say they accomplish the same dramatic effect. I mean, if you if you're moving fragments of rock via prayer it's, song, that's it's not dust reacting to vibrations. It looks like. Uh, have you ever sung and moved dust by vibrations? Has anyone? Well, that's the point. Like I have, and I've never moved dust. As in, I've sung and I've never moved dust. Me neither. Um, but I think so, the dwarves are special in that they could. They're, they're, the song is so voluminous and special that it just creates sound waves that makes the dust rumble. Oh uh, uh, well, okay. So we're sort of halfway agreeing in the sense that the dwarf's prayer song is moving stuff, and the question is whether the moving of stuff is designed to be symbolic to prayer or simply just mechanical sound. vibration. So um, far, I'm I'm willing to. I the vibration I'm willing to give it. I need some. I'll need a push to get it to think that it's like a special magic song that gets the rock to do that. I mean, because it sounds very loud, and it's like like a special chamber that she does it in. Yes. So maybe there's some something about the construction of the chamber that lets it resonate better. Um, well, which is kind of yeah. what you know theaters are to do anyway. Yeah, but but dust yeah. doesn't move when you sing in theaters. May, this is a this is a particular kind of dwarf singing that is enough to make dust vibrate. But, oh, 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 okay, but then, then, then we are coming closer to an accord, I think, in the sense that the dwarves have a prayer song. That prayer song, if you sung it anywhere else in the world, would not have any effect whatever. It's so it has to be in the chamber? Meaning a message. They might be in a specific chamber when they're singing it, but nevertheless, to them at least, this seems like... Because we have a lot of variables. It could be the words of it. It could be the place that they're doing it in. It could be... Well, is it if specific it, to dwarves? If the words determine that matter moves, I would say that's proof that prayer works. If it's that the dwarves are doing it because they have some unique resonance with the rock, there might be a scientific explanation for that. But my reading of the moving of rock dust, or mithril, or whatever it was, is that this is supposed to convey the power of the prayer song. And when you say the power of the prayer song, you're talking about its magical properties, not its physical ones. I would say in universe, probably the magical properties, yes. Because I, you, I need convincing for the magical properties. I'll believe well, in, the physical in, ones. Yeah, now. in the real world, I would need convincing of that. But in this world, you're talking even in this world, you, I need that. You remove the dwarves from that specific cavern of Casa Doom, and you put them in Linden in the open air. Would the same song have the same effect? Is the question i'm asking um i don't think it would now you could say it might still have physical properties which creates the movement but then what you're arguing for is kind of an anthropogenic religion which is the sense in the sense that the songs they have created are uniquely attuned to the place they have grown up in so therefore to the dwarves this is as good as faithful truth as opposed to simply brute scientific truth and reality out of curiosity do you believe the dust is moving, or do you, as in, like it's it's actually it itself is moving, or do you think that the rock around it is rumbling, and thus the dust is just falling to the lowest point? I'm not sure. That's I'm... my understanding of it. That's I'm what assuming I... it's the latter, but at the same I time, know. I would happily consider that magic, as in, like her voice is that powerful via magic that it's doing that or something. The difference without a distinction. I don't. I don't really see the um. Well, right, right. Uh, so, no, so, no, I, no, I, I can explain. So, like yeah. the uh, when you have, say, say for example, I'm holding like a plate, and at the top of the rim there's a circle of dust, and then I start to shake the plate just on a micro level. The dust will eventually start to like fall into the center through gravity and shifting around. 
versus me commanding with magic that the dust walk itself down into the center of the plate. Do you know what I mean? Um, yes, I do, except that I think that there might be an artificial distinction being drawn between the shaking of the plate and the willing of the plate to shake. Um, or at least there is a distinction between those two things which could well, no, be so interrogated. On one hand, the dust is just reacting to the environment around it is falling. Meanwhile, the other is the dust itself is moving itself as a result of... Okay, but say for the sake of argument that via magic or via magical intonation, they are singing a chant which shakes the rocks, which moves the dust, yeah. as opposed to singing a chant which simply moves the dust. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a magic... Singing? Yeah, I, I would believe that a magic en can enhance her singing to just be more powerful and resonant, as opposed to a magic that specifically targets certain particles over others and makes them move in a way i can believe the former far more than that i mean ultimately i'll wait until what the fucking show tells me i guess i don't know exactly yeah, not, what this is know, but i that's what um, i think they're trying to say with this is that her yeah, singing the, is so powerful and resonant in the mountain that the, the, it causes the, the theoretically it's possible to the pitch that, that shatters glass for a human to do that's theoretically possible um but mm, yeah. within the world that we're talking about, which is a mythological world or a myth-heavy world, um, you could see even scientific explanations could have mythological connotations, or rather, science and myth could be confused in a mythologically based world, if that makes sense. Um, the, 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 the reason why I thought it was interesting to talk about is because I don't believe that it's going to be moving the mithril veins. Um, yeah, that one's that one's a huge leap however, in terms of its power. If that were shown to happen in a later episode, then so be it. But like, yeah, what, yeah. What I get from this is just that her voice is like vibrating through all of the rock, and that yeah, uh, this might be they're... strict foreshadowing to just let us know why the Balrog will be woken up. Bear in yeah. mind, though, that of course in the preceding or the, one of the earlier scenes, we learned that the only reason they discovered Mithril was that Deesa sensed it, as in via magic or the dwarf equivalent thereof, mm -hmm. while she was on a routine exploration. Like, she, she didn't discover it, as in she saw it in the process of mining it. She sensed its presence, and they mined to find it. Like well, the dwarf isn't that are... something they normally do? They sing to the mountain to listen to what the mountain <laughs> tells them about the ores and stuff in it, and where not to well, go? They... Okay, but then you've, you've come back to my position, which is that the dwarf's song is much more magical than it is scientific and practical. On, I never said it was necessarily more than that. I said, I don't think that the rumbling here on the stairs is necessary. I don't think that is magical. I think that's just a, a, a result of her doing that song. Because um, I can believe that the dwarves, like when she first explains how they use like their, their voice magic to find ore and stuff, I can buy that. I just don't think that applies to this staircase vibrating. I think that's so physical. They can, use, they can use their voice magic to find material. But when they use their voices and material moves, that's an entirely separate because question. I think, because I think it's making just the mountain vibrate, which means the dust on top is going to settle. Um, would you not extend that explanation to the voice magic you cited in the preceding moment, though? As in, like, what's the difference there between, 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 between making a mountain magic. vibrate with magic and her using that to... Between the voice magic to detect... Just because just something has a magical property doesn't mean that the magic is necessarily an explanation to every effect that it does. Because it's still uh, a song. No. It is still a song, but, but, you, but you are, you've identified two substantively similar phenomenon, and you are is it? saying one is magic and one is not. Well, yes, I mean, using the song to detect the presence of ore. Yeah, but I don't know the, what the mechanism is. the song is. which produces the movement of ore. You have to, ex you, you, your burden is to explain why the magic explains the detection of ore, but not the movement of same ore later on. I don't have, it's not an explanation even. It's just, it, it, I mean, in a sense it is, but when she says that we use this song in order to find ores and the ore, and like in the mountain speaks to us, I think she says, I think yeah. that's different than she's making a very loud noise and it's making the stone, this physical stone vibrate and. Okay, but it, then which the she, top she could have discovered mithril by sonar, which is a practical scientific phenomenon. If that, I'm, again, I don't know the mechanism by which they discover the ore, only that they use like they it's a very it's very ambiguous sort of. It's just we sing yeah. to the mountain 
and we can sort of learn things. We don't really know anything more than no, that. I'd agree with that, but I, I think I think the fact that it's ambiguous means that what you should you have to give sort of a, a degree of leeway to the to the world building that goes on. If you say it's ambiguous, maybe you, you acknowledge in the first instance that the song is in a sense magic, and the the magic of the song detects or then. Oh, it allows them to detect or having having acknowledged that the magic of the song detects or it's more probabilistic within the world that's being built that you extend the 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 uh should we say the um the gratuity of magic to the movement of or as well as opposed to saying well i, I accept yeah, I that magic is so, yeah. in one sense and not in the other it just seems more consistent to say in the realm of this universe the same thing is operative in both instances then in, in terms of that, no, I, I don't agree that with the level of ambiguity we have based on this magic, that it is more probabilistic that what we see here is owed to the magical properties instead of just the normal ones. But would you, would you read that back into it's saying... It's not possible, that. but I'm no, not... I, no, I agree. I agree with that. But then would you read... Look, we're nine hours in. Things get weird, okay? Via magic is itself much more likely to be scientific as opposed to magical. I, I, I couldn't say because I don't know enough about that process. That's fair enough. But then if you can't say that about one aspect of it, how can you say it about the other? Because they're two different things. But they're an extension of the same property. They're, they're, no, they're, they're, they're different enough. If, and if, if the property is magic, then it isn't. Because we know that magic or not, regardless of how we know the magic actually works as a mechanism, we do know that it produces very, very loud sound waves. And I think that's what this that's what this scene is trying to tell us, that it's just causing this rumbling in the mountain just by its well, volume. Uh, and it's, it's I, know, I, 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 I agree that that's that's a consistent and cogent argument. But then I'm not ready to assign a magical uh, property to it yet. OK, but that, that's this fine. seems like it could yeah. this seems okay. like it could be done with just mundane means. I agree. But then if you are going to evince that standard, you have to read that back to the preceding instance, which is the discovery of Mithril in the first place. So my question was. If you, well, repurposed, my question was, if you insist on the movement of rocks as we see in this scene, being by scientific means, which I is I don't what, insist, that's what I, I mean, I could well, be wrong, but that, that seems you, to be... Uh, if you posit that that was the case. Seems to be, yeah. Okay, then why do you not extend that same principle to the discovery of those minerals earlier on in the process via the exact same process of sound magic as the show presents it to us. In other because, words, as, I, as I said, I can keep saying it, but because we don't understand enough about the mechanism that they use this magic voice in order I, to discover I, I, these ores. I agree with you that we don't understand the process. What I'm saying is that if you're going to evince or at least posit a certain standard for one aspect of the discovery, then by implication, you are going to have to extend it to the other one. So if you're not saying at all. that- Absolutely not. Uh, Absolutely not. Is, Probably will seem very ridiculous to chat that we're arguing about dwarf magic, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'm going to insist on this point. If you're saying that if the, the singing of the song, moving matter, moving dust, moving rock in the I don't think it, no, it, it, it vibrates uh, the mountain, which as, a, as an, a, a, a property of the vibration just causes whatever is lighter on top of it to settle. Okay. So That's how is it. that different from the discovery of the mineral to begin with, which the show tells us is essentially, or at least- Because we don't know how it is that they discover it with this song. But the, we, we don't know, know if they are, we don't know if they are listening for it or if they have like, they're sensing vibrations with their hands. We don't know how that actually happens. Um, no, now, if, we... if they were to say, if they were to say in the opening that we, we sense the, and maybe I'm just not remembering the first conversation, but if they were to say in that, it just as a hypothetical, in that first conversation, if they said, we, we, f it would have to be something that would relate to this. Because mm -hmm. we, we don't get enough to work with. It might be the case that it is just the purely magical property that's making this dust tremble or the mountain tremble. But I'm, I'm not given enough to conclude that. When I know that actual sound waves will do this and she is singing very loudly. It takes more of a leap to go to the magical aspect. In which case, you're well, no, I, I don't think it does, given that the show has begun with the premise that magical uh, explanations are at least uh, feasible, if not probable. 
And in this case, it, it depends on what, how myth, they use it. It is probable rather than even just a, a possible explanation. So you're saying it's, it's greater, it's more likely than not, is what you're saying. I think in the case of the Lord of the Rings universe, yes, I would say the magical property of the song more accurate. What about the what about it being in the Lord of the Rings universe makes it more probable than not that it's magic causing this instead of just the sound waves? Because we're talking about a fantasy universe where magic is operative. Yeah, you you said that again a second time with different words. What about the universe? The fact that magic is coded into the laws of that universe. Yeah, I I know magic exists in this universe, but what about this world would lead us to believe that that magic is doing this? Well, I'll turn it around. Because not know. every because not every magic does everything. Having having, ac having accepted that we live or that we are operating for these these purposes in a universe where magic exists and is commonplace, what is it that makes you think that a specific event is more easily explicable via scientific means than the magical events that have already been shown in the earlier scenes to have produced results? Um, because those results are different, and because mundane reasons explain this perfectly. Song is song is the modus operandi here. So song is the song is the song is part of a mechanism that allows them to learn things about the mountain. How they actually go about doing that, we don't oh, know. But then you're disputing the validity of the science, uh, sorry, of the magical underpin of the universe, rather no, than no, only that they're somehow able to do something, both of which are fairly darn ambiguous. Okay. You, uh, right. That's fine. I agree with that. They are somehow able to do something. I agree. Yes. But Magically. Within the, yeah. But within the laws that's established in this universe, this is a universe of the... What laws in particular example. are you referring to? The fact that wizards exist. Wizards, sorry, exist. Uh, the Valor, who are gods with magical powers and properties, exist. The sun can be magicked into existence. The can dwarves they? are created by one of the Valor, uh, early in the... Late, sorry, in the First Age to have a unique attunement with, and that might not be a word, but I think it is, with the rocks, because they are created by one of the Valor outside the plan of God. This whole thing sort of feeds into itself. The, the elves, by contrast, are uniquely attuned to the magic of the moon and the water. The Sindar elves, what for example. What about the dwarves? Because we're talking about the dwarves here, right? Well, that's so, what what us... so the dwarves are actually unique in the creation story of Middle-earth because they are the only creation that's outside of God's plan. One of God's demigods, one of the Valar, creates the dwarves because he's jealous of God's creative capacity. Just to, just to be, before you go too far, is only stuff that's in the, only stuff that's in the show? Only stuff that's in, well, fucking none of that's in the show. Oh, well, the show then, well then, yeah, then that, that's one of, if, if all of the, if, if anything, that's why I was kind of stopping you there, because if anything you said about anything that would particularly lead to this being a more likely conclusion than not was in the show, then I would... I would be going with that. Oh, well, uh, well, I think I can still square the argument, though, because uh, would you accept, for example, that um, the person they want us to think is Gandalf is a wizard? Um, yeah, he seems to have some kind of a magical ability. So he has magical ability. So magic yeah. exists in this universe, right? He already did yeah. say that. If Can I... Do you mind if I just... Um, I just wanted Please to do. say quickly... Uh, for, for, I'd have a question for both, but I'll start with Rags. You, okay. when you when you'd say that, that they we're drawing a line between magical stuff happening to make this stuff happen versus um let's say non magical um would you or would you not say that she would still have to be using some form of magic to be able to sing and make the mountain rumble um yeah if that if the magic was nothing more than to make her sing louder i i could i could believe that far more readily that's where i'm at I simultaneously, this is why it feels so awkward for me, because I feel like I'm stuck between the both of you. I actually think it is a magical singing, but that it is just, especially because I've been staring just at the these volume. rocks for the past, like, 20 minutes, and if you look, <laughs> the ones that are on the highest places are all going down, the ones that are at the bottom parts are just shaking. So it really does yeah, feel like, like the, the, dust the is mountain is rumbling, the dust is settling. Now, my theory for what's going on with the, the, the veins of the... Thing. I don't think she's moving the mithril or anything, but when she sings that she can, I don't know, hear hear the mountain like resonate the song back, and then she can detect where 
that a particular frequency comes in and that the, there's a unique one and that's what led it to the mithril. That's what I assume. And if you said, well, would you describe that as magical? I'd be like, absolutely, because I don't think that's normal. I don't I don't think that's how singing... I don't think... So, do you, do you see what I mean? That's 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 where I'm at. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the magic being just to make her voice louder. I think that's totally... I think that's that's not unreasonable, given how loud we're hearing them sing, the fact that they sing magically. I can believe that that's just a natural extension. That's as far... I think that's as far as I'd go, though. Um, yeah. Not that it can actually manipulate the auras themselves. I'd have to... I'd have to have them talk about that or show that before I was oh, able well, to get yeah, to okay. do. So there, there are three different aspects we're talking about here. So the, there is our perspective in the real world when we understand what the physics of sound and vibration are. That's one. There's the in-universe basic understanding of magic, which is that it exists fundamentally. And then there is this weird middle ground between the existence of magic in-universe versus or in conjunction with our own understanding of what physics ex explains better than magic does. And so the seeming middle ground would seem to be, I accept that magic is amplifying voice, but all that's doing is amplifying physical scientific effect, which is the vibrations of mountain, which creates movement of dust of mineral and the rest of that. And for what it's... Sitting in my position now in the real world, our world, I would completely agree with you that that's the most rationalistic explanation of what's going on. What I'm saying, though, is that within the laws of the universe of Rings of Power, and certainly of Lord of the Rings, like, more accurately, it's, it's deeper than that. And you have to remember as well that the point of purpose of this song is that she is praying via song for the trapped miners to be... Uh, recovered, still alive. And then later on, Durin turns up and he says, I got the last one out. All of them were still breathing. Mm -hmm. So what you've, you're invited to poetically join the dance there. You're enjoying to uh, combine the, the, the song, which is quite clearly portrayed as being powerful and magical in its intonation. And the results of that song and the stated intention of that song and you're invited to at least suspect that the song is the reason that the dwarves were recovered alive from the bottom of the map. Now, the, the great thing about the magic in Tolkien's world is that it is fundamentally naturalistic. And so it's always open to argument and debate as to to what extent magic is directly responsible for effect or to what extent magic simply leads toward effect. In, in other words, it influences natural processes that themselves create effect. But, but we are, we can't dismiss to court the idea that the song, as presented in show, actually has a direct relationship and causes, indeed, the direct cause that the song is stated to be designed to attain. That was a really, really long-winded explanation. I apologize. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Like you're um, at nine and a half hours. I, I don't blame you. I, like, when it comes to the song and the rescue, like the rescue song she does... I'm not ready to accept that they were rescued because of the song. I don't know enough yet. Like, I, 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 I can't say either way. No, I agree because... with that, but then you're not supposed to. So, like, Tolkien's you, magic is not supposed to. Oh, you to think, be oh, I, I, like, the show or in the, the deeper lore? Um, I, I would say in both. Well, uh -huh. if we were to pretend next episode that we find out her singing is at maximum, everything it can possibly do is simply vibrate mm -hmm. the mountain. That is it. Would you then be like, oh, shit. Okay. And that, that's directed at Little Platoon, by the way. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, repeat. If so if, if in the next episode they actually define her singing, the only effect it has is vibrating the mountain, and she heard the frequency, she got lucky when she found the mithril, and that these rocks are only moving, the dust is only moving because it's rumbling the mountain, that's it. Would you be like, oh. Like, would, would you be surprised if they did, did that? Well, that would depend on the claim that's being made of said magic. So, for example, if you're saying that the, the only, uh, quote-unquote, magical effect is that the song moves the mountain, well, then how did she discover the mithril using the song? She must have had a receptive capacity, right? So Yeah, whether that, which could be physical or magical. We don't know I mean, yet. I could dwarves, believe both, depending on which... Bad, I agree. Dwarves could be bats. I agree with that. That could be a thing. But... 
Well, they don't have to be bats. They can make like technology, tuning forks, who knows what stuff they can do, right? I don't know yet. That's why I'm withholding judgment. Yeah, okay. Well, that, no, that's fair enough in that case. I, I would, well, again, I don't, I don't want to come across as the, the, the weird mystic of the, of the group. I don't, I don't believe in this oh, shit. Fine. We need more weird mystics. I'm talking about like based on, on what we know of the law of the universe, even the one that just rings of power is showing us discarding whatever the rings of power has avoided in the law. Um, I don't think it's even necessarily wise to say, well, I err on the side of caution where magic is concerned, because magic is the thing that will create the Balrog, for example, and we know the Balrog will well, I, come into it. Well, I think the, the element is I'm, I'm ready to believe pretty much anything in this world could happen because of magic when it's presented to me in that way. But I'll I'll err and say things are not magical unless otherwise stated. Like the well, default that's, that's, is that things aren't magic until the show explains that it is. Because most but things then, aren't. Um, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so, so Fellowship of the Ring, for example, the fight against the Balrog. There are obvious magical elements in that when Gandalf, um, yeah, uh, yeah, uses the shield, for example. However, there is and Gandalf's main magical uh, faculties involve magic influencing the world around him so for example um in the hobbit you see him shattering the rock to reveal the sun which is the thing he repeats in return of the king when he shines the sun at the uh, nazgul chasing the horsemen back toward uh, gondor but um in the fight against the balrog all he's really doing is applying magic to the breaking of his staff against the bridge so this is this is physicality and magic combined yeah you but i Really it's clear there that there's like a a magical element to it in the effects that are, that are shown and him doing it and I think that there's there's far more of an obvious magical component to that than there is to this vibration we're seeing. Is there is there is there much more of an obvious one from Gandalf I, I breaking the staff against the bridge of Khazad Doom? He like projects a magical shield around himself. Oh no no no! I'm not talking about that one. I'm I'm talking about when he breaks his staff against the bridge. To collapse yeah, the... isn't there like a shockwave to it? And it, it is just a man hitting a stick against a bridge. So this is just a woman singing at some rocks. No, My but we don't know what the element is there. And so so there's let so you're saying there's just as much when he breaks the bridge, there is just as much of a magical element to that as there is to which part of her singing that her singing is magical or the that her singing has physical effects i i agree that this no yeah i i agree the singing has has some element of magic with it but i think that it's just if there's going to be magic with it it's to enhance the volume as far as i'll go because sound waves just vibrating a mountain would do this to the dust on top of it well, that that that's a creditable position and would you extend that then if for gandalf uh, breaking his staff against the bridge is that simply him extending the force of impact and friction to a degree that breaks the bridge? I think it would. I think there would have to be a magical component to that because we know it's just not possible for an old man to hit a bridge with is, a is, wooden stick. Is that a magical component? Is that magical component the same as the one you accept amplifies Deesa's voice? Um, magical. The same magical component in the in terms of similar effects that they. That one, well, that, that a magic that allows uh, him said to break the stone said there is no the way an old man could break a stick hard enough to break a bridge. Well, okay, fine, but there is no way a woman could sing loud enough to break mountains. No, no, no I, as I've said multiple times, I'm fine with the magic just creating an ample, just making her sing louder, and okay. an yep. effect of I, her singing louder is the vibration. And, and I accept that and grant that, fine. All I'm saying is, do you extend the same principle to Gandalf breaking his staff on the bridge? That it is that it is magic making him stronger. The magic is amplifying physical effect. It yeah it would yeah it would have to do that for him to break the bridge as far. Well, I'm not going to say it has to do that because I'm not going to pretend to even understand the magic system in Lord of the Rings, honestly. But if it's just physical for it has to be directed a particular way. But yeah, I, I yeah, there's some mag yeah, probably some force related magical component to him breaking the bridge. Sure, okay. that's fine. But then you've accepted the in principle that magic is the the progenitor of certain physical effects, right? It can be. 
it not necessarily is all the time but in principle but it, it can, can be it can yeah in the two in these two circumstances that we're using because i because the lord of the rings is especially with like gandalf's magic i it's really tough to know what he can or can't do a lot of the time it's very it's it's a very ambiguously sort of defined magic system um which is sort of its problem and its defense at the same time but yeah. here like i said i'm not ready to th i'm not ready to go any further than I am so far. Depends what the show wants to present to me in terms of information. Yeah. I just don't know what that'll be. As long as they try not to like set themselves up with a rule that will really that they'll that they'll end up breaking, I'm generally all right with it. Though my yeah. preference is often for more hard rules. The, no, the same. And the, the, honestly, I'm slightly playing devil's advocate in the sense that like my natural default position is to take the position you've taken. Like you believe in physical effects until physical effect is not sufficient to explain actual effect, in which case magic comes into it. I, that's my default position. All I'm saying is that when you're considering Tolkien's universe, it's a mistake to err on the side of caution, I think. That's Tolkien, what I'm doing. You, and I, I'm, again, my natural inclination is to do the same thing. But when you're considering Tolkien's universe, it's almost a mistake to do that because... To be fair, this it's is very Amazon's to Tolkien universe, so... It's, so. So it's not a mistake to do that? No, it is a mistake to do. It's a you mistake. Said it's almost a mistake. Well, so, maybe okay, maybe I was being too polite. It is a mistake to err on the side of caution when when it comes to that. In which case so I'm caution, wait, wait. So erring on the side of caution for this universe is that things are more likely magic than not? Um well, yes. So the the idea Basically being, if we're talking about the real world in which we live today, um, things that are unexplained, you mm -hmm. can pretty much guarantee will be explained at some point via scientific means. That's, that's a pretty solid assumption. We have a methodology for discovering things, and that methodology will extend to things we have yet to discover. But when mm -hmm. you're talking about Tolkien's universe, you don't have the same surety of, of knowledge. Even there is no equivalent framework. It seems Magic, that even I mean, in this world, the vast majority of things are totally naturalistic. Well, no, because in Tolkien's world, magic and naturalism are not easily separable in the way that well, they are. Well, certainly in that, well, we're, we are still just, this is all within the confines of the show itself. Mm -hmm. Virtually everything that we've seen in the show seems to be just normal stuff that happens without a magical component. Even the outlying things seem the, to be the magical the aspect. Move whole mountains is perfectly natural. Sorry, what? I didn't hear you. What? The, the, the singing of songs that move whole mountains is perfectly natural. Why did I? Why would you even say okay, that? I, wait, 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 wait. Because that, that I, I was about to say that's that's a really that's easy like, invite for it to fall apart. So, <laughs> what Rag said is that uh, the most of what we've seen. So he would consider the moving of a mountain, as you put it, yeah, to be especially a when single. Times I've said I'm a, finding, saying that this is magic. You would yes. say that's a single instance versus, let's say, when they shown to operate a boat that looks to follow all the rules that we know. When they operate, like it's walking through streets, speed. gravity seems like okay. like. A, all of the individual not Gandalf, actions. Not, not Gandalf crashes to earth in a meteor and controls fireflies. Yeah, no, you're right. That is that yeah, would be an that, instance that of magic. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah, that um, absolutely I, happens. And Rags can see that. Because yeah. I was going to say, that seems like an easy thing to concede the, of the majority of the actions that take place in this world. And if they were to be split into magical or normal, quote unquote, there's more normal than magical. Oh, I, no, but, yeah, that's uh, clearly we, the point. It's the vast yeah. majority of things that we see seem to be totally normal and without magical but, elements. But, but magic, magic within any kind of Tolkien mythos is augmentary magic. Like magic is not Harry Potter magic in Tolkien's universe. It's not even Harry Potter magic in Rings of Power, which has very little to do oh. with Tolkien's universe. But it still has. It still calls back to it. Harry Potter magic is this it's in this, the show. Well, if I may, uh, uh, when he makes a shield. Into, around himself, I would consider that closer to Harry Potter magic than augmenting. Yeah. The, the, the shield that he uh, uses comes from the Ring of Nenya, which he gains from the elves. It's one of the three rings the elves have created. Uh, one of the rings that are created for the elves by Celebrimbor. I thought um, um, that's what you that meant by... When, when you said Harry Potter magic, I thought what you meant was like the difference between amplification and just generation of a thing from essentially nothing. So like the light beams, right? Those are Harry Potter thing when he when he lasers with the light beams, right? No, I would say I would say they are generation, not creation. 
So generation, the, the, not creation. The power of the Ring of Nenya, for example, which is the, as far as I remember, I could be misremembering, but I think I'm right. The power of the Ring of Nenya, which is what gives Gandalf the power to have his magical shield and to reject fire, also what gives him the power to control fire, is a property which is imbued within the Ring of Nenya itself. It's not something he's simply waving a wand to create. This is something which is... But it's a clearly... wand instead of a ring, right? Well, I was, was going to no, say, wouldn't Harry Potter the... argue the source of... Like, they need their wands in order to cast these spells? No, but yeah. that's, a dif that, that's a difference. The wand as a vessel to cast a spell is different from a ring created from the fabric of creation itself, imbued with the elements that create... What does that mean, the fabric of creation itself? So when... Um, Okay, we, we, I have to ve uh, deviate from the law of rings of power just to explain this. Oh, feel free to. You don't yeah. need our permission. Unle unless we're talk like having an argument about the show, then we'll stick to it. But for this, no, just no, out no, of, no. to understand okay, I, the difference, you'll... Good, I just wanted to check. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when, when it comes to the creation of the world in, in Tolkien's mythos, um, you have the godhead, the god, which is Iluvatar. Um, and Iluvatar creates this sub-order of demigods you might call them they're called the the ainur mm -hmm. uh the ainur are like no i guess you could say like norse gods angels or slightly above those they're like like zeus or like the greek pantheon for example like okay like, uh, so as so as like whereas Iluvatar is like the the most powerful and the yeah. most maximally knowledgeable that you could be like the ultimate everything yeah, these even... guys are like grecian gods who have faults and yeah. Okay, but exactly. they're still credited. And okay. even in the Greek religion, ancient Greek religion, had this reference to the god above. So there's this, this constant above Zeus, even, is a godhead. Mm -hmm. That's Iluvatar. Iluvatar creates these Ainur, and the Ainur um, are the equivalent of the Greek pantheon. They okay. are responsible for creation themselves. So they are imbued with the power of song and music, and they each have a different part of a harmony. And that harmony corresponds to an aspect, an element of creation of the world as we now know it today. And those Ainur, some of them become the Valar, which we hear referenced in Rings of Power. One of them is Melkor, who becomes Morgoth, the progenitor to Sauron. Uh, Sauron is responsible for chaos in the universe. Um, but between all of them, and, and you have this, this entire complex embodiment of creation. Each of them has a part of a harmony, Morgoth is unique in having a part of all of the harmonies, but he is aspirational, he is jealous, he wants creation for himself, he creates discord and, and rancor and, and general dissatisfaction in the world. Mm -hmm. um, when you come forward then to the creation of the rings, for example, so the rings each have reference to elements. So the ring of Nenya, which is Gandalf's ring, is referential to, I think, fire. Um, there is there are two other rings for the elves which have other elements associated to them. The reason they are again this is this is partly by memory. I think I'm right about this. The reason they are referen they are referencing uh, elements of creation is because they are imbued in a sense with a derivative power of the Valar themselves. In other words, the Valar who embody those elements of creation. So the the ring of water embodies in some way. I think it's Umwe. Valar is. for water. In a sense, uh, yeah, exactly. The Valar for uh, for water, I think, I think it's Umwe, but I could be wrong. Uh, there is the Ring of Nenya, which is Manwe's, who's the sort of the chief god, the Zeus god. There is one of the Elven Ring, and it's so it, it sort of carries on. So the reason that's different then from Harry Potter magic when you get to the level of the Lord of the Rings is that there is an entire architecture that underpins the effect of the ring that Gandalf has. So Gandalf has the ring of Nenya. That gives him the power of fire. But that is not just waving a wand in a specific instance to create a specific magical effect. That is calling upon thousands, tens of thousands, millennia of years of act almost supernatural power that imbues Gandalf with the, the affinity for fire that he has. Whereas in Harry Potter, of course, you just wave a wand in a specific instance. You say Wingardium Leviosa, and the thing floats. That's ad hoc magic. That's that's short termist magic. That's a soft magic system. Tolkien is quite a hard magic system, by contrast. Um, I've always heard it said that wait, the I've Lord of the Rings I've, system I've, is soft. I've reversed. Yeah. yeah, I've always heard those reversed. Where Harry Potter is much more hard magic and. 
I thought the hard and soft, the difference was like, it's more vague in terms of how everything comes together and what the limits are. Meanwhile, Harry Potter's yeah. hard because of the fact that it's like, you say this, you get this. No, nothing else sort of thing. It's like Dungeons and Dragons magic. Yeah, I, yeah but the, that, that's soft in the sense that you can say anything that sounds magic. And no, creative. not no. It, I think it means the opposite, where you have to specifically say certain things to get specific effects. I think that's what it's referring to. That's what I've always known it to be. Yeah. Okay. Whereas if if you okay. were to watch like the Lord of the Rings and you saw Gandalf using his magic, you couldn't really pin anything or much to it in terms of rules and structure. Uh, it's kind yeah, of ambiguous and loose. That's that's kind of paradoxical because in the case of okay, take Harry Potter for example. Um, before J.K. Rowling came around and decided in the first Harry Potter book that Wingardium Leviosa meant levitation, mm -hmm. it never meant anything. There was no wand movement. There was no language attached to the spell. She invented it solely for its effect in the immediate moment. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the invention of... Well, in the story... Effect. Well, but in, this, in the world of... In the universe of Harry Potter... There's an there's a reason why those words do that spell. True, but you can't really differentiate between the in universe and the out universe with J.K. Rowling because J.K. Rowling is the sole originator progenitor, and what she's establishing are not consistent laws that apply to everything. Well, no, because excuse me, what Tolkien's doing is Tolkien is creating laws and and bases of principle, which then are extrapolated upon. So everything is referential back to the Valar's creation of the world. Everything follows from a single originating point. Everything is referential. J.K. Rowling can sit and write Harry Potter and she can say, well, okay, I want, I want a spell that turns beer into newts. Okay. So I'm going to say that spell is fuck-offian levy spastic. Like, the like, you can make anything else you want out of that true. in the moment. But now, it isn't, true, but isn't that the core of Tolkien's Tolkien magic that. Yeah, creation? That's what isn't Tolkien that the, the baseline? Is everything comes from you said yeah. creation? Wouldn't arguably that's no. not necessarily much different from because, whatever you want. Uh, uh, the difference between Tolkien and Rowling is Tolkien does not have reliance to spells oh, and magic. I'm giving it to you that he's he's it's clearly a, crafted something more meaningful, but at the core, he still gets to do whatever he wants. Yeah, he gets to decide with how the magic I, in that world works, I much actually, the same I, I, way that Rowling gets to decide how her magic works. I disagree. Um, very few people have been able. Maybe maybe it's just a a, a, a factor of time, but I think it's a factor of, of history as well. Very few people can take J.K. Rowling and they can say, well based upon the known laws and identified patterns that J.K. Rowling has created, I'm going to expand her universe in a way that is obviously and academically consistent with what she created, without simply saying, I'm going to invent a new magic pseudo-pig Latin word and create a new effect for it. That's a different thing. What Tolkien did was Tolkien created a basis of laws he created in a sense um an epistemology of the universe what he did was create laws by which his universe was governed and from those laws you derive truth about the universe that's different from simply saying i will imagine a new thing in that universe into being because with tolkien if you want to add to his universe you have to have reference to its origin point you have to say based on the epistemology based on the ontology of what has been created by Tolkien, the theology, the theology that's created in the Valar, I have to create something that is of accord with their their creation of our own universe. It's materialistic oh, is, in that way. Is uh, is so is we might be talking like we might be talking past you on this one in terms of are you saying that he's being more faithful to his lore than she is? I'm saying that Tolkien has created a law that can survive without him. And J.K. Rowling hasn't. J.K. Rowling has created... So? No, I don't think so. I think J.K. Rowling hasn't created a law. All she's done is created a, a very, very loose linguistic framework which allows people to take pig Latin and describe to any individual word any effect they want to happen at that given moment. That's all it is. There's no reference to a creation myth. There's no ontology or epistemology to that universe that she's created in the way that Tolkien is. If, if you say that the Valar who controls the water in Tolkien 
gives magical spells to people in the third age, which contradict what he does in the first age, you have reference point to the first age to say, no, that's that's not how this works. That's obviously contradictory to the world he's created. Um, so if I just so yeah. out of curiosity, right? Because like um, again, just want to make sure it's said clearly. Tolkien put a hell of a lot more effort into the magic system than she did, from what you've been saying. However, you know what? You know, you said Gandalf's ring, for example, is uh, it's, it like relates to fire. Yes. Um, what is the the tier? If you can do, because I have a couple of questions. If you can be as fast as possible, the tier above that ring, like it, it is drawn from a thing that is drawn from a thing that is drawn from it. Like that's how it works, right? Like, was there a when that ring comes to be thought of? Is like what makes it a fire thing as opposed to a water thing or an air thing or an earth thing? Um, I, I'd be hesitant to to say definitively, just because it's been a long time since I've read this bit of the Silmarillion. But from what I remember of it, the reason the Ring of Nenya, for example, has the the capacity of fire, the nature of fire, is because it is derived from the Valar, whose nature is fire. So it's derived from a godhead of a type. Um, I could be very wrong about that it's been years since i read this part um, chat might correct me but so, is there any other ring that's derived from them that's not fire or is, is that it yes well well all the rings are in a sense derived from uh the the fundamental elements of the universe so you have the ring of nenu which is the ring of fire i don't remember the names of the others but um galadriel has one of the rings which is i think the ring of water or, okay. or light one or two uh there's a third ring for the elves there are seven for the dwarves nine for the for the race of men most of which sauron has in his possession but each of these has a fundamental aspect of creation a character of creation embedded within the quality of the ring itself and so that that's the reason sauron wants them right so sauron wants to create and control following but on from morgoth's desire he wants to control all of creation so he wants the rings that embody the elements of creation yeah. if that's um... why he goes out seeking them if someone was to, well, let's say Tolkien was still alive and he, he has an addendum and there's a, another ring at that sort of tier level and it's like the ring of, and then whatever name, but it represents plasma, would that be acceptable? Um, I think plasma would come under the purview of fire, so... Um, well, let's just... Mm, so yes, then. Uh, well, well, like, are, are you asking me whether Tol if Tolkien had created... A new element of creation within his universe and ascribed a ring to that element would that be acceptable is that the question yeah and like let's say you contextualize it as it's a, another secret ring that was not quite mentioned before because it's it was hidden for whatever reason well i, I think that would have to there's an interesting thing with tolkien because if you go back to the silmarillion and the lost tales and the unfinished tales there are multiple variants and versions of them the the question of law and continuity with tolkien is uniquely difficult um, but there are certain consistent elements. If you were to tell me Tolkien had created a, a tenth ring for the men, or a fourth ring for the elves, or an eighth ring for the dwarves, that amounted to or represented a different element of creation as he described it, well, okay, I would go with that. That would be fine. And then you would have very interesting subsequent subordinate conversations as to what the implications of the existence of that ring were. But the odds are he wouldn't have done that because it wouldn't have had reference to any of the Valar who originated these themes and harmonies in the universe to begin with, if that makes sense. Um, the distinction I'm detecting, I think, is just the what you're pointing out is JK's created a world where she could just add any spell at any time and it wouldn't need to be justified in any way, shape, or form. Meanwhile, Token has created a system that means he'd have to slot it in with meaning instead of just willy-nilly throwing it in. You cannot it seems like the systems are invent broad. rings of power and stuff. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. You can't randomly invent magical elements within the Lord of the Rings if you're faithful to the Lord of yeah, the Rings. Yeah, that, the thing work. is... Does that apply to individual spells? Like, a, like if the firing allows you to create like a ring of fire, um, would that be consistent? I think, even I though think we haven't in, seen it, yeah, but, that's but that seems point. to follow logically, right? Yeah, I think that, that's a fair point. I think what you, you could derive the impact of specific elements and apply them to specific types of spell. I think that would be acceptable because you would still be referencing an originating point of that magic. So yes, 
Gandalf, for example, can form a ring of fire around him to shield himself from fire itself. That might not necessarily have been described in Tolkien, though I think it was actually in that case, but for the sake of argument, it need not have been. But it would still have been derived therefrom. At least you could make an argument. It would be up to you to make the argument from first principles in that case. You, you're Basically, what you're trying to do is to add to a mythos, uh, a theodicy even, and both mythos and theodicy has a codified system of rules and norms that you have to conform to in order to claim to be a part of that same theodicy or mythos or system of rules. Um, so yeah, you could theoretically invent new spells, but you would have to have reference to their originating point if it were Tolkien, I think. Chat might be blaring up telling me I'm blasphemous in this, but I think I'm well, right. Well, couldn't, couldn't you do that with Harry Potter? If all of the, like, all the spell names seem to have, like, latin links and there are uh, rules about some things you can't do i assume in the in the potter well, world so, so as that long was as actually gonna be my next held, thing i was gonna yeah, say like as long even... as you held to those guidelines wouldn't that be the same thing no if, because you're working backwards with with jk rowling you're working you're, you're saying this is the array of spells we have how can we possibly work backwards and retroactively create a common origin point to these spells. Well, wait, no, 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 no. It's, it's not about a common origin point. It's that in the world of Harry Potter, the, like, if you were, how would you know which came first? Well, that, spells, that comes right? back, how would you know which spells back, came um, first and were added on? Because that yes. would be, it could have, it could have existed all along and no one just used that particular spell. It could have been not very important or super specific. And so no one ever used it. But this so is to say that it existed all along, but no one just ever used it. Uh, and surely she didn't, all the spells that she thought of, if we're going to get that meta about it, surely all the spells she thought of, not all of them made it into the books. So they exist in the universe in a sense, but we just don't know about. It. Well, I mean, well, of course, it's a, it's basically a given that there are obviously more spells in the Harry Potter universe than we see. Yeah, so there's that, all that stuff that is a part of the world that we just don't know about yet. That's because sure. there is no common origin point from which those spells are derived. So, but what about the? In so Tolkien, the sorry, was I was saying is that similar to the fire ring example? Like we never see the fire ring, but it exists as a property in the lord of the rings world someone would be able to use the ring of fire with a fire ring that wouldn't that wouldn't be the same but why does the fire ring have the power of fire is the question so it's in jk rowling's universe um there's no underpinning structure there's no um, oh, i in in jk rowling's there's no underpinning structure yes. i i would isn't there there is no. I, well, I was going to say, I would have said there is, it's just, it's very simplistic. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah that's, that, that is the difference between soft and hard magic systems. It's a soft magic underpinning system. Um, again, I, I, I just, I feel I, like we've got a different understanding of how soft versus yeah. hard works. But uh, to be quick, like, so reverse, yeah. by virtue of like, there's no spell that cracks the earth in two in the Harry Potter universe. And I'm pretty sure JK would be like, you cannot introduce that. That's not a thing. You can't have that. Well, why? She has no reference point to anything she's created that precludes that possibility. What if she has a book? A book of all of this stuff and we just don't know about it. Would that change the well, would that change it? If she had if, that book, if like if she had her, her she made her magic rule book almost as if a guide for when she wrote the book. She basically made it a big magic rule book slash index for only herself as a guideline to make magic in the books. Would that function in the same way? Yes, because then she would be transitioning from a soft to a hard magic system. If she were to be cre if she were to create a book which charts the entire origin of the power that gives power to magic in the first place, therefore the thing from which all magic power is derived in each individual instance of spell, that would be the creation of a hard magic system, and that would then put her on a par with someone like Tolkien, who has created the same thing. But she hasn't done that. What she's done is she started with spells as effect, and she's attempted to work down from those gradually, but not all that deeply. I think I'm, to the extent that we're almost there the now, because now what I want to ask you is, so the Lord of the Rings movies, without reading the books, is that, from your POV, a soft or hard magic system? I would say it's still... I would say it's still a fairly hard magic system because it's a referential system. 
you have so no not, context whatsoever yeah. when watching those films for how any of the magic works at all or where it comes from. Uh, yeah. But you know, well, okay, this is this is the question of authorial input, though, isn't it? Because if, also, if I'm that's why Peter Jackson, I think that's why Rags was saying like if there was a book that detailed all of this, but people hadn't read it from J.K., that's the, then it, it surely within just the context of those movies, you'd have to concede it is soft from your POV, right? If if you are asking me to say that the the three Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films, are divorced entirely from what Tolkien wrote, yes, that would be a soft magic system because there is no underpinning thing which gives power to the magic they use. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. However, that's not what those films are because I fundamentally disagree with the notion of death of the author. I fundamentally disagree with the idea that uh, a film adaptation in 2002 can be treated as distinguishable from the book version of 19... When was it? 47, I think it was. 53. Yeah. Um, I don't agree that you can differentiate those things. The reason the films work is that they are referencing something which precedes them. The books work in the same way. Bearing in mind, much of the lore of the magic that Tolkien creates isn't included even in the books for The Lord of the Rings. It's created in the mythos he creates to underpin the books of The Lord of the Rings. It's created Ooh. in the Silmarillion, The Lost Tales, all the rest of that. Hmm. So the films are referential, the books are referential. What, what creates a hard magic system is whether it's referencing a single point from which every subsequent event is derived. And a soft magic system is there is no single point from which anything is derived Anything you say goes, depending on the needs of plot, would be my definition of the two. Hmm. And hey, for the record, I am 100% um, in favor of Death of the Author. Absolutely, 100 fucking percent. I adore it. I think it's fantastic. And it makes it, it so I'm not limited say, in my interpretations. I might be 50% in favor of Death of the Author. <laughs> you were very... Okay, that was quick. All right. <laughs> we, yeah, um, here, we, we don't, we don't, we want, we want those authors dead, damn it. <laughs> um... Well, because the interesting comparison we always bring up, right, is going to be stuff like The Shining, uh, uh -huh. where it's sort of fantastic movie and a fantastic book, but those two cannot coexist, not even close. Um, I disagree. You couldn't have the film without the book. I didn't say that, that though. That's not what we said. But if they can't coexist, then you can't. No, they both. can't coexist as narratives, as stories. You have to take one or the other. You can't have both at the same time. They are distinctly two different. Well, uh, okay, then when we, we're operating on different definitions of the death of the author there, because the author is the progenitor of The Shining as a story to begin with. Mm -hmm. if, if you're saying that death of the author means the complete ex the expulsion, the expungion of one, well, then these two things literally couldn't coexist and so wouldn't coexist. The fact that The Shining is a film, which I prefer to The Shining as a book, coexists with The Shining as the book, is owed to the fact that those two things can oh, coexist. Oh, like they literally coexist, but what I'm... Yeah, like physically you could have yeah. a book and a DVD in the same universe, yes. You, 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 well, mean, well, the narratives. The, the narrative, the plot of these things, can those two things coexist? That's different. But I don't think the death of the author restricts itself to strict definitions of plot. So... Without the author, Stephen King, you would not have Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining. Well, of course, it's but without, yeah. without any of the there creators, you wouldn't have the creations, the but I don't know what... Um, to be, just if, as fast as you possibly can, in like a sentence if you can, what do you believe Death of the Author refers to? Oh, fuck. Um, death of the Author means... You just told me to do it quickly, so I... <laughs> We'll uh, give you we'll uh, give you an extra sentence if you need to. Uh, two sentences. Uh, two death of the sentences. author means, as far as I've sort of understood it to be, death of the author means that nothing about the moral, the intellectual, or the narrative purpose of that author exists in any work that is derived from the works of said author. That could be completely fucking wrong. But you did uh, ask me. Uh, to do it um, well, if I, so, mine would be the intentions and interpretations of the work from the author are irrelevant to your own, essentially. Yes, but would your interpretations of the works of the author exist without the intentions of the author to begin with? So, like, so, The Shining is a good example. 
Stephen King wrote The Shining in a specific way. Mm -hmm. Stanley Kubrick interpreted it in a very different way. Yep. Would Stanley Kubrick have interpreted it, been able to interpret it in that way, without the interpretation he had rejected in the book form, which is the version the author intended? Well, so it, it sounds like you're almost making it an impossibility in terms of like physics for death be. of the author to yeah. exist. Like you're, it cannot you, happen because the author had to creator. create the thing. Like the, yeah, the argument we're familiar heard... with is people say like you cannot interpret the work without the author's intentions. That you yeah. must do I've, it. You know? I've never heard quite this explanation as death of the author like this before. Yeah, like because um, it sounds like you're saying not... you can't do it without the author's having created the works and it's like well we're fine with saying the yeah. creators owed some level of credit to a degree but yeah what you said seems to be impossible to not be the case well i don't well i i would i wouldn't roll away from the idea that it's impossible to kill off the author entirely well um as much as we love killing authors i think <laughs> I, that it's it's like a separation between intent and what's in the actual thing itself or oh, like it, it's almost like well, you know meta, like um to, to, just to, things here, aren't we? to give an example, if someone saw addiction in Gollum and his story, and that the the ring is represents that, and how you know it can destroy a life, and and all this stuff, and then Tolkien went, that wasn't the intention at all. That's not at all in the story. It, that person can be like, I don't care. It's there. I don't care if it's I not what you your, intended, sort of thing. I don't. What think was that... your example? Your your Star Wars one that you used for Twin Perfect? Oh the, well. Uh... Twin Perfect hated that example. The best example is going to be the James Gunn one with um, Polka Dot Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, uh, actually, I have to pee real quick. Give him the James Gunn example. Sure. It's far away. So, Sui The Suicide Squad has a character called Polka Dot Man, who's this very timid, very quiet dude who's dressed pretty clownishly, and his power is to launch polka dots at people and it melts them. Um, <laughs> he's not really doing anything for most of the movies, just sort of around, and then halfway through, he activates the polka dots to help the team, and it fucking wipes out the enemy, and he's just like, eh, sorry, it's so flamboyant. Because it is ridiculous, right? It's funny, it's James Gunn. Right. Moving on, this new character enters the, the team called Milton, and he's just there, and it's a fucking great joke. He's just this dude who's with the team, and eventually, like, he's got barely any screen time, he just sort of pops up here and there, and he gets killed at one point in just a scene. It's just during a scene, he gets shot. He's dead. And Polka Dot Man is like, Jesus Christ, like, you know, that's, that's horrifying. He was with us, he was helping us. And the other two team members are like, who? He's like, he's Milton. They're just like, literally who? And, and he, he shouts at them. He's, he's really upset with them for the fact that they didn't care that this guy joined their team, tried to help them, and died for the team to help them achieve their goal. Really funny. Um, and then Polka Dot Man, toward the end of the film, gains the courage, because his story is that he's been like terrified of his mother because she's the one that experimented on him to give him the powers. And at the end, he envisions the bad guy as his mum and manages to actually like do some damage, and he's helping to save the world, and then he dies. And it's like, aww. Um, it's, a pretty, you know, it's a complete story. It's pretty tragic. good. Yeah, it's tragic. So a lot of people are appreciating Polka Dot Man. They like him. He's like a guy who was almost built to be a bad person, but he came out, came through, and they would cite that scene with Milton being like, showed he had a lot of heart. He's the only person who actually paid attention to Milton being alive. James Gunn sees these tweets. He quote tweets them and says, no, uh, Polka Dot Man is very vain. He's very obsessed with like being seen. He wants attention. He took that opportunity with Milton. He died, and he made that about him. He starts screaming at everybody because he wants attention for himself. He didn't care about Milton. It's like he's very much a um, self-centered character. And everyone was like, what? If you watch the movie, there's not a single reference to Polka Dot Man being self-centered or vain. But James Gunn, the literal creator, is like, no, that's his character. And it's like, bro, that's not in your story. So, sorry. <laughs> And that's what that's what we consider Death of the Author to be. It's like I appreciate your interest, your you know, addition to the interpretation of this movie, but I'm disregarding it because it doesn't match the references. Yeah, your and your even intentions its its own are not necessarily a part of what you create. Um, I, I, and I don't want to. Your intentions are not necessarily part of what you create. Is that what we said? Pretty much, yes. You can you're... intend to have something be a way, but it might not actually exist in what you create. Okay, that but that's not, not man being... that's not death of the author, that's development on the author's intent. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I'm pretty sure what we just described, like with the James Gunn example, that is death of the author. 
Yeah, um, I've, I've never heard it any other way. Would, would would that character have existed without the author to have created them? No, every creation has a creator. Okay. That's all things that are made. The author of creation, for example. So... so my, my, point about, my point about death of the author isn't that you can't deviate from what the author intended. It's that you would not have deviated. You cannot deviate by definition without reference to what the author originally intended it to be. Deviation yeah, that's by definition referential. Um, that is... I think it's, 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 so, uh, we just yeah, define just... death of the author completely differently. Yeah, I've never heard it like that before. That sounds... I, I, I accept that we might do, but I think I'm probably with you in terms of the, the, the artistic worth of derivation and deviation. All I'm saying is that you can't really classify that as death of the author if the derivation or deviation could not have existed but for the author's creation to begin with. It's like, it's like saying, I created a character called Bob. And Bob is a single man. Um, uh, he divorced his wife. He has three kids. Someone comes along after that and says, I accept the existence of Bob and some of his characterization, but he only has two kids and he's a widower as opposed to a divorcee. Well, that's not true death of the author, is it? Because the author's inspiration, the author's creation is still there. What you're doing is deviating from authorial intent. You're not killing the author entirely. So my argument. I don't think is it, I don't think the name be... is to be taken too literally. For no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying take the name Bob seriously. I'm saying that I mean the, the term definitely of the idea of said character. If you're deviating from an established norm, an established character, you're adding a new element or contradicting an established element. You're still referring to a creation that is not your own, and it is the author's unique creation. Therefore, the author is not dead, by definition. The author is simply being repurposed. Uh, or his creation is being so it sounds like you're saying death yeah, author is an impossibility, author, right? Something else. I would, I, I would be cautious before I even started to say that death of the author was a legitimate thing. I, it's just, if you truly believe what we, everything you just said, then surely you believe death of the author is impossible. It's gotta be. Possibly. I, I, I would be cautious about going so far as to be so uh, deterministic. Well, no, because I actually think it, it follows I from the way yeah, that you logically. framed it that, yeah, that it would be yeah. impossible. And the reason I'm asking you that and hoping you'd say yes is because then I can be like, ah, yeah, because the way we frame Death of the Author, it's like a choice on the individual if they want to consider yeah. it or not. Yeah, um, I've only understood it as... Uh, the, re the, the, reason, the reason I wouldn't go so far as to say Death of the Author is precluded by my definition is to say that I, I'm, I'm, I am as yet, myself, personally, undecided on whether um, a complete or at least a 99% contradiction of character created by someone else constitutes a death of author. As in, let's say you took Sherlock, take Sherlock Holmes. Like There are many variations on Sherlock Holmes. Uh, most of them, however, conform to certain archetypal behavioral types, characterizations. Sherlock Holmes is a definitive entity, but with many variations. If, however, you were to tell me that Sherlock Holmes was a Vogon and he was um, a, a 15th gender and he wasn't a detective, but he was instead a sewage management official, um, mm -hmm. would I consider that death of the author? Possibly yes, but only because you've completely detached the authorial creation from any resemblance of the intent behind the authorial creation. However, if you were to say, well, Sherlock Holmes is a Victorian gentleman, or Sherlock Holmes is a man born in the year 2003 who uses smartphones to solve mysteries, I don't think that constitutes the death of the author because the author's intent is still there. It's simply being repurposed. So I, I'm not... It might be, um... It might be if we draw. This happens with the uh, Mary Sue discussions. I find so if we dropped Death of the Author entirely as a description of what me and Rags are talking about, and instead went with the creator's interpretation of events are no more meaningful necessarily to what is actually happening than anyone else's. Let's rename it Birth of the Reader. Maybe yeah. Um, so um, you know that example I gave you with James Gunn. Would you have said James Gunn is wrong from if everything I told you was true? 
Um, I don't. Well, I, I'm not familiar with the the character okay, he's referring um, to. If everything if, Mario so, said was true, though. Well, I, I can understand why he'd want something that he's more familiar with. So okay. you, it, uh, let's just take Peter Jackson's talking about Lord of the Rings, and he says um, Gandalf is a woman. Absolutely, definitively a woman in my films. That is a woman. Do you think he's wrong? I would say that's that's a deviation from authorial intent, but that, by definition, is not proof of the death of the author. No, I, we'll get to that, Dory. So um, we're dropping death of the author. We're getting out of here. We don't We don't care about that anymore. We're ignoring the title. So... Peter Jackson tells you Gandalf is a woman in in his film Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Do you uh -huh. would you say to him you're wrong, or would you say, "Hmm, huh, that's strange. I didn't think so." Well, to the extent you're referring to the works of somebody who's not yourself, who's created the canon you claim to be part of the lineage of, I would say you're wrong. But this I wouldn't is... necessarily say that you are you are beyond the pale for that for being for reinter reinterpreting that character uh that way. I'll try a different yeah, one. Tolkien's yeah. alive, and he tells you Aragorn is a woman in my books. He he's, he he literally says he is a woman in my books. Uh, what would you what would you say to Tolkien? Uh, well, that by definition is is authorial intent, isn't it? So this so, is maybe how you, I can help ex say? explain again. Keeping death the author out of the hands. What I would oh. say if I was in the room with you and him, I'd be like, "That's a weird interpretation. That's not in your book, yeah. mate." Authors can quite often will contradict themselves. Tolkien did it himself. I mean, if you read that, there are about seven different versions of the Silmarillion, and different names, different characters, different lineages, all the rest of that. That that I, I don't mind deviation on the part of the author. That that's just a part of creation. I've written a book. Uh, there there are two drafts of that book. They're very different. Um, I, I don't mind if the author comes along and says, well. You know, I drafted it in one way this time, but actually now my understanding is it's different. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. That, but that then I would consider to be authorial intent. So, so when you have um, Tolkien, let's just say on Monday says Aragorn's a guy, Tuesday girl, Wednesday guy, Thursday girl, Friday guy, and just forever, you just you're just like, well, I guess he's kind of both, or it depends on the day. Um. Well, I think I'd have recourse to what he'd written. So yeah, because I was going to say, I don't know if the, you'd do it the same way as me, but I would be like, okay, man, I, I appreciate your input, but Aragorn's a guy. Maybe, yes, but I think I, I might actually be more inclined to read into that, that what Tolkien is ambiguous about is the gender of the character in question. The question is, does it impact the character, him or herself? Does, does it make a difference if Aragorn is a woman or a man? If it makes a difference, then Tolkien changing his mind frequently, of course, makes a difference to my understanding of that character. If it's simply, well, I want him to be a woman or a man, but it doesn't change the the, the character or the story, I don't see an issue or a problem with that. Um, you know, you said that it would uh, cease to be Sherlock if it, all those uh, sort of details were met. You mentioned mm -hmm. like uh, changing him almost entirely. If, however, it was written by, uh, is it Arthur Conan Sorry, Doyle? Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah. If he had, no, not even written actually, he'd said, he saw this interpretation that you had described as, that's practically death of the author right there, and he'd said, no, it's not. I'm very happy with this, actually. Would you then be like, oh, okay, it's not? I think I'd have to have recourse to his history of published works and to see whether his newfound understanding of his character comported with the character he has established so and far. what if there was nothing, nothing beyond him having said, he thinks it is? Fine. That was it. That's all if, the information you got. If you were to say, I have changed the name, the gender, the sexual orientation, the sexual proclivity, whatever denomination you choose to, to pick, of the character I have established, it would be his responsibility to com make that conform with the character arc he's already set forth. Mm -hmm. So the authorial yeah. intent is not, an, it's not an immediate thing. It's a buildup of work and intent as new characters taking on a life of their own up to a point. But I say up to a point because they are contingent upon the existence of the author to begin with. If if um, if Arthur Conan Doyle were to change his mind about the character or gender of Sherlock Holmes, it would be up to him to square that apparent dichotomy. And if he didn't? If he didn't, I would say, well, you're writing two different characters. Excellent. So you would say he's wrong. Uh, I would be inclined to say that, but it would depend on the specific instance.
So it's the one I described where he's only yeah, told you that he approves of this new vision and that is it. There's no other reference, nothing to read, nothing for him to give details. So oh, it's absolutely possible for an author to be wrong about their creation. Yes. That's 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 pretty much our position. Yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah. OK, but I wouldn't call that death of the author because the author is still the person who created the thing you're referring to by saying that the author is no um, longer involved. I... I think you have a special, perhaps personal thing for what you think death of the author is. It might that might be a thing, but I don't think people. Whenever people say death of the author, that I've never, to my understanding, I don't know of any uh, one who has that meaning for that. That uh, that could well be true. I'm a fan of terminological exactitude. Like I, I can understand. Maybe, like, I can see how you got there, but yeah, we. Similes, but they they are different. I things. think the it reason to me if people mention different things but use the same terms for them. I'm I'm, I'm asking about a specific phenomenon. I think the reason they call it that because of course it, it would be weird. This applies to like everything, even like video games. And it'd be like it's weird to call the creator of a video game an author. So it's more so it it has evolved into being a very broad term. And I think the reason they gave it the name is because when an author releases a book, and it exists, there it is. You read it. Mm -hmm. It's the author, when they're alive, can tell you more. They can be like, were you curious about why Ben jumped down the hole? Well, uh, I'm going to release another book soon. It's going to be great. It's going to talk about Ben's history, and it's going to talk about the motivation why he did all that. Unfortunately, before they release the book, they're in a tragic plane train accident. Boom, gone. And now, well, with the death of the author, everyone can sort of imagine what Ben's history might be because they that can no longer write into stone what it would have been. I couldn't um, disagree with the literal death of the author. No, um, I'm I'm trying yeah, to describe no, like it, it what it simulates. The, um, yeah, the terminology or how it arose. What, this, is, what to. this is actually like why I'm worried about Joker Two. I like Joker's ending because there's a lot of ways to interpret what's happening. Joker Two will put one of them in stone, which is like worrying to me because I hope they don't screw it up. Um, it's like it's like making a canon. Um. <laughs> If there, if there is such a thing as death of the author and uh, deviation, infinite deviation can be justified uh, based on the, the, the simple divorce of intent from the originator of the character, which seems to me to be the, the fundamental behind the death of the author, what reason do you have to fear that Joker 2 would contradict Joker 1, given both films were Not created contradict. by people, other than the author who actually wrote the first instantiation of the character um it, it wasn't about getting it like our, a contradiction that wasn't the uh, it was the erasing concern. potential interpretations yes but but there would not be a contradiction just, uh, death of the author just creates infinite contra potential for contradiction doesn't it like if you're worried about joker 2 contradicting joker 1 We're and not... joker 1 is simply more of accord with the original creator of the character of the joker then your problem with Joker 2 is the extent to which it deviates from the originator of the Joker as a character. In other words, only as he was in Joker which, 1. The extent to which you like or dislike Joker 2 is the extent to which that character has been result has resulted from death or not death of the author of that, of that character. So if Joker 1 is great because it, it's a really good approximation of the original creator's vision, mm -hmm. then which is not what we hold. As far, okay. I don't want to speak for Mahler, but as far as as far as it's it's that's not why we love Joker. Okay. Um, the reason but, but why I, I don't want to speak for Mahler. Of yeah. The the reason why I like the concept so much is because uh, creators can destroy their own work, and it takes yeah. that power away from them. Uh, cre creators destroying their own work doesn't take power away from them. That empowers them. Surely, like they have but the power. I said it, it takes the power the away from them to destroy their own work. Yeah, it 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 removes the thing when, that they um, can do. Yeah, because so when he, you, when James Gunn says uh, what he says sorry. about Polka Dot Man, that now becomes true with one hundred percent not death of the author. You cannot interpret otherwise because the author has told you that is the truth. Yes, he is prescriptively telling you this is how it is, regardless Meanwhile, of what's actually in the thing. As much as I would agree with anyone, this is the usual argument we get, which is like, well, of course the writer is an incredible resource for understanding what the story is about and what was intended. It's like, I agree, but I think there is no better source than the story itself. Even Notice, even then, when, when we were talking about a lot of the hypotheticals, when we were talking about death of the author, you almost always first said i'm going to go to the work 
I'm yeah. going to go to the thing that they created. That was good. That was your first place to go. Well, yeah, because my my contention was that I'm I'm not satisfied by the even the mere possibility of death of the author was my point. That's foot in the door, certainly. Yeah, because yeah, we're we're a few steps forward where we're just like we'll always refer to the source. The yeah, I'm I'm more than happy track, to hear cause... out the author, but I'm to, but to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Say, for example, would I rather hear Tolkien's opinions on the newest Lord of the Rings thing, or would I rather hear Fringy's? It's like, well, I'll probably go with Tolkien's, because that, that sounds yeah, like a sorry, rare opportunity. We, you, but, well, we can talk to you tomorrow. We can however, to however, Tolkien. however, would I prefer to hear Michael Waldron's opinion on Doctor Strange 2 or Fringy's when it came out? It's like, probably Fringy's. Michael Waldron's would be Fringies. useless. <laughs> yeah. but, but, then you're, but then you're not basing your standard upon any standard of authorship what you're doing is you're basing your standard upon do you agree with the characterization as depicted to you do you think that this character is better represented in the moment than it was in previous instantiations irrespective of who the original author of that character was right how did you know it's that? about in, no it, it's you go ahead Mahler. um when i chose uh, Fringy over Michael Waldron, it was because I don't think Michael Waldron has interesting or insightful things to say about his writing. Meanwhile, I would choose Tolkien over Fringy because I, it was an incredible chance to be able to hear the creator of Lord of the Rings talk about what he intended with his work. That would be amazing. I trust Absolutely. that he's got an incredible insight into his own work. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, but then I, I'm, now, I'm now confused about what your standard for death of the author is. I want so, to gain as much as I can in terms of interpreting and in, insightful like content from the source itself. That is not necessarily the author. That's what death of the, the author, author means to me. Well, if you're trying to glean, if you're trying to glean a, the closest possible understanding of the source material, then what you're doing is referring back to the creation of the author by definition, no? Um, well, what if, like, so that, that's why the James Gunn example is so important, right? He got it completely wrong, but he is the author. He's the author of what? A Polka Dot Man. The movie. The Suicide Squad. Specifically yeah, Polka Dot Man. Yeah. This is, this is, I don't know anything about, sorry. No, you, you don't, you don't need <laughs> to know anything about it. My point is that he has told us how to creation. interpret this it, character. It, but is Polka Dot Man a derivation upon a preceding character created by somebody else? It is, what but it, nobody has considered that whatsoever in this. It's an ad adaptation. That I, don't, I don't even know if it has well, anything to do with the original. Well, the, the clues in the word. It's an adaptation. So you haven't killed the author because the thing wouldn't exist without something from which to adapt. So if we change not... Polka Dot Man to Dodecahedron Man, who's purely made up by James Gunn for this movie specifically. And is it, is and we it kept is it, is it referencing? No, he made it up. I, 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 he is made it, it up. No references. Is it referencing or an adaptation of a creation that is not that of the nope. film's director or writer. No, he, he made it, he purely made it up for this movie. Well, then he's created a different character, so the death of the author isn't, isn't a consideration. No, we were we were getting somewhere. We've gone back. We've circled back we to what your your definition did, yeah. was. We're, so rewind. Sorry, I, was, I might have been distracted. Sorry. No, rewind. We were when when you said like, why would you care to get whoever's input? I was like, I want the most insight on the text. And then you were like, well, surely it would be the author because they're the ones that created it. And then I was like, yes, uh -huh. but in the example with James Gunn, the creator has less insight on Polka Dot Man than someone like Fringy Rags or yourself. I would rather okay. opt for you guys' input on Polka Dot Man than the author of that particular moment, that text, that thing, his intentions. Uh, okay, I think, I think my problem is that I, I, I'm not seeing how this even relates to, to Death of the Author. You don't have to, because yeah, you at this point, it's just, like I said, it's just like Mary Sue. I listened to two people arguing over Mary Sue the other day. One person argued there was three attributes that have to be satisfied. The other one argued there was only one. And they spent so much time arguing about that when really, does that even matter? as long as the, the attributes themselves were satisfied or not in the criticism of the character. Who cares if we call them a Mary Sue? Who cares if we call we, we, this we, death of the author? What we're talking about we, is that we can we, freely we, interpret the term. I am surprised to hear a, a relatively subjective definition coming from someone who is one of the finest purveyors of an objective standard of art criticism that I know. Um, you think you, this is subjective? Uh, well, well, so I feel like... That seems to be the standard for... You've just said... Well, it doesn't matter if a Mary Sue is one characteristic or five characteristics. 
It's whether you think it's a Mary Sue or not. Like that seems no. subjective. No, to no, I didn't say that. Problem. No, 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 no. We're discussing okay, why we don't it. use the term Mary Sue because it's often okay. difficult to carry out I, those conversations. With that term. Yeah, I listened to two people who thought they had a very strong grasp on what Mary Sue is, and they were they spent all their time arguing over what qualifies as a Mary Sue, as opposed to simply the reason they want to get that in stone is so they can criticize a character. And it's like, why not break it down into the individual components and then see if they actually qualify? What I'm trying to do okay, here is but... ignore death of the author as a title. And let's just see if we agree that can there be a time where an author says this is how it went in the story when the story presents something completely different and we can say, no, author, you are wrong. That is not what happened in your story. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, apologize. I, I, I've lost track of the argument. Uh, if, if you're asking me, can authors uh, make mistakes or can they contradict the the general theme or, or tenor or tone of the character they've created. Well, the answer to that is obviously yes, but uh, but I, I've never disputed that uh, authors can make mistakes. That's that seems to me to I be self evident. I think we're okay then, because like again, you just you don't call that death of the author. Meanwhile, we would no. I mean, the the ability to say that an author is incorrect about what is happening in their story is death of the author as I understand the meaning. Yes. So, 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 uh, so work so, itself so, takes precedent. Yeah. To, 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 just a purely hypothetical example. Um, there is there is a, a fantasy author. The fantasy mm -hmm. author has written eighteen books of a continuous, contiguous story. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been perfectly consistent okay. up until book eighteen. Uh oh. And at book eighteen, when said author is ninety eight, has Alzheimer's, and has lost touch with reality, he creates a book which doesn't accord at all with what he'd written in the previous 17 books. Okay. Um, is, is that death of the author in an artistic sense as opposed to simply a material he's dying sense? Oh, well... I don't just... think we'd distinguish. Yeah, so it's, you could just say TLJ. TLJ is basically this. Like, it's what happens when we have so many contradictions in an installment of an ongoing story? What do we do? It's like, well, you can't have both. Uh, TLJ has got plot holes in it. Things don't make sense. I don't... No, I'm not, I don't think TLJ is TLJ is a great example of many shit things in art, but I don't, I don't think it's it's a great example for this one. Uh, like I'm talking about a again, I'm using a hypothetical just to try and sort of elucidate the point. It's a single author, a single story with a single set of characters yep. over eighteen books. He's written them perfectly consistently. He's now at the age of ninety-seven. The eighteenth book forgets, contradicts everything that happened in the preceding 17 books because of the author's physical condition. Are you saying that the, the physical death demise of the author and his contradiction of 17 books worth of consistent material is actually death of the author? Is that what... No, that's just writing a bad story. I was going to say, that's just plot holes and contradictions. Yeah, we... yeah, that's just plot holes and contradictions. That doesn't have anything not, to do with the concept. Also, not death of the author. That's not... The, yeah, death of the author comes in the meta of the... the yeah, it's outside of absolutely. the stories but coming in. My, in. In, my example, in my example, the meta is 17 books with a consistent storyline and an 18th, which is inconsistent because of the author's meta outside of the fictional universe. Uh... Contraction of Alzheimer's, for example. Actually, yeah, that's just... In a what's sense, um, what's interesting is that it is a sort of variation of Death of the Author in the sense that we have canon for 17 stories, an 18th comes out that contradicts everything in those, and so we are forced to consider the 18th the contradiction that is, like, the, that is the tumor, that is the incorrect one. It couldn't, it couldn't happen while the other 17 did happen. One has to go sort of thing. That's what we highlight when we're saying something's a plot hole. Yeah, and then there's one, there's one further question, which is, is that truly death of the author if there are even, if there is, sorry, even an iota of similarity in theme or moral message well, in when, one no, character? When the author says no, that the hyperspace kamikaze is impossible and possible... It's it's going to be on the uh, which came first, which was established as canon first. Talking about TLJ, which is two different authors. Well, you can, you can understand how that translates, right? So if if he did it in the seventeen books that the fantasy kamikaze was not possible, and in the eighteenth it is, it remains impossible. It's a hole in the eighteenth book. I agree with that, but I wouldn't consider that death of the author. If Neither the person do we. Who, you don't That's have to death consider the a death of the author. Kamikaze yeah. isn't the person who wrote the original seventeen but books. We don't. That's not, yeah, it's not Death of the Author, as we've said. You don't have That's to call that Death of the Author, but you are at the same... If you're going to consider that 
irrelevant nonsense, like it doesn't match, then you have yes. stopped the author's uh, intentions. But the thing is, the author's intentions are I, married bachelor. They can't. They can't even make right. sense. Sorry, just just to come back on that. If, if there are seventeen books in or installations, and then like TLJ with hyperspace ramming. Mm -hmm. If I reject hyperspace ramming, I'm reject. I'm saying that there is death of the author at that point. Is that what you just said? Just to be clear, um, death of the author of the previous seventeen installments. Well, so it's a little bit more complicated. This is why I want to move away from even using death of the author because when you have the the authors telling you X is Y and X is X, we have to go with one. We can't go with. It's impossible to accept both. Uh huh. And so typically we opt for whichever was canonized first. Yes. Uh, meanwhile, but... if they're canonized at the exact same time, then it's just nonsense, and we have to try and figure out a way if one could make more sense than the other sort of thing. This is, this is actually like the system we would use. We always opt for going from the source, as opposed to if the author said, I'm preferring X is X today. So it is. Well, I, I don't necessarily disagree, but I, I'm, now, I'm now confused about how what we're arguing about now compared to the, the original argument we had, which was... <laughs> Something about mountains. We're very, very well, far no, down the line. The, the original argument was, what is the definition of death of the author? We've now got to the point where you're saying, I don't want to talk about the definition of death of the author. I'm talking about what constitutes well, yeah, law because and I th Yeah, because... I the, think they're, you they're agree have with what we... Thing. I think, but it, you know, if I was to say, let's go bring down that tree with an axe, and I'm everyone in the in the world is referring to a sword, and you're like, that's not an axe. I'd be like, okay, for, for the sake of conversation, you recognize what we're using as a tool, and that you use it too. Well, I'm happy to I'm happy to entertain that argument, but I, I'm not sure what we're arguing about at this point. I can, I, the, I mean, well, if, if I think you about when you said that Lord, you are happy I'm to consider the author that. wrong at certain points, we agreed, yes. and we're all good. We we just don't call it the same thing. Um. Yeah, but, but to the extent that the author, even when he's wrong, is re referencing something he himself created, and that yeah, reference... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, be... your, yeah that's your, own your definition, and I don't use yours. Yeah. I think yours is a okay. bit hard no, to understand. No, no, I'm happy, I'm happy to have a different definition. I'm genuinely I'm, I'm happy to have a different definition on that. I just wanted to be to be clear about what, what we're talking about. If we're talking about the, the author, that's one thing. If it's law and canon, of course, that's that's something else. I think we probably do agree. It's just we, we are maybe using different terminology. But I am obliged to say, given this is my first time here, that I, I'm... Well, it, was, it was lovely to be here anyway, but the idea... The fact that I can have these arguments with you guys... Oh, fucking Cloud9, it's it's fantastic. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, I mean, this, this is a normal day on oh, EFAP. Okay. Yeah, I don't even know what the... This is what we do. I don't know what the EFAP community will call this argument. It's, it's gone to so many different adventures at this point. I think they're going to go with the dust at first, the, but death of the dust, maybe? Dust, magic. Don't know. Lore, I, I rings, lore exploration, it's like writing a, discussion. But, um, yeah, like I, I would hope that you'd be on the same page as us if, if you'd seen the Suicide Squad, you'd watch Pokemon Dot Man's story, then we went over that tweet from James Gunn, and you'd be like, you'd be with us and saying like James Gunn's just wrong. It's not in the movie. Yeah, I'm willing to believe that that might yeah. be the case. Um, Twin Perfect, who has said he 100% does not believe in Death of the Author, he thinks it's pish. He would tell you, no, that is Poker Dot Man. It doesn't matter what you saw in the story. It only ma he said to us, it only matters what the author said. We are his foil. We'll yeah, but we consider we'll ourselves to be on the literal opposite end of the spectrum to him. Yes. We think that the material, it's the contents of the created work is, it rules everything else. It is king. How, how does he, how does he, um... Dress himself in the morning? That's a good yeah, question. I'm, I'm still... How does he, how does he, like, conceptualize, for example, a, a schizophrenic or a multi-personality disorder, for example. <laughs> that's well, so a it's good funny. That's a legitimately good question. It's actually. funny because he's working with a lot of David Lynch content is what he's drawn this from, which I find fucking fascinating that you think <laughs> that David Lynch's content is going to have like one definitive authorial intent. I'm pretty sure that is not at all what he... I, I should rephrase the question. Without lethal amounts of magic mushrooms, how do you reconcile a multi-personality disorder or a schizophrenic author like it, it, that's it, like, it, that's it, a legitimately it. interesting question yeah i can't answer it for you <laughs> I, yeah i would be curious i wish he was here so that he could not answer that because he doesn't answer questions <laughs> but see which you 
Maybe that helps the whole definitions thing. Like, if he was here, and then we had a fourth person who said death of the author is only applicable when the author literally dies, that would be, like, four <laughs> different interpretations, and I would just be like, maybe yeah. we should just drop, drop the title the and just see yeah. if we agree on the individual definition. Well, that's what you do, yeah. that's what you do a lot of conversations yeah. if you can't agree on a definition. You just say, we just won't use that word. Forget that word exists. We'll just talk about concepts. You could yeah. literally invent a word for the concept on the spot, and you've solved the problem. Often, oftentimes, like you know, def definitionals, sort of, the, they are based upon you know things that which you can find within the space of a conversation. It's like we we can be having the same conversation, and you could actually derive seven different definitions of artistic concept from within the single conversation, even if that conversation was predicated upon a, a disagreement over over the definition of a single artistic term, so like death of the author, for example. Well, okay, if we're disagreeing on what death of the author means we've then had a conversation about what actually constitutes authorial consistency and then you can derive separate definitions therefrom. Like there there are so many brilliant conversations to have about that. So, so the reason the EFAP has been such a brilliant thing to listen to, and like your two your two channels even individually have been such a, a brilliant thing Aww. to listen to for the last how many years I've been yeah. listening to you. It's because like it, it's really, really fucking I, I studied I did a master's in aesthetics at university. Never ever had such in-depth in entertaining conversations as the kind of stuff I heard on, on EFAP and on your two individual channels. It's like this is where the, the most interesting conversations happen because a lot of this comes down to what your definition of the definition is in the first place. And that's without being stupidly relativistic about it. It's simply, are we actually operating upon sound definitions to begin with? And most academics don't have a conception of, of sound definitions because they are idiots. We'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, ditch a, we'll ditch a term if we need to and just we'll go pure... You know, we'll dip the mat, the mat well, we kept straight to the place if we need to. A conversation it's, was it's just, we dug to what I think there was the bedrock. I think we finally hit it, uh, which happens in these conversations eventually, and I don't mind spending the time to get to them. Like, plenty of people oh, yeah. get all bitter and angry in chats. They want, to, they want to see us talk about the end of this Lord of the Rings episode, but I'm sorry, guys. You know the rules, okay? What are the rules? What are the there rules? There are no rules. We have, a, we have, a, we have soft <laughs> yeah, yeah. magic rules here on EFAP. <laughs> And they, they can even get really tribal about it. As far as I was concerned, this was just a conversation. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that's everybody's why, okay that's and why survive. I thought it was. I um, because yeah, like it, it's 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 kind of fascinating when you encounter like because uh, some some people were uh, you know when you said your example of fifteen uh, sorry seventeen books that were written consistently and then one that wasn't like someone said like oh that's a ridiculous hypothetical. I was like oh dude I love ridiculous hypotheticals they're like my favorite thing yeah the ridiculous hypotheticals that's where all that's where all the principles come out exactly well, I mean, there is the, the reductio ad absurdum is is usually classified as like a logical flaw in an argument it's it's not sometimes reductio ad absurdum actually is is just illustrating the the extent of you you're inviting someone to follow a thought through to conclusion but in the case of like a 17 book fantasy saga that's actually not that ridiculous there are many very oh very yeah it's easy, to, it's easy to think about that's, well, that's, that's, to, to be honest with you yeah like yeah i didn't, it didn't even eight times didn't even for a yeah. second occur to me to be like that's an absurd i was like no, no no i'm, I'm with you i'm, I'm following because um someone mentioned as well and it's probably worth one bringing up it's like did han shoot first yes or no like according to the yeah. author he didn't but the movie um, I would say he did, and I think most people would say he did. It's like fuck the author; yeah. he did. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a meme hashtag Han shot first and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the author is, the author is at liberty to disagree with himself, but that does oh, yeah. not mean he's. A yeah, I, I, that's the thing. Almost is what makes it so strange. I'm always interested to hear what they have to say. I mean, this couple of like I said, Michael Waldron. I don't. The less I hear about his interpretation, when he when he started it's talking about sludge. how anything he says is sludge. When Michael Waldron said that. Wanda lost vision, therefore she's kind of like owed the sacrifice of uh, America. I was like, I, the, the, you need to stop talking about your film. The film's bad enough on its own, but like you're making it so much fucking worse. Um, and you know, that's sometimes you get authors who can bring a huge amount of benefit by hearing them talk about having made their thing. So. You know, yeah, it can give you a case. deeper appreciation of what they've created because you can't fit everything you want to into a book or a movie just because physical constraints of the world. So being able to get that extra, it's like watching director's commentary to things like, here's why we did this. Here's why we did that. You're like, oh, that's really great. 
to know that you had that kind of thought and you cared and you had so much to say. It, it, it's explanatory in terms of allowing you to appreciate things, mm. which is, I, I love it. I love a good um, commentary. Funnily enough, I gave the, um, I said, the example you were talking about, Rags, I said that, uh, what if George Lucas said Star Wars was a penguin on a chair? That's it. That's and, the um, and uh, what was his name? J uh, it was Twin, Twin Perfect. Perfect. I was gonna, I, I, yeah. My brain was going yeah. to just right. Was, <laughs> um, was, well, Twin Perfect. How could you confuse them? He said, uh, he said that was ridiculous as a hypothetical, right? But I'm pretty sure that's what you were referencing immediately about the schizophrenic, right? Or maybe a mentally ill creator well, of some kind. In the sense of... In in the sense of I yeah if if you if you came at him specifically and said what if you had a uh, let, let's say a mentally ill author who wrote that book we could use the 18th in a series of 18 and it was just almost literal nonsense that was full of plot holes contradictions is like the, the author was clearly not in a right mind then what if you gave that to Twin Perfect as a hypothetical which is really not at all an unreasonable hypothetical. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Totally like it was, possible. He, he then, wrote it off as like an absolute absurd, but it's just like, it shouldn't be too difficult to imagine that's a thing that it, could happen if, at some point. I mean, I know some a lot of times people who are of low intelligence cannot engage with hypotheticals, and <laughs> wow. some people are not, and some other people are not, I don't, they won't, they refuse to do it because they don't see a point. I... I don't know. It's it's a shame because hypotheticals are our friends and they're useful and they they they're just they're just so darn useful in conversations. Mm -hmm. They're interesting yes. and they're fun. Well, that's For the thing, instance, right? Would you torture baby Hitler? I wouldn't do it. I, if you know, but some people might. I don't know. It's something to talk about. But to be fair, I've never been compelled by like the whole. You know, if if there were a pool party on a spaceship that was hurtling toward the sun, it's like, would you make X decision? And then if someone said, that's never happened, and it's not going to happen for, it's not even, that's probably, if someone said to me, that's probably never going to happen, I'd just be like, okay, we can still answer the You're question. Running, yeah, like that, that, people who take that approach strike me as the kind of people who know where this path leads and they don't want to avoid there. it. Because, yeah, um, if you yeah. remember... This actually came up not, well, I say not too long ago, I think it might have been a year, but um, the uh, sleeping with yourself thing came up in, I think it was fantasy show, sci-fi show, something, or game. Um, loads of people were talking about it. It was super controversial. It was just like fucking yourself, like I said, like a clone. And Cosmic Variety Hour put out a tweet saying, why the hell are people even discussing whether or not they think it's ethical to fuck a clone? It's not going to happen. It can't happen. It's oh, such a low yeah. IQ it's, thing like, to say. I was just going to say, yeah. don't engage yeah. with a yeah. hypothetical. It couldn't happen. That's a way of not answering the question. The, yeah. The question is, is the question will exist whether or not it's practicable in the short term. There's a Robert Heinlein novel. I don't remember which one it is. Where um he's a, he was a weird guy. He wrote Starship Troopers, yeah, um, <laughs> and Stranger in a Strange Land, which are about as as far apart from each other philosophically and politically as you can as you can get to. But in his later career, he wrote one. I don't remember the name of it, but um the premise of which is the main character is that this old guy. He's dying, and um I think he he clones himself. No, no. No, wait, how does this work? No, he he Im he implants his own clone embryo. I think it is in the body of his cloned female alter ego, I think is, is the premise. And then the kid is born, whether it's whether that, that is him or isn't. Um, you could say that's a symptom of a sick mind. I wouldn't necessarily right. disagree because he was at that point in his life, but it's a really interesting hypothetical. Like at what point does, where are the, bound, where are the boundaries of personality and personhood set? Like what differentiates the clone from the derivative of clone from the originator of clone. Where oh, Mahler, we got to ask them. We do? We do. Oh. Have you played Soma? Oh. I don't think I have. You need I to play Soma. Have. Play that fucking game, can you, dude. Can you please, <laughs> can you please, if, if, oh, here's your homework, our loyal disciple. <laughs> your homework is to play Soma. <laughs> like, legitimately. It, it gets better the more intelligent, I think, and thoughtful you are, so I think you get a lot out of it. It is... Like legit. Stop. How could anyone call you vain, Rags? I just don't get it. How could they possibly uh, just? I was calling. I was implying someone else was those things. I'm. Of I'm course, just over of here course. being I'm totally independent of uh, of my. I make no claims about myself whatsoever. I make no yeah. claims. But I yeah, seriously, play this. Soma. It's like one of the best games ever made. Um, and someone in chat, a couple people in chat, reminded me it was Loki I mean, that brought that. this up. 
Um, I've read the Huxley novel from which it is derived, but... Mm -hmm. um, so you got, in Loki, it's a version of yourself is born in a different universe, but as a girl, and then grows up with a completely different life and existence. You meet her, and the, you know, if you fuck, is that, what, what is that, is basically the question. And Cosmo Friday, I was like, I don't care what it is, it can't happen. He's abhorred oh. by the he he abhors all imagery of the female form. It's um <laughs> this is the thing is like that's what's what the nature of the discussion She's was. A, Everyone was trying to figure out what do you even call it, what it necessarily means, especially because it's different universes. How exactly like you know blah blah blah. But yeah. It's just like oh you fucking idiots that can't happen. Which by the way, you don't know that that can never yeah, ever, that's ever, like, ever happen. No, well, no, <laughs> like, that, that's the interesting thing about so like quantum and multiverse theories is that it's not beyond the realms of possibility that that could happen. It's just incredibly unlikely, but unlikely things are still possible. But it, it's a weird sort of it's a derivation or, or a cloning of the sort of ship of Theseus thing, though, isn't it? Because you're what you're asking is, is a an entity from an entirely different universe which shares all of your characteristics, the same thing as you are. Like, what differentiates you from your clone from a multiverse, for example? Yeah, um, it's, um... What, which is yeah, tricky, how much can you take away from something before it becomes something different? Exactly. Sense? What's the identity yeah, of a thing? Or how much, in this example, I think it would be how much that is similar would there have to be for you to be classed as the same person? Which is, it's a different way of asking the same question, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. What, what's the you and you? And if, if those sorts of things interest you... You should play Soma. I have, I have now put it on my phone as a thing to look up tomorrow or today, Please as do. it happens to be. Please do. <laughs> anyway, um, we get... probably should yeah. actually get back to Rings. <laughs> well, of Power. so I was going to say to you guys, we've got exactly, I think, fifty minutes left before we cap out. So we best okay. get we, going. We got, we got this. We got this. Let's do this shit. All right. We we've got. Through. Oh my gosh, we have Duran comes in. Uh, no. We have to get to uh, Elrond is talking with Deza now after the other dwarves depart. Yes, and she's he... thanking him for how if he hadn't gone and fuck it. I found this quite interesting, right? Because what's just mm -hmm. happened in terms of what's actually happened here is that he managed to detect the secret password from her kids having singing it, detect the location in which to say it by eavesdropping on a conversation between her and her husband to then break in and discover the greatest secret the dwarves have ever had by mm -hmm. doing so he may very well have saved Durin's life in the sense that Durin came out of the mines to complain about him having broken their trust as friends or whatever yes but she's saying it seems to have done yeah, that, yeah she's saying oh thank goodness now i'm not sure how i would react to something like this like if someone say uh... for example i knew that you came into my house to steal my tv let's just say i knew that was the case but I was choking to death on a piece of cheese, and you come in and give me the Heimlich maneuver and save my life. But I know that you were only there because you wanted to steal from me. I th I really think I'd be torn. I'd be I like, would be torn too. thank you like so you... much for saving my life. But <laughs> which is well not... here, I think that the your intention was more important than something that just was a coincidence that you created. Your character is not impacted in any way that's positive from this. It's just like, it's almost like a silver lining to your deception, which you yeah. don't get credit for. It's yeah, almost, because... it's, you don't get credit for that. It, this is, a, if I'm Deza and I'm looking at this elf guy, I'm like, you know, funny thing, if you hadn't have done that, it's, Durin might have been in that uh, cavern and he might have been trapped. I'm just, I'm just going to put that out there for you to, I just like, I'm thinking about this and I think that you should know that I'm thinking about this. Yeah, because uh, someone just said a great Stannis quote, uh, the good does not wash out the bad, nor the bad the good. The thing is about that, if I'm choking to death and Rags is there, um, if someone said to me, him letting me die is the bad move, him telling someone to hopefully help me instead of saving me himself is like a neutral move, and then the good move is saving me, I'd have to disagree. If he, consider if he saved me, when he he let's just say it's a really easy save, he has to press a button to save my life, whatever. And then he's like, so, reward? I'd probably be like, man, I feel like you, you, you preventing me from dying with as little effort as possible really isn't like, like, thank you, of course, but do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah, you know, the, the lowest bar possible. It feels like, like the lowest bar possible, yeah. For so low, yeah. Um, I don't, the fact that you want a reward for this is the ultimate. The difference is get made where, say, for example, I've been kidnapped 
and I've been taken to like distant country and I'm tied up and Rags like goes full taken mode and does everything he can for like weeks on end to discover exactly where I am, kill everybody who's I would like do that. Yeah. This is lore accurate. This is not <laughs> if a hypothetical. You... If you did that, I would be profusely thankful, because I know how much you sacrificed in order to get that thing to happen. Versus, you sit and then you go, yeah, I guess I'll let you live. Press his button. I'd be like, damn, dude. <laughs> My reward is having Mahler be alive. And also I get to kill bad people. That's yeah, so, a little bonus. So when you say the good shouldn't wash out the bad and all the bad the good, when he comes in to steal my TV and just happens to see me choking and saves my life, I don't feel like... I'm going to go, you shouldn't be stealing my TV, but it's really good that you saved me. I'd be like, you shouldn't be stealing my TV, and it's kind of neutral that you saved me, because Jesus Christ, if you decided to let me die, like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's, it's two, we're operating at, like, two different levels of evil. Breaking in to steal a TV, it's an evil thing to do. I, I, I wouldn't even say evil. That's a bad thing to do, but allowing someone to die if strangulate, that is evil if you allow that to happen. So thanks for not sinking down into that yeah. level of evil. I guess. Again, the bar is not high for you, especially because you broke my house to do my TV. <laughs> but, thanks, I, you know. So yeah, uh, the reason I'm bringing all this up is that she knows all of that, presumably, about all of this, but she has nothing to say in terms of you, you sneaked around, you broke into a thing, you listened to conversations that weren't yours to listen to, and you happened to help as a result. Feels like she should take more issue with Elrond here than she realizes. Yeah, I think... It, it's tough to really weigh that against her because it's a very emotional moment. Yes. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of like, you know, the elf getting hit by the arrow. It's tough to be in his mind when that happens. I can. So it's just one of those things to really, it's worthy of pointing out. It, so what I would like want, a, hmm. I think, if we were to maintain everything we've seen right now, but also make me happy on this regard, it would be that there's a conversation yeah. between her and Durin at some point about this. Like, absolutely you know he did save uh, well he did save people he did help and stuff it's like what was he doing there and then he could be like during could be like oh you know he came because he wanted I to just even phrase that he saved people it's almost like it it's so yeah it's so weird it it's great that he incidentally being there doing a bad thing just happened to have maybe saved your life but that doesn't have anything to do with his character and the decisions he made Right, because, sorry, for a second there I was referring to the idea that he had saved some of the people in the actual, uh, sort of cave-in. But you're, you're right, she, what she refers to is specifically Durin, and what she's yeah, talking about Durin is Durin being distracted Durin by Elrond doing a bad thing, and thus wasn't in the cave-in. But yeah, you're right, it has nothing to do with Elrond's character necessarily, and she should know all of that. However, it's, it's, it's understandable that in this moment, you know, at risk of losing her husband, she didn't. And at risk of losing several dwarves, she's probably on very good terms with, very much likes, she didn't. So yeah, I can see her being like, oh, thank goodness you were there. But I think we're owed a scene where she can be like, that fucker. Which, by the way, isn't yeah. an impossibility, because yeah, they're going to be driving the orcs and... Jesus, the orcs, the elves and... The <laughs> elves and the dwarves against each other. That seems to be something they're going for. So maybe we'll get well, that scene. You know what would have been more interesting is if... He was if if Elrond wasn't present during the singing ceremony. If he came back with Durin covered in dirt, his cloak he's discarded his cloak. Um, he's just down to his shirt like Durin covered in dust, and like we saved him. Like they both worked really hard to save the dwarves. That would have been a completely different dynamic. Yeah. Where yeah, he was stealing, but he put himself in a lot of danger to save the dwarves. Yeah, he, that he, is he the put himself in a where I'm like, oh. it shows that um, he was willing to risk his life to help us. So there's definitely more going on with it. He's not just trying to take advantage of us. There's more than, to it yeah. than that. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be really and interesting, by the way. More inter it would have been way more interesting. It would have made the conversation afterwards more interesting instead of Duran coming. Yeah, don't worry. Don't, don't, don't worry, Elrond. I saved him. I saved my. There, it's all good. It's all good. I, I, I took care of it. I'm a little tired right now and uh, dirty. It was, it was tough to do. But yeah, the fact that. The, cause his, yeah, his, yeah, that would have been interesting. I'm like the dad. It would have been interesting. If the dad found out, he could be like, you know, Elrond is banished, like the bull, and then the friend could be like, he saved like, five dwarves or whatever. Or, or Durin doesn't even tell his father about the Mithril thing. There was a cave in, and I, Elrond came to help, and he helped just as any dwarf would help. And he doesn't even well, mention say, to his father he, the Mithril thing because. You he can go that direction, to... but I, the reason why, in mind, the dad found out was because it would create so much of a tension between the dad and the son, being that the dad is like, get the fuck out of here, Elrond tried to breach our secrets, and he's like, yeah, but he saved so many lives at the risk of his own. You know, that's gotta count for... You know, you can have that conversation between those two. Well, yeah, both are interesting. 
All but, of our hypotheticals are more interesting than what the show did with its millions of dollars. And <laughs> well, the thing is, and months and months of... you know, you highlighted like we could have seen him covered in, you know, uh, whatever soot or whatever, and, and he's lost his clothes. But we see him and he's pristine. It implies yeah, that he went in and then like sort of went right back out and cleaned off. While Durin was in the mines yeah. helping, doing everything, Elrond was watching this ceremony. He was... This is again the fucking issue with this show they show durin and he is absolutely like covered in soot so what are you telling us about elrond did he just leave <laughs> he was like you can handle this buddy yes yeah um hmm missed opportunity you it's like what we say you're always you're, you're pretty much yeah. always world building and you're always character building what characters do and what they don't do is a part of their character. And you've got to be aware of that when you're writing. This looks, this, this is a bad look for Elrond. Bad is a strong word. It, he's not, I don't want to feel like he's morally obligated to put himself in great danger for strangers. But With some... <sighs> when you do, that makes it all the more yeah. virtuous. When and they're choose... not strangers either, because the, the the entire reason he's there and has been allowed to be there is because they're not strangers. Like they, they are you know, best friends who've mended a relationship. Yeah. And he's in the exact same place as Durin is when the cave-in happens and Durin runs in and he doesn't run in. Which... It, it, I, I, there is a simple way around that. You simply have Durin run in and some rocks fall that stop Elrond following him. That That's a really simple way of doing it, which doesn't make Elrond look like a dick for not helping. But which they I'm didn't intend to give him... do that. They didn't intend yeah, I don't, I'm that not clearly, go by the way. Far... Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go as far as to, to knock it against Elrond for um, not helping. Yeah, to clarify, when there's a cave-in, I'm pretty sure most advice for real life might be don't go into the fucking cave-in. Yeah, you, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, but if your self-proclaimed best friend has gone in... No, yeah, not? Uh, to clarify, right, so let's say you have three houses on fire, and there's three babies in there, and three dads, and two dads run in, and the third one goes, the house is on fire, I don't want to kill myself. I think everyone would be like, that's true, but... I think that's uh, a different analogy. No, of course it's different. Think... The reason what I'm what I'm doing with that is to highlight like how people feel about it, even though what he's saying, if the house is like fully engulfed well, in flame then, yeah, it probably isn't a good idea. There is, a, well, I, I think the, the analogy is different meaningfully in the sense that a father has an obligation to his kid in a different surely, way than Elrond would have an obligation to okay, um, but if, people trapped But in a, in a different way than Durin would have an obligation to... No, not Durin. Elrond oh. to Durin and those, those people. Elrond but, to but, Durin. If, but if Durin is running in to save other dwarves whom he knows less well arguably than Elrond, what then absolves Elrond of the responsibility of following Durin in, who is a well, closer because, friend to him than... Because Durin made that decision himself to put himself in danger for the sake of them. I don't, I don't think that you're under a moral obligation to do that in his position, to also put yourself in danger going into a situation you know nothing about because your best friend did. You're not... Know. No, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say... You're not under that obligation, but it would be a very virtuous and good thing to do that. I think I think it would be virtuous virtuous enough to be an obligation. Like, I think I think I would look down I, on myself if I didn't. They would, I, that, that vibe would exist I, from people. They'd be like, "You didn't you didn't help him out," and he could be like, "Of course I didn't. It was a fucking suicide mission." He'd be like, "Okay, well, all yeah, right. but uh, that, I I don't think the suicide mission is." No, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying though. Yeah, I think. I think people would feel that because I was actually going to ask Rags. You know, you said um, there's more of an obligation for the dad to run into the building, burning building for the kid. What if it was like there's a some. sea of acid and there's a platform in the center? I know this is absurd. A platform in the center <laughs> with the babies on it. It would never happen. Um, and so the dad, like, basically, he's he's dead. If he goes in to try and get that kid, he's absolutely dead. I'm assuming like a, at that like point, a point zero one percent chance. Yeah, of I'm trying to lower it as low as possible without I, making it impossible. Yeah, I. Th I think with those parameters, I wouldn't blame the dad at all, especially because it would like be perceived as impossible, and it would probably actually be realistically impossible to do. But I mean, that, that kind of depends on what, what we're talking about. In terms of, well, fuck it, it's six a.m. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> we we <laughs> might the have definition to, of, we of might moral have to obligation. I'm, I'm just saying, like, if there's a moral obligation in the sense of like a deontological obligation, in the sense that you must do so regardless of your feelings, it's a moral duty that you do so. 
that's different from saying I would feel morally obligated to do so. A moral obligation, a felt moral obligation, isn't the sense as a moral duty to do the same thing. Um, that's something I, we can unpack a different certainly. day because I've got to wake up in can, an hour yeah. and a half. It's, but it's, I, it's I, a I'm lot, not yeah. going to blame Elrond for not going in and helping. Um, but the fact that I he doesn't, and though. almost feels. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that's where I'm going. We need an acknowledgement of like, maybe he's even hesitant. We see his face, like maybe he starts, but he can't do it. Or, I mean, if you don't want to put him in that position, Durin could yell at him, go get help so that yeah. he's safe and he has a safe job, but he's still helping and he takes off like a rabbit or however elves run speed analogy wise. You, you're that way you don't have this issue. Correct. Because it, it's really dependent on what the writer wants to tell us about Elrond. So if they both sprint in and the further in they get, the more Durin is just keeping on going, but Elrond slowing down, looking above, looking around, and then he stops and goes, Durin, stop, stop. Durin's already gone. He's just like, oh, fuck this. I'm out. We can't fit in. We... He's, yeah, he's too. Or, yeah. You know, it's it, it it's something. It's, it's his it's, heart is there, but he physically can't do it for whatever reason. He's either dissuaded from doing it by Durin, or he's like physically too big to fit in where the dwarf can. I mean, fuck it, you could even have it that he's something. afraid. There's no reason why he can't yeah, do that. With terrified. The um, but I guess the reason I bring all this up is just that it was an opportunity to do something, and they didn't. Uh, Elrond went in, but then we see him later, and it looks like he didn't go in at all. And he's not there for the remainder of the rescue operation. So did he go in and help, or did he not? It's not even clear, because Deese is rewarding him, like, like thanking him, for distracting Durin a from being in the thing. mine. Yeah. It's a different thing, yeah. So really, exactly. this is kind of funny, considering we were just talking about Death of the Other. I have no idea if he was in there or not, uh, helping I would assume the not, dwarves. given the state of Durin and him coming back after just finishing. If Elrond was there helping, he would be with Durin. What would your guess be, little platoon? Did he get in there and help yeah. get some dwarves out, or did he not? Uh, I, I would guess no. I would guess no as well. I feel like no. I would guess if no. we're being good I would, faith, I would very confidently guess no. If we're being good faith, the clothing and the fact that Durin is actually still in there doing things while he's not implies to me that he left, which is a really significant moment, you know? Absolutely. But we don't get to see or it. Or should be, if the writers are aware of the significance, but it's these writers we're talking about, so... Probably they're not. So, Durin comes in and says, yeah, they've got the last one. He's alive. That's good news. The bad news from his POV, I suppose, is that his dad has said they're cordoning off that mithril mine. They're not going anywhere fucking near it. And he's very pissed about this, which I, I know I'm not him. I know I'm not, and, and that's not my dad, but that decision doesn't surprise me in the slightest. There was a cave-in. We're, we're avoiding that vein. Like I can see both their perspectives. I know why he's upset, because it's an amazing material, but I think the part that gets me is that he's, he seems to be so fucking pissed at his dad for making this decision, when, to me, it seems like a very, like, you must have expected that was a big possibility, right? Haven. Potentially, yeah. It's, it, that's the thing, that this, I wish I cared more. I, I wish, wish we had more, yeah. Care. Yeah, because this is like a thing, you have to... You have Durin who wants this thing and it could propel his, you know, his people to these, this incredible greatness and it's an amazing thing and it'll help him out. But there's the danger of doing it and that that conversation of is the risk worth the reward? That's like that. That's like multiple discussions between two people, a father and a son that could be very meaningful and impactful, especially with clearly the talented actors that they have to do this. Um, yeah, and they've got the guy who plays Durin is again given a very impassioned sort of delivery here about how he's absolutely fried. Because I can believe it. You've just been doing all that work to save them. You want to make use of this mithril. It's an incredible discovery. There's all this stuff, and then you're being told on top of everything today that that now is locked off. You can't have any of it. Problem is, like, it's it's, some... I need more from him and his dad and Elrond. I need it to be better. Yeah, <laughs> that's right a skeleton. It's certainly, yeah, certainly from them and Elrond. But I think this whole sequence, it, it sort of demonstrates the good and the bad side by side. So the, the bad, to begin with, he, he comes in angry. We all know with he's angry. Just that, to that's, be clear, so the good and the bad with the show or with the, like, the, the show as a production or the the characters, like, in-universe oh, uh, or out-of-history? Well, uh, in-universe. So, well, the writing, so I guess, I guess the writing okay. of the universe. Um, okay. So they, obviously he comes in very angry, and we understand why. He, he explains it well, the acting is good. Um, we do get one of those stupid dumb fuck metaphors about the, the hottest coals cool after however long, whatever it is. That's, is that the dumbest uh, metaphor? 
No, it's not the dumbest, but it's it's another one of those ones which is just. A bit of I, I think it, it, it's dragged down by the fact that again it so closely resembles the others that are delivered by other characters in other in other places. So it, I, I disagree. Um, I think this one's a totally fine metaphor. No, no, I, I agree. In in and of its own right, it's fine. The problem okay. is it sounds too similar to some of the metaphors. Being salt off a table. Yeah. It Sorry, sounds which, too similar. which metaphor are we talking about? I missed it. Uh, this is the the hottest. Even the hottest. When, cool after a time i think yeah, she's even the hottest oh, calls okay. cool eventually i i like that self-contained i think that 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 works in the context it seems That's very fine. dwarf appropriate it does yes the problem is that again it, it's another one of those things that we've seen too much of from too many other people at the same time the the problem i think um comes fr oh fuck what was i actually going to say i've now forgotten a oh, fringy moment <laughs> uh it was it was when the dad comes in um no, I was when, about when the dad or Durin, because we're not. Oh well, because we're. Dad. Yeah, what scene are you thinking about? When the dad, I... the dwarf dad. Yeah, Durin? he comes in later, doesn't he? And he says um, that that no, that was the thing I was going to say that was good about it. I don't remember what the bad thing I was going to criticize was. Oh, I thought Maybe. you were going to say that the relationship between Durin and Elrond is weak and broken and badly written, while the relationship true, between Durin true. and his dad I, is I relatively say, okay. Yeah, that was what I was going for. Yeah, I think I've just. Uh, too many times to repeat it. Yeah. That was what I was going for. Um, the thing when when Durin's dad comes in, though, I think that's there's, there. There is actually a quite a good and meaningful exchange. Unlike the the wisdom being versus being smart thing earlier, right? He talks about how uh, to be king or to, to be to be a dwarven lord. Your knowledge comes not just from yourself and not just from your father, but from all of your ancestors at once. And I thought that that as a dialogue trick actually that works quite well i think that's well, one of the most effective ones that if they i have. can i would like to add a further compliment i actually quite like that he said you get your um you know the inspiration from your all your ancestors their achievements and their mistakes like yes. you um yeah. it's all a like big thing you take on with you because i'm actually gonna i was i thought that was gonna be my hot take i was gonna say i actually like the scene no, between during his dad um, i like felt that my my cold dead doggy heart kind of was like oh man I, I'm sad, not just because this is a very heartfelt thing between a father and a son, which always gets me, but imagine if this was all couched in something really Yeah, imagine good. it was be, part of a great show. Yeah. And the sad part is, this proves that they could have done it. Oh, well. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. not completely incapable. It's just they can't do it 99% of the time. Well, no, if you can't enough, I was actually going to... Talent. Pay compliment as well. I actually think I think I was in such like bad faith mode that I was like, did I just like that? The um when Elrond like basically takes a really long time to say treasure the time you have with your parents. Yeah, yeah. I like that too. I think, <laughs> yeah. It might be strange, but episode four does it have the strongest moments for being the worst episode? Is it does it have the strongest isolated moments? Possibly, because we kind of like the elevator ride scene in episode no, two. <laughs> yeah, episode two, episode two, that one scene in episode two, that's the high point, I think. And I, I yeah, I, I guess I'd say episode four matches that. But it, it's again, it's weird. And I don't think it's coincidental that all the high points in this show come with the dwarves. And they come in the exchanges, by and large, either between Durin and his dad or between Durin and Elrond. Right. The, the reason the high point beyond those characters, it's only because the show does quite a good job of depicting the differentness, the fundamental, like, philosophic and, and like, idealistic differentness of elves and dwarves, but also the familial difference between the dwarven prince and his king. Those are the strongest moments across all four episodes. Um I don't think it's coincidental that they all take place amongst the same characters in the same place. And it's a real shame that they haven't managed to do that with, well, any of the other, any of the, none of the other characters have any fucking personality, for God's sake. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's very tough, yeah. The Fringy's, Fringy example is if you, if you put it all to text and scratched out the names, could you tell who was who? Maybe a couple. But mm. that's not good considering we have a pretty extensive, well, I know the, the one who's always talking like a bitch, that's Galadriel. But apart from that, <laughs> not many that you could really be like, oh, that's that. Because well, whenever, they have these traits. Whenever a character says, get. hey, you're not supposed to do things that's different from everyone else, you can know they're talking to Nori, at least. You won't know who they are, oh, yeah. but you'll know they're talking to Nori. Are they describing Nori? There's someone Nori knows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can narrow some things down, but... Yeah. Um, 
you know, hopefully, as the show goes on, we may get a couple more good scenes, but uh, no guarantees. Because, yeah, it's crazy. I have so many issues with Durin as a character, and yet I probably enjoy him the most. I think I enjoy him the most as well. Um, I was hoping to really like Elindil, the sea captain man, the seaman. Uh -huh. I want to like him, but I can't. But Durin is like, yet. there is... Yeah, not yet. Um, he's still definitely salvageable. Um, he's just suffering from some stupidity right now. But I want Durin. If I could pick one person where everything works out for him, I would want it to be Durin. We'll see. I, mean, yeah. I, I like Durin and Deesa just because it gives me an opportunity to call them Harry and Meghan in my reviews. But Aww. that's that's a different reason. Oh, the royal family. Yes, I mean, he's a red ginger prince and black princess. Is it's just it's. I like her. I I like her. She has a personality. Okay. Dur Durin seems to have one as well. I would, I would much rather the show give me more dwarf stuff than all of these other plots. I could not give a fuck um, about the Harfoots. Durin actually lends his personality to Elrond. The only scenes where Elrond is halfway personable is when he's engaging yeah. with Durin. Dude, Undo the it. scenes with Elrond and Galadriel were shit, but Elrond with what? Durin is more tolerable. Well, yeah, Durin so and uh, I, the, I think the most believable relationship here is. It's probably Durin and Deza, though I really mm. like Broken Foot and Marigold. I'd have to go back and really check their, all the things right. they say to each other. But I I like think I'm pretty sure you only got like the one scene to work with I there. Think it's the yeah. I think that's the reason. Like, there's only one of them, but, yeah. the but it stands Deza out every time they meet together. So you know, there's more consistency with Durin and Deza because at least they have multiple scenes as opposed to just like the um, one. Yeah. One. yeah. She's, and... not, she's just talking to Elrond. I'm like, yeah. Well, there's so much that's... potential for um, if things go wrong as they expected to with the elves and the dwarves, having yeah. El Elrond and Durin at the, the core of that is going to be interesting, hopefully. But he really puts into sharp contrast the fact that you know Elrond and Durin have known each other for I think a couple of hundred years. Elrond and Galadriel have known each other for about fifteen hundred years. Like she's known him since he was born. She knew his father. That's the creation, the creator of the um the the library in yeah. West Numenor. She knew his brother, and she's the closest with Elrond. But like, if you ask me to like, if you didn't know any of the backstory and you just came into this just this one episode or like the two episodes, the two relevant episodes, and you said which are the characters who know each other best? It's Elrond and Durin, because Elrond and Galadriel don't come across as people who know each other at all. They Never mind fucking hate each other. Millennia. Yeah. And that's funny because we're told in universe that Elrond and Durin haven't spoken in 20 years, which is long enough for a person to be completely out of your familiarity. It um, is, even, even if the dwarves can live to like 500 and the elves to... Yeah, um, and yet it doesn't really feel like they've done a good job of portraying that. It feels more so like they are friends at this point. Yeah. But yeah, um, alright. Let's keep moving because <laughs> we're running out of time. Where are we? Yeah, so he, he, Durin says, or the king says to Durin that um, there's clearly a secret going on with the elves. Go check it out. He's like, yeah, all right then. See, the, the, it's like it's like how the episode started, but now it's the reverse. Crazy. It's almost like nothing has actually developed. Yeah. At all. It's oh just... well, the mithril <laughs> will be discovered by the elves, and then something will happen as a result of that, and then Durin will find out, and you'll hate Elrond, but he won't actually do anything because he never does. Disappointing fucking mystery box as well. The, the idea yeah. that your mystery box is actually revealed in the trailer is just... Of all the things you could have done as well, it's so depressingly boring. Will Elrond be banned from all dwarven lands? Find out next time, because <laughs> who fucking knows? Um, so our next scene is with Lady and Elfman. I find it absolutely hilarious. It's this moment that he decides to relay the message Adar had. And when you find out what the message is, he's like, bro, you probably should have delivered this as soon as possible. It's basically a threat. It's like, leave now, and also swear fealty. Like, I just... It, he only tells her because she happens to walk up to him. <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? Um, and secondly... What are we talking about here? It's really Sorry, funny that away. they're, um, they're sort of like having this sort of like, oh, we're reconnecting, you know, it's good to see you, I'm glad you're alive. A big criticism of her in episode two was she completely forgot he existed. She she just like moved I on with her life. Power again, and our lovers, quote unquote, have met up. Which yeah, you don't like seriously. This is all the character has going for him. This romance, but there's nothing to feel it. Uh, she it's, it's, she hasn't even stand mentioned close him to each other. Is really it? 
it's almost like they want to imply like oh they were separated but now they're back together it's like so so yeah it, like actually so there you have not given us anything that would imply that she is emotionally invested in him his well-being his relationship with her how he feels just his we never got that there was never a scene where she like was worried where she like it, maybe she had some memento he'd given her and she's like thumbing it or something anything if if you would have watched the, epi the 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 moments in between his capture and return and just focus on her there's nothing there you would be shocked that her lover was that elf who had just escaped near death uh, when we compare it to Aragorn and Arwen, I mean, I think they oh. probably have less screen time across three films. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, pretty sure they do. Two episodes, three episodes, or four episodes as we are now, much less than over the four episodes. It's just, it's just incomparable. Like you, you immediately know the the extent of the feeling, the depth of feeling that Aragorn and Arwen have for each other, just from like three short scenes. Yeah. But four episodes and of Ring Power, it's that just... Too. The only thing we know about either character is that they kind of awkwardly flirt from time to time, and and if they're apart from each other, it's irrelevant. It just, oh, no. They're so wooden. I don't even know if I could call it. I don't know if that's what it is. Like, could it it's be a relationship <laughs> because the author said it's a relationship. Pretty much. Yeah. That the, there's there's clearly that is his story at this point. What's what's going to happen with him and her? Forbidden love. Ooh, just like I don't. I, I sure okay. Um, and then of course. You have um, the way to fix this. Obviously, is when she's dealing with her village. She'll just be like, you know, can does any has anyone heard anything from him? Does anyone know of any elves that are in the? You know, do you, you just have a scene where you're doing your normal shit, and then you just show that she cares. Because Aragorn and Arwen, when they're not together in scenes, they still talk about each other. They still care about where each other are in the world and what their fate's going to be. Like, so I guess what I'm arguing is just like this is clearly what they're trying to build with these two. They're doing a terrible job so far. But hey, we're only halfway through the season. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. But um, yeah, so you know they need to leave. Is my take on this? They need to get the fuck out of this watchtower. You might be yeah, like, well, it's better here than I don't know out in the open, right? It's like no, no, no. They just need to leave the Southlands. Get the fuck out of here. An army of orcs yeah. might take over the the watchtower tonight. You don't even know. And you can't stay here. You need to get food. So that's another like, reason to leave. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You can't. You can't stay here. If they even if they even camp outside, you're dead because you can't get food. You just have to leave. You're being forced into a bad thing. Sure, but it's better than starving to death. You have to go. And I don't know about the world. Is there a place they could go? Is there like a local government? Is there a duke? Is there a castle nearby? They, Is they there haven't a, told us. Militiamen? Or... I don't, I don't think they're yeah, going like, to I tell don't know us. What, what we can do. And no one brings up the suggestions to be shot down for my sake. Um, wait, is this the last scene? Oh my god, I think we are like near the end. So, oh my god. the kid is chilling out, and then he pulls out his little Sauron sword. Um, unfortunately, creepy old man is around the corner, and he's like, hmm, here's some, here's some water, you've, you've earned it for get, helping get that food, and it's like, okay. And then he says, like, you took my hilt from my barn, didn't you, you little shit? And then he's like, uh, and he's like, don't you worry about it, because it's, it's up to you and me, lad, we gotta be ready, you gotta save your strength, you know, for what's coming, he's, Sauron's gonna rise, and he's like, go on a fucking crazy rant, Crazy political rant, okay? That's what this is. <laughs> it's like, I, does he expect this little kid who has no idea how to conceptualize what the fuck that hilt is or any of this? Is he really telling the kid like you and me we're gonna we're gonna help out Sauron when he comes about? Yeah, it's like, man. What? <laughs> he probably shouldn't say anything to this kid. I don't think you can trust that he's not gonna tell his mum that you're saying creepy shit to him. But like, I think that's the implication, right? This guy is um. We're on a team an, now. He's, he's one you, of the. You, did... you know, like the elves hated the men here because they reckon they're still evil. Like, I'm pretty sure this is like an actually still evil guy, right? Like he's yeah, a... I, I, yeah, I have a, I, I'm, I'm serving the old master. The yeah. old, it's, it's like a Cthulhu thing. I don't know. It's just I'm, I'm serving the old master in this and, sense. And he's like, kid, you stabbed yourself with a spooky back. sword. You're evil too. Let's get ready. And yeah. it's like, what? You're in the club. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was retarded that. Dude, why even say anything to this kid when he's clearly not 
bought in, you know? He just stabbed himself with the sword, okay? That's all he did. Yeah, you think you'd field him some questions? He's like, I know you stole that uh, sword underneath my barn. And then just see how he just sort of talks about it. Yeah. Like, maybe he spins some story about the sword. It doesn't have to be the real one or say, well, the legends say that da-da-da-da-da. What do you think about that, lad? And and get his take on it. You know, you want to you wanna field some questions out there to see if this, you know, this kid might be sympathetic to you. Or maybe uh, this is a great power, this sword. Who knows what you know, we might be able to do with this power. We might be able to save... Uh, yeah, it's, saying, yeah. it's almost like a ring thing. Like, you mirror it with the rings tempting Boromir to save Gondor. You you do the same thing here. It's like this power, it's evil, but we could use that power to do good things. You know, that's how he gets him on board. That's how he gets him in the club, the club of one. If you become a club of two. Yeah. Um I'm gonna fuck that kid later. Then there's a funny scene where an orc says, Dada, we found it. It's in the tower. He's probably referring to the hilt. It's like, why don't you um why don't you be a little bit more honest with him? You had it. You ha you guys had it. Why? Oh, and I'll then... tell you why, because he doesn't want to get killed on the spot. That's I why just, he doesn't It's just that. funny, because Adar should probably know about this anyway. But he's the, the orc is clearly, like, happy. He's not in a state of, like, you know, oh, jeez, like, lying or anything. I just think it's funny. If Adar knew about what happened, he'd probably be like, you if are you all pathetic. Yeah. It, if I was that orc reporting back, I, I would leave out those specifics and say, yeah, we, we tracked it down to a boy who's hiding with the rest of the people in an old tower. Yeah, that's where it is. I'm good. I found it. That's where it is. We just got to go get it. In fact, it'll be shockingly easy to, assuming they stay there. You know, it's it, like imagine describing it to him. Like the guy you released, he killed the guy who had the hilt, and then, like we we just we chased them, and then the sun came up, and we couldn't chase them anymore, even though we were wearing our sun protective gear. Yeah, you you should give your you should give you we need to do something about the clothes budget on it. I've been meaning to tell you, sir. Um, <laughs> we're gonna have to. Can we do have better. like a big portable parasol, or like maybe you know like a giant one? Yeah, could we have like hoods, maybe <laughs> cloaks? You know, instead of instead of making this weird tunnel with all these cloth things over it, what if we put those cloths on ourselves so we can go anywhere? Suntan lotion. Yo, you know it would be interesting if Adar Adar shows up with his orcs or whatever, and they make the ultimatum of give us the sword, we know it's in there, and we'll let you all go. And everyone's like, oh, fuck, what, the sword, what's he talking about? And then, like, the, someone sees this, him with the, the kid with the sword, like, that would be interesting. They could make something happen be, there, yeah. But yeah, they don't usually do that in this show, so I can't see that happening. That's true. I'll just, I'll just entertain it in the theater of my mind. So. I'll enjoy that. I'm pretty sure there's, like, one big scene left for the episode. It takes... 10 billion years, but we don't have to spend that long on it because it's pretty. We can summarize it pretty quickly. Yeah. Galadriel is fucking leaving Numenor. Fine, off she goes. Off you go. Unfortunately, as she leaves, the petals from the white tree start to fall, which is a signal white. to the Queen Regent that this must be the opposite of what she's supposed to do. That this will bring about the fall of Numenor, getting rid of her. And so that is what convinces her then to bring Galadriel back and agree to going to war with her. Imagine selling this to the kingdom. I, <laughs> I cannot fucking believe this shit. Imagine Can establishing imagine the, the, the townspeople fucking hate elves because they're going to ruin their lives, and then an elf arrives and brings us all into a war. For reasons that can't... Let, like I was saying... Good luck, Queen, selling this to your people. Yeah, yeah. They've gone from they took our jobs to they militarized our economy. That's against a foreigner and... invasion for which we have no evidence of. What's crazy is uh, they do it via volunteers, and a shit ton of people volunteer. And I, I don't yeah. know why they couldn't possibly understand why this war is even being fought. We think there are orcs attacking our brethren in the Southlands. We're going to war, lads. Coming with? Like, oh, jeez. I don't know. No. Is that really happening? Uh, no. Like, a, and is, I'm going to stay here. What, um, what are you basing this off? Is it just that girl's word? That seems a bit um. Because the wonky. symbol, it kind of looks like the Mordor Mountains. If you turn it this way here, uh. and all the guards, like, pe they lean in so they can <laughs> like, all see. Whoa. The queen's holding it out. She turns it to the side. See, it kind of looks like the Mordor Mountains, but they didn't do the lake bit. But, and, and, and also, it's, it's really, it's more... This symbol's more curvy, and it's kind of straight on the real map, but it's pretty close. So, I'll tell you all, this is what it means. 
da 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 Southlands and Southlands and Sauron's coming back. There's going to be an evil kingdom of evil. And it's happening all the way over there on the other side of the world or whatever. We, we're going to have to go fight and die for that. Because I had a, a vision from the Palantir where Numenor is destroyed. I have connected the dots in such a way that we must go to this war or else we will be destroyed by a massive tidal wave that sweeps, sweeps over the mountains. And then they say, oh, okay, you, you get this from your father, don't you? This runs in the family. You are following portents. Exactly. I, I, well, I will be, I will, I will state a personal preference that I have. I wish that there was more focus on like the utility and being reasoned into this position other than the signs importance thing. Um, I, that is my I think you're being reasonable because the fact that we've had basically zero attempts from both Galadriel and, I mean, even Ale does Elendil, is he bought into this? I'm, I don't know. Um, I don't know his opinion. I dare not ask. I'm sure he'll give it, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, it's been nuts that um, it, it feels like we like we ate a bread sandwich in um, Numenor. Like, where, the hell, sandwich. where was all the content? Where was all the discussions and the interesting parts? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, where's all the interesting political stuff about, I can't believe we're going to war. We did this because of, wait, for what reason? You've got to be kidding me. There's no way. Like, that we, like this, is, this is a really big deal that you're hint. This is a lot. This is the lives of a lot of men on what is essentially magic hearsay that can't really be. <sighs> Revelations are necessarily first person. Shut so good jail. luck kind of. Yeah, man. Like yesterday, I, people hate you. If I was, if I got woken up the next day and they're like, "Yeah, we're going to war," I'm like against who? We're 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 just chilling on our island. And I was given the story. I'm like, "No, that's horseshit." Can we go in there and kill the old bag? I want a recount of the vote. <laughs> it's um. Put, lock her up in that tower with Daddy O. And this is what we're referring to, by the way. She did indeed end this episode with an army, and she's going to war to the south. And it's just like, what the fuck? How did this happen? It's like, yeah, I don't know, man. It just did. I mean, there's only got like four big... episodes left. We've got to have a big battle in probably episode, like, what, six or something? Seven, maybe? You know what, Mahler? 300 did this better with the, uh, with the Oracle and the Efers. Sure. Where he goes up to get there. Yeah, and, and, and they lie to him, and he's like, nah, I'm going to do what makes the most sense instead of your weird signs and whatever. Also, we got to see some titty. It was just that, like, couldn't she have used more of the evidence she even has? More of the experiences she's had? They didn't do anything. She just said, trust me, bro. And that was it. I need to confer with my generals and sea masters, or whatever they're called. And they have a big meeting. And she gets their input. And there's a vote, maybe. It's like, I, I want everyone's opinion because I'm very unsure about this. And I, and I, I value your input as my generals and... And, and admirals and whatnot and she goes over the evidence and they give their perspectives on it and they say no this is crazy no, no this is just a it's hearsay no we can't trust an elf because that's does she has this to gain from it and that to gain it's such a this journey it would be it would be an incredible undertaking it's never been done before, something like that a scene where this is a big discussion that's happening instead we get a six hour a quasi voyage of her of, of of Gladriel setting off, but then turning right around when the tree starts to lose its petals. I'm like, man, imagine what we could have had if we didn't fuck around. And that is episodes three and four. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Excellent work. Just uh yeah, just a just short, short little EFAP going over some yeah. of the really just some of the the broader points, not really getting into the details, not getting into the nitty gritty, just the general concept of the show as you Three and four. Now you know. These puppies were a lot thicker than one and two. Yeah, I had more, I had more to say. I had more to yeah, say. Yeah, a lot more to say. They're a lot less um, empty and wandery. They start to make claims. And, and then, <laughs> that's where we get to the Every single issues. one of them is awful. It's well, it's terrible. A, I was saying to Jay, because he, he's been watching uh, the New Rick and Morty episodes, the, uh, he, he was like, oh, the third one is like, okay. And I was like, you know... Even if they weren't being written shittily with like the abilities they have, when you reach like a season six or whatever of something like Rick and Morty, it's like it is getting to seriously difficult levels in terms of managing all of the stories that have come before, 
all the technologies, all the establishments, all the arcs. You got to keep all of that in mind when you're writing every news story to make sure you don't fucking annihilate a previous one by forgetting things. Um, I think they've already encountered that problem in Rings of Power, just with like three episodes. They're already like, shit, <laughs> we, can't, we contradicted things we've established already. Oh, shit. It's really hard to keep track of all of our work. Um, and I just find it amusing when shows do that. Like, I almost expect it when you reach like past season five. I think that's considered a bit of a sort of a flashpoint for a lot of shows where they don't usually get better after season five. That's usually they've usually peaked at that point. Um, there's obviously exceptions, but Rings of Power, like three and four compared to one and two, is amazing. In a yeah, bad it peaked way. early, and it's not. It didn't even peak well. It, it, episode two is kind of. Meh. But then yeah. it's all downhill from meh. It's not a good start. And I would even, I'd probably even be harsher than that myself, but... Uh... I think it's outright, it's definitely... When we watched episode one and two, I think it was at like a three and a half. One, Mostly because... Episode one is just super dry. Wasn't... Yeah, they're very dry, not all oh, that wait. much happens. Nothing's really good about it that isn't superficial... Um, substance wise, it's very weak and we don't learn a lot. So not good enough to be a four. I don't think not bad enough to be a three, three and a half. We've sunk with these episodes three and four. I feel it's, I think it's certainly a three at this point. Very bad. Um, yeah. A couple of small a highlights. I don't expect this show to get better. I can't believe we're already halfway through season one. Just can't believe it. Like I said it feels more so like we've finished chapter one of maybe like six. But uh yeah, we're way further than that. Um but hey, Andor's out now. Ooh, oh yeah, that's yeah, fun. Watch and that today. I what I don't I, know anything about it. The common sentiment I'm seeing from basically everybody is that it is slow, dry, and boring. Awesome! I can't wait to watch another one of those shows. <laughs> I was gonna say, man, it's like one wasn't down, enough. With, like enough of this, because the, the funny thing is, She Hulk is like the other kind of bad. It's like concentrated bullshit. Oh, yeah, it's not it's dry. Just, it's just awful. It's it. bad. Yeah. So we apparently they're offering us both kinds. Um, I say both. No, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by how they managed to cock up Andor. That will be an interesting experience. Yes, um, I suppose we will eventually find out, but I will say, certainly before we run out of time, because we're on like nine minutes left, <laughs> Little Platoon, thank you so much for joining us for 11 oh, and honest. a half plus hours. <laughs> it wouldn't be an EFAP if I hadn't joined for 11 and a half plus. No, gen genuinely, I've been like, this has been the most entertaining thing, and I've been watching you guys for, for in your life, years, in the human <laughs> um, history. Certainly, for a good long part of it, I feel like I, I like I've been invited as a Star Wars fan onto a Star Wars panel at Star Wars Con, but like old uh, Star Wars as opposed to I was about to say oh, <laughs> much okay. much less like hatred and resentment and antipathy. Sure, that's a story for um, later. No, it's still kind of giddy making and bizarre and surreal that I'm here. So so thank you very much for having me. Um, Glad to give you the funnest thing you did all day. I feel like. <laughs> I will ask you, because Goga just suggested it. Uh, Christmas or Halloween, what kind of guy are you? Oh, fuck. I prefer Halloween films, but I prefer Christmas as a ceremony. Mm. That is an interesting... That I would... Hmm. Well, I have often would said I, I think Halloween that? has a superior media to Christmas. Yeah, I would rather watch Halloween stuff. Yeah, that's... that's yeah. I, I enjoy Christmas as a holiday much more, but I do like... There's something about the Halloween movies and the spookiness yeah. that's I'll it's better it. than all that. I'm going Christmas to allow it. Movies. I appreciate it. I will allow it. <laughs> you got the big important You've managed part to bridge right. Christmas and Halloween on something, I guess. <laughs> um Yeah, like I said, we our Halloween Final Destination arc is coming on. Final Destination is such a funny set of films. Like if there were a Christmas mm. version of that, I would watch the fuck out of it still. <laughs> like when it's just death is trying to kill everybody on Christmas, I guess. I don't know. Do it. Um, no, he learns the error of his ways and comes good and gives people presents. That's Aww, how it works. Nice. That would be nice. Uh, 
But yeah, well, uh, tell tell the chat, since they've had a very big dose of you, what, what else can they expect if they were to run over to your channel, hit the sub button, and consume everything? Everything? Fuck, well, um... Ugh. The next thing is going to be what we've just discussed over the next Rings of Power video. The last one was two hours long covering two episodes. This one is probably going to be over two hours just covering episode three. But there's a lot of film stuff going on. The thing was created to do a mix of politics and film. Um, and eventually we'll start doing live streams again. Uh, it seems my, my friend sort of has time and decides he wants to exist again. But um, but if you're interested in it, like film stuff, it's like mini Mulder, I guess, in that it's nowhere near as long or meticulous, but it's something you like got, more you got, digestible. You got plenty of your own great shit going on, dude. You don't need to worry about like the idea of a mini Mulder. <laughs> no, I I do my own crazy nonsense. Okay, you you're you're gonna dig yourself out a nice corner of the internet. Uh, so I I was trying to good. finish your video, which is funny for me. Like it's it's rare that I get to say I had to watch your video in pieces because <laughs> that's where everyone. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like oh my god, I'm one of my viewers now. Oh, um, that was such an arse to get online as well. But yeah, no, like there's lots of film stuff. So the next stuff is going to be probably Rings of Power. I'm, I'm going to try and get an Andor review up, hopefully in the next few days as well. Um, but time permitting. Um, otherwise, I think I'm seeing you again, Mulder, on the Drinker stream tomorrow. So oh my, I'll be what are we, there. Do you know what the topic is? <laughs> is oh, it Andor? Is, is it, um, I think he said Andor and She-Hulk. Jesus and Christ. And, and House of the Dragon. Wait, and she and I've caught up on... I gotta, uh, he needs to fucking decide. <laughs> well, the, I gotta, my point, I was just gonna say, I gotta sleep, though. Because, like, that stream will start in exactly 12, 13, 14, is that 15 hours? So I've gotta sleep and I've gotta see four episodes of TV. I've got to be leaving for the office in 90 minutes, and I've still got to watch all of the TV, so I have no sympathy at all. Hey, you can sleep in the office, right? That's two, <laughs> two birds, one stone. Beautiful. Well, hey, I super appreciate you sacrificing hardcore to, to stay on this show then, man. That's, uh, thank you very much. Oh, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it's, this, is, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you both very much. Well, thank you for having me, but also thank you for, like, yeah, years worth of entertainment. It's been great fun. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate you letting us know. We always like it when people enjoy our shit, obviously. <laughs> like this, this, yeah, it's a thumbs up. Because it's, it's funny, we've had guests in the past who'll be like, you know, I could do an hour. And it's like, okay, that's yeah, it's fine. An hour. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. Fine. And then we're done with the intro of the show, and they're like, okay, bye. And it's like, yeah, that's <laughs> great, <laughs> bye. Um, yeah, link is in the description for uh, the Little Platoon's channel. Um, Much obliged. Uh, it's, like I said, I I can personally approve, and I'm gonna keep an eye on your uh, Lord of the Rings breaks down, bleh, breakdowns, because yeah, this I envision that even our coverage is going to get longer and longer the more these episodes go on. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't be fucking twelve hours every time, but hey, you know, you never know. Maybe it is. Strap in. We have no clue how terrible these things are gonna be. I'm I'm just gonna block off twenty four hours for the next one, just just to be sure. Uh... Oh yeah. No. Both will. Well, someone said, "Is this the longest one other than an anniversary?" And I was like, "No, we did actually used to do a lot of eleven forty-five streams." Yeah, we cut that shit out. We stopped because it was ridiculous. We chilled. We <laughs> we were not like the last real. And we fucking annoyed rags. Out. We just did eleven forty-five, and now none of it was super chat catch up. So we just got another whole bulk added to our backlog. Pile it on, I say. Meanwhile, this Saturday we got the stream. Uh, I think Destiny is coming on, and then the Wednesday after that, we got Rakita Law right, covering yeah, yeah. She-Hulk, and then that Saturday, it's gonna be two Rings of Power episodes again. We may very well have you back. <laughs> if you like, so, and that'll be anytime it. you want. It's. I think we're gonna try to have Disparu as well. So it's. This is what I mean. We got another. It's just all stacked. I don't know when we can fit in a time to do, uh, Super Chat Catch up at this point, and we're starting up the recordings for Halloween. Absolutely nuts. And Andor is out. We gotta start doing them yeah. too. God, oh my god. god. Andor doesn't seem bad. And then you when you pile it on top of everything else, it's like fuck Andor. That a little bastard. bit does feel that way. Well we'll give it a shot and uh hey, maybe you know what? Maybe it's so uneventful and so uninteresting we just end up dropping it. Who knows? That would be that'd be nice. I legit on top of all of that, I'm looking forward to seeing the next episodes of House of the Dragon. Like I that's like the I'm really glad that you have a show that you look forward <laughs> to watching for non-meta reasons. <laughs> I, I do too. It's nice. Um 
Yes, the plushies, guys. 17 hours remaining. It's the last time Please you'll see it promoted. Now. On all if you want EFAP. them, buy them now. Do not wait. You need to do it, like, seriously, right now. You've, yeah. If you've fucking procrastinated time is red. this long, you will forget. This is the last, do it. This is the last day. Do it right now. Open up a tab and do it. The time of red is scary. It means that it's going to... Gonna come for you. The time is gonna come after you and kill you with a little knife. Someone said you'll relist them though. No, no. Once once these are done, they're done. This is these they don't are come different back, than yeah. last year's. They do not come back. Once this is over, it's done. There's no way to get them. Um I've already bought mine. Y'all need to buy yours. It yeah, these are absolutely limited time. And like, the quality unit. is the quality is good. Dun, dun, you know, dun, these dun, look great. Dun, 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 dun. Makeshift is good work. Yeah. Um, like I said, there won't be another promotion for these in the form of EFAP because it'll be done by the time... Yep. Even by the time this up re-uploads, this episode. If... Uh, I don't actually know. Maybe I'll try and re-upload oh. this for tomorrow. I don't even know what it'll upload oh, in time um, to do that. Because <laughs> it is tomorrow. It it's is, fine. Don't worry about it. Um, uh, what else? Is, was there anything... Did you want to mention anything, Rags? Is there anything you want to mention? I don't remember. No, I don't think so. Um, stuff's being prepped, but no, well, okay. uh, no time... No time for things. We are I, I no specific time set. Literally one minute away from the actual cap. That's crazy. Um, gosh, thank you all so much for keeping us company, for the kind donations, and of course to our to our guest, the little platoon. I was gonna say thanks to Fringy as well, but you know what? Uh, he hasn't been here for ages. He was only here for what, like eight <laughs> and a half hours? That's not even close to how long this stream was. What a short man. Kind of, kind of He's gonna hate me for saying that. Yeah, um, but yes, as I feel like I just mentioned, you've got all that on the way in the EFAB world. Uh, this will go up as soon as I can get it up. I, uh, don't take that out of context. Thank you very much, mm. all of you, <laughs> for watching, and we will see you next time, folks. Yeah, that's right. And remember, there is a tempest in you. Yes. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.